Babylon's Final Hours, a psychedelic trilogy into the apocalypse, written by J.R. Mason, narrated by Andrew Everding and Caleb Hickman. Prologue. Paranoia in Washington, D.C. Riots in major cities protesting the Vietnam War. And an economy struggling to survive under the pressure. Children sit colorlessly in 4x4 classrooms across America, attentively listening to broadcasts on nuclear survival. Political parties elect Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy to smooth their societal flames. This turmoil, alongside the overlapping threat of the Cold War, combines into a stew that personifies the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. The 1950s is known as the Decade of Conformity. Ironically, the counterculture movement is a major component of the dystopian era. The psychedelic drug LSD rapidly spreads across the West Coast, creating a variety of change from the rise of the San Francisco acid tests to the way journalism works today. The consumption of magic mushrooms skyrockets and the propaganda surrounding marijuana is at its highest. Communism and capitalism hold each other by the throat. The tug of war between these two ideologies results in a historic turning point in our world. The first and second Red Scare, Joseph McCarthy sits at the helm, inspiring future playwrights Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee to produce Inherit the Wind. Racism and sexism make their way into politics. Gender roles tie into the era's perception of women. Jobs become available because of skin, skin pigment. This aspect of American history inspires change in the feeble hearts and minds of the innocent. People speak of an end to the segregation, calling for a great leader to put out the fires of white people in blue uniforms. In Montgomery, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat to a white man. This demonstration with the involvement of the Women's Political Council and the Montgomery Improvement Association leads to the desegregation of buses following the ruling of Browder v. Gay. In mental asylums, their patients experience the worst form of treatment possible. They struggle against the form of doctors in white shirts, against the relentless tides of electroshock and hydrotherapy. With no support from the outside world, these people are outcasts, thrown like dolls beneath the weight of a rapidly changing climate. In this time, homosexuality is still seen as a mental disorder, a fascinating glance into complete immorality. In the Eastern world, American soldiers land on the Vietnam for the first time. This involvement changes the way society views war. The country just barely survived the threats of two previous world wars which were fought on honor, liberty, and bringing justice to the unjust Nazi Germany. This time, the war is about two ideologies, imperialism and American exceptionalism. Imperialism is the foreign drive behind this conflict, whereas American exceptionalism is our homeland coping mechanism. This era, no matter how vile or evil, still remains to be one of the most fascinating decades of American history. In this time, people begin to doubt God's existence and Messiah. A, spectac a spectacle for the aura of today's pastors. However, amidst all this confusion, doubt, and betrayal, the event that brings down civilizations doesn't come from these petty squalors in hindsight. It comes from us. In this universe, America has the militaristic advantage and the Viet Cong become desperate generals. Generals conspire with Chinese doctors to create a disease capable enough to send the American imperialists back to their capitalist wasteland. The disease, Project Runway, takes time, money, and struggle to produce. Numerous deaths occur within this esoteric period, either from elite scientists blackmailing each other or betrayal from inner circle members releasing classified information to the public. Back home, American grows suspicious of China. J. Edgar Hoover, founder of the FBI in 1935, sends agent Raleigh Dijir Amir to the country via airplane cargo hold. Once there, Amir settles in Beijing where scientists work out the clock on Project Runway. Here, he does whatever he can to uncover secrets. On October 31st, 1967, that opportunity unveils itself in the form of rogue Chinese hackers infiltrating government buildings with an aim to leak all classified documents to the public. Amix steals whatever knowledge he can and escapes the country through an underground sewage system. 
Eventually, he reaches Thailand, America's alley, where he boards a ship and returns home with information as valuable as gold. The government withholds the news from the public in the fear of causing mass hysteria. The, so the society is already on thin ice, and this leak could be the pick, the pick that breaks through the surface. Whistleblowers attempt to become martyrs, but firewalls, passwords, emails, written in code, and Fort Knox-esque encryption software prevents hope. Foreign reports are on lockdown in the battlefield. Officers and soldiers lose the right to send letters back to their loved ones, and concurrently, victory gardens begin dwindling. The Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and the World Health Organization, WHO, work together in an attempt to find a cure for the virus. However, the genetic data within the virus suggests its rapid tendency to mutate, mutate making it difficult for the alchemists to create something from nothing. During this time, Russia formulates her own plans for retaliation. Scientists develop an ENT capable to destroy an entire civilization. With these events bleeding into one another, the world becomes quiet in this uncertain time. The smart ones are able to realize the madness, and they abandon their homes for an unknown promise. Some can't cope with the pressure, turning guns to their heads and pulling the trigger. Lone blasts echo through the lifeless streets, riot, riot echoing off the edges of a broken prison. Others remain blissfully ignorant, disregarding the kaleidoscope of mis misinformation and misanthropy. The world engulfs itself in fog, a wave unlike any other. Who can we point the fingers at for this slow crumble? The American dream is a joke. The terror and fear turn into a nightmare. The end of the world doesn't come from a bomb, but from the slow degradation of, a, of our morality. Humans act like gods, destroying and repairing at the snap of a finger and a few million dollars. The era becomes a funhouse mirror, dissolving into countless reflections with winding and morphing perspectives. How do we get back on our feet after this ends? How do we justify and live with the choices we make? What consequences can we can arise without contingency? The following pages record the lives of prominent survivors who aim to build something they perceive is worth striving for. But in this future, without laws, prisons, or rules, what good can come from these ashes? What bad can come from the fire? A man's greed is as sturdy as the foundations on which he built his selfishness and his situation. Selfishness becomes a survival tactic in this era of uncertainty. The only constant is devolution. End of prologue. Chapter 1. Delusions of Grandeur 18-year-old Forrest Whaley wakes up in the middle of a night from a nightmare. He sits up against the headrest, pondering on the horrifying imagery. Don't worry, the voices tell him. You're back now. He climbs to his feet, dragging himself over to the mirror behind his TV. He looks deep into his own eyes, and he realizes his reflection is a lie, a shadow of his former self. A year ago, he was destined to go to college like everyone else, to be successful. Now, he has no dreams, no aspirations. All because of her. While examining himself, he misses the days where he didn't know if he was insane, because it was uncertain. He was dating this one girl, Monica, before they came, before they took all these plans set out for himself. He remembers how beautiful she was, and how different her eccentric personality was different from anyone else's. They were all scared, she wasn't. He can't help but to smile at his reflection, but pain and regret wipes it away. He turns round and looks at the clock at the bedside table. Midnight. He represses all negative thoughts before falling back into bed. Pulling the sheets over his head, they begin chanting, You should have been better for her. You're nothing now. You were everything to her. You treated her like shit. You deserve everything you're getting. You're not worth it. What exactly is insanity? What exactly is insanity? To define it, wouldn't you have to experience both sanity and its counterpart? If that's the case, what's sanity? Being controlled by a government that doesn't give a shit about its citizens anymore? Cameras constantly watching us in public places? Does its affliction really matter in the eyes of doctors at asylums? Or is he just another lobotomy? Too many questions with too little time to answer. He blankly looks up at the ceiling worrying about how much time he has to experience life. Somewhere deep down, he knows something's calling him to change the system, to bring the world out of this dark age. 
However, the thing that's blocking him from doing so is the fact that that something could just be another voice wanting to screw him over. He doesn't know how much he believes in instinct. He's always in this state of cognitive dissonance due to his fracturing mind, making decisions harder. He closes his eyes, damning himself for reading too much about the machine and its tactics. He doesn't know what to make of the world anymore, going to sleep with the conclusion that everyone else is on the same boat as him, that he is the sanest among them all. The next day, he goes to school, where he progresses throughout the day alone and unwanted. There's something he notices about the mindless crowds he walks through. Something about him has always been unnerving. They all act the same. Some talk about hanging out after school with their friends. Others complain about how shitty the condition of the administration is without providing solutions. And the rest talk about their future plans for college. All of it is... unoriginal? And that upsets them. Look at you. Look at how they act. Do you feel any anxiety for not having a plan after high school? Do you feel the nervousness of the unknown closing in on you with every beat of your heart? Don't you want to be like them? No, he tells himself. I'm meant for something else. Something else? Like what? I don't know yet, but the world hasn't seen anything like it before. You're a madman! I know. The day progresses with similar thoughts disrupting his reality. By the end of it, he wants to kill himself because of how loud they get. He goes home thinking silence precedes introspectiveness. He lays in his bed that evening, his parents fighting outside his locked door. The fighting gets so bad that he sneaks out of his house to go to the frequented park across the street. Having a location in mind, he walks to the back of the park, progresses through the woods, and sits down in a small clear. Reaching for a few crushed leaves, he wipes them aside to uncover a small wooden box in the ground. He opens the box, revealing a stash of illegal contraband, a jar with an ounce of grass, three tabs of LSD, and five capsules of molly. He also has the following paraphernalia, two small pipes, one blue and one yellow, a grinder, and a lighter. Do you really want to do this again? Do you want to go deeper into something you won't recover from? Taking a deep breath, he closes his eyes, searching for any other option whatsoever, but to no avail. He grinds up a gram of grass and packs his blue bowl with it. After lighting the grass, he inhales, letting feelings of euphoria and peace flow through him. Only now do the voices quiet down. Only now does he have some sense of sanity. After a few more hits, he pulls out his phone, plugs in his headphones, and listens to 50s music. It's moments like this he admires. In these moments, he ponders on the human condition. How random and vague consciousness is. How do you even define something like consciousness? He used to ask a lot about questions about death and mortality. But then he realized that that's what he shouldn't be asking about. Instead, he focuses on asking questions about life itself. That's when he comes to many queer ideologies. Life is a game. Consciousness survives death and many others. But that doesn't satisfy his need for knowledge. Can one manipulate another person's consciousness? He figures yes, because that's exactly what the United States government did during Project MK Ultra. CIA agents would give the vilest citizens tabs of acid so they would confess a vast range of truths. But what is it that defines truth? How can one with no authority decide what the truth is? The truth about what, exactly? Well, anything, really. The truth about God, the universe's creation, and so on. He needs to know these things, but it's not knowledge he's after. He's after control. With this knowledge, he wishes to manipulate people so they can do whatever they want for him. He starts thinking about his parents. They used to be happy together, but now the days are filled with verbal and physical abuse. Sometimes it's directed at him. He remembers when his brother was in the house. He was their source of happiness. And after he went off to college, that's when it went downhill. They knew Forrest didn't want to go to college, and since they're egotistical, they don't approve of it. He ponders on his brother, Shannon, and how he's living in a mansion in California as a well-known actor. Forrest knows he's never going to be like him, and he doesn't care. He just wants to live in the moment. That's the only way you can enjoy life naturally. You focus on the present, nothing more. He wonders if this is true, and then he remembers that he doesn't have any authority in deciding what's true or false. He thinks about his father, and how much he does for the family, whereas his mother does nothing. 
All she does from his perspective is sit on an armchair with a bottle of beer. She used to be more active, but now she's just a lump in the human collective consciousness. Forrest admittedly hates seeing her like this, but he knows he can't do anything. You can't fix another person's problems. As the euphoria wears off, he looks down at the tabs of acid. He wants to take one now, but he knows he has to balance everything out of if he wants to keep enjoying the highs. He thinks about how wonderful his first trip was a year ago, how life-changing the psychedelic experience was. He remembers the waves, the colors, and how amazing music sounded. At the pink of Pink Floyd's echoes, he felt that his ego dissolved into the lyrics, but his favorite part of the experience were the wavy letters. He remembers having an out-of-body experience, which is common on high doses of LSD. Everything was so clear to him when he was in that state of mind, and he wants to go back to that state of oneness. Only then, only then did he forget all the trauma he went through. Only then did he feel at home. The interesting thing about acid is that it's not addictive, he's just addicted to the trip itself. He decides it would be wiser to leave the LSD for tomorrow, and instead he just smokes more weed. His political stance on the topic doesn't matter. All that matters is that he doesn't. That's the thing he doesn't understand about people. Why do they always want to get into another person's personal business? He hates how expendable those nosy types are. How they just waste their lives not doing anything. He knows he's contradicting himself every time he thinks about this, but he can't help but to imagine a world where this wasn't the case, where the power returns to the leader. In this world, the only thing his people would chase is mercy. His paranoid mind thinks of something creative. What if the people wanted to revolt against him? He smirks, realizing a simple solution to this problem. They couldn't revolt if they didn't know what a revolution was in the first place. All the knowledge would be for him. While the euphoria is still flooding through his mind, he starts thinking about society as a whole. He figures the government used to be genuine around Washington's time. But somewhere along the line, it turned into a business filled with corrupt, backstabbing stockholders and lobbyists. He thinks about how society got here, how we willingly let ourselves turn into this. Hell, the current president is nothing more than a puppet now. He wonders if anybody realizes they're being played. He figures they do, The laziness is a virus worth considering. But what if it isn't laziness? What if it's something more collective? What if they're choosing blissful ignorance over critical thought? He realizes that this is the answer. Since that's the case, why are they choosing to be ignorant? Is the pain of reality that unbearable? His anger hijacks his hypocrisy. He buries the wooden drug-filled box and covers it with leaves. We both know this has to be done. It's the only way. His rationale severed, he sneaks back into his house and takes a nap. That night, he wakes up from another nightmare, and after overcoming the anxiety, he sits upright in a delusional state. You have to do it. You have to kill them. Why, he wonders. They're my parents. They don't care about you. Okay. His heart racing, he climbs to his feet and sneaks into the kitchen. There, he tiptoes to the knife drawer and opens it. Looking down at the blades, the voices begin screaming at him. Drawing a blade, they say seductively, That's right, we know you want to do this. Don't feel guilty about wanting it, it's only natural. He wraps his shaking hands around the blade's handle and walks nervously to his parents' bedroom. Gulping, his free hand reaches for the knob and twists it. He pushes the door open, revealing his parents sleeping in complete darkness. Stepping into the room, a surreal atmosphere surrounds him. Your mom is first. She's done the most damage to you. She deserves this. He goes over to the sleeping caretaker and presses the blade against her neck. Do it! Do it, you piece of shit! There will be more of us if you do- With one quick swipe, he severs his mother's jugular. He doesn't feel fear once the blood starts to flow. Only relief. I'm a sociopath. Finally. He crosses over to his father and delivers 50 stab wounds to his stomach a savage grin widening with every thrust. Afterwards, all the electricity in the neighborhood goes out. Ten minutes later, the entire country goes dark. An hour later, the outage consumes the rest of the globe, leaving humanity in the Stone Age. Two weeks later... Timothy Montgomery, former CEO of Flagstaff Tech, roams through an abandoned nation. The worst part about the apocalypse? The alienation. He hasn't talked to a soul in nine days, and it's tearing him up on the inside. 
Human beings are social creatures, and when you take away that aspect, the only thing you're left with is a chamber of self-evaluation, something Timothy hates the most. He looks down at his blood-covered machete, feeling good about himself because he hasn't used it on a human yet. Gazing ahead, a sign comes into view advertising Seattle. Although you should avoid cities at all costs, he has this feeling that tells him he should go. Why though? Is this his subconscious trying to tell him that he's suicidal? He pauses at the sign, feeling like someone's watching him. That's one thing you can't shake in this world. He examines the option cautiously. Where else can he go? Swallowing his fear, he presses onward. He passes dozens of burnt out cars, each one containing a rotting corpse in its driver's seat. He's gotten used to the smell, but the sight is something that will forever be burnt into his memory. Before he investigates one of the cars for supplies, he pauses at the erupt sound of tin cans rolling across the road behind him. Turning around, his heart drops upon seeing one of them, a vacant shell of something that was once human. It reaches for Timothy, cold groans escaping his mouth with every breath. The groans sometimes sound like the distant screams of its former human. Raising the machete, Timothy walks over to it and slices the bastard's head right open. Black gunk sprays everywhere and the thing falls to the road now with the fate of becoming fossilized. Timothy has never been used to killing the infected. He thinks there's something in them that's still human. He doesn't know if this is a terrifying thought or a hopeful one, but nonetheless, he still feels irrational guilt because every dead one he's killed so far used to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, professors, and so on. He can't picture it, but that's the way it used to be. He sometimes even goes as far to say as to bury the infected in a respectful ritual. But sometimes there's so many that he doesn't have the time or energy. He doesn't know how many he's killed so far, but he figures the number is somewhere in the 50s at this point. Pausing at this realization, he bends over and vomits. The world can't be like this, he thinks. He used to be filled with prosperity, success, and it provided him with every basic human need. Being a former CEO, he tries to keep himself unbiased by also thinking about poverty and political issues, but he then remembers not to focus on the things, on those things because it's bound to keep him at a lower frequency. He remembers the early days of the apocalypse. The overwhelming feelings of fear and confusion are still with him to this day, because they're the only things that have kept him alive. Has he met other survivors that protected him? Sure, but they're all dead now so it doesn't matter. He takes a brief pause. Has he really changed that much already? Has he become so depersonalized that he can't even respect the fallen? He keeps playing these mind games with himself for an hour. It's the only form of entertainment he has. By the time he reaches the outskirts of Seattle, he wants to rip his brains out. Thankfully, the city is quiet tonight. No dead ones aside from a few loners here and there. Every time he kills one, he sees himself in them. He sees how alone they are, and he wishes he could do something to get the images of their faces out of his head. He figures he should find shelter for the night, so he breaks into an abandoned pizzeria. The inside looks like something from the 1980s. However, the smell and the state of disarray remind him he's still enduring a nightmare. He lays his machete down and sits in one of the tattered booths. The table breaks as soon as he puts his hands on it. Alone, tired, and hurt, he starts sobbing into his hands. Images of his parents dying flash in his mind. They were just ripped apart in front of him the infected left nothing behind. And then, there's his sister, his eight-year-old sister, Paula. They were outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming, when it happened. It was just three days after their parents died. They were kidnapped and beaten by other survivors, and they killed Paula right in front of them. He was forced to watch. The night after that, the infected came through the kidnapper's camp and killed them all. That night made him lose his faith in God, because nobody should ever have to experience that kind of trauma. And even if God was real, why would something so loving create people like that? Suddenly, he hears a cacophony of hellish groans coming from the road, from the road he just walked down. He crouches and moves over to the boarded up windows, looking through the cracks in the wood. Slowly, the infected ones begin shuffling into view, and they bring a foul stench with them. They fill up the entire width of the street shoulder to shoulder, as if they're an ancient Spartan army prepared to fight the Persians. He's so enchanted by this movement that he's hypnotized by its absurdity. 
Some of them crawl across the cracked asphalt because they don't have legs. Others look so starved that they look like walking skeletons. The most frightening ones are those who have black ooze dripping out of their mouth. He doesn't know what causes it. It could be a symptom of the disease. While examining the migrators, he spots a particular dead one in the middle of the ocean. It looks like it was flayed because it drags the entirety of its skin as it stumbles down the road. Gunshots light up the night he almost jumps out of his skin. He hears survivors shouting orders at each other in the distance. And he looks along the rooftops to see silhouettes firing off countless rounds. The loudness sends Timothy to the back of the pizzeria, fearing deafness. When they stop, he crawls back up to the window, but explosions make him freeze where he stands. Shit, he thinks. They're bombing the infected. Whoever those people are, they must be highly advanced if they have a protocol to defend themselves against a threat this large. Not only is damage being done, but it's also being controlled. However, this realization is quickly torn apart when a grenade lands right in front of the pizzeria's window. When it goes off, Timothy dives into the bathrooms at the back, runs into a stall, and locks the door behind him. Climbs on top of the toilet seat, knowing the infected must be flooding the place by. Staring at the stall door in front of him, he protects his ears from the rest of the flight. A small group of the infected forms around the stalls. They scratch and bite at the door, but they don't really know he's in there since he's quick with the retreat. He stays in this position for hours until the survivors outside start clearing out the surrounding buildings. Once they reach his pizzeria, they move into the bathroom to stab the infected ones with cutlery. The stall door opens, and Timothy's heart beats with hope upon seeing the survivors on the other side. They all wear black suits and carry military-grade weapons, probably from the Vietnam War. The presumable leader, a six-foot man built entirely of muscle, steps forward. He wears dense clothing to protect himself from zombie bites. An eye patch covers his left eye, and his body is covered in scars. He extends a, he, he extends a hand out to Timothy, which he accepts, and the man pulls Timothy to his feet. They have nothing to say, partly because Timothy is too stunned by what just happened. At their feet are hundreds of dead corpses, all of which are spewing out pus, maggots, unimaginable order to hide him behind a thin layer of gunpowder. Finally, the man introduces himself. My name is Alexander Rudolph. I am the leader of this team. Timothy still doesn't know what to say. Not just that, but part of him doesn't even want to talk. He remembers the kidnappers and what they did to innocent Colin. They invite him back to their camp. He needs to make the right decision. Stammering, he asks, Where are you guys camped at? Alex smiles. You got a thinker. We've camped out at the Space Needle. People either live inside or outside the tents. Several blocks in the city have been blocked off by sandbags and brick walls. We're short, we're secure. We know what we're doing. What do you do for food? We've got gardens growing across the tents. The bombs don't attract the infected? When something like this happens, everyone in the camp stays quiet. How did you know about the horde? The Space Needle is pretty far. When you go to the top of the needle, you get an incredible view. The world stretches out for miles, and it's right beneath your feet. You feel like a king. Timothy closes his eyes and draws in a deep breath. Okay, I'll go with you. Alex's smile grows wide. I think you made the right choice. You're going to see a lot of changes. Timothy feels like he made the right decision too. However, he can't shake the feeling that he has also made the wrong choice. When a man or woman is thrown into a situation as traumatic as this one, they have to keep their guard up constantly. It's survival now, and although the human race has always survived catastrophes, this won't stop Timothy from being skeptical. Being skeptical is his only technical view, and he knows he'll be staying up late at night pondering on what might happen tomorrow. Will these people turn out like they did with Paul? There's only one way to fully know, and that terrifies him. Now outside the pizzeria, the squad surrounds the unarmed Timothy as they march over the charred remains of a once unstoppable force. Parts of a road are craters now, a deadly reminder of the dangers everyone faces. They remind Alexander of the bombs in the Vietnam War, how they just blew everyone into ashes. The worst part about this situation is that he doesn't even know if he's happy to be back home or not. Memories of old friends he lost during the war, flash, war flashes in his mind. He remembers the anguish, anguish and grief he felt every time he heard the news. And that's what made him take a stance against the war. However, he couldn't tell anyone this, because if he did, he would technically be treason, 
he would have been kicked out. When these thoughts kicked in, he thinks about the Viet Cong. He wonders if they felt the same pain and anguish when their friends were killed. Who was the real enemy in a war? Everyone? Timothy takes this moment in because of how surreal it is. A vast city completely abandoned with both buildings and collapsing everywhere. The souls of countless victims limping through the streets as if they are in unbreakable trance. A stench that will take lifetimes to get rid of. Burnt cars and negative vibes of death and chaos. To him, the end is still happening. It's always going to be an unimaginable star in Earth's history. Alexander abruptly stops. The squad aims their rifles down the road. Alex gives them an order. They advance forward and fire off a few shots. Another survivor gives them the all clear. Carry on. Timothy asks him comfortably, How far away are we? We're close. Only a few more blocks. When did this place pop up? Alex whispering says, A few days after the riots ended. They happened that fast? Yeah, almost as fast as the outbreak. Do you know how it happened? Although he does, Alex doesn't want to reveal any information to anybody. It's his own personal vow to keep it a secret. We would prefer if we stay quiet. We're trying to be as discreet as we possibly can. Under his breath, Timothy says, Let's The Space Needle finally comes into view, and a few blocks later they see the brick walls and sandbag blockade surrounding its base. Outside the defenses, guards patrol the nearby streets, They're only concerned with dispatching the infected. Alex leads him to a barred door, which is installed in one of the walls. He opens it and leads everyone inside, and he and Timothy separate from the rest of the squad. From his perspective, Timothy figures Alex must be telling the truth. Where are you taking me? To Judas. Don't worry, she won't bite. What's she like? She's crazy in a good way. She's had this plan out even before the outbreak. She saved me. Damn! Where does she stay? Alex points up to the Space Needle's observational deck. There, she looks over all of us. Guessing the elevators don't work? Hey, it's leg day anyway. Get ready for an 832 step journey. They enter the observational deck by noon, which is now a Victorian style oriental relic. Plants hang around the walls. Gothic bookshelves accentuate the atmosphere, and lit candles flicker across forgotten memories. Timothy approaches the glass windows, awestruck by the sheer magnitude of the disaster. Surrounding this entire complex is a desert of ruined skyscrapers and horde-filled streets. The true enemy in this new world is loneliness. He presses his hands on the glass, fixated by the mysterious aura. Is this, pl is this place humanity's last hope? Turning around, Timothy sees a black-haired girl emerging from the fleeting darkness. She wears black clothing, and the circles under her eyes highlight her exhaustion. She extends her hand, and Timothy shakes it after introducing himself. Alex leaves him alone. She leads the CEO to her queen-sized bed. Kneeling, she pulls out a box of alcohol, almost as if she already knows that he knows who she is. Vodka or tequila, she asks. Vodka. Attaboy. She pulls out a bottle of the clear, harsh-smelling liquid, and pushes the box back under her bed. She then leads him over to a small table, and they take her seats. After pouring shot glasses, they have an enlightening conversation. People die here every day, and I'm supposed to control that frequency. I decide who gets let in and who gets thrown out. Consider this an interview. Why should I let you join our community? Because I want to live. Because I want safety and security. Because I will contribute in whatever ways I can. Timothy takes a shot. Who gave you the power to decide if someone gets to live or die? They did. I gave them what they wanted. I just didn't have a contingency plan for the amount of people dying. Are you asking me to help you? No, but I will ask you this. What were you before the end? A CEO. I owned a tech company that produced arcade games. I was also a stockholder. Good. That means you're good with numbers. I could use your help in rationing resources. So I get to stay? She takes another shot. Yes, you can go back to ground level to pick out your tent. He emerges from the tower that evening with sweat dripping down his face. Exhaustion leads him to the closest tent, and after pulling back its flap, he sees a lone teenager sitting on one of the bunks. The kid looks back at him, 
and they approach each and they approach each other silently. The teen extends his hand, and he introduces himself as Forrest Whaley. He has matted hair and a growing beard. Behind him, a rucksack filled with miscellaneous supplies rests against his bottom bunk. The atmosphere around him is mi militaristic, setting the tone for their conversation. I think you should know something about our leader, Forrest says nervously. What's that? She's out to get us. She doesn't want to live. She wants to rule us. How could you accuse her of something like that? I've been thinking about this for the past few days, and it makes sense. Please, do tell. You saw how she interviews people, how she decides who gets to live. It does seem, it does seem apathetic. I met people like her before the outbreak. All they want is to drain you of who you are. This place isn't going to last long under her control. The walls we have are only one layer thick and we don't have enough fighters if another group attacks. I've told her this, but she doesn't take well to criticism. She's stubborn because this plan was hers. Do you think you could do better? Yes, I have my own plan, and it doesn't involve kicking out anybody who wants to join. That's heartless. Tell me. I see bigger walls, farms, government, distribution of power. I see civilization. Judas is not a long-term thinker like I am. Do you want safety and security? Admittedly, the, fire, the fairy tale dream sounds appealing to Timothy. His skepticism is still prominent, especially now since he sees Paula's smiley, smiling face. Wouldn't she want to live in a place like that? Where everyone's just looking out for each other? Thinks about what their relationship was like before the outbreak. How they would protest against the Vietnam War together. She didn't even know she was part of a historical movement. Ironically, everything's history now. The past, the present, the future, whatever those things meant, are now lost in time, and that terrifies Timothy. He can't get Paula out of his head, so he hangs his head and starts crying. One second she was right beside him, the next she was dead, and he blames himself for it. He could have done so much more for her. Forrest walks away. I'll talk to you more about this later. Timothy shakes his head. This guy can't take a hint. Five months later, Echo Ramirez wakes up in her hometown of Castle Rock, Colorado. She gets out of bed and crosses over to her bedroom window, where she pulls back the curtains and smiles at the snowy, desolate world outside. To her, life is normal. Although she knows about the infected, she doesn't want to accept the world's end. She's unable to comprehend the reality of her situation. She's been able to ignore the trauma by creating the fantasy world inside her mind. Everyone's alive and happy. She has short hair and vaguely re resembles Marilyn Monroe. She walks over to her parents' bedroom and knocks on the door. Opening it slightly, she sees the two corpses of suicide victims lying on the queen-size mattress. They must be. They must be in deep sleep, she thinks. Going back to her room, she grabs a backpack from her closet, and a feeling of stress washes over her. She remembers she has to take a test today and that she didn't study for it. Deciding to skip the day, she throws her backpack back into the closet and sits on the bed. In her mind, cars drive by outside, people go to work, and everything is normal. She hears a knock at the front door and opens it, slightly pissed that her parents didn't answer it. On the other side stands her old boyfriend, Max. Although he's already dead, he was killed right in front of her. Her mind still creates these hallucinations of him because of how important he was to her. Max! He said, she says with a beaming smile, what are you doing? What do you mean? He asks. I'm picking you up for school. Behind him, his friends wait in an SUV. Are you coming? No, I'm too tired! Well, all right. I'll text you when I get there. Sounds like a plan! She closes the door behind her. Now having a free day, she thinks about going to Denver. But judging from the weather outside and the traffic she'll get in, she decides to stay home. She, she hears a knock on her door, and she calls for the person to come inside. Her dad walks in and sits next to her on the bed. You didn't go to school? He asks. I can't! I have a test that I didn't study for! He sighs. You can't keep doing this. Your grades are suffering. She closes her eyes, guilty. I can't stand it! I hate school! Opening her eyes, she sees nothing in front of her. He always disappears. I think I'm going crazy! Somewhere deep in the pit of her stomach, she knows she's lying to herself. She knows Max and her parents are dead, but she doesn't want to confront that. Self-isolation and antisocial behavior has led her to this point. Part of her wants to crawl outside of the grave she's digging, and another part wants to keep living in this fantasy world. 
being alone is better than being in a group. She has a boyfriend, but then again, she's had a lot of boyfriends, and they all left. All her life, she's been the odd one out, the one that everybody forgets, the one that nobody wants to hang out with. She trusts people, and then she loses them. Not anymore. She doesn't want to hurt. She doesn't want. She doesn't want to hurt because of that. She's tired of always falling in the same traps because society needs her to. She looks out the window again, this time scowling. Fuck them! Fuck them for treating her differently! Because she has a different mindset. Fuck them for making her have to fight for her voice. Fuck them for not having given her a chance. Feeling rage, she turns to med meditation to calm her down. Taking deep breaths, she does her best to step back and observe her thoughts, but to no avail. How can I stop feeling like this? She asks. A large knot forms in her throat, and tears flow from her innocent eyes. Fragile and broken, like the atmosphere is something so perfect you can only describe it with words containing dark connotations, her chest starts burning, and her, str and her stress pushes her outside, where she finally confronts the true nature of this vile world. Surrounding her, a land encased in mystery. She spins around, dazed by confusion and heartbreak. She looks behind her, seeing a rotten house where a vibrant one once stood. None of this makes any sense. She would have got groceries from her parents. She hung out with friends. She had a normal life. Has it just been her imagination this entire time? Staring west, a shadowy figure emerges from the snowfall. And then it comes into view. She vomits. And in tra its entrails continuously spew out of its bottomless ribcage. Black bile oozes out of the corners of its mouth, and its arms dangle from their sockets from stringy dead flesh. What has this world become? The creature, frozen by the ear's early winter, falls to its knees, succumbing to the harsh climate. She remembers the psychology course she took in college. The professor was lecturing the class about the importance of social connection. When someone is allowed for extended periods, the minds of some individuals create fantasy worlds to protect prevent them from becoming insane. Is she a victim to this foul theory? Now, having faced her worst fear, she figures she's a lunatic. Is it really her fault in a world like this? What if she comes across another survivor? She needs to defend herself somehow. With guns? She remembers an old police station her father used to work at. It's only a few blocks away. She'd be back in less than an hour. But what's really here for her? What, is she, what does she have that could she return to? A tomb of memories? Ignoring this feeling, she begins her journey through this treacherous climate. Defenseless, she knows she's screwed if she runs through another one of those things, for she has no idea how to kill one. Is there any way she could remember fighting them off when she was in her fantasy world? As if the universe is a poet, she stumbles across another frozen creature half buried in the snow. Its head has a bullet hole in its skull and she quickly puts the pieces together. Head equals dead. During her journey, the only thing she hears are the screams of countless victims. They're so loud, they block out her mind's voice. She imagines how many of those monsters are out there. She questions her origin and wonders if something biological happened in Vietnam. Images of her being grabbed at flash in her mind, and she feels their cold, cranky hands wrap around her limbs. Nothing feels real. It seems that the universe is a wonderful, unimaginable broken mirror. How could the human race fall so fast? She remembers a story her father told her he was involved in the hippie movement and he would partake in political protests. He told her stories about how crazy the people become, about how apathetic they were. She reaches the police station as an ancient relic of the old world. Approaching the front doors, she pushes them open and shivers as she enters. She searches the quiet corridor until happening upon the army. The door is already open. Inside a 12 gauge shotgun strapped in a sheet rests on the floor, surrounded by boxes of slugs. Retrieving the peace, distant memories of her mother taking her to the gun rage flood her mind. Swallowing the knot in her throat, the girl retrieves the piece from the, sh the sheet and loads it. After cocking the gun, she hears footsteps from the corridor outside, and upon turning round, a man runs by the door frame. Her heart pumping, she follows the man to the front doors, where he bursts outside. She follows him until they reach the darkened mouth of an endless tunnel. On the other side, nobody knows. She stops letting him get away. No use in following him without a flashlight. Returning to the police station, she finds a flashlight. In the evidence room, flicks it on. To her surprise, a beam of light flies through the bulb and illuminates the dark space. She goes back to the armory, straps the shotgun in the sheet, wears it across her back, and takes the boxes of ammo. She ponders on the way she found her parents. 
She wonders how long it'll take for them to dissolve completely, as if they're nothing. Now at the tunnel, she flicks on the flashlight and waves the beam across the burnt out carts. The arms of those frozen beasts reach for her from the insides of their metal caskets. They growl and hiss as she passes, flocking the highest proportions of fear. After hours of searching, she finds the weakened man in the cab of a fire truck. The flashlight reveals blood leaking from his wrists, and a backpack rests in the passenger seat. Were you attacked? She asks. The man shakes his head. I just caught him on broken glass. I'm defenseless right now, and I didn't know if you're going to hurt me. She looks sorrow. She helps the man out of the truck. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. I'll admit, it's awfully nice finding someone. Who are you? Echo Ramirez, charmed. And you? Marilyn Monroe, likewise. Would you like to be friends? Yes, I'm alone too. Good, maybe you can accompany me on my journey to Seattle. My family lived there. You think they still do? I'm hopeful. I miss them. Echo weighs her options thoughtfully. Does she really have anything here? Okay, I'll join you. I'm curious to see what's out there. Marilyn smiles. I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I have to get something from my house first. Follow me. They reach the girl's house, and Echo stops Marilyn. She puts a hand on her shoulder. Let me do this. Stay out here. He nods his head. For the last time, Echo enters her house and opens the door to her parents' bedroom, seeing them for who they are, skeletons of suicide victims. No wonder she created a fantasy world. In a situation like this, you have to do anything you can to keep yourself from going insane. She approaches the two beings that used to care for her. Standing by her mother, the girl picks up a lip balm and takes off its aged wedding ring. She does the same with her father, and after putting them on, after putting them on either ring finger, she leaves the nest behind forever. Now officially on the road, she can't stop looking at the absolute de- desolation that surrounds her. Human life is now in the clutches of a demonic force governed by fear and hunger. The fantasy world shielded her from this. It was a barricade and she broke through to the other side. Even the strongest among us have breaking points. Now crying, she stops with Marilyn. He wraps his arms around her. I'm here for you. My parents! She says quietly. I know, I lost mine too. After calming her down, he leads her by the hand into an unknown destiny mercilessly built on pure insanity. Neither of them are certain they will make it to Seattle. However, in the end, is anything certain in the first place? Two days later, they happen upon a cemetery in western Colorado. Marilyn leads her inside. Echo is hesitant at first, but follows him anyway. At this point, Echo has used the shotgun only six times on the infected. However, she's not afraid of using it on a living person. They end up in a grave marked Anne Monroe. Marilyn bows a knee before the fallen mother, his blood getting cold from the snow. How? Echo asks. She had pancreatic cancer several years back, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I can't get the memory out of my head. We were all surrounding her in the hospital room, and she just closed her eyes. Everything was vanished. I lost someone I cared about. Echo chokes back tears. Whatever happens... I hope we can get the old world back. We just need someone who knows our job to do such a thing as that power. You think there's hope? We've survived worse. Marilyn climbs to his feet, and I believe in humanity too. They reach the outskirts of Seattle the following week. Both winter, mother nature infests the metropolis like a plague. A plague as incurable as it is destructive. How do you think those things came about? Echo asks as they walk down an empty road. In Russia, during World War II, the Soviets performed an experiment regarding the revival of organism. They drained his dog of its blood, removed its head, and hooked it up to this life support-esque machine. It changed the face of medical science as we know it, because the head began functioning as if it were still attached to the dog's body. It even responded to stimuli. Its whiskers twitched when touched, and its head reacted to the sound of a hammer. Due to ethical concerns, nobody has performed such an experiment since. If they had this power 30 years ago, imagine what else we've kept in the dark about. They spot the Space Needle, an obvious point of interest. However, they both agree to stick to the original plan. They live they live in a Brownstown apartment close by, he says. Echo spots a small group of dead ones shuffling their way towards them. We need shelter! I don't have enough ammo to fight them off! Next to them, a strip mall encompasses a ruined courtyard. They they enter one of the clothing stores, weak from the journey. 
Edgar watches the group from a window while Marilyn searches the store for supplies. Nothing but tattered clothes and learned hopelessness. As the infected ones pass the storefront, their gaze is fixated on the complex architecture of the needle. They wonder if anybody's in there. We'll check, Marilyn says reassuringly. Echo shakes her head. That's not what I'm concerned about. Once they finally reach the desired brownstone, Echo isn't surprised to see it's burnt down. Marilyn, however, is heartbroken. The people he loved are now ashes. He feels like a victim of a Holocaust survivor. He falls to his knees, reminiscing on old memories he shared with his parents. Standing behind him, Echo watches either end of the road for the infected. Marilyn thinks about one Thanksgiving he had here. His brother showed up high and it ruined everything for him. Coming from a Christian background, Marilyn knew it was bound to happen eventually, but he shows his brother a little pity considering he sp spelt out his own doom. They didn't eat anything that year. They sent his brother to a rehab center and he presumably died there shortly after the outbreak. He chokes on the knot in his throat and he starts crying. He could have done for something more to help. <laughs> and he regrets not doing so. Echo pulls him up to his feet. It's okay, we have each other now. Marilyn sighs. I just wish I spent more time with them. You will when you die. You think so? Yes, because when you die, everything that makes you Marilyn Monroe will die too. Your ego, all of it disappears. And when you don't have an ego, you have everything. You become time, money, and all this shit that makes you marry, grow, and develop. You are energy. You also become the past, present, and the future all in one. So technically, you really will be with them. Marilyn wanders on this philosophy. So, uh, there is no heaven or hell? It's all a state of mind. Hell is me metaphorical for our negative feelings. Like depression, sadness, or anything else like that. Heaven is at the opposite end of the spectrum. Once you understand that, you learn to control your consciousness. Your mind is the instrument that you have to learn how to play. You're control now, Marilyn. When you control everything you used to be in the past, when you learn from it, when you grow from it, you begin to gain control of the future. He who controls the past controls the future. Exactly. What about the other belief systems out there? The Christianity. Some religions only exist to pacify the masses, to make them dogma. How do you know all this? I got my parents' bodies in this house I was taking shelter in. And I created a fantasy world to go with the trauma. When I became sane, I saw them for the first time in ages. But when they actually were dead, I took their witness to remember them. I looked down at them whenever I started thinking. Horde of frozen infected approaches them from the distance, and they decide to start for a space needle. Echo aims her shotgun ahead of her as they walk towards the opposite end of the road, which is void of any threats. They take several detours before they reach the street leading to the space needle. And when they see the, bar the brick barricades and sandbags enclosing a small colony, their heart beats with hope hopefulness. They reach the main entrance, a bare gateway, and they call for someone to open it. A scruffy looking teen approaches them through the falling snow, and he opens it. Welcome to the Neal. My name is Forrest Whaley. I'll take you as our leader. I'll take you to our leader, Judas. Smiling, they got, gladly enter the growing community. Everyone rests in their tents, shielding their lives from winter's fury. The team leads them to the tower's entrance, and they head inside and climb the staircase. Once inside Judas's bedroom, the black-haired girl approaches them in a drunken stupor. Hey, she says wobbly, back and forth with every step. New refugees, Forrest says, disappointed in her al alcoholism. She goes over to a long wooden table and sits down one of the chairs. Come over here. Time to interview you. She pours herself a glass of peach schnapps and drinks it. What? I don't like. I'm your new fearless leader. Hesitantly, they both oblige. She asks, Why should I let you into this fine encampment? Because we want it. Says. Echo chimes in. And protection! Security! Safety! Judas laughs. laughs. We're chock full of that, but that's not the real point of the question. What can you do to better this community? Echo and Marilyn look at each other, stunned by their predicament. Well, Echo starts. We'll take on whatever position you have for us. Judas compliments this. Introduce yourselves to me. They do. Judas points at Marilyn. You are a member of our supply running team. She points at Echo. And you will be his partner, understood? They agree. Good, she sighs. You're free to live in one of these tents at the bottom from now on. You could rest easy. Food, water, anything else are handed out designated times. How 
can you tell the time? Echo asks. The sun, Judy says, smiling. Come on, get with the program. This is the Stone Age now. Once at the bottom of the tower, Echo and Marilyn recuvenate in a FEMA tent, wherein a man with black curly hair sits on a bed. He stands up, extending a hand. A oh, Timothy Montgomery. And they greet each other. The two newcomers pick out a bed. Timothy stands in the middle of the tent, waiting for their attention. Just warning you guys, when Forrest gets back here, he's going to preach about his ideals. He's been doing this to every newcomer for the past five months. Saying through it is practically initiation. Marilyn scoffs. Wonder why he do that. Timothy shrugs his shoulders. He doesn't agree with anything Judas does. You know, I'm not very fond of her either, Echo says. She seems like the type of person that drinks the pain away. The curly-haired man nods his head. She does. It's her only way of coping with the state of the world, and that's heartbreaking. Just imagine what she's seen. Echo looks down at her wedding rings. Yeah, I can imagine it. Does she still perform well? Marilyn asks. Forrest abruptly enters the tent, his expression twisting with disgust. She was drunk when she interviewed him, he says to Timothy. Do you think she's still mature enough to lead? Timothy asks. Relax, buddy. There's nothing dangerous about alcohol. Besides the fact that it destroys your liver and kills brain cells. The boy scoffs. Oh, how tense could something be? Judas is the problem we have to take care of. Other people are on my side, too. Echo chuckles. Ugh. And what happens after you fight get rid of her? We take the others upon her carelessness. It'll take her death for me, but it's worth it. After that, I'll lead this place into the future. I dream of bigger walls, farms, forms of security, divisions of power. If we just take Juice out of the equation, we can have all of it. Echo considers this, and oddly enough, her heart starts beating for him. The way he talks makes her want to learn more about him, his backstory and his ideas. Meanwhile, Marilyn tries ignoring him. See, we do this? What comes right after? Forrest smiles. We have a meaning, and we rebuild. Judas is just a rock in a road. A rock that we could weather down together. The days pass normally in the colony. Everyone does their jobs, and Judas continues to struggle with alcoholism. Her moral takes a steady downward spiral, and everyone, including Timothy and Marilyn, begin to agree with Forrest's ideas. Echo stays up some nights, pondering if she, uh, pondering on if she should kill her, and she even steals a bottle of rat poison on a supply run. She currently hides it in her rucksack, and she thinks about it constantly. She tries putting herself in Judas' shoes. What if it was her that people were plotting to remove from this reality? Does she do things that could cause direct harm? No, but that's the gray area. She does it indirectly. Though Judas' carelessness, many people have died of the hands of the infected, an obvious, irreversible criticism. Echo's moral dilemma leads her to smoking cigarettes, but one night she has an enlightening conversation with Forrest. They are wide awake, unable to get any sleep. The voices are strong in Forrest's mind. Echo's anxiety is now causing insomnia. Timothy and Marilyn sleep soundly in their beds, provoking a somewhat peaceful atmosphere. <sighs> Have to do it, Forrest says blankly. I, I've never killed anybody before. This is the only time I was about to kill Marilyn. That was self-defense. I always think about the reaction if we actually did it. Like I said, the choice is the gateway to what life should be. Are you sure you're not manipulating? You... You always hurt the one you love the most. This is the only way. This is the only way. I'm not manipulating. Have you ever killed anybody? Only those that deserve it. That's a vague criteria. Let me be more specific. I only kill people who I identify as a threat. I kill my parents right before the power outage. So you're crazy. No, you have no idea the trauma I endured because of them. I try to justify who I murdered to lessen the guilt. Do you feel that anymore? No. So why so try to justify it? Kids. This time is political. The colony's becoming weak, so I disapprove of it greatly. There has to be a proper distribution of power. Echo remembers the history class she took in high school. The lecture was about Fidel Castro. He was a man from the mountains. 
He motivated the people through charm and the way he spoke. Is there a connection between him and Forrest? Nonetheless, Forrest's hatred of Judas is visible to other members of the colony, which adds weight to his words. Maybe he's right. She also thinks about her conversation with Marilyn, and this leads her to a final decision. Can we do it tonight? She asks. I can't stand the turmoil. Forrest, happy that he successfully manipulated Echo, agrees. If he can do this, he can convince everyone. He climbs out of bed and looks into her eyes, feeling a spark of love for her. They put on dark clothing and Echo straps on her rucksack. I have rat poison? She asks nervously. She says nervously. Noticing her worry, he puts a comforting hand on her shoulder. No thank it. It's alcohol poisoning. They can't trace it back to you. I know, this won't stop me from feeling guilty though. Echo, this has to happen if you want my ideas to prevail. She knows he's right. They sneak out of a tent, quietly reach in the tower, and enter the treacherous staircase. After climbing for an hour and a half, they reach Judas's bedroom, when they find the sleeping leader with empty glass bottles encompassing the bed. On the dining room table, a half-empty shot glass of vodka. Four stairs for the bedroom door. I'll watch for guards. Gulping, Echo unzips the rucksack and, and retrieves the poison. Before pouring it into the shot glass, she seriously considers if this is the right play. He's doing this for the greater good, she thinks. They deserve to know the truth about her. The weight of the world on her shoulders, she pours a deadly amount of it into the glass and stirs it with a nearby spoon. Placing the spoon back on the table, she pours the rat poison back in her rucksack, straps it on, and sneaks outside. It's done! She, th she says blankly, smiling, the maniac knows he's finally won. End of chapter one. Chapter 2. This is Babylon. Thirty years later. Babylon is a citywide kingdom with fifty-foot stone walls encompassing it. Inside are four districts, the market district, the farmlands, the industrial district, and the housing district. In the market district, people trade amongst each other in harmony then. In the farmlands, peasants tend to the crops, raise livestock, and store food in massive silos. In the industrial district, workers produce consumer goods and steam-powered factories for the people. In the housing district, the citizens live in wooden, stone apartment buildings with an incredible four blocks dedicated to an army in its center. Each district has its own designated leader. Alexander Rudolph leads the army in the housing district. Timothy Montgomery keeps track of the industrial district's power supply. Workers and managers, Russell Martinez, keeps the peace in the marketing district by reporting any suspicious persons to the monarchy. Marilyn Monroe takes reports of the monthly harvests in the farmlands. All information leads back to the monarchy, and they do what they please with it. If they tell the truth, they tell the truth. If they lie, they lie. And if any of the district leaders confront the monarchy, they are disposed of. After all, the only rule in Babylon is to obey the monarchy. All of this is necessary to keep the populace under control. In the observational deck, which is now the throne room due to the massive golden throne against the back wall, Forrest and Echo sleep soundly in Judas' old bed. Forrest's hair has grown immensely, personifying his never-ending descent into insanity. He wears a purple robe, and his staff leans against the bed's headrest. Echo now has a prosthetic arm of Marilyn's design because a bear tore it off a year ago. She has found immense love for the maniac, and they have been together all this time. She wears a red corset, and a thick layer of dirt and dried blood covers her body, just like the other 75,000 residents of the successful kingdom. Forrest's idea continues to prevail, and it only adds to the power that they and the district leaders have. And as we head into the complex political age, one ominous belief looms over all Babylonians. Power is an illusion. If everyone wakes up to this, the monarchy will be overthrown, resulting in a historical rebellion. Those in power do everything they can to prevent this from happening, and they accomplish this through rigorous propaganda, which the kingdom's printing press produces daily. If this idea doesn't exist in their world, nobody can conceptualize it, thus leaving the monarchy in total control. The schizophrenic king opens his eyes, the bags under them acu- the schizophrenic king opens his eyes, the bags under them accentuating his sleeplessness. 
He gets out of bed and walks over to one of the windows overlooking the kingdom. Below them, a steam-powered society wakes up from the depths of deep sleep. He gazes over the gothic structures, unable to be more content with the success of his dream. Look at them. Look at how easily you can control them. Echo is practically wrapped around your finger, unable to suspect us. Keep it that way. You know what happens if you don't. As long as nobody questions whether or not there are other societies, will reign forever. At moments like this, Horus is grateful for them, depending on isolationalism for their success. If the Babylonians ever find out of other societies, they'd leave the kingdom with hopes of finding freedom. Behind him, Echo yawns as she wakes up from a dream. Good morning, she says calmly. Did you get any sleep? You know the answer to that. He stretches his arms. Come on, we got a big day ahead of us. Ain't that the truth? We're still sticking to the original plan, right? Yep, like always. Although the only addition is seeing Dante. Him? Why? I feel like I have to apologize for the fight he had last week. He still hasn't talked to me. Just be nice. Remember Vietnam? It's a fight really worth getting involved in? No, you make me laugh. <laughs> I'll see you at the table. After finishing a breakfast of fresh produce and milk, they kiss each other before heading down the needle staircase. All this time, they both think about the night Judas was killed. They ponder on how confused, hopeless, and heartbroken the colonists look. They remember standing up and preaching about her shortcomings. Their promise about civilization still reverberates in the darkest neurons of their long-term memory. Forrest found a belief the night. The end justifies the means. That is how he gets away with everything now without the people standing in his way. When you use the bigger picture as an excuse for power, opportunities for what you can do with it become limitless. Once outside the needle, they part ways. Forrest travels through the kingdom's dense crowds. The scene looks like a festival from the 1200s. This time, however, the civilians look happy and the morning sun cakes Babylon in a hopeful atmosphere. His first stop is Alexander's house, and, reach upon, and upon reaching it, he knocks on the front door until the general answers. Alex invites him inside, and they take their seats in the oriental living room. Lining the walls are bookshelves full of titles from ancient battle strategists, including works from Sun Tzu. A crackling fire sets the mood for this unimportant report. Alexander retrieves a journal. Forrest takes it and flips through the worn pages. The general nervously folds his arm. As you can see, the, f the heart attack last week took a hundred people. Closing the journal, the king says, 75,000. The population needs to stay at that number. We can cover this up. Okay, this doesn't feel right. Obey the monarchy. Being exiled is the last thing any of us want. Fine. You're the index for all the accurate information, after all. Is there anything else you need to report? Just the usual gang activity off five, off fifth. They're like a ripoff of public enemy num number one. There's nothing to worry about with them. Do you have any leads as to who's ruling them? Not yet. I'll get my guys to look into it, though. Good. We can't have that type of behavior within these walls. If you have to kill them, don't hesitate. That's... You know how our gangs are. I know, but... Jesus, Force, they're still Babylonians. What makes them so special this time? Nothing. Remember what I said earlier about obeying the monarchy? Yeah. Listen to me. A threat's a threat, period. Think about the children. Alex sighs. You're right. Safety comes first. Are we done? Yes. Good. Let me propose an idea. Go on. I want to go to California. Forrest laughs. Ha 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 ha. That's out of the question. You need to be here. But Forrest, do, do you know how much oil the state has? It doesn't matter. We don't need it. We have steam. If we move over to oil, then we constantly have to worry about the supply. Not with how I'm planning on doing it. No. That's the final answer. I have to leave. Now in the industrial district, Forest past the impressive steam-powered factories. Although the levels of coal burning are immense, it's still a better choice than to converting to oil because of how much they mine it daily. He watches the workers through the arch windows, and they're busy doing god knows what. Making guns, cans for food preservation, armor for the military. 
This district is the kingdom's beating heart, and Forrest knows that if he loses Timothy's support, he'd kill them before the workers had a chance to start a coup. He approaches the largest gothic building in the district, the office block wherein Timothy, the CEO, and the managers keep report of their files. When Forrest enters, all subjects in the lobby bow before the king. He ignores them as he reaches the block staircase, the only way to go up. This design is an inspiration from the needle's construction, and the builders got it down to the exhaustion you feel when you climb the 23 floors of the penthouse, where Timothy sits behind a polished oaken desk. An enormous, aging tomb sits on the tabletop, and Forrest closes the door, he simultaneously opens the massive journal. <coughs> Ready for the report? He asks. Ready as I'll ever be. The CEO skims through the torn papers. Uh, from the mines, we extracted 20 pounds of iron ore, 30 pounds of nickel ore, 15 pounds of zinc and tin, 1 ton of aluminum, countless carts of copper. The workers are continuously smelting them down. Excellent. What about gunpowder? There's no shortage. I won't worry about that. What's the black lung situation looking like? It's not that bad anymore now that the miners have masks. Less casualties has to mean that we're doing something right. Has Ruth said anything about it? No. I'm going to visit the hospital tomorrow after our meeting to discuss it with her. Staying positive is the key. He stands up and walks over to a mural that, over that overlooks the kingdom. Smiling, he adds, Echo's pregnant. What? Timothy says, beaming with him. How do you know? Last week, before he went on a supply run, I asked Alexander to steal some pregnancy tests for us. Congratulations! Now we have a prince on the way, or a princess? Thank you, I'm worrying about her though. Why? She sees how sleepless I am. She tries staying up with me, but I never let her. She doesn't understand how people cope with leadership in different ways. Leadership? That's what you're calling schizophrenia now? He whispers, shut up, I'm talking. Timothy doesn't notice. You should tell her that... Does anyone know about the pregnancy? No, I'm only telling you because I know you're smart enough to stay quiet about it. I will. You don't have to worry about it. Ruth's got to know some point though. I'll tell her when the time comes. With that being said, the king leaves Timothy to his work. <coughs> Feeling proud of his accomplishments, out in the streets, he compliments telling Echo that he has schizophrenia. Don't do it! It'll only get worse for you! Deep in his soul, he knows she deserves the truth. Suddenly, his vision gets blurry. His thoughts sound like an egg popping on a skillet. His mind turns into a burning film reel, and he heads into an alleyway, away from crowds. He remembers a time when he was moments away from telling Echo and the voices gave him insomnia because of it. That doesn't matter. He's tired of feeling like a hollow shell, mentally beaten to a pulp by the foundations of its creator. However, what happens next? Narcolepsy? He stops thinking about this, he returns to a normal state of mind, not having anything else to do the entire day until there's an emergency. He heads back to the throne room, finding Echo with Alexander. Forrest, the general says, I told her. Echo intervenes. Listen to him. Forrest gives him the floor, and Alexander paces back and forth. Supplies around, supplies around this state, we are scarce. We're not given. Supplies around this state are scarce. We're not getting anything useful anymore. We have to explore. California might be our solution to this problem, not just for oil, but for discovery. Imagine if we expanded Babylon across the entirety of the West Coast. We'd have an empire. Do you remember how you were when Judas was around? How you dreamt of a better society? How you believed in the idea so much that you're creating right now? This is my idea, let me create it. Goosebumps crawl across forest skin. You got me there. All right, I'll tell you. He looks at Echo. Well, what do you think? It's a good idea, she says. It's the only way why we ever progress. The army's well trained for any possible contingency, so I don't doubt Alexander's capabilities. I believe in him. Forrest nods his head. A consensus has been reached. The general smiles. I knew you'd come around. I'm planning on taking Brock's one, two, and three, which isn't even half of the army. Who's going to lead the others? Wait. Who's going to lead the others? Echo asks. Alexander shakes his head. I'll appoint someone as the temporary leader while I'm away. When he leaves, the king looks towards where Alex left, mumbling, It's not that. I took something from you. It's haunting me. Don't do it, you fucking cunts. We'll invade your dreams until you die, and we'll talk non-stop. You can't hide from us. I, 
have insomnia. That's why I stay up constantly. Good, you're not as dumb as you thought we were. As we thought you were. She stands quietly. I suppose I have something to tell you, too. He focuses on her voices, and this helps him ignore the voices. Go on. I went insane shortly after the holo apocalypse. I created my own world, and I enjoyed it. I don't know how I didn't die. I, I would hallucinate everyone I loved. I came out to it before I met Marilyn, but even after that, I was different. He led me to a cemetery, I had thoughts of killing him. That's when I knew shit had to change. That's why I supported your idea. So we both have a screw loose. I guess so. The king sits down at the end of the bed. I don't know why I didn't tell you before. I'm sorry. It's okay, this is sensitive shit. She sits next to him, puts an arm around his shoulder and kisses him. We rule together. Smiling, he asks, did you finish your job? No, I'm going to see Marilyn now. I'll be back before people start going to those communal diners. Thanks for reminding me how hungry I am. <coughs> now in the farmlands, Echo approaches a small wooden schoolhouse that has an arched roof, and on the bell on it dings as the wind blows through the field of crops and orchids. She opens the front doors, spotting Marilyn standing in the middle of the empty building. Along the walls are black and white posters advertising the monarchy. Hello, Marilyn, she says, grinning. Miss Ramirez, like clockwork. How is your class today? Good. They really like my chemistry lectures. That's fantastic. The smarter they are, the more valuable they become. Yeah. When's the next meeting? Tomorrow, between you and me. I'm not fond of the subject. And that is? Public execution. Marilyn shudders. Are we really making healing machines an issue? Forrest says it'll send a message. A message? What kind of message? That's a monarchy. It's oppressive. I'm trying to make him see reason. Good luck with that. I'm beginning to question him. I'll keep that a secret. But if he finds out, we'll associate you with gangs and throw you in the dungeons. It's kind of weird how we're turning the term rebel into gang. It's how he keeps the masses in line. If you associate negative condemnations to something, people will stay away from it if it means keeping them safe. It's some kind of aversion thing in psychology. Damn, I wonder why our journalists don't put that in the newspaper. That is for the greater good. Do you remember when we went to the cemetery? We were envisioning a better world, and Forrest is the vessel for that. He gave us the inspiration we needed. He ponders on this. Sometimes I feel like he uses me. Why? Look around you, I built most of this city. All the plazas, the arcades, the houses, and the walls are my design. Hell, even your arm is... I get no credit for it. Here's what's gonna happen tomorrow. It'll do its introduction, and then someone will turn them want me to design something that'll harm people. I'm not sure if I'm ready to face that. I know you're in a tough spot, but look at what we have. Despite it all, we're still fortunate for accomplishing this. I don't know, maybe I was wrong for joining the colony. You weren't. You have no idea how much you've helped me during that time. Marilyn smiles. This is why I like being your friend. You're my only source of sanity in this world. The world isn't insane. We are. We will never learn from our mistakes because of our arrogance and greed. That's why we got us here. So what do you think uh, can get us out of this cycle? Selflessness. That's not going to happen. Look around you, Marilyn. Monarchy gave you a place to feel safe and secure. We didn't have to do that. We felt like it was our obligation. Who, what's gotten you in the dumps? I just feel trapped here. I built places for families to live. Yeah, I still feel this isolation that I can't explain. Sometimes I feel right before bed, and that's when it reaches its peak. It just feels like everyone's at a distance. You've got to change your perception. On what? On everything. The monarchy, the district leaders, the apocalypse itself. Forrest helped me see it as an opportunity for change. Maybe I can help you see it that way too. He walks towards the door. I've got to go to the monkey district. Get to join me? I will. I, have, I will have to get the report from Russell anyway. He's not there. He's in the hospital because there's some kind of flu. Ruth's looking after him. Who's in his place? Jeremy. But he won't be at the meeting tomorrow. He doesn't feel like it's that important. Just before dinner, the king finally arrives at Dante's house, his last destination. Knocking softly, the monarch asks if there's anybody home. The door clicks open, revealing a man with a mask of rags covering his face. Eye holes and a mouth hole are cut into the fabric, but no skin can be seen. As if the poor fellow knows a personal sewer. Can I come in? 
the rules quietly up? Go ahead, after the Majesty steps in. Dante closes the door. I know what you're here for. I just want to say that I'm sorry too. Really? Yeah, it was wrong with me for, to bring it up. I just thought it was good enough for the inner circle. You are good enough. We just don't have the need for any more people. What about Russell? He's barely doing anything. Hell, Marilyn prefers Timothy over him. Dante, don't start it up again. Now, have you seen any gang activity? Grunting, he responds with a short, nothing noteworthy. Good. Do you want me to come for dinner? No, I have something to catch up on some reading. Thanks for the offer, though. Smiling, the Majesty says, I'm sorry for being such a goddamn asshole. Trust me, I noticed the value of your work. Dante gestures towards the door. Go on. Your wife needs you. After she talks to Jeremy, Echo returns to the needle to get ready for dinner. Although there's a division of labor, it still takes them all day to walk from one place to the next. Because that's the sheer magnitude of Babylon. When she climbs all the way to the throne room, she finds Forrest cooking two dumplings in the kitchen. The smell is reminiscent. The smell is reminiscent of a Chinese cafe. Well, this is interesting. She, sh <laughs> she says, chuckling. He laughs. <laughs> Shut up. What are you cooking, Chef Whiteley? It's for one of the communal dyers. They're huge fans of my dumplings. How can I not help out? See? You can be nice. No more self-hatred. Stop. It's almost done. Do you need anything before we leave? Just a water bottle. I can't wait to hike all the fucking way back down. They begin their descent. The evening life of Babylon begins to cycle below them. Crowds are dwindling down. Musicians are playing on street corners, and the freaks of the kingdom perform circus acts for the curious. Babylonians in the housing districts hang their pennants from their windows, signaling a peaceful day. This stage of the daily rhythm is the most interesting one, because it's almost as if they're in tune with the ominous vibes of twilight. Now is when everyone starts thinking about their past, because they have leisure time, and this has a ripple effect on the altitudes as the day continues. The monarchy enters a communal dyer, whereupon its occupants hail them. Once everyone settles down, Horse puts his dumplings with the rest of the buffet, and everyone lines up for them. The monarchy get their food and sit on an empty table. Echo takes their minds off the queer scenario. Is your opinion on morals changing? No, it's still the same. This is about meeting tomorrow, isn't it? Public execution? Do you really think that's the right play? We need to show them we're serious about crime. Cri <coughs> crime prevention is more important than humanitarian prevention. How is public execution not a display of crime prevention? Jesus, Echo. I'm just saying there's other options here. Obey the monarchy. I am the monarchy. Don't say that shit to me. You're right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. She lets out a dreadful sigh. <sighs> Who would do it? I don't know. We'll figure out tomorrow. If we even approve it. Returning to the throne room with full bellies, Forrest notices that the first time in years, the voices are finally quieting down. However, he takes it as a bad omen, for he knows the only nature is evil. When a man loses control of his sanity, he can't afford to let his guard down. For if he does, it might give away to the other ailments of our collective unconscious. According to the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung, we all collectively share unconscious archetypes. The mother, the father, the wise old man, the clown joker, and other figures of that nature. What Forrest understands is that the voices combine these archetypes in an indescribable way, making them all in one and none at all simultaneously. Waking up, Echo feels anxious about the meeting. While Forrest gets ready, he notices her acting slow, encouraging her to get up by ripping the covers off, thus provoking a groan from the queen. She reluctantly dons her red corset as Forrest grabs his staff and they leave, holding hands. They approach Babylon's most creative structure, the clock tower, an automatic mechanism powered by steam Maryland's, that, of Maryland's design. Big Ben is the main inspiration be behind its aesthetic. Other features from Gothic buildings in the kingdom blend into its integrity perfectly. They enter the building and approach a set of spruce doors within the backmost wall. Above, our head, above their heads are gears, wiring, and other complex creations that make their ticking hands move. Opening the door, they proceed into a small chamber with the district leader sitting at a round table. Windows line the outer walls, allowing the light to create a heavenly atmosphere. The monarchy take their seats, and the meeting begins. The king stands up. This gathering will cover the issue of public executions. We will discuss whether we should implement it into our society. You may now express your opinions. Echo remains quiet, for Force already knows what she thinks. 
Marilyn is the bravest among them to start things off. Where are the ethics? It's not a matter of ethics, Alex assures. It's the solution. The dungeons are rapidly reaching their capacity, and we need control of the daily unflex somehow. Marilyn appears forlorn. How will we do it? The king sternly suggests guillotine. Quick, easy, and powerful. All we need is someone to build it. Scornful, Marilyn responds with, You only want me here, so you can force me to make one. Timothy chimes in, You're not thinking about the bigger picture. You'll be protecting families and children. A knot forms in Marilyn's throat. I invest this game so people can be safe. I didn't expect to be killing machines. This bolsters force the sternness. You are not building killing machines. You know what those criminals have done are still doing? Marilyn leans back in his seat, scoffing. Obey the monarchy. Bullets suddenly fly through the windows, and everyone falls to the floor. A case engraces Timothy's cheek, but he survives. They barricade their heads with their hands, covering themselves from falling glass. Shards scratch their backs, but nobody is severely injured. The surprise attack quickly ends, but everyone remains on the floor. Fear keeping them there, taking one for the team. Marilyn stands up and approaches a broken window. All the nearby streets are empty, so he exits the meeting room and opens the clock tower's front doors, revealing Dante. Forrest his old best friend, standing on the other side. At the sight of his bolt-action sniper rifle, he punches the mercenary in the jaw, knowing the true purpose of public execution. Whether, whatever Forrest does now, he fully supports. In the meeting room, Echo has similar thoughts. Long live the king. Next morning, Dante wakes up in Babylon's cruelest location, the dungeons. <laughs> Woeful cries from other inmates leave the burnt man wondering what's provoking them. Could starving rats be eating him alive? Is somebody torturing those criminals? He tries moving, but the chains around his wrists and ankles prevent him from doing so. It was part of the plan, becoming a scapegoat. However, the agreement comes from a sickly curious part of the skepticism. He plans to survive this so he could tell his gang about their heinous treatment of prisoners, and when it gets out, it will spark a coup. No civilian has access here because this is hell on earth. His heart drops when the cell door opens, and it drops even further upon Echo's entry. A cold draft floats through the room as she shuts the door. Genuflecting them before them, his silence gets so intense that neither can breathe. She looks into his eyes without empathy, and that stare embeds itself in its memory, for the only thing he sees is the last circle of hell. The mask is off, and the monarchy just plays roles. Shakespeare once said that all the world's a stage, and the moment personifies the truth. His heart rate increases, and the lack of ventilation causes him to sweat. The air feels as if you're rotten. The air feels as if you're in a rotten log cabin in the swamps of Louisiana. Echo finally speaks. He you know you weren't alone. Dante stammers. Think, think what you will, but you know nothing. What do you mean? You think you got it all figured out? The newspapers, the Soka gangs, the full presentation of the monarchy. I know the truth. This is an oligarchy. It's just as transparent as leaders of the old world. Echo scoffs. Do I care? I'm only here to protect my interests, to keep people like you off the streets. Now tell me who you're working for. Dante starts laughing maniac, maniac like a maniac. <laughs> Too many to name, and they're dying with me. You can torture me, deprive me of food, or bury me alive. I still won't talk. After this, Echo leaves the cell and returns to the throne room, finding Forrest staring out the window. She tells him about her meeting, and he leaves, knowing what has to be done. His first stop is Alexander's house, wherein he tells the general to put the California trip on hold. Following this, he heads to the farmlands and eventually reaches Marilyn's schoolhouse. He knocks on them, and a teacher comes out, apparently appearing pale from yesterday's events. They start talking on the porch. The king says grimly, I'm going to need your help. With what? I need you to make LSD. Lysergic acid dilethamine? Yes, you're the only person with a chemistry background in the kingdom. If you do this for me, I will honor you for everything. I'll build a statue, I'll make Timothy stop hating you, and I'll wipe away all your guilt. No, what happened yesterday got me on your side, but I still think you're eating. If you agree, I will grant you to access to lead the kingdom. I will also allow you to create what you want without permission. On top of that, you're free to speak your mind and will not be considered a gangster. You've done so much to help, and this is me giving you credit. He stands silently, weighing his options. What outcomes could arise from either scenario? He closes his eyes and nods his head, becoming a hypocrite to his own beliefs. I need at least four or three weeks to make it. What? Why? I need a hazmat suit. 
I got fungus from bad rye and other things. This process takes time for us, time we don't have. <gasps> the king looks up towards the sky, allowing the sun to warn him. All right, after this thing is done, the privileges will be yours. Forrest's next stop is the hospital, a gothic piece of architecture resembling the Waverly Hills San Sanatorium. Its aesthetics come from the 1940s, a time when mental illness and regular sickness was taken as a joke. Pillars lined the outer walls, and Corp was just out the woodwork. Here, doctors perform queer practices such as lobotomies, hydrotherapy, harvesting useful herbs from plants. However, the lack of sterilization allows diseases to breed amongst ignorant patients. Once you're inside, you're lucky to make it out. Although the kingdom has a medicine factory, an outbreak of any kind would ruin the hospital, for medical supplies are the most difficult to manufacture. The king approaches a receptionist's desk, and behind it stands a blonde woman wearing her hair, in a ponytail. <coughs> Anxiety prevents her from speaking. Uh, are you wanting Ruth? Rachel, how many times do I have to say this? You don't have to be nervous around me. Uh, I can't have it. It feels like I'm talking to a god. His ego grows with every word. Thank you. I hope you know I try. The effort's worth it, but yes, I am looking for Ruth. Have you seen her? Rachel laughs nervously. <laughs> She's in building B. I paid her, but I obviously can't. We'll get that one day. The king, the king enters a massive corridor that spans off the left side of the lobby. And the voices speak to him as he passes the patient's room. Do you notice how big Echo's stomach is getting? Your baby is about to be born. And she's going to be born under these conditions. She's not going to live past a week. And how many people are dying right here now? If you step into one of these rooms, you might as well sign your life over here. Not that it was worth anything to begin with. For a split second, he sees his father, Sh Sharon Whaley, standing in one of the door frames. The father looks back, only to re reveal an empty face. Feeling lost, the monarch strolls until he finds Ruth exiting one of the rooms. Upon seeing Forrest, she manifests a great look. Concerned, he asks. What is it? Uh, we think there's a Black Death outbreak in Building A, I'll show you. She leads him to a darker part of the hospital. Less candles line, the walls, an ominous vibe resulting from this. To Forrest, this is just a place where people go to be sick, not to get actual help. Ruth walks up to one of the patient's doors, opens it slightly, and lets Forrest look inside. He analyzes beds with convulsing Babylonians on top of them. Black spots, blisters, and rashes cover their skin. They're practically sweating through their sheets. Lost in thought, she says. Lucas's medicine factory won't be able to help with us. We've never had to deal with an outbreak before. We don't have the supplies necessarily to cure these people. If it gets worse, who knows what might happen. King ex I the king exits the space quickly. I know what to do. Arriving at the commander's house, Force meets up in the living room. There's another situation popping up, the messiah explains. It's putting me in a position where I have no choice but to send you to California. On your way there, you must look for medicine. Enough for Lucas to work with. If you insist, Alex states, I'll appoint my friend Heather as the temporary commander. I trust her with everything I know. I've been training her in case of something like this happening. Poor scoffs. Oh, you know I give in, didn't you? The commander smirks. I'll get there eventually, and I did. The king grows quiet, analyzing the ground beneath its feet, thinking about his assassination attempt. This could happen again when the best strategies in Babylon leaves. Stresses push the monarch to sadness, provoking clear, sparkling tears. As he sobs, the pressures of being a king pour out of him, his breath poking in his heart like pins and needles. Alex places a comforting hand on Forrest's shoulder, not knowing how to fix this. They sit for several minutes in silence. Horace stops crying and wipes his eyes, figuring these moments in life will happen until the end. Gathering himself, the king starts for the th front door, but Alex stops him, calling his name. What? The crown, the crown demands. Do you know what it feels like to just wait for something bad to happen so you can prepare for wait happening a second time? I know you do. I'm not in the mood for patronizing you. That's all life is, a waiting game. But you don't have to wait anymore, because you know what to need to do next. Forrest enters the dungeons through a trapdoor in the bottom of the watchtower. The lighting a lantern, the crypt-like area before him comes to life dramatically. As he passes through corridors of suffering prisoners, the voices talk to him. What you're gonna do now, torture? Are you gonna beat it out of him? We know you will because we'll make you. You're under 
our control. Like, you've always been. Your mind is a masochist of life, and we rule over it. There's nothing you can do. If you kill him, his voices will be in your head just like the rest of your victims. You hear the people you kill, you hear me, you hear me, and me. You remember who I am. You will see my face. Horace closes his eyes, remembering his kill count, and he opens them, standing in naked disappointment. 15,349, that's how many of us are. And that's how many you killed. You're paying for your crimes, Forrest. It's your fault for not being worth a damn. He gazes into the cell, Dante quivering against the back wall. Upon spotting the king, the inmate spirals into a panic. Do you see how you make people feel? You have no idea the damage you caused society. This is not a better world. Forrest wraps his hands around the cell door, opening it slowly. You're so predictable. After closing the door behind him, the monarch genuflects before the rats, staring into Dante's fright, finding nothing else. You, you. The trembling Babylonian stammers. The oppressor stares blankly. You know the truth. Dante feels an odd sense of relief. It's all, all for show, isn't it? Do you know why I make Babylon a kingdom? It could have been anything else. He pauses, thinking. It's a kingdom because I need to put the Babylonians in a society that was known for having terrible education. I keep them dumb, the population is easier to control. Why do you think we don't have libraries or churches? They can't know about other philosophies. Are you telling me this because you're gonna kill me? The king smirks. Not yet. Today is your lucky day. We're implementing a public execution system, and you're going to be the first victim. You don't have to be, though. All you have to do is tell me who you're working for. I won't talk. If I live, I rot. If I die, at least it'll stop the suffering. I know you used to be friends for us, but... Time changes with views. I always get what I want. After your next meal, or the one after that, you'll be thrown into a state of mind you can't control. Who knows, maybe the paranoia will be too much for you. You're going to drug me? Yes, I have to. You'll never under I'll never understand people like you. You think you could change things, but you can't. He reflects on who he was before Babylon, and how merciless the, wor how merciless the world can be when it comes to a change in perspective. Uh, I didn't mean for that to come out, I'm sorry. You used me like... You, you used me, didn't you? You were a rebel. The king breathes heavily. The past is the past. It's part of you that wants a better world. I've heard stories about you. You know we are gangsters. We want exactly what you desired all those years ago. What turned your dream into a machine? Forrest punches Dante. Don't you dare call my dream a machine. It's nothing like the government of the old world. Do you really think this place is a dictatorship in an authoritarian state? You're wrong. People are safe here, and you want to take that aspect away. That's why we call you gangsters. Don't worry, in a few years, you'll be known as terrorists. Vernacular also changes with time. Leaving the cell, he adds nonchalantly, Rot, you swine. Now alone, Dante's anxiety becomes overwhelming. He can't even trust what he eats anymore. He can't comprehend the web of mind games. Either Babylon's government is an endless maze of contradictions, a pattern with no beginning or end. It's a monarchy, yet other people have power. It has to be an oligarchy. That's the only logical explanation. He tries labeling the manipula manipulation tactics in his head. Yellow journalism, nationalism, a busy work schedule. A swirl of control, a black hole of selfishness cowering behind the wall of fairness. He feels the dirt of the floor with his toes, the cold earth irritating the burnt skin. This is how it ends for him. After discovering the ultimate revelation, death follows, and the ultimate revelation is one dreadful fact. After fear comes society. The oligarchy is the fear, and they have won. He remembers a very fascinating concept from the old world, the new world order. According to this idea, the richest people in the world want to be in control of a society that has one government, language, currency, and religion. Babylon be the new world order? He bonders on this strange connection and wonders if Forrest knows about it. Hell, from their conversation, anything's a possibility. He wonders how mad someone has to be to create this world. He's never known anybody of this caliber. The governments of the old world weren't even this corrupt. Is stopping the system possible? Another queer thought comes to mind. Babylon's currency, or lack thereof. He who controls the money controls society. But since Babylon has no money, what is the equivalent? The market district. The market district is the answer. The Babylonians boycott trade, they'd stop working, and then the system would collapse. He sits upright. How can he make them boycott the bartering system when they work to trade? How can he make an entire society do this? 
The government's deception is deeper wood than what he originally thought. In the throne room, Forrest holds Echo in front of a mirror. His hands rest on her gigantic belly, and they're happy her pregnancy is ending. He feels the baby kick, and warm feelings envelop them. Feelings that boil mixed into the one word, family. Forrest pulls away, and he kneels by their bed. He grabs hold of something and yanks it out, revealing a birch chest with a steel lock. Removing a key from his robe's pocket, he inserts it to the lock and pulls it apart. After he opens the chest, Echo gasps. Inside are two golden crowns. Tomorrow is our 30th anniversary, he starts. I gave a tip to the metalsmiths. There's gotta be some way to constantly fool ourselves into believing in what we are. This is how. That evening, Forrest shows up at Belbalon's gatehouse under his crown. The gatehouse has two corresponding gates, each on opposite sides of the watchtower's base. They open and close from a pulley system of ropes, which leads from the top of the gates to an open window near the top of the tower. Whoever is manning it acts as a gate keeper. The gates themselves are of a light material to make the lift easier. He gazes through the bars, out towards the drawbridge, a massive project that spans over Lake Washington. A body of water separating the kingdom from the mainland. He remembers working on it himself all those years ago, alongside Marilyn, Timothy, and the other usual suspects. Forrest cups his hand, shouts, LIFT, and the gates open. The commander appears from behind the monarch, passing through the gatehouse. Groups of armored soldiers march closely behind him, carrying swords and scabbards and 1960s assault rifles across their chests. The gatekeeper closes the gates, shutting Alex and the others off from safety. The days pass quietly in Babylon, and during this time, Marilyn works on his project. He works on the first day, gets ready, and heads outside. He makes his way to the industrial district, envious of the passing crowds. They find out what he already knows, a revolution will ensue. The interesting thing about knowledge is the more you know, the less you feel because you can't express it without sounding condescending or pretentious. Here lies Merlin's dilemma. He wants to express this information, but Babylon rejects the arts. His only, ex his only chance of expression is through construction of the monarchy's needs. He heads into an alleyway that divides two factories, and he happens upon a metal door at the end of it. He knocks on the door, and the slit near the top opens. When the figure on the other side sees Marilyn, the slit closes, and the door opens. Marilyn gives the doorman a handshake and progresses inside. This club is home to Babylon's most peaceful secret society, the Lucky Nines. They sit around tables beneath candlelight and play poker, auction off prized possessions, and drink at the bar. This place hides in an abandoned room behind a furniture factory, and it goes unnoticed by the busy manager. Marilyn doesn't come here that often, although he wishes he could. But this is the only place in the kingdom where he doesn't feel trapped. He approaches the bar and sits on a stool. Telling over the bartender, she has red curly hair and wears a leather dress. Rebecca, Marilyn starts, it's good to see you. I need your help. Flickering lanterns illuminate her voluptuous. Haven't seen you in a while, what's up? The monarchy wants me to set up a lab for the kids and I need equipment. What kind of equipment are you talking here? Medical shit, not for lengthy chemical process. I'm talking glass machine and you can't even pronounce in bottles and chemicals. Rebecca leans forward, her hands pressing down hard. Lucas is the guy you want. He manages a factory that produces medicine at the hospital. We're under hard times. He has everything you need. Do you think his factory has a room like this one? Dark, unknown to the public? Maybe ask him. His factory's down in the verge of the left. He nods his head. Thank you. Out on the road, he asks the workers to point him into the direction of the vaccination plant. And he eventually ends up at the front doors. He enters the dark building, the original factory of the industrial district. Inside, workers in lab coats surround complex, steam-powered machinery. They wear protective gear, a vague reminder of the Centers for Disease Control. He progresses through the building until he happens upon the manager's office and he steps inside. A man with curly black hair and a shaven face paces back and forth nervously, stressing out over some internal affair. He notices Marilyn, confusing causing him to stay still. Hey, he asks. Are you Lucas? As far as I know, I'm Marilyn. I have a proposition for you from the monarchy. The monarchy? Let me hear it. They won't you let me access any spare dark rooms I have machinery. I'm conducting a chemical process. Lucas chuckles. <laughs> what are you making? Cure for cancer? That's between them and me. When I'm done, you can pretend it didn't happen. Remember, obey the monarchy. You don't have to spout that bullshit. I'd do anything to help them out. I'll give him a tour and set you up with everything you need. He stands up, anxiety ridden. <laughs> There's not work at the hospital. We're running out of shit to produce, so I'm sorry if I seem on edge. 
The days pass, and Lucas helps Marilyn set up his LSD lab. When they're done, Lucas leaves them alone. The teacher dons a hazmat suit, gloves, and he pulls out a bag of regret fungus he got from the farmlands. He puts the baggie on a table, sets up his flask and bottles the chemicals, spreads out countless chemistry notes across the floor, and begins working. Patience is the true element in crafting LSD, and mainly because of how much time it consumes. If one thing goes awry, if he exposes himself to any carnis carcinogens, then he's dead. That is a dangerous procedure, and it's important for organic chemists to take it seriously. A major goal of the process is to extract the ergot alkaloids, synthesize them into a molecule called iso isolacergic acid hydrazidyl, and isomer isomers isomerize it. Isomerization leaves behind isolysergic dilethamine, where Marilyn isomerizes it. Where Marilyn isomerizes it again to produce active LSD. Although he performs much more difficult tasks, that is a basic assault for just one more a part of the queer projects. During his time, he thinks about his connections: Russell, Forrest, Echo, Alexander, and Timothy. He hates Timothy more than the monarchy, and this has been going on for years. Every time they converse, the CEO has to own the subject matter, and the teacher can't get a word in edgewise. They only talk about his accomplishments and his pride, something Marilyn doesn't care about. They never talk about his problems, it's always about the CEO. He wants to talk it out with him, but Timothy wants no part of it. He doesn't want friendship, he wants attention. This causes tension between them. The district leaders and the monarchy, especially during meetings, he thinks about going to the monarchy to report this problem, but he knows he can't handle it himself. It doesn't have to be a big deal. He can never understand egotistical people, and that personality type has always been his least favor. Despite this, he carries on working, feeling like a slave. The monarchy has him under the thumb. Although he supports them, he still questions where his loyalties lie. This question has no concrete answer, because it changes all the time. If he gets a gut feeling about not trusting someone, he follows it. Guilty until proven innocent? That's his philosophy. In a world like this, is that a bad way of life? The day after Marilyn finishes the process, he leads Echo down to the dungeon by the light of a lantern. Besides brush against the jagged walls of the rocket, rocky corridor, at Dante's cell, Echo produces a ring of keys from her corset's pocket, and she unlocks the door. Marilyn hands her the plate of LSD, lays food, and she proceeds inside. When Dante sees her silhouette, he sits upright, cowering it against the cell's wall. Rocks dig into his front back. He knows today's the day, for someone, for someone else usually brings him the pig's log. She gives him a spoonful of the disgusting unknown food, and he keeps his mouth shut, but she forces it down his gullet. He gags and throws it up. And Echo tries again, not retrieving the spoon out until he swallows. In tears, Dante falls to the side. He regrets being a gangster. And if he survives this, he's going to poison them and slit their necks in their sleep. When it's done, Echo tosses the plate aside and waits for him to undergo the life-changing experience. When you unwillingly drop acid, a bad trip becomes inevitable. What, does, what makes the difference between a good trip and a bad trip is the state of mind before it begins. The drug takes about 30 minutes to kick in, and it comes on lightly at first. You begin to hallucinate letters and time waving back and forth. Before you know it, you've thrown into unimaginable realms of thought. How did I get here? Who am I? These streams of consciousness start to calm, but then again, that's how it all storms begin. Dante's vision warps, and the jagged rock walls of the chamber feel sharp against his back. Echo's presence began bringing on the anxiety, a terrible thing to experience when undergoing a trip. The crown she's wearing sparkles, although there's no light source aside from Marilyn's lantern. Her eyes sink into her skull, and everything begins melting. Dante feels like he's sitting on thin air, nothing beneath or above him. Gazing at the walls, spiders crawl out of the cracks and spin webs around the inmate. He shakes and sweats, for nothing will ever be the same again. LSD works by changing your perception on the universe. Everything will imagination is manifests itself into reality, causing its user to question everything. Where does the madness of the situation begin? Am I dead? Dante's heart sinks into his chest, for there are no concrete answers of any of the questions he's asking. Aren't all answers just popular opinions? He ponders on the concept of God, an all-knowing, benevolent, omnipotent being. He remembers being a religious man, the life changes, and he lost his faith. Maybe it's for the greater good. 
because now he wonders if church is a lie. If God is benevolent, how can hell exist? If heaven exists, doesn't it sound authoritarian? If you bow down to him, you get a free pass. But if you have different opinion, into the flames you go. Why does it put a barricade on critical thinking? To him, the church is nothing more than a way to control the masses to give him false hope. People stop waste lifetimes practicing Western religions like Christianity, and they don't take the time to take a step back and truly examine its doctrine. He doesn't hate religions, he hates the fact that ignorance is bliss. That's why people in the West don't take in any other perspectives. They're content with going to church to listen to a pastor gloat about the beauties of tax exception. Echo takes advantage of his vulnerable state of mind, declares, Dante, I am God. It's time for you to confess your sins. Dante's pupils dilate under the darkness and he whippers, I'm so sorry for questioning you. You're going to hell. It's already decided. However, you do one thing, I will absolve you. What is it? He, be he begs. Give me the names of the people you work with. His lips quivering, he nods his head, for he's not ready for another fire. There's an empty house in the housing district. I meet up with people there on a weekly basis. We discuss ideas regarding the overthrow of the monarchy. Their names of Oliver Patterson, Louis Vance, Sandra Williams, and Paula Edwards. We make up their society, the School of Athens. Are there any other gangster secret societies? Yes, but I can't recall how many of the names. I'm only going to my own group and its desires. Thank you. I have to go now. Enjoy the trip. Wait, Dante pleads. I believed in him, you know, but he never gave me a chance. I got jealous and my ego took over. Gritting his TV ads. This place is going to fail without good minds. I know who's in the inner circle, and I know the mirror you guys have is crackling. One day somebody worse than me will have my gun in my beliefs. His expression decays into a glare. He'll just know how to use the gun better. Out in the corridor, Marilyn hides a blank list. Holds a blank list. I got the names, she says. I feel like shit, the teacher states, holding the lantern to Dante's cell. Look at him. Echo rests a hand on his shoulder. Don't feel like that. You're helping us. I'm sorry. She hugs him. It's okay. I'm still here for you. This is for Horace. He's protecting his dream. Marilyn pulls away. You're justifying a maniac. No, I'm justifying a king. Two, un two uneventful weeks pass, and on the morning of the 15th day, Dante wakes up to a dreadful realization. His time is running out. Revolution is impossible at this point. The manipulation has been around for three decades. God damn it. The only thing he's grateful for is dying with the truth. Cell door opens, and Forrest, uh, and Forrest enters. The monarch silently stands over the prisoner, establishing dominance. Dante is the dog, and the king holds the leash. Forrest yanks the prisoner to his feet, chains clanking with every movement. He leads the jailbird outside, into the blazing sun. Crowds of Babylonians line the streets, even watching the event from all angles. They wear a wide range of nasty expressions, and some throw rotten fruit at the burnt man. Arriving at the needle's base, a guillotine awaits Dante's fate. Timothy and Echo stand behind it, knowing today will change things. They pry the rat from Forrest's hands, positioning the burnt man beneath the merciless blade. That's just minutes away. Forrest stands in front of the device. Echo hands him his staff, and he hoists it into the air, shouting to the ground, This is a message for every gangster. We know who you are, and your time is night. This will be first of many executions because of your recent behavior. We will not be forgiving. You come here, and you fuck everything up. Not anymore. Now is our time to stand. To protect nationalism. The crowd cheers. He gestures back to Timothy. Pull it. The gunsmith forces a lever, and the blade falls. Dante screams, The market district! It slices through his neck, and the tumbling head arouses cheers from everyone, including the children. Elsewhere, Marilyn rests in his house, alone, lying numbly on his back. He examines the key roof. The hay roof. Lost in some realm of transparency, a half-empty bottle of Hennessy sits on his bedside table. Every sip he takes reminds him of Judas' alcoholism. Dark, circle lines, dark circles line the undersides of his eyes. He hasn't slept in three days because of this never-ending guilt. His intelligence is now harming people, slowly destroying their lives. He finds him caught between a rock and a hard place. His mother looks like a rotting potato during her last stages of cancer. If there's anything that describes how he's feeling, it's that. The monarchy is draining him, and he can't fight back. He considers leaving Babylon, and knows he can't survive alone. For the isolation will lead him to depression, and then suicide. He needs people, he needs a social outlet. 
Scoffing, he whispers in a voice bringing death to hope. Oh, obey the monarchy. Fuck the monarchy. End of chapter two. Chapter three, the storm. Three weeks later, the day begins with gray skies. Marilyn wakes up and goes over to his desk. On top of it rests a journal. He opens it, grabs a pencil, and writes at the top of a page. Moral compass. After underlying the words, he writes a list. Number one, trust no one. Number two, speak no evil. Number three, repress emotion. Number four, notice the manipulation. Number five, be of it, not for it. Number six, wake people up. Number seven, fuck the monarchy. He stares down at the last phrase for several seconds. They present themselves as powerful leaders when they're just ruthless for the sake of being ruthless. There's no redemption for that personality type. Dante's situation is still hot on his mind, and for good reason. He will never forget them for what they did, even if the victim was a gangster. On one hand, Dante is wrong for the assassination attempt. On the other, Horace is wrong for using him to make LSD. He sighs and stretches, thinking about where his loyalties lie. He pulls back a window's curtain, revealing citizens walking in Babylon's muddy roads. Perhaps it lies in them, the notion of individual minds with limitless ideas. He decides to play the role of ignorance until his breaking point, a wise decision when society closes on what he When and if he reaches that, he'll turn against the monarchy. Until then, his feelings toward Forrest and Echo will remain as gray as the skies overhead. He knows who Echo really is, and Forrest is responsible for her corruption. She thinks that Marilyn's her friend, but to him, they're two different people now. She's just the victim of a manipulative maniac. And then there's Timothy. Marilyn doesn't understand the CEO's resentment towards him. This has been going on for years without explanation. He wishes he could pull the vengeful bastard aside and talk it out, but he knows that arrogant gunsmith won't listen. The teacher figures people are weird that way. Dons leather garb and leaves. On his porch, the architect watches as trees blow to and from the building wind. A tense feeling grows in his gut. A gigantic storm is approaching. He journeys to the market district, observing its behavior. Babylonians stand behind stalls and trade off items from the factories, farms, and mines. <coughs> Some guide cows that carry wicker baskets upon their wide backs. Others ride through the area on horseback, smiling beneath the darkening day. The district's characteristics are similar to a Middle Eastern bazaar, and it breeds emotions ranging from luck to bankruptcy. This is Babylon's stock exchange, complete with the feeling of whether or not a dealer is screwing you over. He crosses a stall that trades vegetable oil for rubies, and Marilyn produces seven of the gems from his pocket. The teacher lays, the teacher lays them across the stall's desktop, and the dealer examines them. The condition of the mineral pleases the dealer, and he hands Marilyn three jars of his product. With a smile, the teacher leaves the market district and returns to his house. In his backyard, a small excuse for one, considering how compact the houses are, a motorcycle sits on the wooden platform. He's finishing up an engine that runs off vegetables in his basement, and he plans on riding out into the world by the end of the day. All he has to do is install the damn thing and get it going. By nightfall, he rides up to the gatehouse, calls up to the gatekeeper, and zooms out of Babylon, across the drawbridge without fear. <coughs> Nature slowly takes back unknown territories. Vines and branches wrap around enormous skyscrapers, choking them mercilessly. Washington is now a jungle of lost opportunities. He rides through numerous pileups, drives by the ruins of 1950s communities, and gazes at propaganda posters from the era. They depict Dwight D. Eisenhower stomping on Vietnam. Others portray Nixon with devil horns protruding from either side of his forehead. Burnt posters of Uncle Sam are also a frequent sight. He arrives at Tacoma at 3 in the morning. Heading off the interstate, the lack of infected surprised them. Perhaps they're starving. Mother Earth slowly fossilizing them through their infinite wisdom. 
In the city, he parks at the end of a nameless road, dense, rock, dense wrecks blocking any progress. The wind blows piles of trash across cracking streets, and a sensation of tragedy overwhelms him. Something awful happened here, something future civilizations will never record in their history books. Marilyn takes it all in. The way the sur shines through decaying buildings, moist surroundings, the graveyard of automobiles, and the thick layer of vandalism draping every square inch. Skeletal remains play the streets, a scene reminiscent of post-Black Death Europe. It's all widely fascinating to the teacher, almost mystical, and this curiosity grows with every examination. <coughs> he strolls down the street aimlessly, free from the monarchy and its duties. He doesn't have to worry about the schoolhouse because classes are only on the weekends, and according to the calendar system, today is Tuesday, March 15, 1986. Russell, the leader of the market district, is responsible for the timekeeping, but Marilyn doubts his accuracy. Hell, he's only part of the ring because he supposedly kept track of the date when everything went down. He doesn't know what to think about Russell other than the fact that he's irresponsible. The lazy bastard barely shows up to any of their meetings, and when he does, he speaks the least and adds nothing to substance of the conversation. Marilyn spoke to Forrest about the issue one time, and all Forrest said is that he's good at keeping the market district peaceful and in balance which is detrimental to its function. The teacher considers this a fair point, because the district has the least amount of problems. Nonetheless, his thoughts fade as a fantastic museum comes into view. Crip, crumbling pillars support a falling roof, and a layer of mold cakes the exterior walls. He draws a dagger and approaches its front doors, taking in its magnificent ruins. They remind him of ancient Mayan temples. So many secrets, so little explanation. After climbing the steps, he heads inside. Thankfully, he doesn't need a flashlight, for sunlight floods through the unstable roof. The place can collapse at any second, but the urge to explore pacifies his fears. Historical exhibits provoke even more questions, and he takes a moment to appreciate the quiet. Water drips into the mold-covered floor, and his shoes make squishing sounds with every step. <coughs> He eventually gains access to an empty observatory, and his eyes widen at a Maroc scene waiting for him. Bodies dangle from the rotting ceiling by rope, and blood paints the walls. Near the center of the domed roof, a message in blood. The acolytes hate vulnerability. Back outside, he pockets his dagger. No signs of life. Can Babylon really be the last civilization after all? The Fertile Crescent experienced the dawn of humanity and one of the earliest civilizations was Babylonia. It's all a cycle, really. Life, death, happiness, sadness. The cycle is mysterious, and it goes without stopping. It doesn't care if you like it or hate it, because even if you perform either of those emotions, that's continuing the cycle. Baron's feelings of being trapped stem from this idea, and he often wonders if there's a way to break the cycle. If there's something outside of life and death. After all, everything is the result of vibrating atoms, and you're somehow obtained consciousness. Something flashes by out of the corner of his eye. He turns around to see nothing, but feels like someone's watching him. He hates feeling this way. It's like a sinking claustrophobic nervousness. Eyes are on you, but you can't pinpoint the source. Marilyn considers running back to his motorcycle, but the fear stalls him. He has to find a source, and if he doesn't, these people could follow him back to Babylon. Considering what happened to Dante and what's happening to the gangsters, he will not be responsible for more death. Who knows how many lives are in his hands now? The monarchy uses the guillotine on a daily basis, and the newspaper says that there's around 20 executions per day. How can he trust what he says, though? Everything in this world is a pack of lies. He follows his cut, and he ends up in an alleyway. At the end of it, a freshly skinned rabbit. The sight fixates Marilyn, because that's exactly how he feels. Stripped from his uniqueness and living in purgatory. Slavery or death? That's Babylon. Hell, that phrase should be the city's coat of arms. He turns around again, gandering at the lifeless city. Cold, dead, empty. Perhaps the end of the world awakens the negative emotions we share. Greed, loss, regret, fear. Perhaps this entire world is a metaphor, and what you experience daily is symbolic towards your unconscious mind. The apocalypse is not a new story, nor is the idea of dystopian society. However, when you look past the surface, when you look past the blood and gore, you find something beautiful. Hope. The end of the world is just that. The end of the world. And what comes after the end? A new beginning. Marilyn believes that's what the world needs on an internal level. 
To him, everyone deserves an easy life. That's the very foundation of the American dream. Something that fascinates Marilyn about the American dream is the idea of pursuing happiness. During the California gold rush, immigrants came to America in the hopes of becoming famous overnight. Some of them did actually, but others fell short. Historians call that period the California dream. Why are these ideas of happiness based on dreams? Is it because we fixate too much on the depressing reality of our situation that we can't experience happiness in the present? Perhaps it's the fault of the demons in our head. The demon that doesn't know how to shut up, except for when you put a gun up to it. And even then, it still finds a way to make you forget about it. He jumps at the sound of breaking glass, and he runs through the street. Spotting a hooded figure running into the lobby of a hotel, he pursues the prey and enters the building to find the figure cowering in a dark elevator shaft. There, he finds that the figure beneath the hood is a young boy. Black liquid covers his skin, and his hoodie matches the dark color. Marilyn lands him a hand, and the boy accepts it. Who are you? The boy asks. Marilyn leaves him outside. Tyler Wilson. You? Wes Preston. I can't speak for long. I have to get back to my group. You have a group? I'd like to see them. We don't take kindly to strangers. We're a family. The leader is my mom. Before Marilyn responds, Wes punches them in the jaw, knocking the Babylonian unconscious. Hours later, Marilyn wakes up to find Wes and four other survivors tying his hands and legs to a chair. They wear the same attire Wes does, and they have black paint covering their skin. You can tell they're in a warehouse outside Tacoma, where the shipping addresses on the boxes are from Olympia, Washington. The sun shines through the broken windows, illuminating the failure of the 1950s business cycle. Marilyn feels sweat dripping down his forehead, and he becomes nervous. When they're done tying him up, they back away, and a female stripe steps forward. She's the tallest of the bunch, and from the looks of her soulless eyes, experiences trauma on a daily basis. How couldn't you when you're in the wild? Your only friend is your survival instinct, something we've lost contact with since modernization. How long does it take to befriend someone you've betrayed? What trials do you have to go to to regain its trust? Maybe that's why the apocalypse happened. Could it be that the universe is telling us that we need to re regain that contact to experience who we truly are? These thoughts run through Marilyn's head, and the family stares at him coldly. The woman speaks in a crackling voice. Who are you? He glares at her. Tyler Wilson. Why did Wes here find you riding a motorcycle? He says it's an advanced piece of machinery. Where's the time to make that nowadays? It's an empty world. There's always a way. The girl scoffs. Your dagger! She produces it from a pocket on her hoodie. Where did you get it? You don't have a sharpener on you. What good is a blade like this without a sharpener? It looks like someone made it recently. <laughs> <coughs> don't you see those fine, precise cuts? Did a black smith make this? Marilyn breathes heavily. I'm not saying anything besides what I know. And what I know is that I'm alone. Unsatisfied, she says, we need to know if you're a threat. We don't want to get involved in any fights. We just want to know if we have to relocate. The Babylonian understands the situation now. These people have a bad case of paranoia. A case that you throw yourself into if you choose to be a lone wolf. These survivors aren't a threat. They're lost among a world of loss. He feels pity for these souls, and he wants to offer them sanctuary. However, he's curious about his bunch. He wants to know more. I'm not a threat. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you something. The girl looks suspicious. This isn't a time for games, Tyler. We're a family, and we don't want any trouble. I trusted you enough to tell you the truth. Now I want you to do this. I trusted you enough to tell you the truth. Now I want you to do the same. Relationships don't work if the other party doesn't put in the effort. I've been so alone, and all I want is to talk to somebody. Monica lets out a dreadful sigh, for she's been in her, his shoes before. My name is Monica Stanson, and this is my family. My daughter's name is Stacy, and my husband here is Edward. The little guy you met is Wes Preston. Preston? Wes grins. Adopted. Marilyn observes them all. Why are you out here on your own? Monica shakes her head. We simply reject the idea of society. 
We know that they all fail eventually, so why join one? Humans are social beings. Although society isn't perfect, you still need that network. Not us, not the tribes. Since you obviously from somewhere else, I'll get you up to speed. Some of us prefer to be alone, and some of us who prefer to travel. Some of us are nomads, people who move from place to place without any intention of doing anything else. We fall under the last category, that's the system in the wild. And we're accepting it because it keeps us alive. Don't you want safety and security? And more people to worry about? More problems? No fucking way. Marilyn sighs. You can't be alone for too long. You start going insane, and you wonder if anything has a meaning. Trust me, I've been in your shoes before. I know some place that could wipe all of that away. If its government needs fixing, but I see hope for it. <coughs> Monica shakes her head. We know of your communities. We've seen them before. We don't want to interact with them. I can guarantee you've never seen anything like us. Monica kneels before him and looks into his eyes in silence. Marilyn reads her expression and he enlightens them. There are walls, knights, factories, and steam-powered machinery. I'm taking old-fashioned kingdom shit, blacksmiths, farms, bakeries, and so much more. What do you call it? Babylon. It was the dawn of civilization then, and it's the dawn of civilization now. We're a melting pot chasing the American dream. Like I said, it needs fixing, but it's worth a shot. Trust me, I've been there for 30 years. One of the warehouse offices, Monica and Edward watch their sleeping children. On the main floor, the Babylonian sits upright in his chair, fast asleep. Monica thinks about Babylon and its limitless possibilities. She's hopeful, but the shadows paring away grounds them in this warehouse. Edward's indifferent about the opportunity, because he wants to hold his beliefs to his heart. They've been out there this entire time. They can't let go of them, like they're nothing. Would it be wrong to abandon the world for society with a failing government? This question may seem like a no-brainer, but Edward's beliefs are everything to him. He thinks they're only breathing because of them. Despite it all, Monica knows the children are more important. What are you thinking about? Edward asks. The kids! I think I should expose them to a different way of life. He gazes up at the crackling ceiling blankly. I... I don't know if that's a good idea. Why? We have to teach them to be loyal to their beliefs. Wouldn't that be safer to do in Babylon? No! They need to stay out there to get the full effect. We have to teach them how to be strong. Ed, you're thinking about yourself. He grunts. I'm the only one in this room that knows the right choice. Really? If you're the all-knowing prophet, why do our children listen to me? They even refer to me as their leader. They don't know any better. They're too young. Are you calling me stupid? No, Monica. Christ, it's just, we thrive in the darkness, in the nooks and crannies of this world. What if this place is dangerous? Monica stays quiet. She hates when Ed gets like this. She wants to find someone else, but she can't. Maybe Babylon isn't a bad option. Maybe it's what she needs, what they all need. She's an adult. She has every right to protect her children and change her beliefs. She doesn't understand how Ed could be so insensitive, so stubborn. Monica's heart feels as if a blender is shredding it into pieces. Although Ed's gonna hate it, she's gonna take Marilyn up on the offer. The only thing that worries her now is the storm. The skies are too dark, and the, and the wind is building, but so far, no rain. Whenever it reaches Washington, it's going to be the storm of the century. They return to Marilyn's motorcycle, and the rain starts falling. The Babylonians gaze up at the sky and smiles, letting the, letting the water drip down his face. Admittedly, he enjoys Forrest's privileges. That won't stop him from having his own opinions. He's never been the one to accept a bribe, even at the cost of his own life. He focuses on the shadows and their lifestyles. Their art of survival reminds them of the early Native Americans. Hell, that's what life is if you're not in a developing society. Mobile camps, teepees, and the smell of fire burning in the middle of a wheat field. To Marilyn, that nomadic lifestyle is for those who dare to ponder on their existence. Some people are better alone, but he also thinks it's not the right way to live anymore. Safety in numbers, after all. This is the painful cycle of the introvert. 
You want to be with people, but when you are, you feel like you're putting on a show, and you want to leave the conversation. Rinse and repeat. They follow Marilyn into the garage, where he leaves his motorcycle. Ten miles to go. Marilyn leads him down the drawbridge as the dark waves of Lake Washington crash against it. The wooden bridge creaks and sways, but the metal support beams keep it intact for now. This beast worsens with every second, and they reach the gatehouse as the waves grow to ten feet. Hurricanes are split into five categories depending on the speed of wind. However, the forces of this storm is enough to create a category six. Mother Nature is a heartless, unpredictable beast. You can only experience an event like this once in a century. A perfect storm tearing the fabric of reality apart at the subatomic seams. Marilyn latches onto the shadows, and they run into, and they run into the clock tower, where the gears and cogs stand still. A ghostly howl follows the wind outside. Cold rain, cold rain drenches the foggy windows, and thin sheets of ice form over the panels. The meeting's room door swings open, and Timothy emerges. He examines the queer group and figures they're friendly, but they are in Marilyn's presence. Marilyn steps forward. Can I talk to you for a second? Are you going to leave them by themselves? Please, it's important. Fine. In the meeting room, the two Babylonians sit at the round table. Rain pelts the boarded windows, and lightning rips the black sky apart, as if it flashes intent to relieve heaven, breaking through to the side. The Babylonians remain silent. Neither can start this long-awaited conversation. Where should it begin? Where should it begin? How? Where does it even begin? They come through their fracturing memories, and neither can share the truth. The only thing Marilyn is certain about is that a dog and a sheep are sitting in the same room. The stars must be aligning. The CEO has the audacity to ask, Do you want to hear about my breakthrough? I came up with the best idea, and Marilyn rolls his eyes. That's exactly what we need to talk. Your arrogance is uncontrollable, and you don't even notice it. Maybe you do. Maybe you just like being a dick. Who knows? The only thing I want to do is to protect the public's perception of the district leaders. What do you think the civilians will say when they find out how self-absorbed you are? We can't have this negativity in the circle. Timothy sits back in his chair. Overwhelming astonishment floods through his body. Excuse me? Do you have any idea who I am? He climbs to his feet. How dare you talk to me that way? He leans over, his hands on a tabletop. I'm here because I had to honor my sister. What do I get for that? Nothing. I get no recognition. It's because of you. The clock tower, the drawbridge, all of it outshines my usefulness. And I hate you for that. Marilyn looks down at the table. The building creaks and sways against the hurricane. But it stands due to the teacher's contingency plans for weather. What he's about to propose means a difference between life and death. Every word must be thoroughly thought out, for one slip could lead him to the guillotine. He whispers, I need your help. Timothy calmly asks, What? Louder, he adds. With our brains, they won't see us coming. You and I can bring down the monarchy. We can lead this place into something better. Timothy sits down, distraught. I, I can't. How can anyone suggest this? Come on, Marilyn begs. You see the manipulation in the yellow journalism. They're giving us fake information constantly. And they're doing anything they can do to retain absolute control. We can't speak out against them. If we do, they'll kill us. They force me to take drugs and the guillotine. Answer me this. Why does the monarchy have more power than the oligarchy? How can there even be an oligarchy under a monarchy? They claim we have power, but who always makes the final call. Them. Like I said, they use my intelligence to kill people. Do you really think I want this praise? It's just the universe reminding me of my helplessness. Timothy clears his throat. What you're proposing is an act of treason. He stands up, starting for the exit. When this storm ends, they'll know about this. Marilyn sits alone in the meeting room. There's no telling how long this will last. Every passing second has to be useful somehow. He can get out of this, but it won't be easy. He climbs to his feet and heads into the clock tower's main area. Timothy sits alone, and the shadows stand on the opposite side of the room. He pulls Monica aside. Do you remember what I told you about the government? Yes! Forget I said anything. Tell your family to keep their mouth shut. 
One word against their ideas lands you in the dungeon. Gravely, she nods her head. Why did you bring us here? When the monarchy falls, it'll be worth it. Just go with the flow for now. In the throne room, the monarchy rests in their bed. Being over 600 feet in the air, the storm is more violent, but the Nita's 25 lightning rods prevent structural damage. Without them, this place would be in flames, a burning beacon of fascinating ideologies. Down below, water floods Babylon streets. The levels grow to six feet in some areas. The monarchy wonders about how much they'll have to do in the aftermath. The crops are most likely gone now, and this fact entails a famine. How can they cope with starvation and dehydration? How long will it take to get the factories up and running again? Anxiety is like a cobra, for it wraps around your confidence and chokes it out of existence, allowing you to see how small you really are. A sudden pain encroaches the queen's vultureless body, and a horrible realization dawns on her. She's going into labor. They have no doctor, and they have no medicine. This is going to be a dry delivery. In Babylon, dry pregnancies fail 90% of the time, for the conditions of this world don't entail mercy. Horace climbs out of bed and stands at its end. Ikora removes her clothes, ready for the king's incoherent orders. Thunder booms outside, their anxiety skyrockets into the land above heaven. In these sacred moments, they remember how much they love each other. Forrest goes back to the colony's days. He remembers watching her sleep in the freezing tent, pondering on how he can protect her. He needs that forest right now. He needs to take control, somehow. Adrenaline floods through his body, and he orders the queen to relax, to take deep breaths. He holds her hand. The atmosphere grows in intensity. The pain Echo feels is reminiscent of a thousand fires igniting at once. This goes on for 36 hours, and their daughter is finally born. In the quiet eye of the storm, Echo cradles her baby girl. At her side, Forrest acknowledges how peaceful they look. He closes his eyes, whispering, Echo, I have schizophrenia. What the fuck did you just tell her? Echo finally asks, What? His speech deteriorates. I hear voices every second of every day. I see hallucinations of people I don't know. The voices scream and they try distracting him. But the king stands his ground. Why do you think I'm so good at manipulation? Why do you think I stay up so late? The queen doesn't know how to respond. What would another woman do if she was in this situation? Leave? Somewhere in the back of her mind, she knows she can't do that, for their connection is too strong. Only a beast can end a 30-year relationship in two seconds. Nevertheless, this doesn't quell her spinning mind. All these years have been a lie. She hasn't seen the real forest until now, and that makes her suspicious of him. What else is he hiding? She figures it's no good to ask these questions, for only fools run in circles. She can't shake one fact, though. Marilyn is right. She is justifying a maniac. Another major concern is that schizophrenia is genetic, meaning Alice might have it. Wanting to deal with this after the storm, she says, All this time I could have been helping you. Why did you wait until now? The voices didn't want me to. They lie quietly for the rest of the storm. As the dark skies clear up, Echo realizes something. You can't blame someone for having something they can't control. Horse is a victim, not a threat. Mental illness is an invisible, complex force that blends good and bad into a gray mixture. It consumes your life, and you don't even realize it. Think of how white noise looks on a television screen. One can compare that to the mind of someone who suffers from depression or anxiety. It disconnects you from the person you are, and it feels like you're pushing a boulder up a hill every day, only to see it roll back up to the bottom. Is there any hope for these people? Yes, and it lies in us. When we realize we're the ones who keep the problem going, we can finally fix it. Once that revelation comes, the horizons will broaden with hope. Force sits up. I think I know what we are. Oh? Uh? Grinning, the king declares, We're the royal family! Echo smiles. <laughs> I like that. I thought of a name for you, for her too. What is it? Alice Whaley. Horace smirks. 
Alice Whaley, the future Princess of Babylon. Five months later, the king wakes up to baby Alice's cries. He never likes the nights where Echo puts her down, for this always happens. He inhales deeply and hoists himself to his feet. Walking over to the hand-built crib, the room stretches and twists before his eyes. Kaleidoscope-like patterns obscure his vision, and he stumbles to the floor, wanting to scream. He stands up, and the vision's clear. We are never going to stop. You swore that you would keep this a secret, and you told Echo. You deserve this, you fucking swine. Now standing before the crib, he peers down to see his daughter. Every time she falls asleep on his stomach, he gets a night free from his torment. He picks her up, and they lay down in the bed. She is the shield against the darkness in his mind. And when she puts her head down on his chest, she stops crying. In the morning, Echo opens her eyes and heads over to the window. Down below, Babylonians reclaim the city in ruins. The two complete districts are the farmlands and the industrial district. For they are the most important pieces to the strange society. Off in the distance, she sees the housing district. And images of Heather flash in her mind. She is a constant reminder of Alexander's absence, and Echo worries about this daily. Did Alex go rogue? Was he a gangster? She takes deep breaths, but this never ends well. It's all so strange to her. One minute he's here, the next, the army is following a nameless face. However, Heather is a productive general. She plans on suggesting to Alex the implication of martial arts classes. An army of ninjas is not your typical military, but it suits Babylon's unique. Turns around gasping. Forrest, you're up! Sorry for scaring you. How is Joggy up and down the stairwell? He goes over to the crib and picks up Alice. How have you been? The baby giggles. Echo hugs them both. What are you up to today? I'm going to Heather's so we can organize a search party. We need Alex back. Where do you think he is? Honestly, I think he's a captive. He's not dead until I see him all. Can I do anything to help? No, just keep your job. Where are you going? The lumber sites in the farmlands. Ben and I are planting trees. Well, I'll see you later. He, laid out, he lays down Alice down in her crib, and Amon and he embrace each other before leaving. One path leads to the truth, and the other leads to a lie. Love is dead in Babylon. You can't trust anybody, not even the ones you love the most. They can try running, but this is their reality. In a world with no morals, anything goes. Although the monarchy's relationship is sacred, they are still human, and they are, they are susceptible to our flaws. The schism in their attraction has been displaced since Alice's birth, for Echo is jealous of the attention Forrest gives Alice. Instead of the farmlands, Echo heads to the industrial district. She walks to the office block and climbs to the penthouse, wherein she finds Timothy pacing in his office. She mumbles to himself about the mines, for he's anticipating a shipment in two days. Finally, he gasps. Why do you need me? You gotta be upset, he starts. It's Merlin. He's against the monarchy, and I told you because Forrest doesn't have any mercy. Echo's head pounds. He's a gangster! Yes, he wanted me to overthrow the monarchy with him! The queen has lost her words. I, I, I had no idea. How long ago was this? He told me to the hurricane. I'm sorry I waited so long to tell you. I've been very busy getting this district back on track. Disorientation makes the queen nauseous. How could he betray me? She leans against the wall and tears drip down her eyes. He was my friend. Maybe you see something different now. What? The longer you exist, the more productive on the world changes. At first, you might... Guys might have been friends, but now, no, he probably... Outgrew you? Echo starts for the door, but the CEO intervenes. Let me go, she demands. If you go now, you're going to do something you'll regret. You need to calm down. She pauses. Okay, you're right. How is Alice? The queen grins. She's fantastic. Forrest loves her so much. She disregards distasteful thoughts about Alice as she continues. She has my eyes, and the cutest laugh you could ever dream of hearing. She's my daughter. Despite it all, her smile grows. She's my daughter. I'm glad everything's going well. You know, if you guys need a babysitter, let me know. Really? Thanks for the offer. It'll be nice to go on dates again. 
You guys don't go out anymore. No, the High King's put a lot on our plate, too. The CEO walks over to his desk, retrieving the tome. I'm so glad to survive the storm. Before you go, let me show you something. He shows the queen a page with a sketch covering it. It's a zeppelin. I want to build the factory that produces them. We have the necessary materials, and this means that we'll have the first boat to to get out for us. Echo feels great satisfaction. It's like a new beginning, isn't it? He closes the tome. Why did Alex want to go to California when we could just convert to solar energy? What are those zeppelins on offer? Nah. Alright, that's the point. He gazes over at the room. I have a lot of work to do, but I hope everything goes well between you and Marilyn. Good luck! Thank you for telling me about this! In his backyard, Marilyn tirelessly repairs his motorcycle. The sweat drips down his face, and a sunburn forms on his exposed shoulders. He's cautious during this process. For one, the hick vehicular problems is a telltale sign of more to come. He pauses, taking it in the moment. He examines his tools, and he listens to the distant sounds of hammers pounding on nails, foreman shouting orders at their workers. All of it is so queer to him, for it feels like he's living in a fake world. Hay roofs? Pristinely built-ins? It all seems as if there's something from a fairy tale, or a nightmare he can't escape from. Maybe this disorientation is what makes the other Babylonians such Susceptible to the monarchy's manipulation. <coughs> the only thing that's fact is that this is reality. Whether he likes it or not. And that terrifies him. Marilyn scoffs, repeating his infamous mantra. Fuck the monarchy! As if he's a magical sorcerer. The teacher finds Echo strolling down his side. Speak of the devil. She pauses ten feet away from him. Tears fall down her eyes as she trembles, pondering on the assassination attempt. Dante is just Marilyn and drag. She patiently waits for him to talk, but he remains silent. She asks, Why? I don't know what you're talking about. Rage spreads through the queen's body, but she retains composure. Why are you killing me for an overthrow? Forrest will kill you if he finds out about it. You think I want that? Marilyn lays down his tools. It's good to know I can't form my own opinions. That really makes me feel safe and secure. What a fantastic job from our fearless leaders. Are you drunk? I've been drunk for the entire week. Echo takes pity on him. Just promise me you'll keep your mouth shut around Forrest. Fine. Don't expect me to stick around when shit falls, though. If you're smart enough to figure us out, you'll know it won't fall. Several hours later, Marilyn opens the front door and finds Wes standing on the porch. The teacher invites him aside, and he prepares tea for the boy. They sit in the living room. After drinking it, the kid says, I'm just gonna get straight to the point. I wanna be a minor. Marilyn chucks, really? That's a surprise. Can you please take me to the mines? Of course. I just need a few hours to sober up. Can I stay here? My parents are fighting. The teacher stops the concerning comment. Yeah, I've got a spare bedroom. Just don't break anything. Thirty miles away from the kingdom, a rock quarry rests in the middle of the mountainous region. The bottom of the quarry, taverns and tents plague a field of dust-covered miners who pick away at the rocky walls. Some work in dark, unsanitary mine shafts while demolitionists blow huge chunks of stone out of the earth. They evacuate pounds of raw ore, feeling great pride in accomplishing their work. Surgical masks shield their mouths from Black Lung, an infamous Babylonian killer. Risky work is all about the reward and the display of true grit. Once they meet the month's goal, they can save anything extra and trade it off at the market district. The miners consider this site to be the birthplace of Babylon and its socio-economic beliefs, for without the stone, there would be no walls, safety, or security. The fact encourages him to work the long, back-breaking hours. It's the satisfaction of an honest day work that drives them. In his hand, Fink Bishop speaks with West Preston. I sit in corresponding bunk beds facing each other. How was the drive? Fink asks. Dangerous. What else can you expect? Yeah, I hear you. We're not going to build a secure rope from here to Babylon. We just need all the power of the necessary machinery. Wes glances around the town. Nothing but the smell of sweat and beds made of sand. You know why I came here? I need this. Why? My family, they're fighting a lot. I need to go away from it. 
Pink admires the boy. And you want to work? Yes, I'll do whatever I can to contribute as long as I'm away from them. That's all that matters. Pink stares off in the distance, thinking, I'll set you up in Tent G. From there, your tent leader will assign you a position. Don't be afraid of her. She's one of the nicest people here. Smiling, Wes nods his head and picks up his backpack. I won't disappoint you. I'll prove that I'm good at this. I'm not trying to belittle you, but do you have experience with mining? No, but I'm willing to take the hits. You have to do if you want to do anything in this world. Let's stop outside, where the aura of the 1950s blooms like smog over Metropolis. The decade is known as the Generation of Conformity. Nowhere is that more visible than here. The workers strive for that ethic, and not only does the title make them responsible, it also provides a vulnerable passage for the monarchy's manipulation. If you're not obedient in this field, you will die. In Tenshi, Fink introduces West to Alda, the tent leader. Short red springs um, from her scalp, an expression that oozes, Moxie listens on her face. A carbon copy of Rosie the Riveter, the woman who paid, who people plaster on posters from World War II. Anna retrieves a pickaxe with haste, and Fink leaves the tent, obviously having other plans. She slugs West's shoulder. Are you ready, kid? I'll teach you as we go. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be here. Dude, now for me, we're working to the... 36. West proceeds into a small, dimly lit shaft. Rails built into a muddy floor serve as telltale signs of a minecart. Stuffy air makes the kick cough. Anna pities his inexperience. This feels as though the mines are in need of a young face. Reaching an end to the 50 long foot tunnel, they, they, the 50 foot long tunnel, they join the workers who pick away at the stone enclosure. Metal support beams bolster a skeptical ceiling above them. But anything can happen, and when it does, their lives are over. It will be a grisly, fantastical end, being live miles under the very earth you walk on. Nevertheless, they press on. A job's a job, and it's unnecessary work. At the day's end, everyone lowers their tools, exiting the tunnel simultaneously. Wes and Anna aid the back of the group, making sure nobody gets left behind. Outside, Fink, roaming alone, saunters into the wooden tavern. This place is reminiscent of a 1920s speakeasy. A light conversation fills the otherwise thin air, and flickering lanterns feel romantic fires. Some workers play pool beneath candlelit chandeliers, while others mourn over their past at a bar. Fink opts for the latter and sits down on a stool. He asks the bar leader for a glass of hard cider. He asks the bartender for a glass of hard cider, and the lanky fellow prepares a poisonous tonic. When he eats the drink, Fink gives the bartender a full can of blackberries and a handful of bread. The bartender accepts the fee, assuming it on the spot. Behind them, Anna strolls into the same building, noticing her friend sitting next to her. Fink takes a sip. Do you remember Eisenhower? A little, she replies. Why? I never liked him. The entire era of Americans are dark. The Vietnam War, political tension, the protests, I'm glad it ended. We were on the brink of destruction. Eisenhower was making it worse. I don't think he wanted to do it on purpose. Oh? Then why did he involve in something we had no say in? Fink, stop. You need to focus on what's happening now. He sighs, takes another long drink. How's Wes? He's doing as good as you might expect. He's just... Kate, no. He's going through a lot right now. I wish I could help him somehow. Do you think your kid? Do you think your kids are gonna remember the old world? Fink laughs. It's a miracle if you get to know if you if you get them to remember the present in order. I feel bad for them. Why? They won't. They won't know the experience of holidays, college, or any form of normalcy. Babylon is the only thing they'll know, and they'll have no idea what America is. They'll be lost. I think you're being pessimistic. Children are curious when they're innocent. Now that there aren't as many threats, the innocence will last longer. Naturally, their knowledge will grow, and they'll fill in the gaps. Nothing is impossible. She thinks about the infected. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Fink finishes his drink, and they exit the tavern. He leads the women to her tent, where she kisses him. Blushing, he turns away and starts for the surrounding darkness. The next morning, Anna and Wes return to Tunnel 36. The day starts off warmly, but a vague sense of uncertainty accompanies the passing winds. Wes works over ten hours, and by the end of the twelfth, his arms are too sore to move. He drops the pickaxe and tells he drops the pickaxe and tells Anna, who lets go, who lets him go back to their tent. Now in the carry, the kid watches as the demolition is planned explosive across the eastern mountainside, where his tunnel cuts through. After the detonation, an avalanche of stones fall. An avalanche of stones flows down the rock face, covering the mouth of Tunnel Thirty Six. Several lie dead from critical impacts. 
Others are in too much shock to even twitch. The stalls and his horses are also gone, leaving them stuck in the pit of their own despair. This is a fantastical moment in Babylonian history. Fink charges into the quarry, his heart pumping terror. Upon seeing the damage, his first instinct is to make a beeline for the kingdom. Feeling destiny's familiar tangle, West pursues him. They eventually reach the outskirts of the mines, where they traverse the road that leads them back to Babylon. Even if they run, they still won't make it. Humans can only complete three miles a day, and their destination is 30 away. They consider turning back, but the fleeting sense of Babylonian pride returns, and this compels them to continue. Their last hope rests in Babylon, noticing the missing, sh the missing shipment. There's supposed to be one in two days, and when Timothy doesn't receive anything, he's bound to come looking, right? What a strange conundrum this turned out to be. That night, exhaustion keeps them inside a roaring bonfire. The two reflect quietly on their own dilemmas, but on the inside, their thoughts ring louder than an orchestra. Wes doesn't know how he feels about himself. He's in that awkward stage where he doesn't know if he wants to leave an impact on Babylon, or he just wants to be a nameless face. He guesses this act will make the inevitable choice for him, but his nervousness outshines his confidence. This is the dread most artists face, and uh, this time it's all too real for the kid. On the other side of the plane, Fink doesn't know if he's capable enough to be a leader. He blames himself for this terrible tragedy. This is partly true, for he could have just told the demolitionists to be careful. Maybe if he did that, Anna wouldn't be starving to death right now. They uncomfortably go to bed that night, and as their minds turn off, they know people are facing certain doom. And as time mercil mercilessly passes by, this becomes even more important. In Tunnel 36, Anna and the others try not to panic, but to no avail. The situation is just too traumatic to ignore the fear. Moisture is in the air, allows them the only short breaths, and sweat pours down their faces. Starvation and dehydration are their demons, or at least it's something physical this time. Anna remembers hearing a story about the Zahner Party. In May of 1846, a group of American pioneers set out for California, only to be snowbound in the Sierra Nevada during a harsh winter. They resorted to cannibalism to survive, a truly a moral act under the umbrella of desperation. If the group experiences that, she wouldn't know how to react. If she can't eat another soul with a beating heart, she'd rather die. Hell, even now she can't comprehend the image of someone eating another's a limb, finger, or toe. You can't return to normalcy after something like that. Terror and claustrophobia pushes them to the end of the tunnel, where they pick away the rocks and the flickering lanterns. They can't do this at the entrance. The granite from the top of the mountains is too dense for the equipment to chip away. Some of these stones weigh 50 to 80 pounds. The shaft walls are softer and easier to work with. The dreadful minutes go by, and they breach a surprise. A massive underground cave network. They dismantle the mine shaft lanterns, and Anna leads them to their tomb. The lights illuminate the vast face. Million year old stagomites protrude from the cold ground, and crystals sparkle within the rough walls. The noise of running liquid brings them hope, and they gather around an underground channel flowing water. Lionfish swarm beneath the surface, and its mysterious ripples add to everyone's curiosity. However, they refrain from drinking anything, for they have no means of purifying it. How long has this been down here? Many chemicals are brewing and mingling with each other. Another dead end. They sit down, their expressions projecting acceptance of doom. They take the ones outside the tunnel several days to clear the rubble. And that's after they spend time gathering necessary equipment. Despite it all, Anna is hopeful. She wonders about how they can prevent this from happening again, and in her mind, Images of a tunnel boring machines flash by. The huge gadget consists of a cutting wheel, the main bearing, a thrust system, and trial support mechanisms. If they had that, mining operations would be almost fully automatic and a lot safer. If this disaster happened again, nobody would be stuck facing death. The future project takes her mind off her current affairs. She feels guilty for not doing anything. She stands up, the lanterns flashing for shadows across the chamber. I know this seems hopeless, but I don't think we're out of luck. Babylon's expecting a shipment soon, and when we don't arrive, they'll know something's wrong. Until then, we need to ration. How much water do we have between all of us? The miners hold up canteens to their lanterns and shake them around. To Anna's astonishment, they have a fair amount. Okay, if we need to find it evenly amongst ourselves, we'll be okay for five days. What about food? I'll take them to a satchel, producing fresh and canned products. Some have stale sandwiches, others spam. They pot everything in front of Anna, who accurately measures the remaining ten. 
If we try, we'll last about a week and a half, and after that, who knows? All we can do now is wait. The lonely inside insanity driven hours pass. Nobody can fully grasp the seriousness of this situation. But maybe that's okay, for one would be driven to madness if they could. That is the Lovecraftian anxiety everyone's afraid of experiencing. That non-stop chill that never goes away. It's like a British soldier quartering in your house during the Revolutionary War. They, they choose to stay in the cave. They'd rather die in a large chamber than a corridor. To distract themselves, they begin talking. Anna listens as words from silhouettes reverberate off their surroundings. Oddly, a faux calm flows through the air. Isn't it strange how we only reveal our true colors when we're only up to our necks in bad luck? Desperation is the threshold to revolution. The very meaning of the world of the word apocalypse. Anna almost flinches when she hears laughter. These people are using this time to establish relationships for the future. She figures their their taste in her own, and they want more. Either that, or is this all you could do when time's your worst enemy? However, the calm comes before the storm. Sometime during the third night, someone sneaks through the pile of precious provisions and leads to their greed consume the lives of 52 innocent miners. The world will always have this type of person, apocalypse or not. Selfishness is a human habit that has been with us even since before the Neanderthals, and will outlive any diseases we encounter. It's an uncontrollable demon, and we take advantage of the innocent because of its stealthy invasion. Hours later, the others wake up, and the place dissolves into chaos. They collapse to the floor in a fetal position, and panic attacks spread mercilessly from body to body. The lantern also begins dying, adding more fear to this hellish cauldron. Shouts arose Anna. She does her best to control the wildfire, but to no avail. Sometimes the flames have to burn out by themselves. After they simmer down to whimpers, Anna wants to say something about reassuring, but nothing comes out. What was once their bubble of production is now the chamber of death. They don't even make an attempt to find the culprit. It would be a waste of time and energy. Outside the cave, strong winds blow to the mountains, and a ghoulish howl rings all over them. One simple fact remains true. They still have to wait, and they can't fix anything. Some distract themselves by swimming in the lake, others slip into delirium. Not the average delirium where you feel a strong sensation of depersonalization, but the delirium where you see yourself reliving your life from start to finish. The painful darkness is too much for these feeble minds, and as the lanterns fade out one by one, so does their sanity. Lunacy is a complex topic to cover thoroughly, but it's what these miners are devolving into. More time passes, and by the fourth morning, all the lanterns are out. They drink the cave water supply, only to face a simultaneous stomachache and headache. Caught between a rock and a hard place, cannibalism crosses their minds. From their groans of malnourishment, Anna hopes knows this to be true. She can't fight back against it. Exhaustion pins her to a stagnate. All she can do is hope, and they don't get her hands on her. Tear consumes her on the seventh day, for growls replace the painful whimpers. They use whatever lantern fuel they have to burn the wheat and light the bodies with the lighters they use for their cigarettes. Anna uses her strength to find darkness to power in. Watching from the shadows, her eyes widen at the ensuing horrors. She needs to find the mine shaft somehow. Blood paints the ancient town, and the smell of cooking flesh makes her vomit. Sitting up, she waits quietly as the day presses on. The meals conclude, and the miners fall asleep with full bellies. As for Anna seeks along the walls, her heart sounds like it's loud enough to wake them up, but luckily these beasts remain asleep. She finds a small area breaching off the main cave and feels her way behind stout stalagmites. She takes shelter here for the day, and the sound of scream makes her cry. She can't believe this is happening. What kind of god would allow it? She loses faith in the guy in the sky right there. There is no such thing as a merciful father in this nightmare. In that case, Satan doesn't exist either. He can have one or the other. Logic doesn't work that way. These spinning thoughts help her expa- uh, escape reality, for she no longer feels the weight of the world on her shoulder. The false sense of security doesn't last. She's just fooling herself. The miners fall asleep again. She continues her search. What a confusing, terrible situation. Who would have thought that she'd die at the hands of her fellow Babylonians? She pushes these thoughts aside, for she's not dead yet. Her determination aids her through her weakness, and her hands find the edges of a rectangular empty space. Beneath the darkness, she reels a wide, beating smile. And between the invisible mine shaft, the blackness somehow gets darker. 
Half a mile of limping passes, and her foot catches the stomach of a sleeping Babylonian. The figure rises, and she considers enough strength to run, albeit poorly. Looks like she's in hell. The only way out is accepting your fate. She reaches the tunnel's entrance, and as her predator wraps its cold hands around her arms, head and rays pour into the blackness, and they fall into the quarry. The sun blinds their vision, and Anna lies on her back, and then the sun cook her pale skin. She sits up and opens her eyes, and then them readjust to freedom. However, when she sees the men in white cloaks holding the Babylonian rescuers hostage at gunpoint, she finds no freedom. Whatever these people are, they didn't help their cause because they're merciful. This is an act of dominance. Their presumable leader, an Italian-American with mutton chops and a glove-covered arm, issues forth. He holds the arm away from his body and whistles. Down from the sky comes a giant magnificent golden eagle. It lands on the man's arm, and Anna stares in horror what's dangling from its feet, the head of Alexander Rudolph. Shock, dehydration, and malnourishment push her to an unconscious abyss. In the kingdom, Forrest nervously observes the progressing society from the throne's room window, just like Echo. So many things are putting them on the edge. The inevitable loss of sanity, Alexander's disappearance, and the mind's missing ship. He doesn't know how much longer he can balance his worries before more tip the scale against his favor. Sun change uh, changes across the horizon. Beyond all of the skyscrapers to the east, the sea of survivors in white cloaks approaches the gatehouse. Alarm bells and watchtowers blare, alerting Babylonians archers to the wall tent blocks. They carry assault rifles, bows, and arrows. Within the defenses, civilians brocade themselves in any shelter they find. Meanwhile, King dons his cape, crown, and meets Echo at the base of the needle. What should we do? She pleads. You stay here, I'll come nothing. Echo objects, but he disregards her. At the gatehouse, the king watches attentively as white cloaks march across the drawbridge. He wants the knights to fight back, but after seeing the captain of miners, he keeps his mouth shut, even Fink and Lesser in the bunch. Without Fink, who knows what the mines would turn into? Without the kid, the shadows will probably realize how unsafe this place is and revolt against the monarchy. These people want blood, and the force isn't going to let it happen. The Italian-American leader steps forward and says that Babylon is his. Who the fuck do you think you are, Horace demands. Do you really think we're just going to hand this place over to you? The mobster character replies with, Hey, <laughs> the more you fight back, the more your resources depletes, and the more I'll have control. We're more powerful than everyone in this shithole combined. We have fucking zeppelins. What do you have, rocks? <laughs> no, not even that. You have nothing. That's why we're going to kill you in front of all your people. Then we're going to take the miners hostage, and we'll begin our raid by taking the game. When you kill the king, beware the people who hail them. The mystic shot of a human friends. I like you. My apologies. I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Calnister Ignitus. And my people are known as the Acolytes. You probably recognize us. We're isolationists. We prefer to stick ourselves for this exact reason. Ignitus scoffs, produces a flintlock pistol from a hidden holster, and aims it at the king. The captain miners gasp. But Timothy dives in front of the mur But Timothy dives in front of the monarch, shielding him from the bullet. It shatters his kneecap, and the CEO collapses in a bloody mess. Marilyn quickly appears on the scene, expressing great disgust towards this atrocity. Stop! the teacher demands. I have a deal! Behind him, the king and other brave Babylonians carry Timothy off to the hospital. My service for Forrest is safety. Nice, grows curious. Hey, service, what do you do here? I built this city from the ground up. I'm smarter than your own fucking gunmaker. I owe the ins and outs of the architecture, of its social dynamics. The place is at the back of my head. So you tell me. Why aren't you the leader then? I'm not as capable as he is. Forrest takes note of the strange shift in Marilyn's character with gratitude. Nodding, Ignatius motions him forward. Ignatius motions him forward, and Babylon gates slowly rise. The creature confidently steps into the drawbridge, scheming escape. Before leaving, the mobster yells, Hey, if you wonder in Alex's, he's dead. So are the ones who went with him. For your own sake, stay out of California. That territory is ours. End of chapter 3.
Chapter 4 San Francisco A 75-foot wall of boxcars encompasses San Francisco, California. Within its boundaries, society above Babylon continues to develop. This city, home to the Acolytes, has no districts or monarchies. Its government is a democracy, and the people want to bring back the belief of manifest destiny and the American dream. From its paved roads to its solar energy, one might think that they're practicing what they preach. However, the facade of normalcy is just the tip of the iceberg. Everything from the outside is just a mirage. There's one hell of a devil in its details. For instance, they can worship whoever they believe in, but the catch is, they have to swear their allegiance and life to the cult. Considering newcomers, like the Babylonians, think San Francisco is the last society, they oblige. The cult itself believes in capitalism, human trafficking, and slavery. An embargo prevents them from violating their ideologies. They print money at a minting facility on Alcatraz Island, and they host human auctions in their great basalt cathedrals. They don't dare step beyond the walls, for safety is non-existent without them. The men, women, and children all appear identical. They wear white cloaks, some of which have hoods, but those that don't belong but those that do belong to close friends of Ignitus. Their behaviors reflect the practices of the Ku Klux Klan. For instance, they pile books upon each other, ignite them, and dance around the flames. They do this with crosses, and sometimes they conduct live crucifixions of Alcatraz prisoners for entertainment. Plantations cover most of the land, and slaves from the wild work of their grounds. The main thing they farm are cranberries, corn, wheat, rice, and rye. A strict diet is necessary when you're in a cult, and it's the main thing that keeps everyone docile. For when you meet everyone's needs, what is there to complain about? Still, unlike Babylon, Convergence also believes in imperialism, and they seek to conquer everything they can. Power is their game, and capitalism slash imperialism is a surefire way to victory. However, despite this perception, their ideals might have a strange appearance to sane individuals. In fact, if you can see them now, their actions encapsulate the failure of the American dream. The saying goes that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and Convergence can't bring enough truth to that. When you hold on to something that started as a lie, you try everything you can to make it real, and you can't bring yourself to acceptance. The city is as chaotic as a 1970s Orlando night on a Saturday. If it wasn't for the veil of normalcy, the place would fall as quickly as it came up. The society acts like a rolling wave, especially when it comes to trends. One second, crowds treat one object as if it's the messiah, and the next they glorify another pointless item. Greed gives them short attention spans, but the need for wealth and reputation blinds them from seeing this. In fact, an unspoken rule in the convergence is no money means you have no reputation. So if you don't have a plan, you become a dog. Beneath Ignitus' friends, the convergence is split into three social categories, pigs, sheep, and dogs. The pigs are plantation owners, well-known figures who live in mansions, and anyone who's sociopathic about rising to the top. The sheep are the nameless faces in the city, the crowds, the fleeting faces you see out of the corner of your eyes. They have next to no purpose in the convergence, but they can't know that and propaganda slash manipulation prevents them from discovering this. The dogs are hobos, misunderstood artists, and people itching to find their voice. To those out of the loop, it's easy to find out who fits into these categories after being told about them. There are over 80,000 survivors living in San Francisco, and it outshines Babylon by several milestones. Amidst the ruckus, there are a few people who want and there are a few people who want and do change everything. These select people are known as the greats. They reinvent all the necessities and implement them into their daily routines, like solar grids, trains, trolleys, and zeppelins, for warfare. Their army has a general that's both stronger and smarter than Alex, and they can easily overpower Babylon's militia. Everyone has their ideas about antagonists, and Convergence brings an entirely new perspective to the definition. If you think Lovecraft's Cthulhu is the harbinger of doom, that's because You've never met this strange society. In a brownstone apartment, Helen Schroeder gazes out a dust-covered window. 
Her brown, frizzy hair stretches down to her calves, and her dark skin blends in well with the bedroom. She works part-time as an electrician for some of the city's most prominent projects. Sometimes she works on solar grids, others engines. It depends on the mood of the day, really. However, her job isn't as important as her revolutionary beliefs. After years of experiencing a nice rain, she holds a strong hatred towards the hawkers. This isn't the way things should be, but the people are stuck in an unbreakable trance. The worst part about her awareness is that she stands alone. Despite that, her gut tells her to hold on to what she supports. Her woman is lost without her beliefs. She watches as the city's industrial gates swing open, and her mouth drops upon seeing Nidus in front of a horde of guarded prisoners. However, she cringes, for the president oftentimes acts like a child when he displays power. This is not real democracy. If it were, the president wouldn't have this much power. The president is only supposed to be the face of the country. Their decisions based on a majority won from the people. What ignites his projects is nothing more than fraudulent views and his charisma is the only thing bolstering them. Turning away from the window, she finds herself facing a wall. Blueprints of Alcatraz's island cover it, and she can't help but to smile. The future is bright for these prisoners, for this one woman revolution will be inspirational. The sacrifice is necessary. In Ignitus's crowd of Babylonian slaves, Wes Preston examines the area around him. The territory gives off horrible vibes, and some areas remind him of the ghettos of World War II. The president leads the way to an unknown location, his armed guards patrolling all sides of the awestruck newcomers. No teenager should ever have to experience something like this, but life has an unfair game of constantly changing patterns. They hunt on Pier 33, the dock for Alcatraz's ferry. The boat awaits the prisoners, and the guards push and shove the Babylonians abroad regarding their pleas for mercy. To Wes, the scene is like the river of sticks, and Sharon is the ferryman. The kid tries retaining calmness, and he looks for Fink and Anna, but to no avail. The last time he saw them was a week ago. It's like they're just non-existent. He focuses on the cold, the treacherous waters of San Francisco Bay, with Alcatraz looming ominously over his fate. What cold, terrible trials await him? Is there any shred of innocence left? At this rate, Babylon won't be able to liberate them. There are too many rings to jump through. The ferry starts up, and the kid vomits out of fright. The trip to the island doesn't last long, and four self-proclaiming officers board the boat, only to escort its occupants to another dock. Around them, snipers and watchtowers aim their guns at the new arrivals. This is all a game, and when they begin the trek to the top of the hilly landmass, this couldn't be more apparent, for the snipers pick them off one by one as they pass Building 64, Sally Port, and the ruins of the Officers Club. It's times like this where his West is thankful for being short, but he still keeps his head down, examining the bodies and hallucinating dead friends. They reach the top of the hills, where a menacing cell house awaits. Algae covers its gray, cracking walls, and barnacles accompany the natural overgrowth. Red, flickering candles sit on the interior window stills, their flames illuminating the rusty bars. A salty smell blows through the warm summer air, and the seagulls fall in the distance. The cell house's door opens, revealing a beaten, strong warden. She dons SWAT gear and wields a black baton. The doors close behind her as she examines the weak, tired crowd. These people just made a five-month journey, and their dirty appearance proves it. Some sob over the recent deaths, others are too scared to look away. Welcome to the rock! Welcome to the rock, she says with a heavy misfit. Welcome to the rock! she says with a heavy Midwestern accent. My name is Melissa Howard, and you will listen to me. Whether Ignitus desires for you, I'll carry it out. If she says to execute you, I will without hesitation. Once you're in this facility, you belong to him and I. I assign you your job, and I tell you who you are. In other words, don't get comfortable. Do I make myself clear? Silence. Good. Follow me inside. 
The Babylonians reluctantly followed, but the snipers will kill them all if they don't. Inside the administration block, the warden beats down a miner before them. They all give her their undivided attention. Behind her, a vicious cell door with a maze of terror on the other side. Undress, she demands. As they do, guards from the block's hallways flood into the entrance corridor. The warden dons a mask, and the armed henchmen bombard the Babylonians with tear gas. West scratches his young eyes, weakly falling to his knees and blacking out. Several hours later, the kid wakes up in the bottom bunk of a cell. Looking down on himself, he sees now that he wears an orange prison jumpsuit. He is breathing from the top bunk and investigates to find that the cellmate is Fink. West lets out a sigh of relief. One familiar face makes this slightly more bearable. He sits down, gazing out at the corridor. Along the top edges of the walls, guards use protected walkways, gun galleries, to move safely around the prison. The guards themselves carry guns ranging from M1 Garands to flamethrowers. More artillery rests in the armory, waiting to combat any against threats. Cells line, cells line the opposite wall, containing the shells of distant souls. The fresh meat appear anxious, whilst the cold cuts appear stern. That's what time does to you when a metal box becomes your home, especially when it's on an island in the middle of a fortress. From the look of things, Wes is the youngest one here. If he wants to escape, he has to leave his naivety behind. What is Stacy going to think of what he becomes? On the other side of the city, Ignitus stands in the study of his estate. Play River. Beside him, Merlin Monroe, he cocks at the similarities between their tastes and authors. Gazing round, the teacher spots an entire section for the economy. Volumes upon volumes, books might as well as be this room's pain. How in one man absorb all this information in one lifetime? Monroe then starts from the back of the study, where a fireplace rests. The flames illuminate seven porters of unknown males above it. Ignatius notices his interest. They're all the presidents before me. Your term's a bit off. Can't ever say a vision of democracy is perfect. As long as the people to early in power, who cares? The teacher faces him. What's going to happen to the Babylonians on Alcatraz? Believe him, and if I were you, that would be the least of my worries. And why is that? You have work to do. There are things we need and I don't have the time to focus on. That's where you come in. We need indoor plumbing, irrigation systems, and a sewage plant. Do you think you could help us? Will you leave Babylon alone? Merlin, don't you see that's up to them? I only took the miners because they were out in the open. We need to be plucked by somebody bigger than them. It's our job to conquer the weak. It says so in our constitution. What about Axe? The knights? Can you rationalize that? The president shrugs his soldiers. They wanted to fight. We don't tolerate that kind of nonsense. And I expect Babylon has those same principles. He starts for the exit. There's a bathroom on the other side of the hall. Go to it. Now in the ornate bathroom... The Babylonians stand in front of a clear mirror. Everything is too clean for his liking, after all. His only frame of reference from normalcy is an unsanitary medieval kingdom. Behind this reflection, a white robe, its hood dangling from a metal hook. In his hands, scissors and a razor. Am I against the monarchy? Raising the appliances to his head, he cuts everything off. His hair falls lifelessly to the tiled floors, and he can't help but to long for the echo he knew in Colorado. The one that found him covering and cowering in the fire truck. He stares at his reflection uncomfortably, for he doesn't see a cult member. He sees a Babylonian. Donning the robe, he exits the bathroom. That night, he stays awake, gazing at the wooden ceiling. Taking deep breaths, he feels the anxiety of an impending conflict. In the distance, a nice golden eagle's call as it confirms his suspicions. Imagine being underwear and unbeknownst to you, a great white lurks closely behind, its mouth wide open, and its hunger fierce. Babylon is going to lose unless they can't get help. Despite his feelings toward the monarchy, innocent people still live in the kingdom. He sees no other option besides being a spy, and that entails working with the people he hates and ultimately against his beliefs. He sits up, thinking that the road to the least casualties is the right one, no matter how treacherous it seems. It's either be a slave or a foreign land, or be a slave with a familiar land, with the fame of being an advantage and a instead of a reminder of his maltreatment. For the sake of the people, he opts for the latter. After all, that's what Babylon is supposed to represent, humanity. From the looks of things, there's no room for that here. 
In her apartment, Helen Schroeder smiles, for a riot on Alcatraz is inevitable. She kneels before all the plans, bomb equipment and a flyer calling for an electrician to repair fuse boxes in the island's powerhouse. Considering her 15-year-old experience in the field, she's bound to get the job done. If she does, not only will she have a clever pretense for what's going here, she'll also be able to contact the prisoners in secrecy. Five years of planning is paying off. She can feel passion beating through her body. All she needs is the right moment. Whether it comes, it'll change the course of the world's uncertain future. On Alcatraz, West and Fink remain awake several hours into this strange, historical night. Hope stems from here, and although it's slim, seeds grow into trees. Fink feels, Fink feels guilty about the miners. He could have stopped it, and he regrets not being more cautious. He's responsible for every death, injury, and trauma, and this makes him weep. He doesn't want to hurt people, but companionship is stronger than harm. The memories of that horrific event mark the beginnings of his descent into the world of PTSD. It's not your fault, Russ results. You can't prepare for everything. You can't change the fire, kid. People died. You aren't a murderer. Do you know how you can prove the world wrong? It's here. You can help me break everyone out. Wes, you're too young, and Hamilton was only 14 when he started changing things. Nothing's impossible with a plan. I don't know. Come on, you're capable of pulling this off. Imagine the people who are suffering out because we aren't doing anything. We can make names for ourselves. Fate crosses over to the cell's door. On the opposite side of the corridor, Babylonians and California prisoners shift uncomfortably in their bunks. They're all lost, in need of someone with a passion for leadership. Is this really what their lives mount to? Should they let 30 years of labor go to waste? The kid admittedly has a point. This will make him a hero. How could someone so young be so damn understanding? <sighs> Facing Wes, Fink simply asks, when do we saw it? The kid grins. As soon as we come late into our jobs. We can't rush this. Countless things can go wrong if we're not cautious. We should stick to finding Anna and learning about our rulers for now. Nope. West climbs into bed. Now we sleep. We'll do our agenda tomorrow. The sun rises slowly over this odd realm and ignites this estate. Marilyn lies awake. He had a dream he was in a relationship with a guy. Out of all the things happening right now, does he really need to think about his sexuality? Still human, of course, he does. He's never been in a relationship with a girl before. In fact, they don't attract him. Logic would say he's either gay or bisexual, but maybe because he hasn't met the right girl yet. Whatever it is, doesn't matter in the end. What does is survive in this haunted situation long enough to gather accurate into legends for the Babylonians. Someone knocks on the door, and Marilyn looks to see Ignatius is upon his threshold. The golden eagle rests calmly on the glove-covered arm. It seems as though it's about to fall asleep. In the president's free hand, a black book embellished with crystallized skulls of fossilized herbs. The title reads, The Principles of Calvinism. From Ignatius' grimace, Marilyn figures the novel has something to do with their outlandish beliefs. Who's Calvin, he asks. Our first president. We honor him by following his orders verbatim. His crooked smile widens. It's like he's reliving a memory where he lived out a fantasy relationship. Come on, when you're gonna love today. Care to explain? You're going to witness an initiation. Nidus leads the teacher through the magnificent, clean estate, and they reach its ornate oaken doors. Before leaving, Marilyn catches the president's fleeting incident inside his expression, and he gets a gut feel that tells him to split. However, Babylonian nationalism broaches its urges. He's doing this for them. In the streets, the spy examines the passing crowds, horse-drawn trolleys, and the stylish properties. Everyone looks like a complete doppelganger of themselves all the way down to the genetic code. They purchase items in markets and mingle about pointless topics. The spy notices several hunting similarities between the social aspects of Babylon and San Francisco, but the most prominent difference is San Francisco's race issue. The majority of siblings are Caucasian, and the only African Americans are working on the plantations and mansions. The Irish and Asians work in odd jobs like construction or house care alongside the Mexicans. And when the Caucasians work, they usually get a better job that provides a fearful salary. Marilyn Ignitus approaches the doors of the largest cathedral in the city. From the outside, it looks like a bleak South Carolina asylum. It sticks out like a sore thumb, and it rises far above its neighboring competitors. 
The brick is of basalt, and the darkness accentuates dread. Ignitus sent his golden eagle into the sky, and they entered the devious structure. Now in the cathedral's nave, Marilyn grows nervous as he passes hours of hooded figures. At the apse, a, pa a pianist plays the melody to This Land is Your Land by Woody Guthrie, and it doesn't stop until they reach the podium. Ignitus clears his throat and lays the book on it. All right, the president commands. They, can, they climb to their feet and pray in an ancient Middle Eastern language unknown to Merlin. Ignitus then points to the Babylonian, declaring him the internet, initiate. Merlin's heart drops, and from the end of the nave emerges two followers holding a squealing pig. Between its cries, it sounds like someone begging for mercy. Ignitus hands Merlin a ruby dagger and instructs the Babylonian to gut the swine. Spike does so, and blood washes over the dark floorboards. It flows into the nave, and the pig withers on the ground, as the intestines spilling around itself. The Babylonian observes the otherworldly behavior in the room, and he wonders if the monarchy will think this is authentic. And he thought living in the kingdom was weird. He's feeling a forgotten brew of emotions ranging from excitement to regret. It makes him think of the early days and how insane everyone was. Sweat drifts down his forehead, and he backs into Ignitus, who shoves him into the blood-covered ground. With the ritual ending on a successful note, the chamber turns into a circus of laughter and cheers. Ignitus congratulates Marilyn, yanking him to his feet. Who knew animal sacrifice could be so celebratory? That evening, they prepare a feast in its nave, its centerpiece Marilyn's pig. Who was the first leader, and how did he have such an influence? Are any of the previous presidents still alive? Where are they, if this is the case? One answer burrows into a labyrinth of questions unanswerable to of those who desire sanity. Marilyn, standing next to Anitus, fails to ask the president these questions. The laughter and routines of the chamber prevents the spy from getting anything. His attempt at failure, he consumes the breath of the Convergence's wrath. The night goes on, and more members of Anitus' inner circle show up, bestowing upon the feast wine and cheese, presumably made by their slaves. Marilyn plays the game, anxiety-driven at every step. Imagine having a dream that's so real and can't distinguish it from now. That's how the teacher feels. First a kingdom, now a cult. Can things get any more convolu convoluted? Despite these worries, Ignitus and Marilyn get along well at the party. They shout about the old days, and Marilyn finds out that the president was in the Vietnam War. He was 19 then, and he's almost 50 now. Time has a unique way of making us feel uncomfortable. And Nice sees this when he looks into the mirror, knowing the end is more twenty years away. Marilyn can't help but to understand this. However, no matter what, you can't sympathize with your enemies. The feast concludes, and everyone shakes the Babylonian's hand. After they file out of the building in a single file line, Nidus and Marilyn gawk at the mess behind them. With determination, they finish the job in four hours. You do this with every newcomer? Marilyn asks, tying out the garbage can. Yes, Galvin says so. What he demands, we provide. Who's Calvin exactly? Ignatius lays down his back, sighing. He's a prophet. We have him because he gave us this great society. This way to make us puts me to shame. In all honesty, where he died, we buried him in the crypt behind this very cathedral. Follow me. Marilyn drops his bag, and he and the president reaches a small door along the wall behind the podium. The president opens it, and they descend into a winding world of endless mysticism. When they reach the, the crypt, Marilyn finds tunnels of bones and skulls branching off in every direction for countless miles. The catacombs are the most haunted part about this place, Ignatius admits. The damp air makes it hard to breathe, and the poisonous unknown chemicals are without a doubt disturbing the respiratory systems. Ignatius crosses over to a small wooden chest. In his robe, he produces a key that matches its lock. After opening it, he pulls out two masks. Marilyn takes one and holds it in his hands. It's black, covers your entire head and neck, and even comes with goggles for your eyes. The oddest thing about it is that the part that shields your nose and mouth extends outward, ending at the point like a beak. Putting it on, Marilyn smells po poises. It's like one of those plague doctor outfits, he said. <laughs> Shuckling. Ignatius dawns his. My advice, don't touch anything down here. Several people have contracted diseases like tuberculosis. 
You should design suits or something. We tried that, but diseases change and mutate. When they use countless corpses as a breeding ground, anything can happen. Who knows if these masks even work? They happen upon a ground oversized coffin that provokes from the muddy ground a metallic plane on its lid reads Christopher Calvin, 1936-1962, cause of death, suicide. Marilyn rereads the last word over and over again. Why would someone like that kill themselves? Shouldn't even bother asking questions anymore, for their answers reek of confusion. All around the Babylonian, the eye holes of human skulls glare at them beneath the flickering torches. Is there anything innocent in this cold world, or did all of it go extinct even before its end? He backs away from the site, turns, and leaves. Ignatius remains, praying over the casket. Back on Alcatraz, he thinks that quietly into the warden's office. His heart races. He hasn't stopped shaking since he sat down. The warden sits on the other side of the desk, examining him. He clears her throat, climbs to her feet, and walks over to the filing cabinet. After pulling out a folder, she returns to her desk, opens it, and Fink watches the two small bags fall to the desktop. Side white powder. Smiling, the warden removes her SWAT helmet, and red frizzy hair flows down to her shoulders. Bandages cover her left ear, and a scar along the length of her forehead makes her look like the victim of a psychology experiment. She's if she's strong enough to survive a head injury in a time with almost no medical science, what else is she capable of? The warden unzips the bag and lines up the powder. She produces a $100 bill from her pocket, rolls up a cin cilind cylinder safe, and snorts the powder. She twitches, saying, I'm gonna make you the best fucking person here! Where were you before? A miner. She punches the desk. A miner? Fantastic! Another twitch. Well, uh, are you good with mechanical shit? Well, I... Good, we'll put you in the powerhouse. Your first day is today. Go there now. You've got no idea what you're doing, do you? Excuse me? You pretend you're intimidating, but you're a coward. I'm not afraid of you. The one in spits in his face. <laughs> Did you forget that I could execute you for whatever reason? Don't fucking tempt me. Think wipes away the the glob. Do you believe in karma? The warden grins. I am karma! Now get the fuck out of my office and tell the guards where to send you! If you lie to them, I'll find out! You know what happens then! Fink grunts and leaves. The warden loses her mind as she jumps around the room, giggling. The euphoria distracts her from dark thoughts, and her compulsive thinking ceases. However, during the come down, memories spark in her mind, and 15 minutes later, she finds herself sobbing at the desk. Her hands covering her face. Why did she hurt them? She's the cause of nice pain, and she can't make him better. The only reason she's alive right now is because of his mercy, which only makes her feel more guilt. They used to be so happy together, but now all that remains between them are small, awkward interactions. She feels as if she's losing control of herself, for her cocaine use disrupts vital parts of her daily routine. Despite this, she doesn't stop, but she can't. Her brain is too fucked up. Being high is the only thing that helps her escape these terrible feelings. In the end, isn't that why any of us do drugs? And in her case, when all you do is hurt people beyond repair, isn't there any other way out of that winding path? She looks up to the desk, wiping tears away. She has to move on somehow. She needs to kick this addiction so she can be a greater leader. Most importantly, she has to get Ignitus back. Only then will the puzzle be complete. Two guards sho shove Fink towards the front doors of the intimidating powerhouse. From the front lawn, they hear generator generators humming, whistles blowing, and electricity sparking. The horrors of this place are immeasurable, and Fink feels whatever is beyond those doors is going to bring him pain. This is the most dangerous area on this island, not because of its conditions, but because of its purpose. If anybody messes up their duties, the cell house door open the cell house's doors open. They're on a grid. And the island will go into chaos. The warden will find the person responsible and kill them. If she doesn't, somebody else will. Fink realizes this riot will have to be as organized as possible with every contingency recognized. They enter the building, where in a maze of metal corridors and endless hallways awaits the Babylonian. Somehow this is more terrifying than the prison. He passes enslaved workers, and what gets them are the stairs of confusion. They have no idea what they're doing, but maybe that's the point. Fink sees that the guards divide the workers into teams, with one instructor leading the way. All the instructors appear to be oppressive, and they purposely hold valuable knowledge just to keep their team ignorant. 
How nice as men carry corpses on cots, and Fink catches sights of all the danger signs. This is the personification of capitalism. Nobody has any rights here, and nobody gets a chance to form a union. This is a prison camp. His captors station him at one of the countless electric generators, and his team's leader is a woman with dark skin and curly hair. She's different from the others, as her smile brings him in the other team's warmth. She notices the Babylonian, and you are... Fink. Stretching out her hand, she introduces herself. Helen, it's nice to meet you. Since it's your first day, I'll teach you the very basics of working with a machinery like this, she whispers. Unlike the other here, I don't want to see you dead. She accepts his hand. He accepts the handshake. How long have you been here for? I just thought today. I want to look at my resume. They put me as a team lead. I work on hundreds of electrical grids in the city. Fink warms up to the kindred, the kind-hearted acolyte. She teaches the crew how generators to convert mechanical energy into electrical power. She shows them blueprints and techniques on how to maintain these massive ma machines. She puts Fink in charge of the engine, and the others on the fuel system, alternator, voltage regulator, cooling exhaust systems, lubrication systems, battery charger, and control panel. Fink looks over his shoulder and realizes that the island only runs off this type of power to impress the prisoners. This island can run off solar or wind power. It's a deliberate choice. Despite this, Helen shows everyone how to do their job properly, the opposite approach from the others in her position. The day passes by and they sweat off an honest day's work. Thirty minutes before leaving, Helen pulls Fink aside when the guards change their posts. What is it? Untie your shoe. He does. And? Helen drops a folded up piece of paper. Act natural. Hide that and read it while you can. She returns to help on the team, not knowing if she made the right choice. Fink, hoping, feeling hope for the first time since he saw Babylon, bends over, places the note behind, beneath the tongue of his shoe, and ties it. The final whistle blows throughout the powerhouse, and the guards file everyone out of the building, only to escort the night crew into its careless corridors. Now, in his cell, Fink turns away from its doors and produces the note. Unfolding it, it reads in ink. Dear prisoner, if you read this... Oh, dear prisoner, if you receive this, it means you are... It means you are going to get out of here. My name is Helen Schroeder, and I am against Ignatius' government. I am planning a riot from the outside, and I need your help in formulating a plan. In my apartment, I have blueprints of the prison. I know it like the back of my hand. I have the beginning of the event planned out, but I need your help in filling these gaps. Step 1. Create a diversion. Step 2. Cut off the island's power supply. Step 3. A slave uprising on the mainland to distract the military. Step 4. A complete overthrow of the island. This is how far I've gotten. Step 3 is essential to our victory. We need those sails. When this day comes, all of our work will be worth it. So if you have any ideas, please jot them down in the empty spaces below. Give this paper back to me. Sincerely, Miss Schroeder. <coughs> Fink holds up the note again and slides it under the cell's bunk bed. Between him, the door opens, and he turns to see guards push a beaten west to the ground. They slam the door shut and lock it with a skeleton key, laughing as they walk away. Fink pulls the bleeding kid to his feet, and he sits down on the bottom bunk. The kid's left eye is swollen shut, and blood spews out of the corners of his mouth. What's happened? Fink demands. Uh, I fucked up. She threw me in a mint facility. I fucked up. God took me to her office, and she beat me with a fucking skull. He hugs his legs. We have to get out of here. I, ca I can't take this. I have a note. The kid wipes away some blood. What, 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 what note? Fink explains his day, and he reaches under the bed to prove it, its existence. Read it. Wes obliges. So, uh, that's that? Yes, all we need is something to write with. Can't you just see, ask her to bring a pen? He shivers. I, I don't want to risk anything. I'll see what I can do. All we need is time, kid. He hugs the crying boy. It's going to be okay. The next morning, Marilyn wakes up to a stormy day. He jumps when he hears Ignatius' golden eagle cry. He'll never get used to that thing. He climbs out of his bed, crosses over to a dresser, and produces the white hooded robe from a drawer. Donning it, he turns to the room's door to see Ignatius is standing in its doorway. Instead of the robe, the president wears a hazmat suit. He holds another one in his hands. What? Marilyn asks. I'm going to ask you to sew something that you since you're part of the inner circle. The teacher removes his robe in uh, frustration. Give it to me. The president does, and the Babylonian wears a suit, feeling humiliation. 
They exit the estate where a limo awaits them on the driveway. Its driver looks lost in her thoughts, but she snaps back into reality when they climb into the vehicle's backseat. Marilyn watches the world outside as the limo starts up, backs out of the driveway, and zooms down the road. How do these people even have functioning cars? Are their mechanics really that good? Did Forrest deliberately keep this knowledge hidden on purpose? The more he's alive, the more Marilyn hates the monarchy and the president. No man should ever be in this position. It's too difficult to comprehend. The only thing he knows is that he can't be alone. Sometimes he thinks that the very thing that's going to kill him one day, and maybe he's right. The limo approaches the city's gate, slowly opens as they drive into the broken world, and it closes after they pass it. The area around San Francisco reminds Marilyn of the destruction left behind after the blast of the atomic bomb. He remembers what it was like during the Cold War. He had bomb drills in the school on a regular basis, and the class was showing anti-communist propaganda. That's all everyone would talk about, the pros of capitalism and the cons of communism. It was rare to find an unbiased source of information, which is what Marilyn wanted. He has to see both sides of an argument before he can come to a rational conclusion. He gazes out towards a wheat field. Most of the crops are burnt, and the charred remains of silos and barns paint themselves in contrast to the bright blue sky. Nothing is the same anymore. He can't imagine people tending this area. In the distance, a mountain range comes into view. They drive for several hours. The Babylonian falls asleep as they pass through abandoned towns and cities. The car jolts to a stop, and he wakes up, seeing the driver in her own hazmat suit. They exit the car, high in the mountains. Ignatius guides Marilyn by his hand over to the edge of a rock face, and the priest stared down towards the valley below. The Babylonian mouth drops, for what awaits him is an endless ocean of infected. The growls sound like the lowest pitches of a howling storm, and their skin is as black as boiling tar. Dark blood spews out of their sores and blisters. Flies swarm throughout them, or maggots nest inside their organs. <sighs> Foul, hellish order rides with the passing winds. And Marilyn feels nauseous. Imagine the diseases brewing and mutating down here. Pathogens with the potential to end entire societies. Whoa. What is this? Marilyn stammers. <sighs> when you want to be an effective leader, Ignatius starts, you come up with ideas how, how you get what you want. Fear is a surefire way to do that. When you beat someone up and drag them here in the middle of the night against their will, you gain their respect and submission. We show those people death, and they beg for mercy. How do you keep them alive? Ignatius watches the infected see you. There are always enough children. The young rejuvenate the infected. We need to control our population growth anyway. Think of it as a trash can. Enough of that, though. I thought you here because I need something, information about Babylon. I thought you weren't going to do anything to them. I lied. From what I saw, they had a lot of shit. Most of it is useful to our condition. I want to know about what I didn't see. The limo's driver produces a pistol and strikes Marilyn on the back of the head. She stands behind him, ready to kill. The Babylonian falls to his knees, groaning in agony. The ratio isn't in his favor. He examines the infected, and as if they're begging him to comply. One kick sends him over to the edge, one bite sends him to his doom. What do you know? Marilyn asks, stammering. What kind of guns do they use? He keeps Timothy out of this. Just flint locks, cannons, bows, and arrows. We aren't as sophisticated as you think. Bullshit! You have an entire area to cannons dedicated to mining. You're advanced, and you are just hiding it. The driver strikes Marilyn again, this time on his neck. Speak! She growls. Your government in the United States. What is it? It's a monarchy. Who rules? A king or queen? Both! Then it's not a monarchy. Kings and queens never rule at the same time. <laughs> That's the thing. Our flaws are advantages. Forrest, our king, is a lot like you. He does things like that because he rules through manipulation. He lulls people into a false sense of security. And that's when he strikes. He adds you before he knows you. At first, Ignitus wants conflict. Now he wants compromise. Imagine having someone of his caliber on his side. Imagine the power! The president kneels. Do you think he can meet me? After what you did with the miners, the army? That's what you'll do with all the vulnerable people. That's why we didn't attack Babylon. They were easy targets for us. Well, why you shouldn't let your guard down? Marion closes his eyes. I don't think you how you can meet him. They could be making their way here right now. 
don't you think it's safer to stay put? Get in the car, Ignatius demands. I'll deal with him. Back in the city, the Warren sits alone in her office. Candles flicker, illuminating the queer decoil of hum human skulls. Her door opens, and the heart drops upon seeing Ignatius stepping over the threshold. He leaps to her feet, wanting to hug her. But something stops her. They stand in silence as if they're watching each other's ghosts. The warden opens her mouth, but the glare on the president's face sends a silencing message. He scans the room, noticing the smeared lines of coke on the desk. A disdainful sigh escapes his mouth, and he starts for the door. Wait! she begs. Please wait! Nice pauses. If I tell you something, will you do it? Will you love me? If you complete my assignment, I'll reconsider. Okay, what is it? I need you to go back to Seattle. There's a group there, a big one. I have to get in contact with the leaders. She nods her head, not caring about the repercussions. I'll do it for you. Ignatius kisses her. Thank you. Now, in his estate, the president stands in a dark room. One light dangles over a post, and on top of it rests the golden eagle. The animal's green grass-colored darts, uh, grass-colored eyes dart across the room. It lets out a shriek, much to Ignatius' approval. He produces a live rat from his pocket and holds it in front of an eagle's beak. Without hesitation, the beast clamps on the creature and swallows it whole. Ignatius pats the bird, proud of it being its owner. He's seen the bird kill in battle. It stuns the opponent by appearing out of the sky and then kills them. It acts like a guided missile. Loyal pets must have loyal owners. The door opens and a strange light illuminates the room for a moment until it closes again leaving the room occupants in almost complete darkness. Why don't you get more lanterns? Marilyn asks. The president sighs. She likes it that way. Too much light all day explores her vision. She's fragile like that. The Babylonian approaches the pole. What's her name? Athenia. How'd you find her? I was in the Vietnam War. We were in the mountains and my platoon came across this nest. It was weird seeing it in the middle of all this trauma. Anyway, we saw eggs. One of them hatched, and Athenia's head was sticking out. A few feet from the nest, its mother. It was shut down out of the sky. That struck me. Athenia was going to die, and everyone was too caught up in the war to notice the little things. I wanted to change that. I saved and raised her daughter in the war, and we grew close. Now, we're here. How old is she? In her forties. I don't have the exact number in my head right now. Ignitus, why do you have the pit? When I was in the war, I supported the fight against communism. I wanted us to win. We did it. But our society stands because capitalism is here. The pit represents the power it holds over these people. I don't think that's a fair argument. Communism is a moneyless society. Babylon doesn't use money, and we're doing relatively fine. Although we are communists, bartering works for us. All societies have their own ways. We can't downright abolish ideas simply because we don't agree with them. These isms are vulnerable to change, so why don't we fix them is beyond my understanding. I thought you were in my inner circle, not Babylon's. The teacher stays quiet. The president moves towards the door. Let me show you how things work in the simplest way possible. He leads the Babylonian through the estate onto the ornate balcony. In the distance, a slave work on plantations, and a cloud of smog forms over the city. Marilyn stars and stares in awe at the pollution, a silico killer. The president rests his hands on the balcony's safety rails. When you control the money supply, you control the people. When you become the money supply, you hold all the power you could dream of. I am now your leader. You will do as I ask, and you will not speak against my word again. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Good. Outside San Francisco, the warden walks through the land confidently. Her feet brush across the overgrown weeds that sprout upward from the crackling roads. Dawn is breaking, as if the sky looks like the bruise in a painter's crucible. Cancel the landscape. Nothing but emptiness. One can't understand the true nature of loneliness until they behold this hell on earth. It's still a game, no matter the disorder. The word, that word disorder reverberates in her mind as it hides under the bashes of a gong. Disorder always intrigues her. It's not the state itself, but it's the fact that it can lead her to order. How can such a chaotic idea bring organization to even the most heinous of situations? Buildings creak and settle around her. So she is it's as if she's living in a giant house with wooden framework. The air rumbles mimic her sinking stomach and she grows desperate for food. Reaching into her pocket, the warden produces a small metallic dagger. She pauses, examining the engraving of the number 33 in its hilt. Sure, her family has free mason blood, but what difference does it make now? She is no more special than the dirt on her shoe. 
She presses on, realizing that her journey is larger than her self-deprecation. This is her love life on the line. As she endures the miles of post-apocalyptic land, the days pass, and finds the wild game, but no other humans. There's no bee left in the earth, no sign of life on this coast, at least. Now from her perspective, maybe there are people hiding in the bushes, waiting for the perfect moment to attack and slit her throat. That's just how it is, though. And it always will always be like this. The strangest part about it is that it mimics how she felt in the real world. Lost, drained, and alone. There's always this paranoia following her. Lingers behind winding trails of thoughts like the black smoke that erupts from the exhausting pipes. She distracts herself by finding patterns in the skeletal world. Patterns in this peeling plaster of decaying walls. In rusty cars and in the cracking asphalt. She spends many cold nights in the withered uh, foundations of firehouses. Police stations, schools, post offices, malls, and anyone else that has a roof. The only thing that makes her feel safe is the lack of the infected ones. Tonight, she sleeps against the trunk of a birch tree. Exhaustion, hunger, and thirst winning. Above her, a trembling gray sky. Rain pelts her body softly at first, but the storm drenches her within five minutes. She doesn't move. She's too weak. All of her demons catch up to us eventually. She gazes down at her dagger's hilt protrudes from her pocket and has a mocking presence. She's too weak to even cut her own wrist to put an end to this terrible nightmare. She stares ahead into the distant woods. The winding branches and leaves look different now. Something about this place provokes a sense of, uh, sense of powerlessness. Looking down at her legs, she sees nature's floor covering them. Insects crawl over her arms and neck and they bite and pick at her skin. She hears a wolf howling in the distance. With every cry, it seems to get closer and closer to her location. The hunched beast emerges before her, licking its curly lips beneath the falling rain. It growls as it circles her tree, and in its glowing red eyes, the warden sees pure evil. There can be proof of the devil. That is it. Hell is right here on Earth, and it's the last thing she's going to see. Gazing down at the mocking dagger, the warden is too weak to even reach for it. What other choice does she have now besides giving up? It's not like Ignitus is serious about this offer. The beast's stomach growls, but before it pounces, a seer strikes its head, and it collapses to the cold earth. A few minutes pass, and nobody reveals themselves. She numbs herself to the tireless exhaustion and falls asleep. When she wakes up, mad covers the skin, worms, caterpillars, and other insects crawl through the soft earth. She leaps to her feet, wiping nature off her shivering body. A few feet from her are the infected wolf. She examines the spear protruding from its head, takes it out, and raises it to the morning light. No designs, no carvings. She doesn't even know if they're washing her right now. I even need dense foliage. Paranoia pushes her out of the woods and into the open road. The sun beats down on her. The thirst quickly becomes a problem. No water. She hasn't had any in, in hours. Her tongue is as dry as the surface of Mars, and her lips are like the mud cracks of the Mojave Desert. Holding her aching stomach, she limps down the road like a drunkard. Exhaustion never fails to ruin the goals. Above her head, the sky darkens once more like a summer in Florida. Great, here we go again. To her surprise, it's only a drizzle. She presses on, forgetting about the light rainfall. What's her purpose? Is she as dead as the rest of the world? When one wanders a wasteland of burnt architecture and decay, one ponders on their existence. What's this senseless meeting going to accomplish? Some part of her thinks Forrest won't even agree because of what Ignitus is doing to her people. Who would want her to team up with abductors? She pauses. She loves them, and she won't let them down because of her entitlement. Too stubborn to see reality, she stops asking these questions and distracts herself by observing the past scenery. Miles and miles of absolute destruction, comprehending the magnitude of the old world's ruins is like calculating an end to pi. At noon, she walks by a mall. From its parking lot, a deer leaps into her path. A spear files out of nowhere and strikes the innocent animal through the eye. A precise hit. <coughs> The warden approaches the animals hesitantly, her head pounding. The spears have the same design as the one that killed the wolf. Whirling around, she scans the surrounding structures. Nothing, not even a tumbling weed. A vulture circles the sky. Overhead, she, she ignores it, but an ominous feeling grows inside her chest. These hiding protectors are haunting her. Despite this fear, she needs to eat something, so she skins the deer with her dagger and roasts the raw meat over a crackling fire. The warden devours the meat, leaving nothing to a desperate straggler. She reaches Oregon, and when she spots the state sign, her heart races. One step closer to ending this personal exodus. The Israelites supposedly wandered the desert for 40 years. What she feels must be similar to how she felt. 
the story is true, of course. She doesn't understand religion, and she doesn't know why Ignatius has this cult. She just wants him. He has this personality of a mobster and the tenacity of Sisyphus. Everything he does is attractive to her, although this obsession is unhealthy. She fails to recognize that because of how captivating she is. Despite her gruesome past over, her, her ghosts kill more animals for her to eat. She even leave canteens full of water by the campfires in the middle of these cold nights. At some point she gets lost, finding herself at Fort Stevens Stage Park, the tip of the peninsula. She happens upon an old Civil War structure, its use lasting until 1947. On the night of June 21st, 22nd, 1942, the Japanese fired 17 shells at this place. The warden remembers learning about it in school, pondering on what future textbooks will be like. All the libraries here are burned. The human record is gone. What will happen now? Here she experiences the worst of cocaine withdrawal, becoming lethargic within the first hour of her arrival. Unable to reach out for help, and not knowing if the protectors are just dragging her into a trap, she remains here. Unforgettable, terrifying days pass, and they grow worse with each pristine sunrise and sunset. Restlessness prevents the warden from any form of a good night's rest. She grows uncomfortable in her skin, and this discomfort makes her want to rip it all off, so she could finally free herself from this misery. Insomnia develops alongside the heat of freak night sweats, for which her body feels like she's bursting over a bottomless inferno. Her obsession with Ignitus spikes, for thinking about him is the only thing that brings stability in these dark hours. However, this invites delusional thoughts of her being his wife. She believes they have a family in the mountains of California. Throughout this experience, her protectors still bring her gifts. Jars of food, cans of ice water. Why don't they just confront her killer within the masonry walls of this historical structure? Why can't she take a dagger to her wrist to end this helpless opportunity? She regrets not bringing the drug, not bringing any supplies. A realization dawns on her. She did that intentionally. She wants to suffer. But why? And how does she do it unconsciously? Why did Ignatius tell her to bring anything? Well, he's probably too focused on other things. Being the leader of a developing society doesn't entail leisure time. Each time, she justifies this action. The deeper she descends into this queer obsession. The peak of this terrifying trip plateaus and descends into a downward spiral. It takes her endless days to recover, to rehabilitate back into her previous habits. She regains her strength slowly, first by walking, then hunting, then self-fulfillment. Her protectors don't provide the jars of food, but they still leave behind the cans of water. She wonders how they get all these supplies, what drastic measures that must be undertaken in order to achieve such a regular stockpile. Are these people friendly, or is this just another trap? These questions run through her broken mind, but she brushes them off for the sake of her own sanity. Conjuring her thoughts, her supplies, her courage, she exits the fort, preparing herself an uncertain path. Has this crossing has ever been done before? How could anybody know? Where would their record of their travels be? On the road, she approaches a waiting area for the country's non-existent transit route. In a neighboring newspaper stand, a clean booklet of maps in each individual state, sticking out like a sore thumb. Her protectors instantly cross her mind, but why would they wait until now to bring such an artifact to her? Picking it off the shelf, she flips to Oregon and traces her route into the state's northernmost border. Even more tireless days passing through this lonely, isolating life, she feels like a nomad, having no direction, no shelter, and no purpose. Maybe that's why these survivors are all like nameless, face faceless people just following the meaningless hole of a heartless, forgotten world. Maybe that's been in all of us since before this confusing downfall of humanity. Reaching Washington, a silent breath of relief flows through her. Now wandering through the country's northwesternmost state, the, wander, the warden stumbles through empty cities, sleeps in small, abandoned structures, and roams over relics of a forgotten time. Future archaeologists uncover this. There will be an end to the story, no end to the stories, and claim they'll be thrown out. Today, humanity's legend reminds her of Egypt. With that being the case, Nidus is a powerful, divine pharaoh. On her final day, her feet reaches Babylonian's uh, wooden drawbridge. Each time her blistering feet stamp across the wooden oak, she feels an aura of accomplishment and pride. How does this masterpiece manage to withstand the sands of time? The kingdom's walls and glaring archers loom over her. They stretch far above her head, protecting the protruding rooftops of the medieval uh, buildings behind it. The boiling sun illuminates the Holy Land, and it gives the region a peaceful glow as she approaches the barred gateway. Here, she meets a weary, rough-looking gatekeeper who looks like a reincarnation of the Mer Virgin Mary. Please, the warden weakly mutters. I need shelter. I've been on the road for the past few weeks. This is a matter of extreme importance. 
The gatekeeper reluctantly pulls a lever inside the fort fortified gatehouse. We have to pat you down. Go, men. Above the warden, the archers lower their weapons. She gladly enters the small masonry building, where the gatekeeper finds a dagger and a booklet of maps in her pocket. I'll take you to the monarchy so they can talk to you, the gatekeeper explains. You see that huge building? Taller than the rest? That's where they live. The warden follows the Babylonian through the stage of original society. The acolyte watches how everyone behaves, and how she quickly notices the, light, the lack of racist ideologies and currency. Taking note of this, she turns her judgments to the architecture. The simple wooden, hay roof buildings of fascinating dimensions contradict the modern, fading appearance of the Space Needle, accentuating the intention behind their designs. Whoever built Babylon like this is... did so deliberately. For what reason, she knows not, but nonetheless, they enter the destination and climb the tower, so exhausting the staircase to the throne room, where the gatekeeper knocks on its menacing doors. The portal swings open, revealing an ornate, fa fanatical interior, and a man with a long, scruffy beard. The lines on his forehead accentuate his age, and a golden crown rests upon his head. A purple cape hangs off his shoulders and washes down his back like a waterfall. Lagging a few feet behind him, the warden feels like he's in an entirely new world. He says to the gatekeeper with a warm, inviting smile, Good job, Samantha. You can return to your post now. The king then gestures for the warden to come in. The door closes behind them, and he meets her at a large dining room table. A chandelier dangles down from the ceiling and flickers overhead, casting an ominous vibe through an inevitable, brutal discussion. <coughs> the warden doesn't know how to put this offer into words. She doesn't say the right ones, she won't get what she wants. Everything according to her is at stake. The king sits down in his chair. My name is Forrest Whaley, and you are? Marissa, where are you from? San Francisco. Well, you come a long way. It was difficult, I imagine. Listen, I'm actually on an assignment. Assignment? What kind of assignment? Castamore Ignitus, the man who killed your general, wants to meet you. He admires how you lead. The horrible realization pries the king's mouth wide open. You, you have my people, don't you? He bangs his fist on the tabletop. Why the hell would I want to talk to them? Maybe you can negotiate something like I said. He minds how you leave. And if things go well, well, maybe you could have a common understanding. Then maybe, then maybe, just maybe, I'll convince them to let your people free. Do you know what to know? Do you want to know what we've been doing this whole time? <coughs> Forrest snarls. Maybe you don't. It's none of your business anyway. There is no room for negotiation where your people adopt mine in broad daylight. Where is this logic in here coming here? I worked all this way from San Francisco. Humor me, please. Please, I just meet with them and talk about the current state of affairs. I need this. Y you you need this? We can meet them. That's the soft, angelic female voice from the back of the darkened room. Oh, she emerges. Wearing a jewel contrasted in headpiece. My name is Echo Ramirez. I'm interested. Echo? With all due respect, honey, let me talk. The queen approaches the table. Where we can meet him, Marissa. Do you have an address? Fort Stevens, Oregon. It could be a temporary checkpoint between our two societies. If any conflict breaks out, it won't cause damage to our properties. Can you draw us a road? Yes, but it'll just take a while. Most of the roads are gone. Traversing them is like a warning through muck. The asphalt's just dissolving. Echo gives her a reassuring look. You can stay in one of our inns for today. Forrest's face turns blood red. What? Echo glares at him. She can stay and we'll have someone to look after. Turning to the warden, she adds, Tomorrow we'll send you off to San Francisco with a rucksack full of pro provisions. However, you are still our enemy. We won't forget what you've done, but we're better than you, and we're going to prove it. This mortifies the king, and he abruptly leaves the area. The queen lowers her head and whispers, Forgive me, for the breath of my mercy. The warden climbs to her feet, itching to get out. I'm terribly sorry about that. Can you show me what he ends? Echo lurches back into reality. Yes, follow me, please. She leads the harmless adversary all the way back down to the Space Needle. They walk into the king's ki uh, kingdom confidently, the queen towering over the warden. Pennants and banners fly in the wind as they dangle from open windows, a thick smelling of burning meat and the distant sound of some celebration conjure a sense of enlightenment, something the warden has never felt before. The queen gestures outward. It took us years to build what we have, to create a generation a world has never seen before. What would you want to take that away from someone? Do you think I personally made that decision? Uh... Look, I just believe in them. Like everyone else, he rules over. 
This doesn't mean you should adhere to his every whim. That's hypocritical coming from someone who wears jewels on their head. I choose to let you stay. I expect respect. You would have a harder time had I not intervened. Fine, you're right. Thank you for doing that. We close. All our are in the housing district. You'll see them soon. That evening, Marissa lies under the white covers of a comfortable woolen mattress. She can't stop thinking about the feelings she would get from those cocaine eyes. Those sharp electric emotions of euphoria. Mentally, she misses it, for she can't dive back into those habits. She wants a nice back, she has to improve herself. Her addiction is the very thing that drove her away. She sits up, facing the room's window. Outside, the elderly place banjos on rocking chairs as the evening skies turn to twilight. The red... The red glow haunts her, for the hue is of the same luminance that ignites when blood pours. A cold, familiar chill runs down the spinal column, and she climbs out of bed, unable to rest. Moving her to the door, she gazes through its people, and at the back of the Babylonian soldier, what is this place? North Korea? She examines the room's furniture, an old bookshelf, fading paintings, and a slow rotating fan. She's never been in this place this bizarre before. The smell is of freshly chopped wood mixing with a hint of maple pine. Lit candles sit on the bedside table, the shadows flashing across dark walls. Once a warden, now a prisoner. Someone knocks on the door. She opens it to a man with curly black hair. His eyes cower behind sparkling glasses, but his mercilessly stares suggest forthcoming hostility. Entering the room with a limp, he closes the doors and rele- uh, reveals her a rucksack full of provisions, plopping it down to the glowing floorboards. He holds his stomach, pressing down to an unseen, bothersome wound. This is what your people did. Oh, this is what your people did. He growls. I got shot protecting Alito. Yours tried killing him. I'm not forgetting that. I know. Do you feel any remorse? No, and I doubt you do. Why is that? I'm not a dumbass. Our experiences in this world harden us. Sometimes they cripple us for life. They make you numb to the things you should care about. In the end, you only care about yourself. We. We don't want to admit it, but you're selfish people. More selfish than we have ever been. This is survival, and there's no room for guilt in this game. I manufacture externally and copious amounts. I defend this place, and if you think your people are getting away with it, you're mistaken. What's your name? Timothy. Timothy? Next time you threaten me during a peace. No, for a peaceful negotiation, I will take that opportunity away from you. Understood? She gestured towards the tower. Thank you for the bag. Alone again, she watches the kingdom through the clear window. Outside, cultures of all types mingle and laugh with one another, not knowing the trials that lie ahead. Everyone lies are going to change because of this meeting, not on a physical level for now, but on a conscious one. For she doubts they have knowledge of other societies. Turning around, she misses Alcatraz. Not the place itself, but the feeling of power that resides within. It's still strange to her how she could be in fear in one place, and a stranger in the next. What does it mean? Why can't she have power everywhere? Even more tantalizing was stopping her. In the throne room, the leaders watch over its sleeping Alice, who turn and twist in her crib. It's ruthless how unsafe everyone is, even when it comes to her own minds. Life truly doesn't guarantee anyone for anything, nor is it against us. It just simply is. Poor struggle with this council a lot, especially when it comes to mercy. Even weeks after Dante's assassination attempt, he still questions the very nature of it. Mercy is nothing more than a temporary truce. So in this case, wouldn't it be easier for de- uh, someone to deliver uh, their crime sooner? Uh, no action comes without consequence. Everyone's due to pay for their unjust attitudes at some point. He observes the infant inf- uh, instantly, while Echo leaves and turns, staring for the door. She's about to exit, but Alice abruptly wakes up, crying. The king picks her up, cradles her, and gives her a bottle milk. Echo watches the care she puts into every movement. The general nature of this affection is indescribably attractive. She wonders if raising Alice helps with her schizophrenia, but the realization that your child is part of you is always a powerful one, enough to make even the most dangerous mongers feel sympathy and sorrow for the defenses in the weak. <sighs> Echo, the forest whispers, come here. What is it? I have to tell you a secret, he admits, gazing down at Alice's eyes. I was drafted into the Vietnam War, but I dodged it. I kept it to myself because I didn't feel like it was worth noting till now. Why is that? I-, I trust you a lot more now. I want you to understand my situation. It was the 50s. Mental institutions treated their patients horribly. If I went to the army, they'd find out my problems sent me to one. I was cornered. There was nowhere for me to turn. He sighs. I'm not mad at you for letting her stay. I'm just worrying about the fallout. What, what, what if it doesn't turn out right? What if something happens? We go to war. Then you're just going to have to face your fear, aren't you? Echo won't be good for me. I'd have to kill people. Are you forgetting I'm hallucinating right now? I thought Alice calms her head down. She does, but I 
still have these lingering symptoms. Whatever happens because of this meeting, it's going to be okay, I promise. Forrest echoes his eyes. Forrest closes his eyes, saying solemnly, I still think about Judas. I can't forget her. Echo rubs her fingers through his matting hair. Was she the first person you ever... No, the king revoked sharply. She was still the leader. Before I... I hated leaders. Now I pity them. I killed the leader, so who's going to kill me? Nobody. Don't let them. That's why we have the army. They support us the most out of any other district. They couldn't protect me against Dante, remember that? That attempt caught us off guard. Nobody's ever done anything like that before him. Now that we're aware of the possibility, we have the contingency under wraps. I feel as like I, I don't say this as often as I should, but I love you. Echo smiles, blushes, and rubs his head. We're gonna be okay. Whatever happens, Bell won't prevail. It has to. Back in San Francisco, Marilyn wanders to Ignatius' palace, pausing in the art gallery. He admires the works of Claude Monet, Vincent Van Gogh, and Pablo Picasso. A certain piece speaks to him: "Liberty Leading the People" by Eugene Delacroix. The artist. The artist deceives a woman in a torn dress stand upon heaps of dead bodies. Her breasts aren't enough to distract the soldier's fighter around her. Personifying their determination to bring down King Charles X of France during the July Revolution of 1830. In her hand, the French flag. Marilyn figures Babylon needs one and takes note of the idea before Ignatius appears at her side with, Anina, with Athena resting on her shoulder. The president smirks. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, it's beautiful. I see it as a downfield of monarchism and a rise of democracy in a fair two-way. The world is fair to you? Yes, it has been. It always will be. I don't know what's going to happen if the meeting fails, but if it does, at least you're on our side. A nice leaves the sacred man alone, and the Babylonian's eyes fixate on the woman's. End of chapter four. Chapter 5 People Bold determination overwhelms Heather as she guides her troop of Babylonian soldiers through a colorful area of Oregon's wilderness. They stomp over the infected autumn leaves, and Heather wraps her hand around the grip of her holstered flintlock pistol. Twenty feet from the edge of the tree, she pauses, and the others follow suit. Through the infected trunks, she spots an intimidating stone fortress from the Civil War. Now at their vantage point, the Babylonians drew their weapons and aimed them at the building, preparing themselves for the worst case scenario. The air is quiet today, aside from the unsettling sound of tweeting birds, which proves to be a stark peaceful contrast from the ensuing events. A terrible dark feeling resides in the pit of Heather's trembling heart. She has the weight of the world on her shoulders, and if anybody dies, it's on her. This realization flows through the cracks of her spine like a toxic, haunting ooze of unimaginable ingredients. How will they know when to strike? When they hear bullets from inside? Surely by then, it'll be too late to save the king. Heather glances back at her troop, recognizing the severity of every passing second of calmness. If they lose force, they lose everything. She has to be willing to make every sacrifice possible to ensure victory. That's the hard part of being a leader, she figures. You have to want to lose your followers. Is that what the monarchy has to experience every day? the feeling of loss that nobody deserves? Perhaps they're numb to it now, and they've forgotten that painful sting of death. Nonetheless, she uses this time to think about Alexander and how much potential he had. He was Babylon's best fighter, and Heather had the honor to be his best friend. She recalls meeting him outside Everett, Washington, in the yard of the country's airplane facility. In the yard of the county's airplane facility. From there, her life became what it is now fighting for what he gave her. You can't perform this kind of conflict with a selfish attitude. You have to approach it with the aura of American revolutionaries, or all is lost. When you don't have a purpose for fighting, you give up easily. Thusly, Babylonian nationalism proves to be what they need most right now. Force enters the Union base confidently, cautiously maneuvering through piles of debris from years of maltreatment. He arrives at the door of a bunking room, and on the door itself is a message that reads, Welcome, Babylon, in red paint. Calmly, he wraps his hand around the doorknob, withstanding the screams in his head. They sound like buzzing alarms, warning him away from this godforsaken place. For once, maybe they're right. Actually, is this the first time? Who knows what the king? Regardless, he disregards their pleads and presses into the room, taking deep breaths. On the other side, he finds a slim, Charles Arthur type figure sitting at a simple wooden table. 
The stranger dons a white hoodie, has no hair, and wears that same confident look Forrest has. The king sits in an empty chair, on the opposite side of his enemy. The president leans back in this chair, appearing to be at peace with his surroundings. Forrest, however, sits in a state of catatonia for the greater good. The amount of anger he can unleash right now would be enough to shatter dimensions. The president sighs deeply. I thought you looked different. He shrugs his shoulders nonchalantly. I've been disappointing myself a lot lately, so I'm not surprised. Before you start talking, I want to lay down an offer. We have similar leadership styles, and I want to team up with you. We're powerful people who have powerful impacts on others, and I feel like we can make a new world order. Forrest shakes his head. Here's what I know. You killed the old commander of my army. You took my people away in broad the daylight. You're forcing them to acclimate into something they barely understand, and I doubt you do too. You have no idea what we can do when we put our minds together. That's no way to speak in a negotiation, the president suddenly bursts out in cold laughter. <laughs> Wait, that's why you don't know how to talk to me. I need to introduce myself. He extends a hand for the monarch. Kasima Ignitus, and you? The Babylonian scowls at the invitation. Forrest. The president lowers his hand. Well, Forrest, just so you're aware of the respect I require, you will not fucking talk to me like that when I'm trying to be fair. Fair? Yes, that's the glorious thing about democracy. All of it is fair. Again, Forrest shakes his head. That's the thing. On a monarchism, you control the people. That's a fair expression of power. Under democracy, the people control you. You're nothing more than a puppet. That's the thing, Ignatius retorts sarcastically. Under monarchism, you control the people. Until you don't. Revolutions? Coups? Those things tend to happen to people under crowns. He closes his eyes, patiently inhaling and exhaling. <coughs> Let's take this back a few notches. Let me give you a background. Maybe that will convince you. I grew up in Mississippi before the Vietnam War. Did I dabble with the KKK? Maybe. Am I proud of it? Perhaps. But I digress. I got the draft, and I accept it. The voices in Forrest's head forced him to ask. What did you see? The president leans forward along to the tabletop. We have a dodger, don't we? Interesting. Well, since you asked, I saw what the other side of the world was like. I saw what communism did, and I want to obliterate it. That's why I do what I do. I don't see why that should bother me. Ignatius grins. I've got the money, and I've got the time. We're bringing America back to how it once was, and we're not stopping until we do. Your vision of America is corrupt with white supremacy. Oh? And how's your vision moral? I never said I'm moral. In fact, I don't believe in morals. I haven't since I saw sick people devouring each, each right in front of me. It was a crazy time, wasn't it? This meeting is pointless. Only because you're making it seem that way. You're a tough person to crack, Forrest. I respect that about you. Stop saying that shit! What shit? You don't respect or admire me. You're only doing it to make yourself look like the better person. Ignatius changes the subject quickly. After I took your people, how did you react? What have you been up to over there? You don't want to know. Enough with the power moves. I'm trying to be civil, but you're pushing me to the edge. We've been preparing for conflict. We don't know what you're going to do with us next, so we have to put ourselves first. Do you still have family? Again... The voices forced him to whisper, Echo! Echo! The king lowers his head. I love her. Do you want to see her tonight? Yes. Then you'll join my order. I'm playing through games with you. Uh, and if you think you're going to conquer us, I won't let that happen. I'll die for my people. Will you really? Of course. Your track record with conflict doesn't seem very promising. I ran because I had to. I had no choice. Only fools run from protecting their country in a time of crisis. You wouldn't understand. I do. My father was a business tycoon. He built and owned oil refineries all across the country. He glorified capitalism, and he became somebody because of it. He told me all the flaws behind communism, and I listed to them. The world can't survive without money. Babylon does. It's possible. What was your father like? What was his attitude? 
Why are you asking me about my father? There's cycles in families, and it's usually the son that breaks the cycle of their fathers. If it's unfavorable. He was a nobody. And it looks like I was right. You didn't break your cycle. No, but that's only because accepting it would make me more successful. That's how things work. We have to find out what's most useful to us. Let me ask you something. How do you keep your people in line? We practice oligarchical collectivism. But the people perceive us as a monarchy. As long as they think we're the only ones who have a say in what's going on, that's all that matters. One or two people can't control a population of our magnitude. There has to be a strict, efficient, deep part of the system that, that's in the now. At the end of the day, what the crown says goes. It's all for show. Forrest smiles, proud of his explanation. What about you? Money is at the heart of power. The more you have, the more you own. How do you think I won the election? I have money, and I buy out all my supporters. Money is sickness. It creates poverty and the unnecessary struggle between classes. It makes everything more confusing in the end. It doesn't. Once you see how we operate, you'll understand. Who thinks I want to see it? How else will you understand us? Horace grits his teeth. I already do understand you. You're nothing more than an obstacle to us. Why did we find one of your men on our turf? You're in Washington and hundreds of miles away. What were you doing down there? Alexander wanted oil. I listened to him, and he sounded convincing. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that oil is ours. Even if he survived, there still would have been conflict. These things don't go down easily, which is why I'm trying to negotiate. Four sits back comfortably in his chair, letting emotion show for once. Before I built the kingdom, I was alone. Nights were so dark and cold that I couldn't get any sleep. I found this kid on my way. His name was Thomas. He was younger than me. There was innocence and purity in them, the last of his kind. I wanted to protect him from everything, and I was doing good. Until we reached the hospital. We had to stay there. We had to get out of the snow. I didn't want him getting hypothermia or frostbite or whatever hell this fucking world throws at you under those conditions. Anyway, there we were, in the children's ward. He was looking out a window, and somebody from the outside shot and killed him. Blood and glass sprayed everywhere, and I just... stared. I didn't cry, and I didn't feel any pain. I just... looked. What once had life is now limp on the floor. Something that had so much potential lost because someone was paranoid. I never found the person that killed him, but that night, I vowed never to let my guard down. Now you know why I'm a tough nut to crack, as you put it. Nidus chuckles. Damn, what are we going to do about you? Giving me back my people would be a great step forward. You see, I can't do that. They provide for me, and I need their skills, especially Marilyn. What have you done to him? Absolutely nothing. His change is on his own terms. What kind of games are you playing? The abduction? The meeting? The taunting? The dots aren't connecting. I'm simply being diplomatic. I'm trying to construct civil relations. You can either abide by your own standards, or you can leave. And seeing as you haven't left yet, you have an interest in my offer, and I want you to go for it. Why did you join the KKK? Why something so sinister? Why does anybody do anything? Influence. That's what it all comes back to. You either influence yourself, or society does the work for you. I went for the lighter route, because it got my name out there. I followed my dad's footsteps. It led me to a higher version of my life. And what you do to honor your family name? You perform. You put on this act that nobody could see through. That's true evil. If you ask me, however, I think you're the type of guy that can come to an understanding. If you had any perspective, you empower me to unimaginable levels. There are no limits to this form of power. No more issues, no more hoops to hope through. The new world order is here, and it resides in the hopes that you accept this invitation. You're the perfect candidate for it. We're the same person. I am not like you. Do you control people with force? Do you disobey their pleads of wanting to know why you do what you do? Do you look in the mirror and feel like a king? The monarch slams his fist on the table. That's none of your goddamn business. Seems like there's a nerve to avoid. Why do you keep taunting me and then saying this is a negotiation? If anything, this is a threat. 
Do you pity me? Pity you? I merely take an interest in your style. Sure, my mannerisms show here and there, but that's just a slip of the tongue. Disregard it. Those comments have no basis in reality. How can I trust you? You just do. You don't reset it. And don't rebel. You just accept. How much oil do you have? Why the sudden interest in my markets? My people die trying to find it. I want to know what they lost their lives for. Well, in that case, we have endless amounts. Black oceans of the stuff. We have refineries that convert it to gasoline for our cars. What else do you have? Aren't you the one that didn't want to talk about your community? Aren't you the one that killed my men? I deserve to know. It's my right as your victim. We have plantations, islands. We control San Francisco, as well as other smaller communities. We travel by train. We have airships. What's even more immaculate is that we're advancing. Our culture is changing, and we're accepting that change. How's it looking back in the Dark Ages? We progress intellectually, not materialistically. Oh, how so? We have an education system for our children. They know what's going on, and we're raising them to be seen better than how we are now. We're teaching them how to build, and how to form relationships, how to work, and how to be happy. Marilyn was our teacher, but... We don't have them right now, so they can't learn if nobody can teach them. You teach them how to be happy? In Babylon's way, right? Yes. And in the end, the happiness is just manipulation, correct? Yes. It takes the heat off us. Damn, you've got every angle of this figured out, haven't you? All the way down to falsifying joy. It has to be done for efficiency. I like you, Forrest. I like your ideas. They're innovative. And the world needs more people like you. The more you say it, the more I doubt you. Why? Because I see this fire behind your eyes. This lust for invasion and siege. The weather is getting colder. We'll have no time for conflict in the face of the coming winter. Can I ask you something? Yes. If you have airships, why did you make Marissa walk? They're only for conquering people. You can't use them for small missions like that. It's inefficient. Is she okay? Why do you have to know? Because when we shoot us out the kingdom, she looked scared. None of the new environment, but of leaving. We gave her supplies, but when we parted ways, she looked back at us with this look of... loss. She was in love with me. I sent her there to prove it. But you don't love her back, don't you? No. You see, I've always found people like you disgusting. Do you have any idea what the journey is like? How much it could take out of you? Do you even ask her if she's okay? I had a girlfriend before the end of the world. Her name was Victoria. We dated for about three years, and we fell madly in love with each other. But after that, she left. It was just for show. Ever since then, I've always looked down on women. I know, it's a generalization, but it's helped me survive. And now, I'm happy. Happier than I've ever been. You're happy? Yes, how can't I be? I have money, and that's all you need. That's all that intrigues your world, financial empowerment. What intrigues yours? Community. So you're a communist. No, our bartering system is completely different from communism. Plus, monarchical communism doesn't exist. It's a complete contradiction. You know what I've noticed about your society? You have two leaders. When most kingdoms is the past, only have one. Why is that? Who said we had two leaders? Marilyn. He willingly told you? Then he thinks about the pit of the infected. He remembers Marilyn's gaze of fear. For he knew at any moment one kick could send him over the edge, into the pit of the infected. Yes. The king suddenly leaps to his feet. Schizophrenia finally gained complete control over this man. This is payback for trying to silence us. Sweat forms on his forehead, and he screams, The walls! Gasping for air, he heaves, There! The closing! He runs over to the closest wall and bangs on it. Those damn bastards! They think they can run my credit score! Shoots a devious glance toward Ignitus. Little did they know the market is already crashing! Look at the stocks, they're all fucking shit! Right across the board! Ignitus doesn't know what to do. Uh, are you okay? Forrest spreads out his arms and twirls around. I'm more than okay! He runs up to the table, hopping on top of it. I just saved my own ass! The game's rigged, and it's working for me! Forrest, sit down. 
We're trying to have an adult conversation, and if you can't handle that, I'll have to get someone. The king stares dead into the present's eyes. You have more people out there. I thought this was one-on-one. -on -one. How that brings him back to reality, and he climbs off the table. The thought of the convergence coming down upon the Babylonians in the woods tethers his broken mind to the very chair he sits down in. Tell me the truth. Are your people watching us? No, it's just us. What about you? Did you bring soldiers? No. So we're on a common understanding. Yes. Why did you freak out? Was it a trap? Not wanting to reveal himself, Forrest nods his head. I'm psychological in that way. That's why you should be part of the New World Order. I'm not going to give you up easily. You're my only shot to success. And you're scared of us, aren't you? That's why we're negotiating. Scared? Why would I be scared? Because we're the first civilization you've encountered. You don't have any idea of our history, and you don't know what happens behind our walls. The same should go for you, right? I'm not going to blindly accept something I disagree with. Listen, we're on the brink of war. We need to avoid car- You killed Alexander! End of story! Just come back with me to San Francisco so we can- <coughs> Forrest flips the wooden table over, causing a nice to react in surprise. The table breaks into splinters, which fly in every direction across the room. Do you have any idea of the terror you've brought upon us? Do you have any idea how strong we are because of what we've experienced? Every Babylonian is their own leader. They lead by respecting me. That's why they're so easy to manipulate. My people don't want anything to do with your people. We want to stay as far away from you as possible, but you won't let us. War is inevitable with your approach to this situation. United launches towards the king, clutching his fist. One blow strikes Forrest's stomach, and another pierces his jaw. Broken teeth fall to the muddy earth as the monarch stumbles backwards, colliding with the rock wall behind him. The ensuing pain sends the king to his knees, and he spits out clumps of blood. The crimson liquid seeps into the mud, drying and darkening the area of its previous existence. I wanted you! The president cries out, taking on the role of a judgmental om omniscient father. You left me no choice! Holding his bleeding mouth, the king whimpers regretfully, Where do we go from here? Thirty minutes later, Ignatius returns to a camp that's a few miles from the fort. Here, the acolytes file in and out of tents, stack wooden boxes on top of each other, and warm up by kindling campfires. Some roast game over the open flames. Others just stare with uncertainty into the fleeting embers. He remembers what he told Forrest, accepting his personal dishonesty and labeling himself as a liar. In one of the tents, he finds Marissa sitting alone on the bottom bunk. Her red hair dangles over her eyes, and she gazes solemnly at her only experience with true love. Well, she pleads, it's done. What did he say? The president shakes his head. He's insane. He doesn't want to listen to reasons. Do you know what we do to those kind of people? He's left me no choice but to fall back on the inevitable. He told me that people are out for blood. We have to be too. What about the families that don't want to be part of it? The children? We'll throw them in the pits. We'll need to utilize to its fullest potential. He turns to leave, but a questioning force stops him. Marissa? Where did you pick this place? Out of all other possibilities. I had a revelation here. And that is? You'll know soon enough. Can I ask you something? Why did you bring guns to negotiate peace? Because I knew how this was going to end. Nidus exits the town, basking in the glory of the camp's progress. They'll have the fort operational in no time, that's for sure. By whatever means it took Marissa to find this place, he's internally grateful for it. He watches, he watches as acolytes pry open the wooden crates, feeling an endless surplus of ammunition. The bullets range from .5 calibers to 5.56x45 mm natos, some of which can, uh, contain guns, mo most of which are from military outposts. It took years to scavenge these supplies. San Francisco doesn't have a gunman like Timothy. That's our only disadvantage, the president figures. A cold breeze flows through the woods, sending colorful leaves flying past his field of vision collecting in piles after their landings. The crisp smell of autumn lingers in the air, reminding the president of an innocent childhood experience. Making apple cider, he's perverted it in this nature, thinking about something so nostalgic in the time of an impending crisis. He walks through the camp, approaching his black car. A thin layer of frost forms on the glass surface, and he brushes the sheets off before entering the vehicle. Pulling his key up, he slips it into the ignition, twists it, and shivers as warm air blasts through into his face. The engine travels beneath him, and he grips the steering wheel tightly as he pulls away from the sight. 
That night, he detours through the ruins in Northern California. The gas meter display is an almost empty tape, so he slows down, pulls over, and parks on the side of a crumbling road. He opens the dashboard, retrieving a flashlight and a siphon hose. Getting out of the car, he coils the hose around his shoulder and flicks on the flashlight. He moves to the trunk, opening it and grabbing a jerry can. Turning around, he waves the flashlight's beam over a dense pile of 20 yards away. He approaches the melting vehicles, no one will find gas. Fuel isn't hard to find, nobody thinks about scratching these cars anymore, but they're just relics of a distant time. He opens the fuel filter of a DeLorean, settling down the flashlight and jerry can before probing the hole within the siphon hose. He wraps his mouth around the other end of the hose and begins sucking fuel out, spitting into the jerry can. He almost swallows the gasoline at several points, wincing at every close call. Once he has a decent amount, he stops, picking everything up, and carries it back over to the car. He sets everything in its pot for place and fills the empty tape. After he finishes, he returns the jerry can to the trunk, climbs into the driver's seat, and drives off into the unknown. While driving down a collapsing interstate, he ponders on strange thoughts as he gazes through the windshield. Why did Marissa say that about her revelation? How is she capable of keeping such complex secrets when she tells him everything? Now that she's seemingly through with the habit, it makes him feel uneasy. Like there's a disturbance in a system that has aimless goals, patterns, and purpose. He figures shrugging, off is, shrugging it off is healthier, so he turns his focus onto the road. Potholes and withering asphalt with weeds and shrubs growing from their cracks. What is he going to tell his people? How is he going to present it? In the early hours of the morning, the sun's rays glow over the horizon, appearing to vibrate on molecular levels. The car approaches San Francisco's gate as a gentle fog settles over the Golden Gate Bridge. The night stops the car as those impenetrable iron bars swing outward, like the entryway to some violent, undiscovered sin. The gatekeeper rushes out to the vehicle, stopping the pound on the driver's seat window. Side window. Nervous, the president rolls it down. Nidus, the cultist gasps. Alcatraz is burning. What? He shrieks. The acolyte appears as if he's recalling the death of her, his mother. It's happening so fast. One moment's quiet now. A distant explosion alarms Ignitus, and he speeds past the gatekeeper, ignoring the screaming pleads to stop, to take a breath, to handle the situation logically. There's no time for that now. There's no time for anything. He drives through panicking crowds, which simmer down upon his arrival. They bask in his presence like a reptile basking in warm light. He reaches Lombard Street, watching the island in terror as flames engulf the uh, minting facility. Ignitus! screams Wendell, a prominent artist. I got one! The president turns around, spotting Wendell with a Babylonian prisoner in cuffs. He approaches the pair, feeling pretty for the teenage inmate. What's his name? Wes! The president mumbles. I'm the one who did this. Wendell rolls his eyes. He thinks he's a hotshot! I just think he's a pussy! Take him to my palace, the president demands, sounding like a businessman. Do the same with the other Babylonians we find. We aren't going to kill them. Have any escapes? No, but the confusion is prolonging the wind! Good, Wes grunts. The president gr grins. Put that bastard in my room and stand guard until I get back. In the middle of this? Wendell screams. Are you questioning me? Do I need to denounce your membership? Master, I'm sorry. That's what I like to hear. Get going. Don't disappoint me. Several days earlier, Helen approaches Fink as he works on a broken generator. She admires his determination towards the learning process. He knows so much now that he's been doing it for a few weeks. Has it really been that long already? The ride's distracting her this much already. Imagine the time she won't feel during the event. Hey, she whispers. I have some bad news. About? Nidus. He's meeting with Forrest in Oregon one week. When he leaves, it's going to be a big farewell. Where'd you hear this? <laughs> SanFrancisco.com. Do you know how dishonest the people are there? It's probably just a rumor. Well, it's the only lead I have. Then we'll take it. How's Wes doing? He's spreading the news. The job's almost done. Good. I'll get word out to the slaves in the city. When this place goes up, it'll be the signal. They distract the army while we get our asses out of the island. We're just using them. No, we'll find the army too. The owner of the mining minting facility, Dewey, purchased their section of the powerhouse, and they quiet down. He always wears this stale, emotionless expression that disgusts Helen to the core. He wears a black suit, different from the usual accolade attire. He wants to stand out, to show some sort of authority over the people beneath him. 
hears himself like a speaker at high school debate, with his back straight, hiding the insecurities of a troublesome past. His mouth hangs open with a burning cigar protruding from one corner. The ashes float softly to the ground with every puff. How are things going? He asks slightly. Helen stands tall against his mask behind me. You know how the power is, huh? We're working hard to get the grid back and running. We'd appreciate it if you have to get time to focus. Dewey blows a cloud of smoke into her face. That's not an excuse. Do you know how fragile our economy is? If that building isn't back along within an hour, you'll hear back from Marissa. Fink stops working on John's conversation. We're on the steel every hour of the day. If you have a problem with that tank, we'll take it to Marissa. Dewey slaps the miner. Don't you dare talk to me that way. You are a prisoner, nothing more. Fink rubs his, Fink rubs his bruising cheek. All you do is cower behind a shadow. Collecting himself, Dewey walks away, clearly wanting to scream. You shouldn't have done that, Helen states dreadfully. You're starting a lot of drama before you real shit gets started. I don't like how he's threatening you. It doesn't matter now, just focus on the work today, okay? You got it. We can't have close calls like that anymore. We'll go back to the mainland to get more copper wire. That night in cell block B, West Preston hoists himself into the top bunk serving the altitudes in the cell house from the confines of his hovel. The guards in the elevated gun galleries hold their pump-action rifles closely to their chests. A strange, unsettling emotion lingers in the atmosphere, one that's comparable to the ominous, um, ominous nature of fog settling over a vast, endless plane of existence. He waits until the guards change shifts to flip over his pillow, revealing a thin slit with stuff pouring out of it. He reaches into the cup, pulling out a blank sheet of paper and pencil like how an ancient shrine pulls out the still-beating heart of their victims. Examining the pen, he realizes the, me the mechanism is man's true enemy, not a sword. Where you can communicate without being caught, uproots this truth. Taking a deep breath, he figures he has ten minutes to collect and catalog his thoughts. But that's how long it takes before the new guards get here. He writes, Helen. The word is out. Every prisoner is on our side. Even the mentally unstable ones from cell block D. All we need now are your people on our side on our blueprints. How many of them are here? Will slaves listen to them? These questions still ring through my mind, and I doubt they'll disappear before I get an answer. The Babylonians are holding on. I don't know how, but we're doing it. Every time I look at their faces, I feel desolation. I want them to feel the sun again, while walking in a valley, not within the walls of a cement courtyard. I don't know if this plan will work or not, but I'm doing my part. I did my part. It's time for others to do the same. The cell door opens, and his heart rate spikes, but it falls back to normalcy after a guard shoves Fink into the hovel. Wes quickly hides the pen and paper, and the guard slips away, unseen by everyone. I got some news from Helen, Fink says with a beaming grin. Wes folds up and hands up to the miner. What is it? Fink retreats the paper and slides in his pocket. Night is in forest meeting in a week. That's when we strike. Wes stuffs the pen back into the pillow. What about the army? Helen will have the numbers by then. I believe in her. Fink rests a hand on Wes's shoulder. I know belief doesn't put a nail in the coffin, but what others do we have to do to rely on it? I know you're scared. I am too. I look at those Babylonians and I smell the blood that's coming. But when it does, we can't let it all come from us. That's why we have to be ready when we do this. What if that asshat Dewey finds out? What if I told the wrong person? As far as I'm concerned, Dewey is in the water. People could be working for him. God, I'm such an idiot. No, you're hopeful. That's the king of approach we need. Wes smiles and hugs Fink. Thank you. He steps back. Why do leaders have to act like this? Why do we get in these situations? Because we're better than them. It feels like I'm in a cave again. I know. That's why I haven't been getting sleep. He captured us when we were going back to Babylon. When it all happened, I thought it was completely over. It's hard to be a good person now, Wes admits. Everything you do to survive makes you feel bad. Babylon is for the good. That's all I know. And it's the comfort I need. It helps me cope with the things I've done. Do you think for us the good? I believe the monarch here can't take us. They foster us. Yes, they're good. In the elevated gun galleries, new guards replace the old ones. Fink and Wes talk in whispers. Like the other prisoners, there's no point in risking getting caught, especially with Dewey in charge. The air, the air is thick with an ominous nature. The expressions the guards wear show that they know something horrible is right around the corner. Wes notices this, and he feels an intense wave of fear. Did a mole rat him out? Is there any hope now? The way the guards hold their rifles makes the kids shiver. They give them stale glares, as if the truth hides from just beneath their pupils. For whatever reason, the guards don't act on their suspicious suspicions, like a toxic parent waiting for the right moment to embarrass their kids. 
You're paranoid, Fink states. Yeah, no shit, I have every right to be. It's consuming you, kid. You have to let go of that fear. Wes hoists himself to the top bunk. There's nothing to let go of. He keeps his eyes open. I miss Babylon. Fink lays down on the bottom bunk. I do too. I miss the smells, the music, the security. How will I know when Ignatius leaves? He's preparing some big farewell. I wouldn't expect anything less from somebody of his caliber. Wes, I have to find Anna. When we get out, she's still alive. Do you really believe that? I'm not believing she's dead until I see a party. Wes turns his head, laying on his side. I used to have more... Wes turns his head, laying down his side. I used to have more siblings in the world. Before Marilyn found us, we had 12 people in our family. The world is a crazy place. Anything can happen at any point in time. It's jungle law. Even when you run into a mobile clan, you'll have to retain suspicion. It can be murderers, rapists, murderers, rapists, or worse. You have to compensate for all of this. When one of us would go missing, we, we, we wouldn't look for that. We just assumed the worst because it was easier than finding the truth. Where's that? I know, it's a bad mindset, but that's just how I was raised. That's not Babylon. We look for who we lose. We need them, and she needs you. She doesn't even know me. She will if you save her with me. I can't think. Wes closes his eyes, holding the memories of the shadows close to his heart. In the city, Helen moves beneath the dark, blank night. Tonight, the sky is void of any stars. Planets and the shadow of a new moon hangs high above her head. The homeless huddle by fires, their, fi their flames towering above a metal drum. Nobody glances at her. Nobody knows her. She's the perfect person for this job. Passing by oinks by Onyx Cathedrals, churchgoer worships Ignitus, performing queer animal sacrifices in his name. Is this how we're supposed to honor the people above us? Is there any need for such a heinous pastime? She wonders how they're all under his spell. Does it come back to a simple need for someone's search for a person with courage? Does Ignitus even have any courage? It's like their loyalty to the president rests on a subconscious level, like the loyalty is a dark, poisonous gene pool in San Francisco's DNA. She walks up to the arching front doors with a manor with white spotless walls. Behind it lies a, a surgeon's uh, sugarcane plantation, her true desire. The rooftop of small slave shacks protrude from the blooming fields, and white men on horseback tramp by, keeping their people in line. The strange thing is that some of the slaves are white, making San Francisco's racism problem a huge static gray issue floating above the net. Ether of corruption. She knocks on the oaken doors and steps back, waiting for the man in charge, Tompkins. The doors swing open, revealing the ornate lifestyle of the upper class. Tompkins stands tall, confident, ready to tackle whatever she's going to, she's about to give him. Hello, he says politely. Good evening. I'm here to speak to Lillian. About? The sugar canes of the lie. I read we're doing poor, and I want to show her something that can help. You don't think I have it under control? Do you know anything about agriculture? Irrigation? Listen, lady, I just watch over them. I'm no farmer. This isn't our work. He steps inside. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. She walks out the manor's back door, successfully entering the plantation's grounds. The sharp odor of manure mixes with a calm fragrance of spice. She wanders through the blooming fields, approaching the closest wooden shack. Its front door is missing, and the roof is about to cave in. Nobody fixes it, for the maltreatment of these slaves resembles the characteristics of somebody who abuses animals. She steps into a human structure, finding Lillian crumbling on a torn mattress. Mold grows over its surface, like how mycelium covers miles of ground beneath our feet. Lillian! Helen starts. I have an offer. Lillian glances up at her through tears. Wiping her eyes, she stands up and hugs the frizzy-haired traitor. What is it? Helen backs away and glances over her shoulder, making sure nobody's there. She whispers, her voice barely audible above a blast of wind. There are prisoners on Alcatraz that want to escape. They're planning a ride as we speak, and I need your help. Lily nods. Why did you have to come to me at first? Out of all the slaves that have influence, you're the leading woman to me. Lily blushes. How can we help? The traitor smirks. I admire your eagerness. In the night of a nice departure, I need you. Fill up the others to lead a rebellion against the army. Kill as many as you can. Your signal will be Alcatraz's flames. Lillian's face flashes from flashes red, uh, from rose red to ghost white, like the mercury in a thermometer when the weather transforms from warm to cold. Helen, I can't kill people. I'm not like that. The traitor heart races. Please, I need you to hear me out. You haven't given me a chance to explain the second part. Fine, go ahead. Then? 
from what I've been hearing, the prisoners are from a kingdom called Babylon. This event succeeds. We can escape and go there. They really told you that. Well, not exactly, but I'm going to convince the leading men, West and Fink. Merlin wanders slums of the city, the moonlight casting a white glow over brick brownstones. He passes fields of solar panels, pondering on a way out of this situation. The meeting isn't going to end well. Why forced and ignites of doing this is foreign to the teacher. If conflict unfolds, it's going to be hell on earth. How will it even play out? Will civilians on both sides commit? What about the innocent? He gazes up at the twinkling sky, thinking about the first day he met Echo. He still doesn't remember how cold the tunnel felt. All those hands reaching out from broken car windows, with shards of glass protruding from their knuckles. He, cl he smells the crimson fumes of blood, turning his memories to the first day in the Seattle camp. Is that anything different now? The Jews' death amount to nothing? In the distance, he hears a train's horn. Trains in the city don't run at this hour, so this spurs his curiosity. He follows the sounds, reaching a concrete train station that's built onto the east wall. Its design mimics Grand Central Station, complete with an atmosphere of quickly shifting schedules and stresses. It holds the aura of a broker late for a new day on Wall Street. He enters the building through grand, barred doors beneath a columned roof. The open interior gives way to a spacious emotion. In the daytime, the traffic in this place must be a nightmare. Blank figurines of acolytes stand behind ticket booths, souls devoid of meaning, a true display of capitalism. He watches as a steam engine pulls in from the wild. When it stops, the boxcar's doors slide open, revealing slaves and cuffs. Acolytes shove them from, acolytes shove them from their compartments, and they beat the weakest arrivals. Upon further inspection, Maryland discovers a map of the west coast covering the ceiling right above his head. Red polka dots cover the names of towns and cities of San Francisco. In Washington, a blue one encases Seattle. Exiting the station, he returns to a palace and finds Ignatius in Athena's chamber, dangling a live mouse over her beak. When the door closes, Ignatius drops the mouse. The eagle devours it whole. What did you tell me about the other communities? Marilyn demands. Ignatius turns, his pointed hood striking his eye in Marilyn's heart. I didn't think I had to. How far does this go, Nidus? We have twenty feet we have twenty five communities with an art control. Why was Babylon marked? The president smirks. You saw that? Good. Just means that Babylon is a work in progress. Marilyn, during times like these, you have to stick to your rhetoric. That's what being a president is all about. Before I went into office, before I got my cabinet, I told the people we conquer more territory to strike in our city and our dominance over others. Stuck to my word, I'm going to stick to it. Nothing is going to change. Where would the Babylonians go in case something helps on Alcatraz? I remember you saying you'd prepare for every possible contingency. Comstock is where the west of the west go. You have a cabinet? My inner circle. Nidus, that isn't democracy. Your cabinet can be over the richest people. It is democracy! God damn it! It's our version of it! Merlin's heart races. Aren't you thinking about how much damage this future conflict will cause? What if they raid San Francisco? What if you're in over your head? Doesn't matter! I have an agenda, bye bye, you're just starting to sound like a damn rebel! Did I make a mistake when I invite you into my own fucking house to live? Merlin hangs his head. Why do it have to be me? Your intelligence is valuable here. You're going to play an important part in our victory. You know everything about Babylon. I thought you were negotiating for peace. The people need to think that. I'm just doing this to see what force is like. I know you care about people here, but sometimes in life, you just have to let go of the ones you love the most. My king has killed more than 3,000 people. I just want to know that you don't say the wrong thing to set him off. The teacher crosses over to the chamber's door. I'll see you in the morning. In his room, Marilyn basks in the blankness of a note. Pen in hand, he wanders about how he can describe his idea. He realizes it's futile, sneaking out of the palace and back to the train station. He jots down every detail a ceiling map provides for him, and then he writes the letter that can save countless innocent lives. The week progresses very slowly, and everyone feels the milliseconds drip in and out of basic comprehension. One morning, Marilyn finds homing pigeons surrounding a water fountain. Orphans, f orphans feed them bird seed and slices of stale bread. He remembers hearing stories from the American Civil War when spy rings would deliver messages with hidden codes written in invisible ink. An idea forms in his head, and he returns to the empty palace, in the endless backyard in an apple orchard, the perfect in incentive for birds to come back to their houses. He goes back to the city, finding a hardware store. 
Inside, ro robot cashiers help with acolytes check out items. Shelves upon shelves of tools and plywood await the beholder, providing them with the eerie experience of post-apocalyptic, fully functioning economy. Since Maryland's an elite, he doesn't have to pay for anything, so he snatches whatever he finds useful and makes a round trip to the orchard. Here, he, bu he begins building a birdhouse. Elsewhere, Helen converses with the slaves about the night of the riot. On the island, things get worse for the inmates. Dewey's strict schedules take away all possible sleeping hours, and the guards become increasingly reckless. They stop hiding in the gun galleries and roam the corridors in groups, as if they belong to a military parade. The guards break into cells regularly to beat inmates with chains, whips, flat irons, and hammers. You'd hear the rhythmic sound of breaking bones and ensuing screams. If there isn't any blood drawn by lunchtime, the prisoners consider it a good day. On the day of the riot, Wes and Fink remind each other of the plan. There are many historical locations on the rock. For example, the docks, where the ferry rests. Building 64, where the acolytes live. The water tower and lighthouse, sniper's nests. The officer's club, the powerhouse, and the cell house, and the laundromat. Within the cell house itself are four cell blocks, A, B, C, and D. The final one is comparable to maximum security or solitary confinement. Ironically, that's where the riot will begin. And this goes down. We have to get to the army, Wes instructs. It's going to be a lot of fighting to... But we're going to have to push through, but we have to get those weapons. Unless we pick someone on the way there, Fink suggests. How will we do that, Wes asks. I'm just thinking about other options. This is the only option we have. Twenty minutes pass and a power outage consumes the island. Fink and Wes watches as the cell doors open and the prisoners flow into the corridors. Guards in cell block D try containing the crowds, but the uncontrollable nature of those inmates is too much for even a military commander to control. These prisoners have an endless spectrum of illnesses, from insanity to PTSD. Fink and Wes join the ensuing mass gathering of orange jumpsuits, and they let out their rage against the machine. Prisoners, ga prisoners gang up on a group of acolytes, easily overpowering them without guns. The blasts of bullets echo off rusty metallic walls, and the smell of gunpowder replaces the salty fumes of the bay. People throw each other over guardrails. Grenades explode in an effort to stun opponents, and flashbangs blind several unfortunate victims. By midnight, the prisoners gain access to the admin block, where the armory is. Fink le leads West by the hand through bloody scenes which conjure an unknown level of evil. They almost die at several points. West almost gets shot in the arm, but an unarmed Babylonian saves him. The guard tackles Fink, but West kills the attacker by breaking the neck. The pair uses the distraction of violence to separate from the brawl. They slip into a dark hallway, where the flame of flames of torches illuminate the compact space. The Babylonians reach a simple wooden door, and this arouses suspicions. Why aren't there any guards or booby traps here? Keeping this in mind, Fink wraps his trembling fingers around an oaken handle. And West steps aside as it opens. Nothing happens. The distant sounds of rebellion give them chills. Wasting no time, they enter the small chamber, gawking as the stockpiles of weaponry. Assault rifles, shotguns, pistols, grenades of all sorts, and canisters and mustard gas too line the walls. Boxes of ammunition rest beneath the shelves, right, right, next, to, right next to body armor and plating. This is too easy. They think it's a trap as they don themselves in military-grade equipment. Fink loads an M16 whilst West cocks a 12-gauge shotgun. Your shoulder will be blown away by the recoil, Fink ex exclaims. You need a smaller gun. I can handle it. Wes, I... An explosion in the hallway sends the tips of their guns pointing toward the armory's entrance. When they see a wave of inmates, they lower their rifles and rejoice. Outside, rows of acolytes from Building 64 march down the pathway. But the prisoners are too quick and begin firing before they do. Wes and Fink stand at the back of their team, carrying below a stray bullets zipping above their heads. Bodies pile on top of each other on both sides, and they become barricades for the survivors. There's a break during the stand, and the prisoners push through it after setting off mustard gas. The most capable push through the confusion towards the Solace's front doors. Fink and West barely hold on to their sanity. They frantically scratch at their throats and wipe their teary eyes, gasping as they charge through the entrance into fresh air. Here, the powerhouse erupts in the flames. Fink whirls around, gazing up at the erupt blaze. The night sky flashes with reds and oranges. Everyone on the island feels that distant heat. Black plumes of smoke fall upon the bay, covering in a cloud of darkness. From the mainland, they hear gunfire. West smiles, knowing the slaves are paying attention. Fink grabs the kid by the arm, and they hold on to their guns as they press through the fog. 
The riot continues all around them. They dodge tra traumatizing firefights, several more burning buildings, and listen to the shrieks of an unknown victim. The pair rejects participating, for they only have one location in mind, the docked ferry. Snipers in the nest surrounding the island fire off deadly rounds. A bullet strikes the dirt in front of Wes's feet, and other grazes Fink's chest, and another grazes Fink's cheek. They wonder if the snipers have thermal scopes, or if they're just spraying and praying. Exhaustion eventually consumes everyone. The fight drowns the island in sweat and blood. A dark reenactment of Atlantis. Guards corner Wes, Fink, and several other prisoners near Building 64. They surround the small group, beating them down with the butts of their weapons. Bullets strike down the inmates' opponents, and from the fog emerges Dewey, holding an MP-35. Fink climbs to his trembling feet. Who are you? Dewey shoves him aside. Just go, I don't... I have no need to explain myself. And just as mysteriously as he appeared, he vanishes. Wes climbs to his feet. We got to get to that ferry! Can't waste any more time! Fink glances over his shoulder, watching the empty space behind him, hoping for an answer to come out of this cosmic nonsense. Wes scans the bickering group of surviving prisoners. He shouts over the blast. Do any of you know how to pilot a boat? A female prisoner steps forward. Good, we need you! When they get to Alcatraz's ferry, the riot's almost over. Fink stares in awe as the blooming destruction. Gunfire fires away in this region like how the ocean's waves roll back into the world after kissing the shore. Nobody won this battle. Everyone's either dead or dying. Behind them, on the mainland, the survivors face bigger problems. Facing the slave rebellion. Wes grabs Fink's shoulder. We have to... We let them to die! Fink shrieks. No, joining us was their decision. We can't save everyone. We aren't heroes. Fink backs away from the kids, storming onto the ferry. We aren't! The survivors watch the island as they drift into the cold, shark-infested bay. Fink spots the rem remnants of the minting facility, and a horrible realization dawns on them. There's no going back from conflict. What they're doing will bury the hatchet between these strange societies who are already uncomfortable with the other's existence. Babylon is now Juliet, after her suicide. As the, as the buildings turn to ash, so does the hope for peace. They ruin San Francisco's money supply. They're akin to terrorists. Are they really good people? Is that even real anymore? Fink turns his thoughts toward Helen. Before leaving, he has to find her, so he set her on the right path. Then he can find Anna. What about Wes, though? What is sending that kid down this reckless path? Fink remembers how merciless, merciless he was during the fray. A normal kid shouldn't act like that. Even after it collapsed of civilization, he figures the best option would be to bring the boy into the wild, so that neither of them die for a larger conflict that clearly want no part of. Fink, er Fink gazes down at the waves, exam examining his reflection in the rippling surface. Who is he? They dock the ferry at the mainland. Dismounting the boat, the survivors charge into the encompassing madness. Plumes of flames and smoke suffocate dying acolytes and slaves. Distant bullets ring through the night. At any moment, one of those blasts can be for them. Anxiety chokes out hope as they push through the disarray. Craters from bombs poke it out the roads as if the scene is an aftermath of a Vietnam battle. The world is dangerous once again. They're devolving back into surviving through fear. The worst part is, it's their own faults yet again. They say history repeats itself until you learn from it. Somewhere in the confusion, Fink bumps into Merlin, knocking the teacher on his ass. Fink remembers him and he, and he helps the fallen Babylonian to his feet. Thank God! Marilyn explains. What the fuck is happening? Fink grabs the teacher's arm. Come on, we have to find Wes! I lost him! I'm sorry, I can't go with you. Fink feels like Fang. What? Marilyn reaches into his pants pockets and produces a note. Take this to Forrest. It will help with whatever you're planning. Expect more deliveries once I train my homing pigeons. Fink hesitantly retrieves the note. What are you going to do now? Marilyn vanishes. I'm finding Initus! The battle flickers and wanes like the last flashes of candlelight. The only separation between its birth and its death lies in its perspective of its observer. Whatever remains of the Babylonians, prisoners or slaves, gets thrown into Initus' palace. Hours of confusion follow. Hours of hopelessness, unknowingness, and self-pity. Marilyn finds himself in the palace, watching over the prisoners in handcuffs. Once again, he's left questioning his beliefs. Is it the Babylonians he's fighting for, or some other ridiculous cause? The president emerges from the other side of some blazing torch. Do you know, do you find that you were looking for? He 
He, he gestures towards the crowd of cowering, shivering, cold unknowns. Is this what you really wanted, Marilyn? I knew I didn't want this. But Zama, we're here. I just go in to accept it. What are you going to do with them? We ship him off to a work camp, the president singles out west. However, I don't know what I'm going to do with that piece of shit yet. What concerns Marilyn the most is that he's worrying more about San Francisco's forthcoming issues. How can they recover from such a loss? The entire economy is in shambles. Somebody's going to have to put it all back together somehow, and God knows he won't be the one to do it. For some odd reason, the, the image of the painting pops back into his mind. The one by Delacroix. One simple phrase follows. War is now. Sometime later, Dewey bumps into Ignatius in the crowding palace. The economist pulls the president aside. We need to talk. But what? Where have you been? Why aren't you putting out fires? This is a more dire issue. Other communities have overpopulation issues. That's what the pen is for. We can do some house cleaning, but they'll have to stay here for a while. We have to put the economy first. No, a democracy first. If we don't deal with our foreign issues, we don't have an economy to fix. Economy drives democracy. United grunts. Fine, how long will it take? Four weeks to rebuild the minting facility, and we'll go from there. Ignatius spits on the ground. You disgrace me. How many men did we lose? I... I don't know. I just saw bodies everywhere on the way here. What happened on Alcatraz? The Babylonians started the riot. They took the ferry. I had to get there by a raft. Do you know anything else? No. Dewey responds, staring hopelessly at the crowd in cuffs. But do you have anything for me? Nice looks confidently into the economist's soul. Dewey, if there's anything I can confirm, it's that we will have our revenge. They won't know when it's coming, but it will come. They can't think he won't respond. We have to. If there's anybody I could promise, it's that we will win this war and we'll conquer them, just like how we conquer everybody else. Somewhere on the back of his mind, all he sees is the same painting. Chapter 6 I Hear Voices The morning glow casts a heavenly range of vibrancy over the farmlands. Forrest strolls through the gusts of manure-rich wind, gawking in appreciation at the peacefulness. His hair is short, the beginning signs of a beard spring from his face. Less scars and bruises cover his skin. The experience of life less apparent in the surface features. The year is 1963, making it almost 13 years since the blackout. The king ponders on this, traveling along a dirt road right up to the facade of a construction project. Babylonians surround the wooden skeleton, driving nails through plywood. The smell of work, the imminent noises of progress. Marilyn emerges from the workers. What do you think? It looks like shit. What is it? It's a schoolhouse, he declares with a beaming smile. The people are finally going to have a sanctuary to learn, to develop intellectually. This could be an entire movement for society. This is the start of how life should be. Do you think it'll be successful? No! You shouldn't have wasted this time on such a useless project. The schoolhouse? We just have to wait and see. The kids here are so lost, but who could blame them? They're not the only ones that are lost. Most of the adults are too. Including you. Please come to the first class. I'll see. Being lost is a strength. I think being lost is a strength. Is it, Forrest? When you're lost, you have to go to extreme lengths to protect yourself. Your sanity. Is that why you kill your own people? To protect your sanity? I do it to preserve this. Babylon is in a world for criminal for Babylon is in a world for criminals. It's a world for a second chance. There's no better version of a second chance than one for mercy, Marilyn gazes at the structure. There's a quote from Dante's Inferno. The path to heaven begins in hell. Maybe we had to experience what we did at the beginning to experience this. Forrest watches the growing grass alongside the schoolhouse. The blades brush against the plywood, and he hears the distant whispers in his head. God, how they haunt them. How are you and Echo? We're doing good. She told me you guys were trying to get pregnant. I wish you the best of luck. We've been trying for a while, Forrest admits. It's not her fault she can't get pregnant. It's just something I have where it's ineffective. You'll get there one day. Just keep trying. The foreman calls Marilyn back to the site. I'll see you soon. Now, more than 20 years later, Forrest finds himself standing on a bridge. The 
Babylonians stand proudly before their king, donning themselves in iron armor, and their scabbards, swords ready to kill with one slice, and their holsters, sideburns, across their chests, salt rifles. They all carry rucksacks over their backs, each containing wide varieties of provisions. Heather and Forrest wear golden armor, indicating their leadership. The golden color glistens in the sun's rays, rectifying a source of hope. Birds wake up in the surrounding woods, tweeting away in incomprehensible language. The king basks in this aura, where he feels at peace with himself. For once, the voices are gone. He clears his throat, facing, his na facing the nationalistic crowd. This is it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. If what Marilyn said in his letter is true, then this is our chance to free the stolen. Marilyn is still on our side. That's what matters most. The Babylonians erupt in cheers. A glistening grin forms on Heather's face. When the train reaches the 50-yard line, that's when we abandon the bridge. We'll go down to the woods, and Heather will take this thing down. We do this today. Victory is ours. We can't think of this as good, but necessary for the progress of our nation, our integrity, and our intellect. We are the founders of the next world, so let's make that point clear. The train comes into view, and they evacuate the area, following the king's instructions. Obedience is the true victor in any war, no matter how big or small, and Babylon's only order is to obey the monarchy. Do they stand a, do they stand a chance against this rising tide? Can they really prevail under tensions within their walls? What will the aftermath consist of? These questions flow through the minds of these volunteers as they wait in silence for Heather's wrath. She produces a small remote with a red button from a rucksack, and staring deeply at the bridge, listens for the right moment. It comes to her in the form of a train's whistle, so she presses the button, watching in amazement as a piece of architecture collapses into dust within mere seconds before her eyes. The steam engine crashes headfirst into the pile of debris, and the Babylonians observe this moment carefully as the train's boxcars fly off the rails, injuring several prisoners and acolytes inside. The Babylonians remain in hiding. They're patient and watchful of the quickly unfolding events. They're observers of their own creation, but as the dust settles, they come to understand that there is no time for observing. Grenades fly out of the boxcars' opening doors, sending the Babylonians back 30 feet. The knights fall to their stomachs as explosions send trees toppling over. The acolytes limp through the confusion, firing off their guns. Bullets ricochet off breastplates, striking different targets. The Babylonians commence their opposition, withstanding the blows of a thousand emotions from lost comrades. Several knights guard the king, who stares coldly through the scope attachment on his assault rifle. Through the anxiety-ridden moments that divide life and death by a hair, the worst of it comes in the form of reloading your gun. If you aren't fast enough, the cost of predestination is pricey. They all share a common hatred for these moments, the ones that define adrenaline and intensity. When the bullets run out, their desperation forces them to use melee weapons. The Babylonians unseed their swords while the acolytes produce anything with a blade. Forrest decapitates an acolyte, feeling the old rush of murder, but he pauses, feeling something else, snow. He gazes up at the sky for a brief moment, admiring nature's poetic way of telling time. During the ensuing events, he remembers how the wood of the schoolhouse smelt when it was first being built. He remembers a time where everyone was a lot closer than they are now. These new memories cause him to lag in battle. Several Babylonians risked their lives to save him on multiple occasions. The Babylonians win the battle, with casualties on both sides. Force approaches the boxcars, discovering several prisoners suffering from injuries ranging from broken legs to bodies with twisting necks. In one of the cars, he finds a trembling West. Thank God! The kid cries out with a smile upon seeing familiar face. I knew you didn't forget about me! Force pulls him out of the boxcar. We'll give everything here, food and water for the journey back home, but I'm not coming with you. Why? West demands. I need to go to Oregon again. I'm meeting with Marissa. When I leave, you will all wait for me. The kid's mouth hangs open. What the fuck does she have to do with this? Heather approaches them, overhearing their conversation. A lot! If we don't find batteries during this conflict, both of our societies will crumble. I need to tell her before she finds out about the train, Forrest says urgently. There can't be this constant back and forth. At the end of the day, we all have to sleep somewhere. West shakes. West shakes his head. Not these motherfuckers. They don't deserve any pity. We understand. 
We understand that, Heather says in the tone of a manager defending an employee. But, Forrest adds, they deserve something. We can't be reckless. You're not being reckless, West scoffs. No, the king declares, I'm being calculative. Heather lets out a dreadful sigh. Ha! Ah, let's remember our current objective, keeping these ex-prisoners safe. We have to ration out our provisions for now. We can't give all our food without some number system. What do you propose? Forrest asks. Every night before we go to sleep, we count how much food we have left. That way, in the morning, we can hand it out to the people who need it the most. Wes interrupts. So us? What if, what if you starve? We'll have hunting part. We'll have hunting parties, suggests the monarch. People can scout for game. How do you know they're not on the way to the kingdom? West rebuttals. We need you, Forrest. You still have Echo, the king states reassuringly. She's as strong as I am. You can't rely solely on me, especially now. The kid lowers his head. Fine, you're right. Heather puts her fingers in her mouth and whistles. Everybody gather round. The knights and prisoners alike circle around the commander. You all did excellent work today. The people we lost, their sacrifices won't be meaningless. This conflict just drew blood, and at the end of it, we held the knife. We can't give up now. Today seals the future for Babylon. We have to go back there now, so we need to split the party into hunting teams, each consisting of five members. The following day, Forrest leads the party on horseback. Wes and Heather ride along either side of him, in the first defense against a hostile tide. I'm glad we set up that camp, Heather comments. Forrest shrugs his shoulders. I got the idea from Marissa. Heather tilts her head in confusion. What do you mean? The king says grimly. Marilyn also said in this letter that the fort is the Oregon is a stronghold now. Then why the hell would you even consider returning? West screams. Forrest suddenly becomes calm, collecting himself with meditative breathing. Because it's times like these where sacrifices mean something more than life itself. I don't know if I'm going to come back, but I have to talk to her. We can't destroy both of our communities. There needs to be some order in the chaos. Heather shakes her head. I agree with Preston. So much is going on right now that we can't even keep track of. We have the acolytes, Black Death, constant threats of starvation, and it's not even noon. How can we control these things? How can we eliminate them? Is there some pattern to this godforsaken riddle? I have to. I have to. Heather watches as the snow falls to the road. The horses leave trails of prints as they gallop in a strange formation. The flakes glide softly off their armor plating, and the cold wind is almost blinding. If they encounter any blizzards, they're goners. If they step on something hidden beneath the snow, they're goners. What happened to Fink? Wes asks abruptly. He made it to Babylon just under a week. He's in the hospital right now. The kid gasps. Why? Forrest lowers his head. He caught Black Death. In an effort to curb the anxiety of the unknown, the king ponders on a memory during a night in 1965. The doors of Maryland's schoolhouse opened for the first time, and a large group of kids and adults containing the monarchy enter the building. They rush to empty wooden desks and sit down, basking in the room's simplicity. Bookshelves line the walls. Moonlight beams through the window panels, glazing everything beneath a white, ghoulish glow. The smell of nearby crops adds an indescribable, rejuvenating freshness to the aura. Marilyn stands high and proud behind a large, glistening desk made of oak. Behind him, a giant blank chalkboard. He writes on it in all capital letters, A-R-E-S. Now, he says, laying down the piece of chalk, does anybody know who Aris is? Any idea? Silence. Come on, it's like you guys weren't taught anything. Cheap laughter. Coughs. Anyway, Ara is the... Oh, I mean, Ares is the Greek god of war. Why do I bring this up? Because it appears to me that our world was wrapped in his wrath. We were at his mercy. Vietnam, Russia, assassins, the Red Scare, all of these things has war written all over it. Why do we experience these things? Why do we have to cope with the aftermath that's so visible to this day? 
Why was there so much fear? Well, here's the stinger. We're supposed to learn from it. I will not teach you anything until you understand that I am not the teacher. Logic and understanding history will be our only guides, our fountains of refugees. Forrest doesn't listen. The atmosphere around him throws his memories into a time when he was in school. They don't come from nostalgic roots. They grow from the childhood nightmares of the teachers beating him with wooden mallets or ins insults. The voices trickle into his mind like how a droplet of rain splits into rivulets after colliding with Earth's surface. Her humble whispers turn into intense, glass-shattering cries that sound like the realization of some incomprehensible truths. His vision wraps through involuntary understanding and visualizing the natural patterns of our universe. The Fibonacci sequence, a pattern of numbers increasing by the sum of their predecessors, speaks to him as if it's its prophet, the glue that binds reality together. He sweats under the pressure of hiding these emotions, eventually breaking and leaping out of the chair into the night. He pauses abruptly on the porch, sitting down on its edge. The door behind him opens, and Echo sits down next to him. What's going on, Forrest? I, uh, I don't know. I just start freaking out. Everything just felt fuzzy. Marilyn's voice sounded like it was fading away. Abruptly, he asks, are you still thinking about kids? Are you? Yes, now it's time to bask in our comfort. Everyone's having children, we should too. Aren't you scared? Echo, we don't have to be scared. We have walls, security, and most importantly, a future worth striving for. I'm not talking about that, I'm wondering if being a father will scare you. We're leading Babylon, how hard could it be? Echo gazes at the encompassing crops. Do you know, do you want to know why we're not married yet and why we're never gonna be? Yes. Before everything happened, the war, the blackout, and the outbreak, I had a boyfriend in Colorado. His name... God, I forgot his name. It was so long ago. Such a nice guy with this ambition you can't find in anyone else. He died because a drunk driver killed him. One moment someone's in your life, the next they're gone. No remorse, no mercy, no holding anything back. He was just gone. I still hold on to these memories. Is there a part of me that I can't forget? No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard it gets, I still see his face, but I can't remember his name. Do you understand any of this pain? You'd be surprised. He climbs to his feet, pulling the queen up at him. Follow me. She giggles. Ah, uh, are we really dishing him? Just follow. Within the blanket of smog covering the industrial district, the monarchy find themselves sitting on the shoreline of Lake Union. They watch the rotating wheels of water mills and smile viciously at the purification plants as they pump clean water for the kingdom. The summer wind blows through the warm, human night, carving out a feeling of blissful ignorance. Echo, Forrest says breathlessly, do you hate that we killed Judas? No, we had to. Do you think leading makes you numb? Just me, specifically? Why not you? I've been numb. She listens to the hypnotic sounds of rolling waves. I do sometimes, but only because I see what you do. I do it. For protection. I know the spiel. Why does it make you numb, do you think? Nobody else has the courage to do it. Do you really think, believe Babylon would be better if we gave our position to Marilyn or Timothy or anyone else? Why do you think nobody's tried assassinating us yet? We have them right where you need them. The obstacles of leading society are so immense and draining. It's like digging through concrete with your bare hands, just accepting and taking the pain. Why did you want to do this with me? Because I love you. Endless days and nights pass over the Babylonians like sand as it blows above miles of naked golden dunes. Food is scarce. The tribes of the wild pick off game right before they can. Wes remembers what it was like in the tunnels. And there's a spe specific feeling he reached when he was in that situation. Feeling so ghastly and terrible. Pending horror. Horror is the only word that barely scratches the surface of witnessing cannibalism. Wes doesn't know if he could experience the emotion again, for the first time almost made him lose his sanity. At some point, Forrest splits off from them. They give him canned food, but nobody follows. It's like they're saying, go, go, right up to the doors of a ticking time bomb. We don't need you when we have rationality. Forrest doesn't know fully why he's doing this, if it's a good idea or not. The only thing he can assure is that he's going to try to keep Babylon safe. Ignitus would do if he was in that situation. While riding through the falling snow, he keeps having these fleeting memories. He worries that the voices are somehow changing these recollections, transforming them into tools to make him weaker. Maybe that's just the paranoia talking, or the anxiety from sleep deprivation. Either way, it's meant to be a distraction. He's not willing to succumb in times like this. Eventually, the king stands gawking at the fort's new implements. 
Boxes of ammunition and guns rest in stacks on the lawns. Tents are set up among the stockpile, and acolytes move in and out of them, working on some unknown project. Cannons rest on top of the fort's roof, aiming outward, appearing vengeful. The workers outside take notice of the king, and they quickly capture and disarm him. Forrest doesn't know why they don't just kill him on sight. That's the whole purpose of this damn thing, right? The captors drag him by the knees into the compound, where other acolytes repair and reinforce the walls. The monarch ends up in front of a lone stone door, with many guns pointing at his back. An acolyte knocks on the door, and Mercer reveals herself. What the hell are you doing here? She cries out, grabbing the king. She pulls him inside, slamming the door shut. We need to negotiate, Forrest states, stabilizing himself. I'm here to offer you an Ignitus ultimatum. What is it? She demands. We fight an organ to co containing the conflict, otherwise both our sides will turn to ash. Marissa chuckles. Ah, do you really think that's going to work after what you people did on Alcatraz? We need to step up to prevent any sort of damage. I'm being diplomatic about this. Please, we can organize this so that neither of us gets hurt. Marissa backs away, rubbing her head. Do you know why we didn't kill you just now? Nice considers you special. He considers all of them special. Timothy, Marilyn, Echo, Heather, he doesn't want to kill you because of that when we win this thing, he's going to train you with any sense of ra ra rationalization. I don't care who wins or who loses, Marissa, but when this thing ends, don't you want something you will return to if your plans go south? Don't you want to be the person who saves the day? Marissa doesn't know how to respond. She thinks of the ones who don't deserve the sea battle, the ones whose innocence bring light to this dark world. What would they do if they didn't have anything? What would they do if they saw their homes in ashes? Her eyes widen, realizing this is what empathy is. She doesn't want their people to suffer any more than they already have to under these times. Okay, she whispers. How are we going to do this? We designate areas and organ as battlefields. We schedule them and we show up. What if one side refuses? If your side refuses, then I'll kill you. If yours does the same, I'll do the same to you. I thought Unitas isn't going to kill me. Exactly, he isn't. Forrest shakes his head. Let's just get back to the main topic. First, I will be Portland. Second, Cannon Beach. The third, Smith Rock State Park. The king's look of surprise amuses her. I'm originally from here. All your life? Up until recently, we began fighting there in two weeks. She extends a hand, showing hints of gratefulness for the first time. Thank you for doing this. Forrest accepts. No unnecessary deaths. No unnecessary deaths. Well, on his way back to the camp, he happens upon a vast black wheat field. Wooden crosses among the useless crops catch his attention. And he can't help but to investigate. He reaches the small clearing, his heart drops upon seeing Timothy, Marilyn, Alexander, Echo, and an older Alice dangling before him for the charred crosses. Age old nails pierce through the palms of their hands and the ankles of their feet. Echo's prosthetic hand is non existent, revealing a bleeding stump. Nidus suddenly appears from Sinerfield. Do you really think that you could save them, Forrest? Do you see the pain you cause? Can you feel the magnitude of historical change? Why do you consistently fail recognizing the truth of who you are? The king closes his eyes. This is real! It's the damn voices! Nidus chuckles. It may not be real now, but it's about to be. Somehow you're going to deal with it. Forrest throws a punch at the hallucination, striking the target's cheek. The president tumbles backward, falling across the cross. He produces a bowie knife from thin air and charges the king, stabbing at the king's heart. The blade effortlessly tears through the monarch's breastplate and pierces his heart. Now he twists the melee weapon, tearing apart Forrest's organs. The king tells himself that it's all imaginary, it's a figment of his imagination. But that's what terrifies him. Whose mind can be this far gone? If they're out there, how can they remain in this physical state without feeling the urge to leave? How do people love him? Nidus leaves the knife, stands up, and kicks Forrest several times in the ribcage, The foe blows making the Babylonian squirm. This is real, cries the president. What can I do to make you believe that it is? You can't. That's how I know this is all fake. The cultist chuckles in a way an insane man would after getting drugs in the hours following an involuntary hiatus. You're making a suicide look like a death. The truth is, Babylon was already failing before me. Do you really not think I don't know what that kind of thing feels like? It's like a tsunami. Forrest, 
Perhaps the society comes on slowly at first, but when the wave hits, that's when your nightmares become a reality. At the point, you realize all societies begin the same way at the end, through fear. Everything disappears in the mystic wintertime weather. Ignitus crosses and forces blood fade away beneath the snowfall. The king remains on the ground, not sure what to make of himself. The snow almost buries him, but he finally stands up out of fear of a hypothermia. The monarch resumes his lonely journey, wondering what causes physical conflict. Is this a need for humans to be part of something changed in their society? Does it all come back to people simply following orders? All Forest can assure from this madness is that at least they have their home now. They can rest easy without the anxiety of waiting for some sort of bombing or blitz. Don't tell them. What? Don't tell anybody about the deal. Why the hell shouldn't I? People have a right to know. Can't you see how much of a power move you have at your hands? If you deny the deal's existence, everyone will be scared. They'll think something will happen and they'll turn to you at the sound of a snapping twig. Don't you want that? Forrest plants his feet into the ground. Their logic is right. Why do you want me to, to help me now? Because we love watching you suffer. Do you really think more manipulation will cause suffering? No, but as the death rate increases, as your responsibilities deplete, that shit will weigh in on you. You'll like it when people venerate you. You'll like it when people get on their knees and chant your name. Imagine seeing all of it die out. That evening, he rides on horseback in the original formation, West and Heather on either side. The snow pelts them as they advance through this harsh, barren climate. A game is impossible to find. The king thinks it's safer to stick together rather than hunt. Nature changes after society's end. Shows the surviving observer how merciless she is, and how spontaneous she can be. Every winter is like this, albeit seems to get colder with every Passover. The horses neigh and cry, and Babylonians shout at each other as to not lose friends. Some are lucky to have lanterns, but even that isn't enough. They seek warmth and escape from the circle of hell, somewhere where they can wrap themselves in woolen coats and sleep away this nightmare. They don't see the sun anymore. A great forecast forever shields its rays from reaching Earth's surface. The entire planet traps them slowly, suffocating the survivors under the pressures of mutating natural conditions. One should never experience conflict at a time where frostbite should be your main concern. With sparse medical equipment to care for such wounds, the forthcoming moments become vague and heartless. The horse proved to be more of a burden than means of transportation. Simply require too much food and attention. It gets to the point where force occasionally puts them down. Two people on a horse become commonplace, and they force themselves to have faith in these beasts. They eat what the king kills, being guilty for consuming an essential need of survival. The party reaches southern Washington, where a past storm has turned everything into pools of ice-covered mud. There aren't any buildings, roads, or signs for humanity in, for miles. Hooves easily get stuck in the wet, frozen ground, so the Babylonians free the stallions deciding to brave the rest of the journey on foot. Dark, cold, and hollow. All the Babylonians feel during this march of the free falling crystals striking their armor, acting as if Indian spirits sharpened them into arrowheads. Can one measure the magnitude of desperation during wartime? Can words even interpret such feelings? Why do we feel to our, why do we fall to our knees and beg for mercy at the feet of someone who is exactly like you? At certain points during their dreadful march, certain Babylonians slip and fall into the mud, whereupon his axe like quicksand, swallowing the victim, albeit hearing their cries for help. Nobody lends a hand for the fallen, because the survivors don't want to risk coming to the same fate. That night, after all the traveling, suffering, and grieving, they camp in the traffic tunnel. Snow howls by outside, and vines cover the interior walls. Most of them are restless, holding their growling stomachs by piles of dust to which were once cars. The commander and king sit beside each other, watching West as he shifts from side to side while asleep. Heather says weakly, I was in New Orleans before Babylon in a town called Salvation. It was a few miles outside the state's capital. A knot forms in her throat. These raiders moved to Louisiana. They claimed it as their land. They started to destroy nearby colonies. People who we communicated with. We tried fighting back, but we lost. We had to abandon them. The conditions were getting so insane for me to comprehend. I, I won't abandon you, though. That's why I'm telling you this. My loyalty rests in Babylon. You did what you had to do. So, I'm not crazy for leaving? No, and neither are these, neither are us for cra crazy for staying in this one. Those raiders, they killed my family. 
when I left, I found that I absolved myself someday. That is now. That's how I'm going to do it. She bows her head. I still feel guilty for not avenging them. I feel like I lost an opportunity to exemplify myself. You're exemplifying yourself now. Heather smiles. What did Marissa say? Didn't I already tell you? Yeah, but I still think there's more to it. Jesus, Heather. Do you think I'm lying to you? I'm only here because I got lucky. She was going to kill me if I didn't leave right then and there. As soon as I offered the ultimatum, she just turned me away. Why didn't she kill you? United Swans was alive. Us? You, me, Marilyn, Timothy, people like that. Who wants to torture us after? What are we going to do? Heather asks on the verge of panicking. We'll own up to the situation. There's no going back. Alcatraz is gone, the economy is done, and we got one of their trains. They're going to come after us. We made a commitment today. What if other people run? What if the civilians want to support us? You know how fragile everything is back home? What have we done so far to gain their trust? We did what we had to do. We did what we said we would do. It's a start. You're right. I know being a leader is hard. I know it's a lot of pressure. What you, uh, what you can do to overcome it is accepting whatever happens, good or bad. At the end of the day, feeling regret will be your downfall. Thank you. Ego, Heather. Ego is the source of power. In my mind, nothing is good or bad. Everything is corrupt somehow. Because that's simply the nature of how things are. There's always a balancing act, some equalizing force. What did Einstein say? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Do people succumb to good acts because they're actually generous? Because they want recognition? Because they want respect? Whatever that reason may be, good nature comes before a bargain. It always does, even when we forget all reasons. Even when we're pure. The universe measures out with bad. Is anything purely good or evil? I beg of you to ask yourself this. Why are you telling me this? Because it's what I told Alexander. I'm sorry I never got the chance to tell you, but better late than never, I suppose. Can I ask you something? Sure. What's wrong? What? You heard me. Nothing's wrong. Everybody notices it in the kingdom. What do they notice? They see the bags under your eyes. They hear the rapid way you talk. They watch the way you eat. The way you declare orders and the way you act so numb. They question you. That's why everything's so fragile. I'm asking you what's wrong because I don't want any civil unrest. I don't want to talk about it. Forrest, I know there's something going on somewhere deep down. Do it. Tell her who you are. The moment you say anything, she will turn her back on you. I... I, I can't, Heather. No matter how hard I try to talk about what's bothering me, I can't. I'm not built to be sensitive. I don't want to open up to somebody I don't know. Okay, but I want you to know if you ever need to talk to me. I'm here. The king grins. Thank you. Deep within the night, Heather wakes up to the sound of someone coughing. She leans up, finding several Babylonians, including the king, huddling around the source of commotion. She, something tells her to pretend to sleep, so she does. The more she hears the king's yelps and cries, the more she realizes there's something ugly unfolding. She picks up the purpose behind his screams. One of the Babylonian prisoners from the island got sick and didn't tell anybody. Who knows what kind of sickness this dying bastard has? What if it's airborne, or what if it's quick to mutate? He wasn't coughing but b before Forrest demands. No, cries out the dying man's friend. I don't know what's happening. I'm not a fucking doctor. The monarch turns, looking toward the tunnel mouth. How far are we from Babylon? Two, three days tops according to these maps. What are we going to do when we get there? Cross that bridge when we get to it. The main thing we need to do is understand what happened. Biochemical warfare. What's that? In World War I and II, it wasn't uncommon for the enemy to poison food and water supplies. It also wasn't uncommon for them to experiment with microbes and biological toxins. What we have here is an act of retaliation. You really think they're capable of this? They probably wanted to cover every angle they could. Say someone attacks the Babylonian's train on the day of its departure. Wouldn't you want to prevent that somehow? Even if you couldn't do it personally? So either way, Anders would have died. Yes, and wherever you were going, everyone there would have died too. Listen, we don't have a lot of medical supplies, so we need you to pick up the pace. They have an advantage, and they're going to squeeze in all of it for its use. We need to fight fire with fire. What are, uh, what are you proposing for us? A hospital, all those black death fatalities. Maybe we won't have to dig holes for them anymore. 
Jesus, do you really think it was a good idea to stoop to their level? Did you think it was a good idea to join me in our second terrorist attack on a society that's still recovering from the first one? I see your point. It's just, I don't know. We're Babylonians. We don't need that. We need them to hear that. We need to win. Desperate times call for desperate measures. You're right. I just didn't know he made can deplete that fast. Let me level with you. I know we haven't experienced the same things. But let me tell you something. People are like a light switch. One moment they're good, the next they're bad. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. The way I see it, we exaggerate how good we are. Remember Korea? What about those newspaper articles on the Berlin Wall? Or the social fragility around communism and capitalism? I'm left asking myself if we're better off with the way things are. Maybe we need to start from scratch. I don't think so. Forest drugs. Either way, we need to leave soon. We'll start packing. He moves over to Heather, shaking a pretending commander awake. I know you are listening. We're heading on 15. Anxiety, paranoia, exhaustion, all the words that can deprive the Babylonians of happiness don't hold the candle to how they truly feel. They press on cautiously, eyeing one another with immense suspicion. All lives depend on holding in coughs and sneezes. The reduction of someone's value can, can change spontaneously. The war is of a different nature now. What once was the conflict driven by belief and action is now a conflict driven by absolute life and death. No contingency or face can be forgotten. In any name the enemy speaks of, the Babylonians are sure to remember. Who knows how long this cycle between hope and helplessness will last? It's a cycle you must acclimate to if you want to last more than a day in this world. There's nothing left but natural instinct and selection. Forrest shields the snow fill with his arms. We're still here, Forrest. All of your victims are here, your parents, everything. You should have sent to those public executions and everyone they, you lied to. We should let you know that we've really been here since birth. We watched you how you grew and changed as you got older. And you remember what happened that triggered it, right? We don't have to explain that part. This is who you are, Forrest. Our mind is our collage, our canvas. The king wants to fight back. He wants to challenge them as if they're challenging the devil. But any rambling whisper can be a symptom of the mystery illness. Perhaps their paranoia is enough for them to turn against their leader. The voices are winning, and they know it. You keep going back to these memories. Most of them are about that damn schoolhouse. What's so important about it that you can't escape the present moment for it? We don't want to know how it can be any happy memories. We all know what school is like for you. It's because echoes in those memories, though. Don't you long for her? Forrest Whaley, the man with a brick for a heart that actually misses someone. This fight is too much for her to handle. No matter how many times you manipulate her to think otherwise. Yeah, she's at the kingdom. She's behind those walls. But do you account for anything that could have happened with him during your absence? When you were a kid, we actually thought you'd be somebody. We thought you'd have purpose. And then Vietnam came. Dodge the draft for us. You weren't wrong when you made that decision. Don't you see any beer from that? Can you solve it some form of self gratification? You made the right choice not to go because look where you are now. You want to know something interesting about us? We know we don't have any reason to be in your head. We just are. Do you really think therapy will help you at this point? Do you really think we won't interfere whenever you talk to somebody about us? You're our bitch. The bags on our eyes only accumulate that fact. You enslave others because you know what enslavement feels like. You want other people to understand stuff with your own suffering. Don't you see what the problem is? You! When will you accept what you have done? When will you stop running for the guilt that you say you don't feel? When will you turn back and stare the truth in the face? Look in the mirror. Face who you are. You manipulate people because we manipulate you. You kill people because we make you feel like death. You are a walking collage of fracturing and self-reflection. The worst part is you take it. You keep taking it. Why don't you stand up against us? Why do we carry on and support that the how of your thoughts? Why do we keep this control? You're feeling anger. We see it. We don't want to put a gun to your head. You want to stop this. Even if you die, we're on the distant other side. Still be in the minds of others who suffer a condition. There's no care for schizophrenia for us, especially this degree. There isn't some vaccination you could take that magically make us disappear. There's not a drug that have you change, and it sure as hell isn't someone you talk to. You won't win. Some of us think you just like suffering, or think you enjoy the pain because you know you desire it. Guilt runs deep in you, turning you into something irredeemable. You keep doing this, you still have more guilt. You keep wondering why you are who you are. Do you ever think before you act? Why haven't the people risen up yet? It should have been long. 
It's almost a lot more reasonable than others. The merciful ones believe it too. Babylonus mistake. Your idea behind it will leave a scary man for sessions. What do you really care about? Populous? What a dream? Why is this even your dream? Excavation of morality? Can you even comprehend such concept anymore? Do you remember boundaries that fight good and evil? Do you even care to try? We'll see you when you kill people. Watch how you act. Your face doesn't have the same comments of the same person. They're cracks on the surface. People notice. That's why you have all the secret societies back home. Remember Dante's assassination job? Remember like the fear you felt? It's because that's what you should be feeling every day. First you realize you're not as important as you think you are, but someday the realization will save your life. Sometimes, you have to accept where you stand in the world and force you're no king. You can hide under the embellishments of gold crowns and jewel crushed tiaras, exceptional garments. At the end of the day, all you do is encounter your voices. You can fool them, but you can't fool us. It's your leadership is show. Excuse to escape your real love with us. You act down steady to perform for the feeble as of a race worse and loosen. Leadership is not some game force. Not death on time won't fix shit. Won't change anything. It sure as hell won't make your life easier. If you all are in abstinence, the pit goes deeper. Why do you let it sink? Why do you let this pressure build on you till you combust like a blast furnace? The monarch keeps on talking and walking. What other choice does he have? What choice do any of them have now besides escaping their own minds with some fountain of relief? Time loses its meaning. Through their suffering, they lose and regain themselves. After each grave, after each loss, they decide to cling to one another. They learn the true meaning of brotherhood through this journey. However pure this proves to be, they still have the honor of saying they overcome. They march until the roads bleed and become one with their clad iron boots, until dealing with the snowfall becomes stuck in nature. Babylon's medieval rooftops come into view that dreadful cold evening. The way they manifest solely into greatness from behind 50-foot stone walls with that bittersweet aftertaste make the aftertaste itself seem like a dessert. The clock tower chimes, ensuring every step to be worth more than the last. They arrive at the king's strawbridge. The king, the, they arrive at the kingdom's strawbridge, the link from Babylon to the rest of the world. The gatehouse at the bridge's end awaits their arrival, but they don't progress. Four steps forward, and that's when the others fall suit, disobeying previous plans at the formidable smell of smoke. The king's heart drops, seeing echoes somewhere of the gatehouse with a weeping Alice makes him stand still. Echo, Forrest moans. What? I, I don't know. She reaches out for him, but he steps back. What is it? I, some of us are sick. I'm not, but I can't touch you. She not have to be this close to you. Echo hides a distant countenance of anger when I clenching teeth. Follow me. Babylonians stay back several feet as they follow the queen through an eerily quiet kingdom. The smell of smoke worsens, and they spot several civilians rushing to the source of the blaze with buckets of water. Heather wants to help, and she struggles with the guilt of helplessness. She watches as they pass by houses where people board up their windows from the outside, as if the conflict is already here. Pennants dangle lifelessly from colorless windows. The streets are empty aside from defenders who ride and guard them on horseback. They bask in the flames as they consume the farmlands. All that equipment, those silos, barns, and fields, all of it is withering down into nothing. Echo doesn't stop here, but she gets into a very prominent area now in ruins. Maryland's Schoolhouse Another memory. The year is 1991. On this autumn night, the monarchy stand, behind, behind the por the monarchy stand beneath the porch's roof. The farmers work in the fields around them, preparing for the year's harvest. Hanging above their heads in the twinkling night sky, formidable blood moon. They take in this relaxing period of the kingdom's life, they watch with beaming smiles at their effective leadership. Lanterns twinkling the windows of farmhouses. Livestock sing and call to one another. Why don't we celebrate holidays? Echo asks. For the same reason behind for the same reason behind why I'm not letting anyone step foot from the outside world besides the army. We just need to focus on reestablishment, not re institution not reinstitutionalized. I was thinking we could do something for the kids this year, you know? Maybe the king can dress up as Santa Claus. Forrest chuckles. We'll see. Ha ha ha. Do you mind if I ask you something? Go ahead. Remember that night we went to Lake Union? Yeah, why? Has anything changed? Echo rubs her stomach. Well, this is awkward. I'm pregnant. So does that mean marriage? The queen shakes her head. It means we have to put our heads together and figure out a way out of this. A way out? What do you mean? I don't know if I want it. I can't even comprehend the fact that something is growing inside me. Echo, we've been trying for how many years now? It's completely natural to get scared, but is the abortion something you really want to look back on? No, but I don't know what I can look back on trying to decide to. Forrest lowers his head. 
That's exactly how I feel. The queen, cl the queen clasped her cold hands around his, warming the calluses. Listen to me, everything is overwhelming as it is. I figured something else in the world make anything easier. Look around you, Echo. Is there anything meant to be easy? She smirks, giggling. Ha <laughs> No, I still don't know how to look the day I met him. We were all so young, weren't we? God, do we even think it's safe for me to have a kid? Echo, was it safe for us to throw Judas? Is it safe for me to remind you about that? Could we get anything safe behind our walls? Are you not going to give me a choice? No, I just don't want you to be negative. Echo blushes. Oh, thank you. You are strong, brave, and beautiful. Never back down from a challenge, and you're always on my side. I know I don't say these things nearly as much as I should, but... The queen kisses him. I want it, I want it! Forrest holds her, nodding. I hope you understand I want the kid for you. I've always seen you as a, as a mother. Are you upset that I don't want to marry you? It's hard to understand at first, but I accept it. It's just who you are. He leads her off at the porch by the hand and turns her around. Behind the school, I was Babylon's bustling district. Let me in on your mind. Do you know that what we have to get to this point? Do you know how much effort we put into it? Do you know how blissfully ignorant we are about the efforts we haven't? Everything feels so weird. I knew killing Judas would change something, but I didn't know it would mean this. People still question whether you're or not we're good? The people aren't the ones in the throne room. They can disagree with me all they want. Till they get caught, the military supports us. We'll be fine. Still, why do you think the people stay? Why don't they revolt? Because they're scared. They don't have the courage to push themselves off the edge like we do. I remember waking up the morning after the blackout. Everyone left without me. To this day, I still don't know why they left me behind. They're supposed to be my fucking parents, goddammit. It still hurts knowing my entire life could be different how they take my shoulder. It's funny how life's fast life just reduce you to nothing. But when you're something, I don't consider myself a celebrity. I just want Babylon to succeed. That's where true leadership is, fighting for an idea. I'm still scared, though. Of? The success. Ask yourself, Forrest. Are we buying off more than we could chew? No, I'll prove it to you because I love you. You're the man I fear because of how much I love him back. Presently, they stand emotionally naked in front of a burning structure. The schoolhouse's roof caves in, crashing into the classroom beneath, destroying it completely. Echo gazes at Forrest, and for the first time sees an emotion she has never seen before. Helplessness. Nobody knows who's responsible. No names pop up in the distant conversations of makeshift firefighters. It's almost as if the perpetrator is invisible. With her free hand, she grabs hold of Forrest. The king rejoins the Babylonians, who stand behind and observe the unfolding chaos. Do you remember your responsibilities, Heather? He asks. I want you to send a letter to the army telling them to drop a census. Why? Whoever did this walked among us. How do you know? We fight when the enemy is obvious. What are we going to do about food? What are we going to do about food? West asks. There are emergency reserve and stockpiles in the industrial district. Other states. I saw them when I made my first round through the kingdom. They're impressive, but they won't last forever. At some point, we'll need to figure something out. We all have to fight, West declares. The ones who can, at least. Four shakes and said, we have to organize this. We can't just let everyone toll a gun. Some of them don't even know how to use. I'll train them, Heather suggests. Whether I'm not in the field, I will train the ones who don't know how to fight. The king lets out a long away dreadful sigh. <sighs> everyone. What about all those shop owners? The tradesmen? What about Timothy's workers? The farmers that have to repair this place? That's why I said the ones who can, West retorts. The ones who want to volunteer. Or we can make a draft, Heather suggests. No drafts, Forrest cries out. I'm sorry, I have a personal disbelief in the draft. The commander shrugs their shoulders. Hi, right, let's just get some volunteers. Forrest shakes his head. First things first, the hospital. Later that day, Wes finds himself in a hospital bed. All around him, current and separate small cots of wool and wood. Here's the hacks of ill-ridden folk, the moans of someone with terrible muscle pain, and people scream because of amputations. The hospital is a complete contradiction of itself, for one never goes to the doctor to catch an illness. The lack of ventilation allows the hot air to mix with the body heat. Sweat stains cover everyone's scrubs. And there's what curly hair approaches him. 
Kristen, is that you? West nods his head, propping himself up on the cot with his shoulders. What is it? The nurse pro produces an envelope. This is written for you, by the guy that had the exact same bed before you did. His heart racing, he stomachs the suspense and rips the package open. Unfolding it, the letter reads, Dear Wes, I'm sorry I couldn't wait till you got back. Just kept thinking about Anna. I just can't this feeling that we shouldn't be wasting time. I had to leave. I have to find her. We can't leave anybody behind. I have a rucksack with provisions. She lasts me a week and a half. Beyond that, I don't know what I do. If I don't come back, forget about me. I'm sorry about getting angry with you at Alcatraz. There was a lot going on. I didn't know what to do. I hope you could find it in your heart to forgive me. Think. Wes folds up the letter and slides in his pocket. Looking at the nurse, he asks, Did you read this? Patients need the privacy, kid. We don't want to intrude on anyone's business. Wes cracks a smile. I like the way you think. He examines the other patients. Some of them have sores which look like they're about to burst into fountains of pus and bile. Black and purple bo boils cover the skin of some. Others spit globs and mucus on the stone floor. What's happening to us? The nurse shakes her head. This is always going on. Anyway, two more of your Babylon friends got sick. We're examining them to diagnose whatever those acolytes give you. We should give you a proper. What does the prognosis look like for them? Not good. They're both healthy young males. Whatever's inside them is making them look older. Those sunken eyes, clammy skin, photos, photo flashes do end up taking their physical toll. That's the strangest part about this thing. If it makes you feel any better. I know how you'll figure it out. The nurse blushes. Thank you. I have to check on everyone else now. The next morning in the throne room, Echo sits alone at the large bed. Outside, snowfall prevents her from seeing the fire. She worries about its growth, its consumption of the rest of Babylon. The volunteers, firefighters, give her hope. Beside her, all sleep soundly in her crib. The chandelier above the dining room table swings back and forth gently against its own weight. She can't get the image of the schoolhouse out of her mind. The moment she and Forrest share together on that site will never be forgotten. The strange thing is that it meant nothing there until she saw it in ashes. To combat this, she climbs out of the bed and down to her knees, pulling out a chest. Lifting the lid, she produces and dons her crown. As silly as it is, it makes her feel powerful now. It didn't when Forrest first gave it to her, after Alice's birth, but as soon as the crown makes contact with her frontal lobe, a surge of superiority surges down her spine. People need something more than faith now. Role models. Whatever this conflict takes them, wherever the road leads, the only thing that remains consistent is the figures who make it all possible, who make the future possible. War strips humans down to the foundations of their instinctual origins, and the only way to retain humanity in this time is by having the proper leaders. Staring back at the window, Echo realizes her destiny. She has to fight whether Forrest likes it or not. If she dies, it won't matter, because the walls will remain standing. She feels grand coming from selfless intent, but she has enough self-discipline to reel her ego back in. When Forrest gets out of that damn hospital, she knows what she's gonna do. She's tired of feeling like she can't do anything, like she's always on the back burner she's meant to stay indoors. Sure, Babylon will need temporary leaders, but once they leap over that hurdle, once the sky is clear for her involvement, she will join. She will kill Ignitus. A knock on the door makes her heart jump. She stands up, walks over, and opens it, feeling a Babylonian soldier on the other side. In his hands, a seemingly endless scroll with names on its surface. The soldier hands her the scroll, and Echo closes the door. After spreading it out on the dining room table, she crosses over to a row of filing cabinets which trace the wall adjacent to the bed. She opens the one with the most recent date according to Timothy's calendar system, and sifts through files upon files of census. She eventually finds the right scroll and brings it over to the table, laying it next to the new one. The honest work takes hours, but she knows it's necessary. If the culprit is in the scriptures, some are just below a first and last name. She feels like a librarian, sniffing out the proper adjective to use for Methosaurus. As she continues, she stretches out, repeating names with her nails. Immediately, the queen has no idea if she's doing this right, for they didn't account for a psychopathic crime of this magnitude. In the future, she dreams of building a fire station of Babylon's medieval Romanesque design. At the end of the day, she circles three names, and her heart shatters when she does. The perpetrators are Monica, Edward, and Stacy Stanson. What does this mean? What do they go off the rails suddenly? To her, 
They were adapting pretty well, especially after being out in the wild for so long. She wonders if there's any chance of catching and bringing justice to these criminals. Most importantly, she thinks about if the Stansons are already reverting back to their tribalistic habits. The queen follows her urge to look out the window. The city's nightlife from this perspective always entertains her. There isn't any snow today, but it still covers the kingdom. Soldiers work by lantern to clear cobblestone driveways, muddy streets, and whatever else the Babylonians frequent. Still, most of the civilians remain indoors. Babylon is a city of mystery. There are many twists and turns in the social climate as it is. And these people are about to experience war. The realism hits her like a train. She personifies her anxiety with one movement, by turning away. In the hospital, Forrest lies awake, restless. The vaccination is coming soon, and the only symptoms he's showing are hot flashes. According to the redhead, it should be ready in a few days. Since he's the king, he gets his own room. However, it feels more like quarantine. The voices keep talking to him, forcing his insomnia. Not knowing what else to do, he stands up. When he does, his vision warps and twists like an LST flashback. He wearily stumbles into the corridor, roaming the stone halls of Babylon's own Wavery Hills Sanitarium. He arrives at a door, the room behind it containing sick patients. He opens the door and sneaks into the chamber, where he gazes over the civilians until finding a slumbering Heather. He nudges her awake. She wipes her eyes. What? What is it? She asked, half-conscious. Earlier, you asked me what my problem was. Four sighs. I... I hear voices. End of chapter six. Chapter 7. Who will you become? Time is the most valuable resource in nature. It takes, destroys, rebuilds, all within the cosmic blink of an eye. The Big Bang begins with time, and it will be there indefinitely, ushering the universe along its infinite cycle of growth, decay, birth, and death. The most important aspect of time is that it produces. This can't be any clearer to Ignitus as he wakes up, tracing a singular trail of thought Time is money. What the Babylonians did is inexcusable. There is no way to justify it and nobody else to blame. They are a problem that needs taken care of. There is no way these two societies can coexist peacefully anymore. They have too many disagreements, differing values, and beliefs. Isn't that partly why any two groups go to war in the first place? You saw the damage they did to the train. You saw the bodies of his men, the ones who he appointed to protect him. Rage courses through his veins as he leaps out of bed, dons the cloak, and storms down an ornate hallway. Arriving at the door to Athena's chamber, he wraps his hands around the brass knob, hearing whimpering on the other side. Grinning, the president pulls up the cloak's white hood with his free hand. He twists the knob, pushes the door open, and invites darkness. No! A woman suddenly shrieks. Please, I already told you it wasn't me! You don't have to keep doing this! Don't worry, Helen. I don't have any of this. I don't have anything this time. I just want to tell you a story. You see, I don't think you're taking my threats seriously. I know you've only been here a day and you haven't had time to adjust, so I feel like you should understand me. I don't take nonsense. Do you mind if I tell you a story? Next to Helen, three familiar faces, Monica, Edward, and Stacy Stanson. We did what we had it is to do, Monica cries. We don't deserve this. That's my point, United States. Your use is useless to me now. The more efficient I am, the more the Babylonians will suffer. Drawing a pistol, he aims it at Edward's head, the trigger sending waves of three blasts ricocheting off marble walls. Helen descends deeper in desperation. There's nothing to understand about you. I know who you are. You're a monster. You can't understand a fucking monster. Ignitus smiles in the blackness. That's where you're wrong, Helen. You see, humans have a unique relationship with morality and immorality. What do you think is bad? That you're in here. What if you weren't? Would it still be bad or good? What if you were somewhere worse? Does that make this place better? Do you see what I'm driving at? Perspective, Helen. It's all about perspective, and I happen to worship the former in this matter. 
Helen gasps. Why do you try to justify it? Because I can. Because even if I don't, the people will still look to me and because they believe what I am doing is right. They're too far gone to realize how much we own them. Like I said, Helen, I'm a no-nonsense guy. Now, I think it's time for me to tell you a story so that I can prove you wrong. The year is 1973. The radiant sun hangs high in a blue, cloudy sky as if a post-apocalyptic world doesn't exist beneath it. It traverses the landscape alone, distraught and lost. I've heard stories ever since Montana about other groups and how they're making their way to San Francisco because it's where the last society is. Currently, he roams through Eureka, California. He never acclimates himself to the quietness of the suburbs and cities. All of it is still too strange for him, even this late into everything. He, a man of a disastrous caliber, didn't want this for humanity. When there's no people, you can't make money. Currency used to be the essence of which he built his prominence in yesterday's world. People used to know his name from New York to Florida, because he belonged to a very fortunate, productive family living on Long Island. Everyone earned what they had. His parents never gave him anything for free. He lived under strict rules, and he became very self-disciplined as a result. To him, following the rules is what got him successful. <coughs> when he was 16, he was forced by the muzzle of his father's gun to join the Ku Klux Klan. So he did. It's either that or death. His father was very conservative, often turning into funda fundamentalistic views, to exaggerate his opinions. It had a unique effect on Ignitus, because he isn't religious, he doesn't believe in God, because the only God he sees is on the dollar bill. That's the only God that can change things. He's not meant for this world. He's, he knows it in, in his heart that it isn't for him, and he struggles not to escape it. Despite this situation, he hasn't killed anybody yet. He still offers people mercy because future generations will need people to re-establish the economy. It's a funny thing to think about, the prospect of there being a future monetary system. He might not have the drive to make it happen himself, but he finds hope in others. Finding the will to live through other people is the key, and now he's alone. No will, no purpose, no meaning. It lets the wine guide him through his destination, because even if he makes it, he's still going to die one day. He closes his eyes, echoing his father's words. Yeah, what, what you touch. That philosophy makes him who he is today. If your hands aren't reaching for anything, if they're just waiting idly by on the wayside, there's nobody to blame for your failure besides yourself. A man's value depends on the work he puts into his life. This aspect sparks an unrelenting love for capitalism, and ignites a curious joy wherein he pretends it's all a game, a choice dictating him. Choice is an illusion under capitalism. The better ones you make, the better outcomes you have. It's as simple as that. People didn't understand it. Resting here, he ponders on the future of the game. Is there any chance for revival? Should it be brought back in the first place? What if he adopts and changes it to fit his own perspective? The insanity of even finding out where to begin is too much to comprehend. There's nothing now. People inevitably make something out of it. He doesn't know why he's alive or he's been in multiple situations where he shouldn't have escaped. Why did the world save him? What good does he do in this uncontrollable environment? <coughs> he refuses joining tribes. Some offer him membership, but he rejects each time. He doesn't want to let his guard down. For comfort is a precursor to one's death, he never works well in teams either. He's always been most efficient when working independently. An eagles cry. She breaks him out of his trance. She has the only meaning to his life right now. The bird swoops down from the sky, landing gracefully upon the veteran's shoulder. What are we going to do, Athenia? Ignatius asks, letting out a sigh as if he's a deflating balloon. <sighs> Sitting in the field, they bask in the peace. <sighs> how are we going to get the world back to how it was? How can we fix everything? How can we get the right people with the right minds? We need something, Athenia. We need to find this place. I don't want to be without someone else anymore. Later, Athenia flies overhead as Ignatius roams the land. With night on the way, he seeks shelter eventually finding a Victorian graveyard. A coal black fence taller than him encompasses the cemetery, and an eerie gate at the front invites him inside. On the gate, plywood with a message in blue spray paint, except what is. He stares at the message for a while, wondering if the person who left this is in San Francisco. Holding his breath, he presses into the grounds, navigating the area while Athenia hunts. He stumbles upon a museum sticking out like a stork thumb. Fuck. He stumbles upon a museum sticking out like a sore thumb. 
The brown and green moss complements the cracking gray exterior stone. It nice wipes away cobwebs, talking at an enormous, ominous door beneath the years of rocks. He wraps his hands around rusty metallic bars, twists them with both hands, and pushes the blockade open. A cold gust of wind escapes the chamber, engulfing the veteran in chills. He gulps, entering and leaving the door open for Athena. Inside, his heart breaks from the poetic devolution of life. Maggots and insects crawl through the space of bones left behind by a couple's suicide. Inez finds two rings on the floor beside them, next to the remains of a pump-action shotgun. Along the walls, the museum's coffins reads the plaques, and he figures the universe has a sick sense of humor, for the golden place have matching surnames. Athena lands outside, tossing a fish into the air and gulping at mid-flight. Unitas watches with great amusement, envious he can't just up and fly like his only friend. Her talons scrape across the stone as she approaches her savior. Think we could stay here? He asks. The eagle flapped their wings, nesting right before, it, before his feet. Guess that answers it! He watches as he... She, he watches as she eyes the corpses, and the show is understanding. He drags the bodies outside, lying them on the affected grass. Turning, he comments, Made me uncomfortable, too. The stench hangs thick in the humid air. He chokes back vomit, wondering how the bird could hold in that fish. Let's just try our best to gather some energy for tomorrow. These are the last few miles. He suddenly, he suddenly closes his eyes, growing solemn. I regret everything, Athena. My dad, he... You made me hurt innocent people. You made me abide by his ideologies. He laughs. <laughs> the son of a bitch was the first one to catch a whiff of the collapse. He was this occultist freak. He had connections with the Freemasons. He knew that the Russians would attack us with that EMP. He knew about the conspiracy between Vietnam and China. He didn't do anything about it, and that's what terrifies me. How can you hold that information from the public? How can you... Put a curtain over everything. He reflects on his past, the present being too discomforting, the future being too uncertain. The only thing he knows is that what's behind him. And he seeks solace in the concrete nature of that fact. We suffer because we, like Ignitus, can't separate our thoughts from ourselves. We trap our consciousness in a downward spiral, unbeknownst to us, until a damning realization makes itself apparent. Ignatius chooses to be ignorant about the nature of consciousness, because in the grand scheme of things, Earth is a speck of meaningless sand floating endlessly in cosmic wind. It's pointless to wonder about those types of things, especially now. He remembers the family gathering before Vietnam, early in his life, when he was in Utah celebrating the occasion in Salt Lake City. He was sitting on the back porch of a lake house, watching his siblings play in a boat in the middle of the rippling water. The sky was blue, a different blue than the one he sees today. It was the blue of innocence, a radiant color of hope and life. Time changes you. Ignatius doesn't believe in the original perception of it anymore. In an age without clocks, radios, cars, all these things we think we need, everything becomes one. Days, nights, the seasons, and the weather seem to bleed into one entity. It moves in waves, whatever this entity is. It's a force dependent on the existence of vibrations, mathematical calculations, and geometric shapes transforming in less than the span of a sneeze. In the middle of the night, Ignitus sneaks outside, restless. A thick fog looms over the cemetery, and the trees surrounding him seem to dance and twirl in the mist. He doesn't know what to do about this guilt. He consumes him daily, weighing on the consciousness and robbing his heart from a breath of genuine, quiet air. He hopes San Francisco could take this feeling away from him, because he doesn't know how much longer he could last, even with Athena. He asks himself what this suicide would do to her, as it hurts him too much to think about. Look at all these tombstones. These images into the lives of people who knew order. He makes up backstories for each name he reads, forgetting about the moon shifting across the black sky. He feels a strange, natural connection with death in this moment. He usually fears his grasp, but now a euphoric acceptance flows to him like the notes of some French concerto. It isn't normal to be afraid of death this late in the game, but it still bothers him because of its roots. He witnessed a car accident wherein his sister passed. Still frame image of her body withstands coping mechanisms like drug highs, hobbies, and hoping for a better future. These objects that we used to escape reality are of no use to him. Life goes on silently, just like him. Examining graves, he finds himself missing the people he's lost. Thinks about all of them. Carly, Dennis, Nick, Lucas, Henry, Sydney. They're all just memories in a labyrinth of suffering. More still frames, more change. He remembers how each one died, how they all 
fought for his survival. Why did they choose to do that? They knew who he was, yet they let him live. They know about all the shitty things he's done, yet they protect him with their souls. What does any of this nonsense mean? Why would they, the ones with higher potential, sacrifice themselves for him? What aspect of this personality do they want to die for? We aren't meant to understand life in its entirety. Our brains are too feeble to comprehend that. There has to be a limit to what we can know, or else there won't be any mystery, and mystery is the heart of reality's origin. In the distance, he hears clopping hoofs. Standing up, Ignatius moves over to the graveyard's gate. From the fog emerges a small girl with a rucksack, mounting a pack mule. She passes the gate, and Ignatius is about to leave her behind, but something tells him not to. Something tells him to invite her inside. He listens to his calling and whistles, alerting the passing survivor. She turns, her heart dropping out of fright. Upon making eye contact with the man, she grins. This isn't the reaction you usually get from meeting loners on the road. He was half expecting her to run away. She dismounts the mule, leading it by the straps of its harness to the gate. San Francisco? Ignatius nods his head. Do you want to come inside? I'm trying to bring hospitality back. Where? Here. I'm staying here for the night. The girl glances behind the stranger, trying to view his camp. She feels apprehensive, staring away with the mule. Wait, Ignatius begs. Please, I haven't talked to anybody in years. I just need someone. The girl stops. I don't know if I can trust you. You can't, Ignatius states. But is going at it alone easy? Does it keep you sane? It's not easy, but it's just what I do. Ignatius rests his head in front of the gate bars. I've been alone for nearly three years. No parents, no friends, nobody to talk to. You'd be bleeding on the floor if you had anything worth taking. You need me just as much as I need you. The girl faces him. What's your name? Ignatius, you? Violet. You were born after the collapse, weren't you? I was born in a Kansas settlement, but it's gone now. Why are people so comfortable with murder? Because there is no murder anymore. Are you a bad person? What is valid? At the end of the day, what gives us the right to put a label on such things anymore? Look around you. What do you mean? Morality and immorality. It's clear to me now that this is an illusion. The truth is we just define these things to control some feeling of importance from an unknown source. Nobody is purely good or purely bad. What defines those situations? Our actions and motives behind them. Thank you. She approaches the gate with her mule and eyes opens it. All around them, withering flowers sprout up from the earth. Sentra Varapi makes the violet gag, and she leaves her mule for the lake behind Nice's Mausum. At a shore, Violet mules and spews chugs into the black green water, where once you could have seen a reflection as clear surface. The girl stares into it, fixating her consciousness on the reality of her situation. Ignatius watches with curiosity, tethering the mule to a nearby gravestone. The remnants of innocence never cease to put him in awe. In a world where such a concept should be forgotten, it exists in this moment, a special glimpse into self-realization. No matter how brief these glimpses are, they still offer evidence for something to be born from this broken generation. Violet knocks herself out of her trance and returns to Ignatius. Thank you for inviting me inside. Something just occurred to me and I'm grateful for what you did. I have a feeling I would have died otherwise. I was about to let myself... Why? You are the only person in the past nine years that wanted to reach out to me. I thought you were a mirage at first, I just want to accept an end. I don't think I even want to make it to San Francisco. Who is the last person you talked to? My mother. The girl grins. It's funny, I still remember how she sounds after all this time. The last thing she said to me was that she regretted not being there. Nice gazes up at the nebulous glow of space life. It was like all of the other missions. But for some reason, this experience becomes a part of me. We got in a firefight in Vietnam. I saw myself for the first time in the perspective of my enemies. And for a split second, I questioned what we were fighting for. Is it really worth it to hold someone else at the end of a gun because those were your orders? He gulps. The last person I talked to was my mom, too. 
She would always tell me that you're with what, what, the, what you touch. She looks toward, toward the graveyard's entrance. You know, we don't have to leave for the city right away. We could stay here for a few days. Ignatius chuckles. Ha <laughs> ha, sounds like you uh, need time away from the road. We can hunt and gather wherever we can over the next two or three days. We can't stay that long. It's an obligation to see this place. Peaceful hours follow. Rarely do these moments ever happen to Ignatius. He laughs and talks with the girl through their efforts of sustaining themselves. He gets to know himself through her on some occasions, and he likes this man. Hell, he chases it every goddamn second without him knowing. He feels at home in its presence, feeling he wishes he could capture and lock away for himself. A waiting gibbous glides over them without ever stopping. Ignatius aspires to be like that. JFK promised to put a man on the moon's surface by the end of the decade. Promise never came. Now man has to become the moon if he wishes to survive. Rentless accident and Mother Nature swirling around a gravitational pull in the boonies of the last frontier. They full violets rucks back to the brim of game, feeling a sense of enjoyment from the adventure. They walk back to the graveyard. It's silent, because the guilt of us accepting happiness in this world consumes their egos. The smile doesn't last long in this world, its nature can be comparable to the characteristics of a non-renewable source. Admittedly, they feel strange sharing a good day with each other, because they're still pretty much strangers. That's the only thing about this world Ignatius can't understand, the way connections develop so quickly. Later that night, Ignatius wakes up on the mausoleum's floor with a start. Looming over him, a sleepwalking violet, the blankness of her expression terrifies him, but he's quick to remember what waking a sleepwalking person is the worst thing you could do. The girl mumbles in her sleep, subconsciously living out a dream in real life. Ignatius can't make anything out of them. After a while, it decays into an ancient tongue. The sight fascinates Ignitus, but the fear of an accidental arousal keeps him on his back. The next morning, he exits the museum with Athena. She takes the flight, and he finds Violet sitting near the graveyard's lake with her mule. She feds it an apple, and they rest together, basking in the warmth of a sunlight he doesn't recognize. The morning rays bake the lake's murky water, slowly hardening him to a muddy pace. Violet spots Ignitus, and she waves him over. Smiling, Ignatius proceeds, stopping over tall grass. What does Bird think of Charlie? Violet asks, chuckling. Athena does Charlie. Strange. Think she'd attack him? Maybe she didn't for a reason. Do you think that's possible? My dad was obsessed with evolution, and he taught it to me. Something natural and larger than Earth itself works on tandem. It's the machine at its core. Although it takes millions of years, everything changes in this system. These changes might be tiny, but down the chain they grow at observation of value. With that in mind, the system is still changing, and maybe that's part of it. There's just new rules we don't understand now, and we still have to learn them soon. I still believe in God. Really? Yeah, I know it's stupid. I know I should it, but something keeps pulling me towards it. I never went to church when I was a kid. Why? My parents were huge on it. Vietnam got in the way and put everything on hold. Do you regret fighting now? No, it's the best thing I ever did. I told you about those milliseconds where I did feel guilt. But then I overcame them. Proud that I had the chance to fight for my country. I thought you were from Italy because of your name. I could thank my dad for that. Did you have a wife during the war? No, I never married. They tether the mule to rails inside the mausoleum and loot near nearby neighborhoods for anything useful, finding medicine, small portions of food, and a pocket knife. In a mansion's chest of drawers, they uncover a bow with eleven arrows in a bundle. On its front lawn, they examine the empty district before them. Broken glass, pieces of plywood, trash cans, and rusty cars rest in infinite motionless state atop decaying asphalt. Soon, everything around them will be dust. There will be no relics of the old way of life, and that terrifies him. They forget what will become of that madness? New government types? New undefinable obstacles? Apocalyptic fog grows in a dense societal hailstorm, but only in hindsight. It rains on their way back. When they return, Athena waits patiently at the gate for Ignatius with a rat dangling from her beak. The rainfall turns the dry lake back into the brown marsh. The stench, what? <laughs> the stench worsens with the moisture. Everyone crams into the only shelter for miles. The 
The storm lasts for hours, and the lightning blasts across the sky as if God's tearing the fabric of reality apart with a machete. Certain strikes start fires, and they grow into respectable blazes as they mercilessly assume anything that survive. Why don't you believe in anything? Violet asks. I don't trust it. I don't want to waste time believing in something that might not even exist. There's this thought experiment called Pascal's Wager. It argues that people should live their lives as through God exists, even if he doesn't. That way, when they die, they only have a finite loss, only to gain infinite shagwe law. I see fallacies in that statement. It assumes God is real right of the bounds, giving the other party no choice. He also suggests humans are immortal, and this can greatly damage someone's way of thinking. Imagine living a life, knowing where you go after you die. It seems pretty pointless to exist in that first place, doesn't it? I also disagree with the idea of hell. Why would someone so loving create a place so damning? The logic simply doesn't add up. You see those people already out of something. What is that? When you have nothing, wouldn't you like to believe everything is going to be alright in the end? I want to make everything alright now. Charlie sleeps on the ground. Behind her, next to Athena. Sight makes it, Arcnidus, yawn, and he decides they should sleep. Deep in the night, he wakes up to a snoring violet again. Instead of staying put like she did the first time, she lumbers over to the museum's door, pushes it open, and walks into the night. Arcnidus slips by the sleeping animals. Following the strange path, he watches as the girl limps to the lake's shoreline, pausing where the tips of her shoes touch the water. Her aura dances in the rain, and she slowly submerges herself beneath the water's surface. Arcnidus takes one step forward, but a seductive, evil force within him stops progression. Bubbles pop where she sinks, and her eyes shoot open underwater. Finally grasps her breath, unable to swim. One minute, two minutes, three. The struggle explodes to a steady halt, and her lifeless body emerges from the depths. Then he returns to the mausoleum, digs through Vi's backpack, and produces a pocket knife. He waits for the storm to pass, pondering on a gross act. The violent rainfall succeeds into quietness that morning, and nice skins a mule. He roasts the meat over a roaring campfire on the lake shore, observing Athena as she picks up Violet's floating flesh. They leave after Nidus steals Violet's rucksack, closing the gate behind them without looking back or feeling remorse. The bird rests on its shoulder, the sun illuminating blobs of crimson on her feathers and beak. They pass through several burnt towns, examining the callbacks to the old world's problems. Signs from the early riots still shine through the apocalyptic crust. They display simple, rebellious messages demanding change, a, cha a cure for the virus, an end to American involvement in the Vietnam War, an end to communist invaders. It's during this time that we nice recognize the mag magnitude of stupidity. How did we let it get this far? What made us give up that spark? Why do we call ourselves survivors where we shouldn't even have the option for that? Images of Violet impede this train of thought. She was too good for this world. What happened to her was merciful. If San Francisco's gone, the discovery wouldn't hurt her now. Either way, she just would have wound up dead later. What happened was an act of natural selection. It was the universe taking its own course, warranting no intrusion. Who's he to stop her god? They reached the ruins of a drive-in, investigating the burnt-up cars in the parking lot. The movie screen is torn to several pieces. Speakers rest in their own ashes, and telephone poles lay peacefully on the roofs of vehicles. Ignatius turns down an aisle, only for his fatal step to trigger a bear trap hiding beneath a layer of miscellaneous trash. Metal prongs pierce his leg, and Athena takes flight as a horrible shriek cracks through the wayside. Makeshift alarms blare, and the distant yelps of a tribe bring life for this once barren area. Dark figures hop fences and climb over cars until they reach their building, crying target. They threaten to stab him with spears, knives, anything that has a sharp edge. They throw us the blades in his face, ch chanting ancient hymns. The circling stops, and the chief emerges, holding a head by its scalp. Do you say this? The chief growls. You do. You know who we are. You don't. You are not done. The chief screams, swinging the head and striking nice with it. You damn ass you play dumb. I'm not. He nice screams, pleading for his life. I'm trying to stand for this. Chief recognizes sincerity, backing him. The chief recognizes sincerity, backing him and calming down. The claw of a retreat into a volcano. San Francisco, why? Are you kidding me? I am your senior. He struggles against the metal prongs. Please release me. I'll tell you everything you know. Blood loss, blood, blood loss causes him to faint. Hours later, Ignatius wakes up to the tribe pouring water on them. 
From Shay's forces back against a cot, and a pyramid-shaped roof fabric suggests a teepee. A wooden pole supports it, and unintell an unintelligible conversation surrounds him. Merging into his consciousness like the early waves of a record-breaking tsunami, the powerful surge of a headache pulses in his frontal lobe, and his leg rests under the protection of gauze, stitches, and rubbing alcohol. These incompetent bastards seem to provide him with a blood transfusion. The chief enters the tent, sharpening his spear. You have the kind to ask full. I need more blood, Nice demands. I lost a fucking bucket full. Do you know how stupid that would be? Chief retorts. We're no lads, not doctors. Why well, we give you the raw blood type? I'm not going to be responsible for the death of a man that can lead us to safety. You don't want to be no lads, lad? No, we no, we just never had a for Oklahoma. San Francisco! Ignatius gasps weakly. There's a rumor that the city is at the last civilization. We have all those rumors, the chief states. Hendricks County, Birmingham, and Kennedy Township, Babylon. We've tried for most of them, and they were all gone. We're losing hope. Babylon? Who oh, is that? Location game staging. We have Spitzberg, New Mexico, Nevada, all over. It's either Babylon's a ghost, or there are different communities that have the same name. Either way, we want to avoid it. What makes you so confident about San Francisco? It's closed the home. We have nothing going around us out there. So, a few days travel from here, and I'm up in the rucksack you took. Wait well, yeah, until your luck is. I'll take any half measures. No luck with that take. The chief is sharpening the arrowhead. Like I said, we're not doctors. Conversation outside them turns into frantic cries of cowards at the sound of gunfire. Neighboring teepees catch the fire of Molotov cocktails. The chief evacuates the area, leaving Nia to beg for help alone. Shadows dance across the fabric at a quick sprint. Blood splatters across the shield. Globs creating ominous dark patterns. In this moment of truth, Ignatius finds the motivation to do something he's never done. Pray. He asks God to forgive him of his sins, to let him live so he cannot travel down the road he rejects. He apologizes for letting his father have control, for letting a deep unknown evil kill Violet. By the end of the session, he's in tears. At the mercy of memory, black plumes of smoke flood into the tent creeping over the vision like the hallucinations of a victim undergoing sleep paralysis. Eventually, he passes out under the overabundance of carbon monoxide. In this foggy state, memories from childhood come back to him. He remembers these talks he would have with his mother. These talks that had the potential to justify a murderer. Wherever his dad would stop behaving erratically, she would defend him a hit on her own time. She would tell him that what he does is normal and that the kid must always abide by his parents' wishes. He remembers a strange feeling he got when the draft came to his door. It's a sensation of relief. The war was his escape from his aristocratic lifestyle, a lifestyle they had no intention of living in his youth. He remembers the sensation of battle, the cycle of chaos and order complimenting itself within the span of an evening. He still feels that rush, the indescribable coincidence of anxiety, instinct, and courage. He used to hear stories about soldiers accidentally setting up booby traps in the labyrinths of jungles. Some would be merciful, an instant penetration of a poison dart air striking his skull. Others would bring the capitalist supporters to their slow weapons. The even steward is trapped in pits more than ten feet below the surface. A bright white obstructs the darkness in his mind. An energy so warm and loving it brings him the euphoria that even the drugs of the counterculture movement can't conjure. The light fades away, and he envisions himself standing upon a mountaintop, overlooking a civilization with boxcars acting as barricades. Within the boundary, a city with a familiar sight known as Lombard Street. The winding road twists up a hill like a drunk stumbling home from a bar. Brownstone apartments, a race of solar panels, and fertile plantations begin a vegetarian aura to the settlement. Zeppelins rise from the opening roofs of warehouses, displaying their confidence into a lone figure. Next to him, a shadow emerges from Black Cloud. Ignatius recognizes this figure as the physical manifestation of the evil presence he felt when he didn't stay violent. Hey, I'll be yours. It's just with a growl. You have the whole opportunity to own everything. I believe in God now. You can't affect me. I won't allow it. We both know you have control over evil. You gave orders on the battlefield, goddammit. People turn to you because they respected you. You can have it all again. This people will penetrate you. You'll be their god. Why believe in him when you can become him? I'm not going to turn back on someone who saved my life. You earned my loyalty today. Ignatius, I know how unstable you are. You try taking these steps to become a better person, and you wind up where you began after that moment and one change passes. Your savior is only a pipe dream. Why are you showing me this? Because these people are lost. You have the proper experience to lead them. You're evil. 
knowing that is not fear. Fear is the fail behind survival. You have the energy within you to turn that fear into production. It's my opportunity to live through you. Are you a demon? I'm entirely separate from religious beliefs. I only look like this because of how you physically perceive an emotion. So if I make them afraid, if I stay in power, if I play by the rules, they'll know me. Yes. The blackness consumes his mind again. He's sent back into a childhood memory. He's in a Louisiana swamp cabin, standing next to his dad. Before him, a count of civil rights members. His dad holds a whip, ready to strike people who stop at nothing to protect liberty. Prisoners don't cry or beg for help. They sit in silence, keeping their gazes to a wooden floorboards. Outside, crickets chirp and buzzards feed in animal carcasses. The cabin's open front door reveals a dock <coughs> leading to an airport. Leading to an airboat. His father nudges him on the shoulders, displaying the whip. Son, you know what you have to do. But I... Father smacks him, sending the boy summoning backwards. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. What do they do? What the fuck did you just say? Phone forms on the corner of the tyrant's lips. These copious motherfuckers are taking the safety of the Jim Carlisle's. The girl, she drank from a water fountain for colors only. The boy, he went to problem with a black girl. It's unacceptable, and it makes us weak. We need to free America from this Roman. For the first time in his life, Ignatius feels fear. Selfless kind of terror. He wants to jump into the airport, but his father forces him to whip the second time. He shoves the kid over to the captives, laughing as if he's in the middle of listening to a comedian. The kid stands over his innocent martyrs, the whip's handle rolling in the trembling hand. The straps dance across the floorboards, as if Ignatius is puppeteering an empty presence. He raises the whip cautiously, purposely stalling every second he can. The anger in his father boils like water in a tea kettle. He bows over to his son, grabs his arms, and forces the boy to strike. Shrieks ring out through the empty swamp, and the insects pause their songs. Like what you made me do, his father screams. You could just listen to me the first time. It could be so much worse with that now. Seconds go by in quick flashes of blinked intervals. Nice closes his eyes, struggling against his father's strength. Why does his mom defend somebody like this? Can she be too far gone under his authority? The captive cry out in agony, screaming for his superiors to stop. The beating lasts for 20 minutes, the final strike hitting the boy, who finally dies from the abuse. Ignatius drops the whip, gazing over this act in horror, backing away from the scene. Do you want to know I keep you alive? His father grunts, because murder is illegal. I'm not killing myself, Ignatius retorts. I don't care what it takes, but get away from you. You like your life, you hypocritical bastard. You live outside of poverty because you are above it. We are without this money. Well, guys, go move and come. You want to run away and make something yourself? You won't. That's what you can't comprehend. You can't run because the fortune's too alluring. If you really want to, you would have left a long time ago. That night, Ignatius and his family sit around the dinner table in their mansion. His mother shakily cuts her steak, sunglasses covering black eyes. <laughs> his father sits confidently in his suit at the end of the table, devouring the portions as he's lifting out a Chinese famine. The son stares down at the plate, hearing the whip crack into terrible thoughts. Son, his father starts, eat. He reluctantly obeys. After dinner, he cleans off his plate and goes outside to check the mail. Opening it, he receives a small yellow envelope. Tearing it open, he reads the draft for the Vietnam War. Tears of joy form in his eyes, dripping off his cheek and dampening his source of relief. He wakes up from this nightmare in a fit of coughing. Opening his eyes, a room with four white walls and a low ceiling. An ivy bag injects blood into the broken survivor. A heartbeat monitor chimes in from the right side of the room. Looking through the window in the opposite wall, he sees the distant sign of civilization. Proudstone apartments line tightly packed streets. The members of the lower caste pass over asphalt roads and horse-drawn carriages. The wealthy ride on vehicles, insinuating a clear division of power. The door of this room opens, and a bald male doctor enters the room in a white hooded coat. He carries a clipboard in his hands, mimicking the old way of life. Good morning, the doctor says with a smile. I'm Dr. Samuels. You've been out for a while. Why do you keep me alive? The healer examines his leg. You are invite the tribe. We exterminate all tribes. God was a clear indicator, too. Is this San Francisco? Yes, I'm very lucky to be able to make it. Nice almost jumps out of his bed. Please, I have so many questions. I just need to understand this place. I've been out on the road for so long. Explanation is the least I deserve. The doctor lets out a mournful sigh. <sighs> Honestly, it's not the best place on earth. It looks the side of the city is almost on fire because I'm a president, Hudson. It's 
bringing his entire city down. Nobody's willing to stand up for him. He has his wife, our first lady, Marissa. She's not fit for our position. People spread rumors about her all the time, from abuse to human trafficking. How long has this place been here? Doctor asks if he doesn't want to remember the early days of San Francisco. Putting on a facade that he's grateful to share his origin story. We'll start going up under the authority of our first president-elect, Vincent Wyatt. Wyatt had an idea to bring the American dream back to us. The dream gave us an excuse to come together to build a sanctuary. We got the boxcars from rail yards, stacking them on top of each other with cranes powered by vegetable oil. We built our own solar panels, and everyone was grow food on window sills until we got proper materials to construct plantations. Dewey's arrival changed everything. He was an economic advisor before the collapse, and he helped Wyatt build a minting facility on Alcatraz. Ever since the reinduction of money, nothing has ever been the same. Why the hoodies? Part of our belief stems from occultism. People need something to hold on to, and occultism gives them that. Ignatius feels a spark of pain in his leg, and he asks, How long will I be in here for? Well, they say you're late. I say about a week. Pogs didn't even touch your veins, but they did damage muscle. We're going to have to examine it more, but with the drugs we have, you won't feel poking us or make him feel any area uncomfortable. You have a strong chance for complete recovery. The days pa pass quietly. Nice feels very fortunate to be here. He watches the city through the window, getting a feel for his vibe. For when you can see, everything the doctor said is true. One evening, the citizens from more parade to boost patriotic morale. But the event stirs conflict revolving around different viewpoints. Before a riot breaks out, the city's mili military unit shows off its power. The people simmer down. The parade continues on a much different aura, and everyone's thankful for its end. The selfless poor protests on street corners, demanding higher wages and an income they can live off of. Science display rogue messages of criticism toward capitalism, city's labor laws, and President Hudson. From this vantage point, a fire ignite, ignites and ignites his heart. It isn't a fire born from evil, but a fire born from a genuine interest in making the city a better place. As the hours of recovery pass, this gives him time to focus on this new idea. He plans on exposing himself to the city's political climate, feeling passion and emotions from the people run through him. He envisions himself standing alongside their protests, standing beh behind podiums with crowds listening to what he has to say, to what he has in store for their futures. He sees himself taking a noble, honest stance against the forces that aim to take away peace. However, behind this wishful thinking, he still thinks about what happened to Violet. He tells himself to forego that regret, but he still remembers the strength of the dark force that stopped him from saving her. Can he stop it to save himself? The day finally comes where he's able to leave this crippling life behind. Emerging from the city's hospital, he shields the sun rays from his eyes. The doors close behind him, and he listens for that inevitable slam, the sound that separates his old attitude from the new one. The noise never comes. Instead, he hears a female's voice screaming. Nidus, wait! He turns, a young redhead following his tail. Who are you? Marissa, she says, gasping her breath. I'm glad I could catch you on the way out. I was calling your name, but you weren't listening. Marissa, aren't you the first lady? She blushes, the paparazzi recognition never getting old. Yes! I just want to see you because I want to hear your story. My story? It makes me so important. You're the first lone survivor to reach us within two years. I want to invite you to dinner. You can tell House and I about yourself. Well, if that doesn't bother you, I, I don't want to seem like a burden, but I don't exactly have anywhere to stay. They just kind of kicked me out. A sudden smile burst on her face. We have a guest room. I feel confident you'll like it. Later, Marissa drives a limousine to the front doors of a gargantuan palace. Marble walls complement in golden braces, and large windows display murals depicting prominent scenes and artifacts from the Bible. The Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the hidden scriptures beneath the Vatican. It's only imagination to conjure a theoretical monetary picture. So insignificant, yet its mystery continuously withstands time. Miniature statue of Christ the Redeemer blossoms from a flowing fountain in the front yard, seemingly inviting members of any class to come in. But a feeling inside Ignatius knows this is a red hearing. They ride past the site, Ignatius examining the statue thoroughly. Marissa parks the limo in the driveway and ushers Ignatius inside, where he passed in the warmth of the entrance hallway. Lit chandeliers line the walls, the lights casting ominous shadows across the length of an open interior. Footsteps echo towards them from the far end of the hallway seeing the sound of a door closing. A figure taller than either of them emerges from the depths with a cane, the chandelier is casting an eerie glow over his old, pale face. The age difference between him and Marissa sounds ignited, but he keeps his comments to himself. Hello. 
Hudson starts, Sammy Clayman. We're both pleased to have you here. Nice success gesture. What's on the menu? Hudson chuckles. Ha ha. A Midwestern special. Cornbread, fried potatoes, and beans. The world takes the nice back to just a few days ago where he was eating wherever he came across. I remember the last time I've had food of that quality before. Hudson eyes on Astonishment. How did you go crazy about there by yourself? Marissa intervenes. This should be safe for dinner, honey. Hudson rolls his eyes, leaning down the hallway. The dining room's this way. Entering the dining room, Ignatius finds an ornate table set up for the evening. Three plates of fruit sit idly in front of throne like chairs. Glasses of red wine complement the servings. Everyone takes their seats. Hudson at the end of the table, Marissa to the left, and Ignatius to the right. This is supposed to be dinner, so why does Ignatius feel like he's in an interrogation chamber? Pushing this feeling aside, they begin eating. Ignatius is every, every last Marcel. The warm food and immaculate preparation was almost too much for him to handle, and an unknown hunger with him rages. For years, he was a scavenger, but now he's finally king. After drinking the wine, Hudson breaks the ice. Do you remember the days of the early Ignatius? Stops eating, laid down his utensils. Yes! Where were you? Marissa asks. Nice almost forgets, but an image of his dad's football jersey flashed in his mind. New York, but to a very fortunate family. Till the draft came. Marissa gasped. The draft? Were you scared? Shakes his head. It's the best thing that could happen to me. Hudson recalls a memory. I was a thousand years younger, but I used to be a judge in Oklahoma. I already knew how to play the game. Have you ever heard of Hitler's backstory? Ignatius shakes his head. In World War I, Hitler served in the trenches alongside the Germans. One day, a British soldier approaches him. Hitler's weak, defenseless, and the British soldier, against all odds, lets him live. The war ends, and the world blames Germany. Hitler goes back to his country and rises to power, using rhetoric that amounts to making Germany great again. This sparks World War II in the 1940s. It's the butterfly effect, Ignatius. What I want to do is use choice to my advantage. Choice matters. Choice matters. When I was in the hospital, Ignatius starts, I watched the city. I observed the characteristics, socioeconomics, and maybe want to join the government. Marissa's heart stops. Hudson, I think. Shut up, the president interrupts. This guy's out of the unit for a week, and he wants to play games he's never even pick up the controllers for. I'm sorry for offering my service, Ignatius retorts with a quiet lick of offense. Marissa shakes her head. Let's just change the subject, shall we? Hudson obliges. Why don't you tell Ignatius about Liam, Marissa? All the color drains from Marissa. All the color drains from Marissa's face. Even her red hair turns white. The name brings her back to the worst moments of her life, a moment where violence and evil become inseparable. She drops the fork and knife, clearing her throat. I... I want somebody drown. I didn't save him, though. I could have. It was this boy. He was too innocent for his world. What I did was... Merciful, Hudson finishes. Tell me, Ignatius, how do you define mercy? Ignatius wipes his lift from the napkin. Leniency. It's like striking oil nowadays. Hudson smirks. You obviously haven't seen our refineries, then. We are a civilization that thrives pride on mercy. After conquering other civilizations, we take control because we have to. Because this civilization needs growth, recognition, and fear. Recognition and fear. We go for these as vulnerable, defenseless, and weak. How many colonies are you under your control? Nice to ask coldly. Twelve, and we're only growing. So is our army, too. You see, there's a formula to this game. Mathematical calculation behind power and control. Leonard Elliot had a great influence on mathematics, but he forgot one thing. These numbers are in our head. They're in our head. If they can transmute them and channel them into existing in this reality, then we could do the same with thought. After dinner, Hudson leads the nice down the hallway and most of the tents of the dishes. The president leads them to the guest room, where they talk in private. I'm sorry about that, Hudson states. You're our guest. I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. I feel quite the opposite, Ignatius insists. The place is heaven to me. Marissa, he sighs. She's still stuck in the past. She has a hard time moving on from things. People are a lot more vulnerable now. This is part of a form that makes it easy to control. Smart become aware of this and do as they please. Why are you telling me this if you don't believe I can make it in politics? I never said it was impossible, Hudson grins. The passion you felt when you were injured, I felt the same passion too. Somewhere along the line, I lost sight of who I was. I have completely different goals now. The power consumes you if you're not careful. Play your cards right. And only then you can pretty and understand the significance of every action, no matter how big or small. This is advice. You're preparing me. Yes, I see hope in you. With that, Hudson leaves the room. Later, Ignatius lays in the bed, gazing blankly at the oaken ceiling. Faint shouting from a nearby bedroom keeps him awake. The curiosity ceiling is insomnia. Just hours ago, Hudson pers- 
portrayed himself as a kind man with a few futures for his morality. Now, it's clear that's not the case. The president barges into the quarters, wherein Marissa straightens her hair. Son of Boo makes her jump, and she drops the device, jumping out of her seat to protect herself. A red glow of anger on his face tantalizes any sense of control. She cowers against the edge of the king-sized bed. Tears swell in her eyes. He looks like a cartoon character before steam shoots out from the nose and ears. There's no motive behind this outburst, no, no meaning, no, no rhyme. Sometimes Hudson just wants to show off his power for her, or force her into some submissive state of mind. He's nothing without her, but she can't leave him, no matter how much she wants to. The gravitational force for his abuse brings her back, like a satellite con or a gas giant. From a nice room, he hears the lamps breaking, erupts shouting matches, and shrieks for help. He doesn't know what to do, nor does he want to make the situation worse. If he intervenes, Hudson won't let him participate in any p- political affairs. If he doesn't, Marissa will turn into another violet. The name triggers the fleeting sensation of evil, that devil-like emotion even the most negative words can't describe. At his reassur- reassurance, he climbs out of bed, enters the hallway, and crosses over to the room where the cries emerge. Galpin he knocks on the door, and the muffled struggling ceases. It opens, and a weeping Marissa opens the door. Please, go away! Let me talk to her. The door opens wider, and the old president towards over the defenseless girl. Oh, hello. Hudson smiles, the audacity of that bastard. Did we wake you? A bit awake, he states. Listen, if I'm a guest here, I need you to treat me like one. I can't be the witness for this kind of shit, unless you want to keep your reputation. The president chuckles, realizing the cards he's playing. You're clever. You want us to be quiet? Fine, but if I catch your ass snooping, I'll kick it to the curb. And now he snaws his head. Duly noted. It's in this moment where Miss Marissa falls in love with him. Nobody has ever stood up to Hudson before out of the fear of it backfiring. Hudson's response surprises her, because he usually never sees anything for anyone. Perhaps she sees something in him that she didn't see. Whether that is, she sees it now. She needs a man like Ignatius in her life. Someone will protect her from harm's way. Kurt of Hensley is something she fails to recognize. It seals her down with everyone that intrigues her. With Ignatius, she doesn't feel doubt. This is real, and when love is real, only a fool pass on such an opportunity. After Hudson shuts the door, and after a whispering war, the president falls asleep, but Marissa remains awake. Upon hearing the telltale signs of sleep, she quietly removes the covers and falls to the floor with a distant thud. Reaching under the bed, she produces a small wooden box of her own creation. Laying on the floor, she opens the lid, revealing an empty interior. She wraps her hand around the false velvet bottom and pulls it out, smiling upon the sight of a palm-sized baggie. Inside, four grams of cocaine from a rogue cultist. She unzips the bag and slides up the blow, enjoying every second of his nasal consumption. Euphoria overwhelms any possibility of sadness, and the room around her spins as if her mind riding an invisible carousel of time. Her body shivers under the artificial, temporary happiness, and her heart rides the waves of tsunami. This is why she stays with him. If she didn't have anything to escape for, what would be the point? A loud banging at the door wakes Ignatius from a dream. Angry, he climbs out of the bed, wondering what time it is. He rubs his eyes and opens the door, and Marissa charges him with a romantic embrace. Ignatius accepts, giving it to First Lady's seduction. He claps on his bed in a volcanic eruption of lust. False perception of the love ringing out through the endless nights. After a climax, they rust, gazing into each other's blue green eyes. You know what I want, Ignatius states. Can you give it to me? In her unstable consciousness, she says, Yes, I'll do anything I get you. Lying, he replies with, What makes you think that you don't have me all by two? She leaves an hour later, sneaking back into the president's bed like a rapidly growing mold specimen. The dark night pours over like a sleepless Unitas, who can't stop thinking about his next move. He decides to trust Hudson's advice before the intervention. Anything he says now is up to speculation. He replies what Hudson said in his mind. This guy has been here for a week and he wants to play a game he's never picked up controllers for. What gives him the right to assume those things? What form does he have a hold over him? She's an aristocratic mindset. Hypnotizing his host through fame, fortune, popularity? Unable to sleep, he climbs out of his bed, roaming the empty halls in the wee hours of the morning. At some point, he finds an art gallery, where he basks in the poetic interpretations of life. Marble statues rest lifelessly over dangling chandeliers. Paintings from obscure artists line the walls, and artifacts of unknown value hide beneath the production of clear glass boxes on pedestals. One painting in particular speaks to him. He stands before it in awe. Beneath it, a golden plaque reads, Liberty Leading the People by Eugene Delacroix. The way the woman appears, reaching for victory with the rest of her men, this ignites like the first toke of DMT. It represents a certain part of his life he thought the universe forgot about. 
When he was charged in those jungle battles, battles which took place in a territory and ecosystem completely foreign to the freedom fighters, deep sorrow grows within him, feeling so ancient and the furore soul wipes it off the cobwebs. He gazes at the painting at his own reflection, a mirror from a different distant dimension, peeking into this one in less than a cosmic blink of an eye. This moment only lasts for a few seconds, but the stillness of Eugene's genius makes him understand that time is eternal. Perception creates the minutes, seconds, and the hours that go by. Beautiful, isn't it? states Hudson. When did you find it? There was an art museum here before we tore it down. Not all of these great works that I couldn't let go of, so I stored them in this room. So you built the presidential palace? Yes, before that, the presidents would sleep in luxurious secrecy on Alcatraz. Why do you do that to Marissa? You nitus. Sometimes you have to show people how to be strong. Marissa, she was weak before he met me. Now that she has something to endure, it hardens her. I want to be like you, Hudson. Nitus starts, but if you make it hard for me to have any form of respect for you whatsoever, I physically beat her. Even I wouldn't do that to someone. I think you're a coward. You will not talk to me like that in my goddamn palace. That's why I'm not sleeping here tonight. Years go by, past the mastery of my consciousness. And Nice becomes a self-starter, joining protests and negotiating with Marissa behind Hudson's back. Through blackmail, paying off debts, and signing life-threatening contracts, she gets ignited into the system. The Democrat government operates from the Capitol building. The Coliseum, a masterpiece right in the middle of the city. The ideology completely revives the values and standards of the Constitution. With additions by the same and insane, Tay catch is once the law written and it can't be undone. But the Constitution is a sacred record, and nobody has the power to tarnish its originality. Laws work differently here. There is no electoral college, ballot, or voters. Voters. The president is given fine laws during sessions, written by the sane and insane. His job is to put the most beneficial one into practice. There are four sessions or one each presidential term, one for each year the elect is in office. The people don't even have the power to vote for a president. His job is at the mercy of the elite. High-ranking acolytes from our current president concur into a cabinet. As the sands of time fly in the internal winds, Ignatius acclimates herself to a strange environment. He shaves his head, cleans himself up, and dons a white robe, its hood always covering his head. He slowly realizes why this is a standard uniform here. In prison, inmates experience something similar to downplay any sense of individuality. When there are no individuals, there are no individual thoughts. It's a manipulation, a literal form of hiding in plain sight. Nice takes note of some interesting events during this time. He oversees construction projects secretly, spying on the artifacts of their design. At one point, a train station forms before his eyes, built into the east walls if it's meant to go beyond the, uh, the boundaries. After talking to Mercer about this, she replies blankly, It's the law! This convinces him that someone has foreknowledge of the city's progression, that there are people who have a vision that they want to bring to life, and they're hiding behind the nose, beneath the nose. He spends weeks trying to find out who's in the city of the damned, and a list of names omits from the finding grinder of the tip of the pencil by candlelight. Dewey Duke, the economist. Like the doctor said, everything changed after his arrival. Duke currently leads the minting production of Alcatraz. People around here say he's a con artist. He scams prisoners out of their welfare for a lifetime of labor. This means that even when a prisoner serves their time in an island, they still have worked in the minting facility. This judge gives them a prison sentence, not a work sentence after all. The warden of the prison, Victor Harolds, can fill in the blanks with Dewey however he chooses. Victor Harolds has been the warden ever since the refounding of San Francisco. He rules over the captives with an iron fist, and legend has it that he keeps the human skulls of his victims in his office. Candles apparently rest in their mouths, flickering across the walls in a pattern broken by teeth and orifices. A true jack-o'-lantern. Overpopulation spikes at certain periods, but sometimes Ignatius notices empty houses where residents one once lived. One day, occupation, the next, abandonment. He doesn't know where the people go, but to be aware of it, unaware of it, out of the fear that whoever hears him talking about the subject has the power to send him away. Protests against Hudson skyrocket, and Ignatius takes this opportunity to join protests in an effort to join public morale, and to gain public morale. He holds conferences with the prominent civil activists, gains the trust of the Forchester surname, a very famous family and the elite class, he even hosts parties in the city's underground clubs. His personality is unique to him, and he feels confident that the people are on his side. Some nights, he lets himself go, doing drugs like MDMA and codeine. Unbeknownst to him, some government officials follow him, taking pictures of his shortcomings to bolster doubt. In some cathedrals, he speaks to the churchgoers about his backgrounds with religion. He tells them their story when he was captured, the moment when his life became God's. Crowds cheer and venerate his bravery, and Ignatius grins, remembering Hudson's advice. <gasps> He uses city cert current issues and formulates his own opinions while reflecting on how the public feels. 
Using his time wisely, he expresses his personality by becoming the city's only comedian. Through his daily practices, he invents a craft of his own, displaying himself by pointing out Hudson's flaws and captivating audiences through his dark humor. In one performance, he briefly mentions Violet before turning the subject to Athenia, his lost pet bird. In the election of 1982, he runs against Quentin Div Davidson in the Coliseum. Every politician in the city gathers in the stands, listening to men in black suits behind podiums. The debates go on for weeks until the politicians state their opinions. Davidson appeals to them more because of the, the plans to improve militaristic combat, to lay down on the fugitives who escape the plantations through an underground railroad, to implement a sewage system. Ignatius tries to prove himself through another method, by appealing to their sense of humor. However, Davidson's plans overshadow his performance, and Ignatius walks off the stage after the election, looking like a fool. The night, he passes by Brownstones, holding Marissa's hand. You need an agenda, Marissa states. You're not going to get away from them skits. You're not going to sway him either. I don't want anyone to hurt anyone like Davidson, Ignatius grunts with frustration. I actually want to make people feel better about this situation while also being their leader. Marissa scoffs. Ah, purity is not existent to the presidency. Do you know how Hudson got elected? He proposed the human trafficking project. Remember the train station we're asking about? Those bastards in the Coliseum. They're misanthropes. I don't understand, Ignatius sighs. I have this feeling, this dark void in my heart. I only felt it once, but it happened when I watched the little girl drown. I didn't save them, but I could have, even if they feel like that in Vietnam. That's like me and Leah. Yes, exactly. They stop walking, with Ignatius looks in her eyes. Why do we have to hurt people as they're nothing more than me on a conveyor belt? I didn't make the rules, that's just how this place works. A light bulb goes off in her head. Lie! What? Lie to them! Tell them all the bad things you want to do! When you get elected, don't do it! Do what you want to do! They'll call my bluff! They know how to read people! Just trust me! Do you want your life to change? Do you want to rise above your doubts? You're hypocritical! Becoming cuts and a coward! Because that's what you're being right now! She walks away. Four years later, after greatly improving himself, he runs against John Calvin, the founder of his own Calvinist philosophy. John immediately appeals to the occult, pioneering new ideas on how to spread the word of God. He proposes concerts, fairs, and the abolition of the dollar bill because of its decreasing value. It's here when Ignatius recognizes how he can accept and overcome his loss. The debate coordinators never ask him anything first. For some reason, they always start off with the guy to the left. When Ignatius gets a chance to propose his ideas, they're already focused on what Calvin wants. It's strange how one topic can captivate millions while also binding them. John defeats Ignatius in the end, giving our antagonists more time to prepare for the next show. In the election of 1990, he runs against Fiona Forchester, Fabian's wife. The Forchesters are crucial to San Francisco's operation. Their wealth and generosity fan away any feelings of paranoia or doubt. They volunteer at fire stations, donate to hospitals, and have a great influence on how things work in the call scene. It's here where Ignatius finally gives in to Marissa's words. He speaks before she can. I know who I think I'm a nobody, United States, but I can show you that there's more than meets the eye. I've been trying to gain your attention over the past 12 years, and if I lose today, I'm not going to stop. That damn feeling of pure evil rises within him. The more he accepts it, the more the crowds appear intrigued. I need all of you to hear my words. I'm well aware of our overpopulation crisis, and I'm well aware of how we could solve it more efficiently. The darkness that killed Violet consumes him again, and the evil within fuels his words. That train station we're building, we can link it up to whatever we're sending the victims who are at their houses one day, but gone the next. Whatever you guys are doing to them, we can make them disappear at a faster rate. We need to conquer more colonies to end the puppet states. Destroy them is the decision when they have valuable resources that we need. Before the Civil War, plantation owners have this contraptions that they went over the heads of slaves. It was a device with the bell on it. When activated, we crush the victim's head instantly. If we had that for us, ladies, we wouldn't be too keen on joining the underground railroad. For once, if they cheer his words. For once, he feels a strange mixture of evil and gratitude, and wherever that former emotion is, it gives him this power, so he lets him take over. After the debates, the Coliseum finally ignites Ignitus. Alex Ignitus. That evening, he arrives at the presidential palace, where he tears down the Christ, the Redeemer statue. Before entering, he hears the familiar call of a bird landing on him, behind him. Turning, he spots Athenia in all her glory, smirks, and invites the bird inside. Now, several years later, Ignatius finds himself staring into the eyes of a beaten Helen. Beneath the curtain of darkness, a pistol in his hand. Do you want to know the meaning of that story? Helen, I let immorality consume me, because it lets me win. Get my people into the mindset, because that's how we become feared. That's how we get people to fall in line. You scare them. They become vulnerable. Vulnerable. 
What? What? What do you to kick the wasp nest? No, you do. What the hell? You, you go down with Babylon! He raises the gun to her head, cocking the pist pistol with a grin. Why did you want to do this? Some part of you should have known how this was going to end. Sobbing, she replies, Ever since you got elected, I wanted things to change. I saw that you were going to do with those slaves, and I wanted an inevitable massacre. Do you have any idea? Do you, do you, do you know how many people you killed with those things? 23,670 people. I have a book filled with every first and last names of your victims. I was the last. I was the one who pioneered the, the Underground Railroad. Now other people are following in my steps. People like me, we don't go away. People like you, just create more of us. This isn't who we are, and you know it. Ignatius pulls the trigger. Bright light entwining with a de deafening blast bursts through the chamber. Thenia flaps her wings, lets out a cry, and shoots up to the rafters alongside the ceiling. The president lowers the gun and leaves. Here and Thenia descend to pick at the corpse's flesh. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8, The Babylonian War, Part 1 Timothy leans over the safety rails, holding the spot on his stomach where Ignitus shot him. He overlooks the workings of complex machinery. Steam-powered engines ignite the lives of conveyor belts, gargantuan pistons, slide collectors, saws, gears, gizmos, and nameless diamonds in an alchemist's rough. Humans are the puppeteers of the machine world. We pull the strings so they can make what we need. Every time Timothy watches this scene unfold before him, he usually feels accomplishment, pride, and greed. Now he feels anxiety. He wears protective eye equipment, shielding his eyes from the excess molten material from ores, whose supply is extremely low. A layer of sawdust covers the main floor, and workers pour every ounce of energy they can into making guns and ammunition. They all fear the day when things run dry. What tactics will they resort to just to keep existing? Timothy turns away, rejecting these thoughts. In his office, he finds his tomb, opening it to a blank page. Dipping a quill in ink, he scrawls out his mindset as if preparing for everyone to see a silver platter. The days are much longer now. The fields are gone, and what we have in the silos won't last us through winter. We were just about to harvest the greenhouses. Everything feels so... premature. My men are tired, sleepless and frail. The war effort is futile in my opinion. Even with what we're making now, it won't be enough. Enough is never enough anymore. It's getting to the point where I can't tell a bullet from a whisper. Knocking interferes with his progress. He opens the door and in comes the queen, cradling Alice. Her prosthetic hand rubs the infant's hair as it snores against her chest. Timothy smiles. I can't believe I didn't notice you were pregnant. Morris had to tell me near the end. You have your projects, Echo says, closing the door behind her. I need a favor from you. And what's that? I'm going to fight in the war. I don't care what Forrest thinks. I'm more useful with my people. During this time, I need you to adopt Alice. I don't want her to be alone, and I can't find a nanny. Everyone in the city is too scared for their own families. Echo, I wouldn't have any time for her. She'd be alone in the room for an unknown amount of time. I don't even have a crib for her to sleep in. Are you the one who would always want more recognition than Marilyn? This is your golden opportunity. If you do this, people will notice and respect you for taking care of the monarchy's child. Who will lead us when you're gone? We live under martial law for now. The guards are here for your leaders, and they communicate with us before they do anything. In a way, we're still leading. <coughs> How will the communication be possible? By creating our own temporary Pony Express. Timothy shakes his head. Everything's getting more complicated by the day. Sometimes I wish he would have just killed me on the scene. Why do you think he let me live? Psychopaths have their own way of doing things, believe me. Does it make a difference anymore to be a psychopath or an empath? Why do you think I don't want Alice to experience alienation? Yes, it makes a difference. The gunsmith shrugs his shoulders. You're right. I'm going to find some blankets so I can set her up in the drawer. Hell, if they invade us, she'll probably be safer in here. Echo smirks. That's the spirit. Outside Portland, Oregon, a man emerges from the sewer system, climbing through the open mouth of a manhole. 
Across his chest, a satchel. On his face, the scars of distant fights and tormentors. One scar is the shape of the number 33. He takes a deep breath, decompressing after sneaking through a city filing up itself with mil militaristic outposts. Where did these people come from, and what are their motives for setting on an unnecessary property? He gets a bad feeling for the road, but disregards it for the sake of his own sanity. <coughs> the man reaches into his satchel, producing a compass. A smirk forms upon the affirmation that he's going down the right path. Repeating the directions, he says in a whispered breath beneath the pitch of howling snowfall, 46.1879 degrees north. 123.8313 degrees west, Astoria. Nodding, he presses onward, away from an impending conflict of historic proportions. The Babylonian knights march with steady pacing alongside the stallion brethren. Nobody could skip a beat in this line of work. Behind him, medics walk alongside the pushers of cannons and the carriers of gunpowder barrels. Uncertainty and motivation become their engine, their grit the fuel. They hold shields in front of their own iron breastplates. Swords rest in leather scabbards and straps keep Timothy's guns against their backs. Heather and Forrest lead the pack on horseback. The king wears his own set of armor, a crown, and a black cape. Heather dons a bulletproof mask, vest, and copper leggings. In her possession, a Thompson submachine gun. In Forrest, an AKM. They reach a bridge that leads into the city. Beneath it, bodies rest with the river's frozen state. I have a proposal, Heather states. We take a peek our mansion. I've seen pictures of the place before. My militant live there. It's a fortress. We can use it as a stronghold for our effort. We're not separating during battle, the king retorts. We have to stick together, safety in numbers. The mansion is the key to our victory. The location, the magnitude, the interior vantage points. We take it, we win. It's a stronghold. You know we need one, too. Either way, you put me in charge, and if I see a chance, I'm taking it. Horace chuckles. Ha. Huh. When did you become so stubborn? Fine, have it your way. Just be bullets fly through the windows of boarding skyscrapers. The knights scatter, triggering a field of bouncing betties. The acolytes are already here, preparing the site for their own benefit. Heather rapidly gathers up a squadron of 60 soldiers. A falling skyscraper crumbles upon the road that connects her to Forrest, leaving her no choice but to fight towards the mansion. Whatever this is, it's an unfair fight. Ethical rules broken, the disturbance of nature's balance. Nobody feels guilt about what Echo's doing on another battlefield right this very second. <coughs> Downtown, Forrest hides behind the remains of a police cruiser. Aiming over its hood, the acolytes who stand proudly upon windowsill after windowsill. Medics drag bleeding Babylonians into the lobbies of distant holes and corporations. Others prepare cannons behind metal shields and barricades of sandbags. Rusty military equipment from the early days lie beneath winter's weight thanks to the Russian EMP. Skeletons of helicopters rest in street craters, and FEMA tents reek of decay. During the riots, the city was a base of some sort. Evacuation signs line the facades of some buildings, proving this area knew more than the surrounding regions. Ignitus is here somewhere. You have to find him. The king reloads his AKM. Where would I even begin to look? Follow the alleyway to your right. There aren't any booby traps. There's going to be a warehouse on the other side. He's in there, preparing a cargo van for delivery. Well, how do you know that? You'll understand soon enough. Before he rejects, the feeling of memorizing submission overwhelms any chance of rebellion. Despite his attempts to stay put, instinct, promo instinct prompts the king to follow their ambiguous path. Whether it be the control of him or volunteering, he accepts. Whatever clues that help the Babylonians win is necessary. He listens to the voices, slaughtering anybody that doesn't wear armor. If it wasn't for the Babylonians' loyalty for the king, he'd already be dead. Several peasants sacrificed themselves for an idea born of mental illness. The fact only known to Heather and Echo. He doesn't understand why he told the commander. Was it the sickness that broke the straw of silence? Perhaps it was the pressure of keeping quiet all these years. Everything about that moment is a mystery to him. The strangest part about it is that he doesn't feel regret. Revealing something like that should leave some sting behind, some afterthought of hindsight. He doesn't recall feeling such an emotion. Was that moment 
a nebulous haze of a choice that right one to make, or has he had yet to suffer the consequences? There, that's it! His eyes land on the metallic gar garages of a giant compound. A steel door in the facade. No guards nearby. You'll be fine. He doesn't even know you're here. He tries reloading his AKN, but he gives up upon noticing a lack of ammunition. Dropping the gun and drawing the sword, he approaches the warehouse, gunfire echoing through the evening. Gulping, he opens the door, revealing not a workshop, but the bedroom of his old house. A bright ray of sunlight from an unknown source casts a heavenly glow over the furniture. The universe shows, shoves him inside, but he keeps a tight grasp on the sword's hilt. He's not in Portland anymore. He's back in the 50s. A record player from the living room blares wartime propaganda. His mother sings Earth Angel, Will You Be Mine by the Penguins. A dog barks in the front yard. The smell of cooking eggs retreat relieves his sinuses. He approaches the door to the rest of the house, wrapping his hands around the knob. How is this possible? This can't be real. The king pushes it open, inviting whatever's on the other side. He meets the old hallway and ignites his eyes open. The villain produces a dagger from his pocket and cuts the rope, dropping to his feet with a steady thud. The Babylonians take a violet swing, and he is back in the warehouse. Before him, the Archim Archimede, wielding a melee weapon longer and sharper than the king's. Every strike that takes sends force back to childhood memories. These forces clash through his past, all while the world burns around them. The voices replace the president with people he believes he cares about. Echo, Heather, Marilyn, Timothy. Terror c consumes the monarch. Any lethal swipe can mean the death of someone who actually deals with him. The room spins in a beautiful dance of the balance between life and death, of good and evil. Sweat drips to the cement floor, evaporating in mere milliseconds. If one's, life could on, if one's life could depend on one wrong movement or stance, uh, the, this moment is unjustifiable evidence of that idea. A fatal miscalculation sends Forrest to his back. The president stands over him, knocking the king's sword out of his hands. You see, your majesty, this is what you get for making the deal with them. Way back when you met Marissa, you neglect to realize we can be manipulative too. Oh fuck. <laughs> Do you think I want to kill you? Ignitus shrieks, howling with laughter. Ha! That would be too merciful. I don't care where I end up, Horace retorts. As long as you're dead after this, that's all that matters. The president kicks the fallen monarch in his head. No, you don't get to say things like that anymore. Do you think actually you think you're going to get away with what you've done? You didn't think that there would be some balancing to counteract your ego. That's my fucking job now, and now you're paying me for it. He makes a beeline for the cargo van, returning with handcuffs. The totalitarian restrains the king against the pipe, one wrist separating the foe from a rabid death. Do you want to know something, Forrest? We're not different. All of your men are going to die because of your arrogance. What did you want to show off by starting this? Didn't you see my forces just now? Force spits in his face. I will not forego hope. I didn't build Babylon over the course of 30 years for nothing. She has a voice, and it's time people finally hear it. Ignitus kneels before him. What makes so you so dense? What causes you to reject the fact that we're the same person? Is this war your cowardice move to avoid acceptance? Can't you smell the blood of your people? Can't you hear the screams from mine? Your life is built around these delusions of grandeur, and I want to be the one to make you see that. We are- Don't say it! Distant explosions shake the building. That cargo van I have is built under armored plating. When your people get here, I want you to see me take you hostage. Why the fuck did you decide to take me on alone? Why do you want to be like me, Ignitus? What? I'm not repeating myself. Every time I see you, you always bring it up. Why do you idolize me like that? Idolize? If anything, I look at you as the worst possible version of myself. Do you want to know the funny thing about life? A few moments and instances is all it takes for someone to become good or evil. You understand this. You deliberately choose the darker path. Pretty soon, I'm going to be just like you. Is this what your life has become? 
staring into the reflection of a downward spiral. And killing Alex started this. You came into a territory you had no permission to cross into. No one's ever stood up to you. That ends now. And if these are Babylon's final hour, then if she burns, so be it. At least you won't step foot on her ground. The guy just chuckles. Ha, ah, damn, you are a fighter, aren't you? Many people have you killed. More than you. Babylonians. Can Babylonian cannons strike the roof, and the president knocks the king unconscious. Fuck it, thought I had more time. Retaining his calm, he frees the Babylonian's wrist from the pipe and drags him into the man's cargo hold, escaping the Mercer's fort. Elsewhere, Heather leads her own squadron of Babylonians to their final destination. Whilst fighting down the winding streets, through the ruins of strip malls and skyscrapers, among the bodies from fallen survivors, they stumble upon the Acolyte's booby traps. Bouncing Betty's leap into the air, detonating at less than a meter. Projectiles spray out in every direction imaginable. Thanks to the iron amp, thanks to the iron armor, most knights come out unscathed. However, some blasts severely injure the weaker ones, and they collapse to the ground, welcoming their inevitable fate. Some fall into pits dug right out from the center of an asphalt pathway. Poison darts strike the exposed parts of many, killing them almost instantly. The Vietnam War clearly gave inspiration for those jungle entrapments. The road to Patak comes to sight for the bloodiest spot in the battle. Bullets, grenades, and the consistency of the pair rips Portland apart from the seams. To the millionaire iso isolate isolationist taxpayer, the worst part of war is property damage. To the survivor, it's dealing with their own actions. What would you do if you were in these streets? Barely able to see more than 10 feet ahead of you become to dust, snow, smoke, and debris? How would you cope with the loss of a best friend, neighbor, or romantic interest? Would you watch them bleed, or would you run? In war, those are your two options when it comes to those moments. Heather learns to use her time wisely. Strategy is born out of patience, not selfishness. Throughout this philosophy, she guides the remaining Babylonians down this road from hell. During this time, she realizes that there is no difference between good and bad during the war. Boundaries dissolve into a fray of your own life. Second, self-actualization hurdle everything into a melting pot of chance, risk, and reward. Desperation turns into the most useful tool against the enemy, and it's all the Babylonians have. At one point, the commander triggers a bear trap, and metallic prongs cling to her iron leggings. The knights come to her aid, but a bomb lands just inches in front of the trap. It explodes, separating the leader from help. Medics break through, pulling her into a nearby pizzeria. Outside, the fighting continues. Some acolytes follow Heather to the hideout, where knights protect the temporary triage center. Triage center. On a table, on a table, Heather tears off the bulletproof mask, shrieking as medics peel off the bear trap, whose prongs are sharp enough to pierce through iron armor. The doctors scramble for their first aid equipment, retrieving stitches, rubbing alcohol, gauze, and painkillers. After stitching and dressing the wounds, she sits upright. Well, a doctor asks, can you walk? She puts pressure on the leg, smiling upon managing the stand. <coughs> Need a puncture of the vital, the armor must have cushioned the impact. Relief, a timeout. The talk's not far from here. When we get there, we have to be ready to pry from those bastards' hands. A knight approaches the door, scoffing. You think they're already there? Any component strategist would make it a stronghold. She sighs. There's going to be a lot of people there, more than what we've seen so far, probably. When we take it, we're going to win. That's all that matters. No sacrifice is pointless anymore. From here, grip fuels their survival. During the Battle of Thermopylae, August or September of 480 BC, 300 Spartans fought the Persian army until they all died. The Babylonians feel the same aura. The Acolytes outnumber the knights in a ratio of 5 to 1. From what they see during battle, Heather's troop concludes that most of them are skillful at combat. Finally, they reach Patak Mansion, where the residents of San Francisco stockpile their resources. Now only 96 knights remain. In this building, Heather calculates a range from 150 to 235. Low on ammunition, medical equipment, and energy, they conjure whatever motivation they can to bring Heather's plan into reality. 
Accolade snipers position themselves in this mansion's windows, firing in unison at the approaching knights. Batak's architecture comes from the styles of a French Renaissance chateau. It was built in 1909 as a private estate for Henry and Georgina Patak. Henry was a publisher, active in Republican politics, and the greatest grandfather of the header. Thanks to her background, Commander knows of several secrets that will be useful to them after they obtain the outpost. Memories of this place flow through that frail, frail grandfather Heather. Thanks to her background, oh. On her 14th birthday, January 18th, 1943, after Henry's death, the family gathered here to celebrate the announcement of Heather becoming the high, high risk to the Batak fortune. She enjoyed the money for a few years, right up until the blackout. However, she's glad the blackout took every material thing out of her life. Greed was getting to her head, and if she kept going down that road, she figured she'd turn out to be dislike or worse than Ignitus. She cowers behind an ice cream truck, bullets sipping by in every direction. Some Babylonians fall from cases of friendly fire, others are crushed under the weight of vehicles after being launched into the air by grenades. Just when she thinks there's no hope, cannonballs fly through the mansion's window striking the snipers and sending them to their maker. The facade becomes the focal point of the conflict, and when the acolytes feel desperate, they charge out of the mansion, wielding melee weapons of all shapes and sizes, each blade reflecting the sun's winter rays. The Babylonians, now out of ammunition themselves, fight fire with fire. Iron clashes against steel. Sparks from instant contact spray in every direction. Shields block fatal swings, and sighs of relief blend in with passing winds. It's here where Heather declares this event the Siege of Katak, cataloging in her mind's database. These just stop moments will come together under her umbrella term, the Babylonian War. She thinks about how Marilyn will teach about this day in the future, and this gives her the motivation to continue. In the back of her mind, she knows the other knights to have these same thoughts. Somehow, they'll get them back from the acolytes. They'll eventually breach the stronghold, pushing the cultists into the building. One of the topmost rooms, Brandon Sherman, United's most trustworthy lieutenant, reloads an FN mag. He wraps a coil of ammo around his shoulders, hoisting the heavy equipment into the air. Rage pulls him into the hallway, where he proceeds downstairs. The tables turn against the Babylonians upon his arrival. Bullets pierce through armor, and Heather has to hide beneath the fallen knights to survive. She remains here as the clash continues, but miraculously, the Babylonians press on, leaving it everything they can. Eventually, Brandon runs out of bullets, and the knights get the upper hand. The acolytes retreat, pouring into the mansion's front lawn. Her shoulder aid the commander to her feet. We need to prepare this place. They'll be back. A female volunteer asks, Where do we start? Heather smirks. Grab whatever guns you have. Find whatever ammo you have. Position yourselves at the windows. I have a surprise for everyone. In the mansion's library, she approaches a large painting. Smiling, she removes the artwork, revealing a hidden hatch on the other side. Wrapping her hands around its knob, she opens it, revealing a valuable stockpile of guns and boxes in event of the ammunition. Henry was also a gun collector. He supported the Second Amendment, albeit a select few of the arms inside are illegal. When the knights receive the weapons, confidence flows through the mansion like a cloud of gas. Heather does another head count, counting to number 35. They wait until nightfall for the next attack. <coughs> Snow continuously falls from the sky, blanketing the front lawn in a heavenly virgin white color. To Heather, this moment represents the worst side of the chaos and order par par paradigm. They're all cold, scared, but waiting to protect an idea that's clearly worth dying for now. Babylon has never experienced something like this before. However, an aura of understanding rings through her heart, where they're all experiencing it together. A knight standing beside Heather says, Why didn't you get the guns before they took over the mansion? How was I supposed to know about Oregon's involvement? I didn't have enough time. The Babylonian soldier shifts his position, exhaustion consuming his psyche. Tell me why we're doing this. It's because of Alex. Heather scoffs. Oh, he was your leader for years. 
That's how you honor him? What if it was? If it's simply because we can't coexist with them. Force want this. He wants Babylon to succeed. Sometimes kingdoms have to do this for this kind of shit to become empires. Suddenly, cast canisters land in the front yard. Poisonous mist emits from the equipment, and the Babylonians naively duck beneath broken windows, covering their faces with anything they could find. Some knights resist the clouds, firing into the darkness as black shadows approach the mansion like demons crawling out of hell. Acolytes don masks and suits to protect them against the forces of this terrible retaliation. What they have up their sleeve is bromide, a powerful chemical capable of melting flesh to the bone. Abiding by intuition, Heather abandons the scene through a first floor window overlooking the backyard. The Babylonians can't afford to lose another commander, not at a time like this. The captain always goes down with their ship, but what happens when that captain is morally obligated to protect the future of the idea they built this ship? Will people only remember her as a woman who went AWOL from this moment on, or will she be lucky enough to have no survivors following that scent? It is morbid to hope for the latter at the risk of banishment. Dante Alighieri was an Italian poet at the late Middle Ages. He was exiled from Florence for being an absconder. That aura Frankenstein itself back into Babylon. A crude repeat of that mystic event. That night, the cruelest form of slaughter occurs with toxic, impenetrable walls. As poison engulfs the land, Babylonians rip off their armor, surrendering to Brandon. Guns dying knights down with his machine gun. By the time his reign ends, blood paints every surface imaginable. He notices the erupt increase of the guns. Stealing them, the lieutenant takes a moment to treasure the aroma of death. The thick crimson scent blending with copper. His men return to their regular duties before Heather's arrival. They clear out the bodies, waiting for the gas clouds to disappear. But they don't dig graves. Instead, Babylonian corpses now line the front yard acting as a final warning. The commander copes with her failure, returning to the fight downtown with an Owen gun, over 90 people dead because of her within the course of the evening. Is this effort to change things futile? Combing over similar thoughts, Heather wonders what her next move will be. Gathering more Babylonians for second attack? Fishing downtown? Which option contains the least amount of casualties? What saving grace can prevent their destruction? If Emperor Clovis gets a cross in the sky from God that helps his people win the fights, the same force should allow Babylonians the power to conjure hellhounds to right the acolytes' wrongs. During her return downtown, Heather realizes that Al Alagiri's crime wasn't that he was an absconder. His true act was publishing a vision, which the world wasn't ready for. Babylon is anxious to this chain of thoughts, and it motivates the commander to push the AWOL event out of her head. For now, at least. She can't go back to the talk. Brandon has his hands on what she was after anyway. What is she going to tell Forrest? Outside of Portland, King wakes up in the back of Nice's van. Its wheels rumble across the bumpy road in the boonies of the apocalypse. At some point, the Babylonian lost his crown and burnt away the purple cage. In the material, he wears a leather garments which Ignatius put on during his coma. The voices did this on purpose. Havoc is their only reason for existence. Snow howls outside the cargo hold. Distant gunfire fades quickly into the background. He rubs his eyes, acclimating himself. They knew this would be the outcome. He fell for the seduction like he always does. Turning his head to the left, a hallucination of Echo sits quietly. She lays her cold, ghostly hands on his lap, and tears flow down the king's cheeks. Pure exhaustion rings through his heart. Leaving everyone out to his spirits. <coughs> I'm so tired, Echo. Heather isn't. Rubbing his eyes, he says, What? Talk was a failure. More than 90 people gone, and they just left to survive during a gas attack. Bewilderment, heartbreak, and hopelessness. Why did I trust him? Why do I trust you? Hey, Echo, why would I lie to you? You're a mirage. Am I? Perhaps some part of me is permanently stuck to you. Do you think those voices are yours? You know who I am. Had I not met you? There's an undeniable impact I have on you, and you know what it is. My submission, your control. He chokes on his words. Why do you stay with me after everything I've done for you? 
I believe in Babylon. Yo, yo, you're a psychopath. I wanted to succeed just as much as you. Future generations are among us, but I want them to remember it for good reasons. Do you want to kill me? If I did, we wouldn't be talking. Do you hate me? I'm not, not allowed to do so. Oh. Thing is, first. <coughs> One day, this will come crumbling down around you. Everything about what you think about, you know about me will change. And when it does, you have to be ready. I'm starting to decode your game. And your selfish ego prevents you from apprehending my capabilities. You try using schizophrenia as a gift. You obsess over that need. Get to see who you really are. Echo, I love, I love you. I love you too. <coughs> the apparition disappears. Shadows dance across the walls. Whispers following their tails. The road grows bumpier. And it's as if the van's driving off the road now. Before the climax of this vision, the cap smashes into a tree. Everything upside down. Crash breaks the cargo's hold doors open. Winter's screams flow into the mobile cell. Force doesn't block out, but a severe headache forms in his cranium upon regaining stability. He stumbles outside, falling dazzledly to his knees. Surrounding him, miles of bare bark corpses. Now they steer so far, of course. Standing up, he scans the environment for any signs of the president. The monarch then investigates the cab, finding a broken shield, an airbag, and an empty seat beneath puddles of blood. His eyes land on footprints leading away from the scene. Into the woods, malice grows with every step as he follows the trail like a bloody tracking and escaping. Terminus is a word that means end of the line. And whoever stands at the end of this one is the physical embodiment of that very definition. The snowfall hastens, and nature covers up any leaves. He finds himself stumbling through an empty landscape, little protecting from him from harm. Somewhere in the distance, a wolf's cry echoes through desolation. Fear overwhelms his bravery, but he doesn't know which way to go. Back in the van, he'll find nothing. Same goes for if he continues down this path. When you're lost, the only way is through. The repetition of the mantra feels from his king's motivation. Whether or not those hellhounds attack him is up to nature. It's his time, and it's his time. Nature's selection will never turn its back on the world's policy office. He is take up power away from something so omnipresent. It's just a first. The you know how close you have become one of us. You have to recognize you are the victim yourself. There's a pack of wolves nearby and they're hunting you. You don't have to lie to the sea anymore. You're going to end up dead soon anyways. He feels eyes peering at him so beneath dead trees. Sensation exists all around him as if there's no more than five stalkers. The worst part of his situation is his grounding in reality. What if the voices are playing tricks on him? How would it feel to let one of those fanatical cryptids chew away at his arm? It's a pointless search for a deep and meaningless event. After all, symptom schizophrenia is believing that ordinary event has special and personal meaning. Silhouettes of ravenous beasts wax and wane into the endless mist. The devil's pets are circling, talking weak Babylonians after vultures flying high above the pride. Crawling from ben behind stops all movement. Running, running ahead would be suicide. Turning around would yield the same results. They say that God made the hardest choice by sacrificing his son for his sins. If somebody could be put in a worse situation like that. Ben Bots. Humanoid figure emerges from the storm. She's at least 13 years old, whereas Tiara put herself in a blue corset. To the left hand, the tip of a golden scepter. Or stops. Who are you? Shinaya Narabanadad. He squints. Alice? Yes. How can that be possible? Your mind is powerful. What's that saying you were taught in school? Mind over matter. Are you real? Is anything around you real? Can't your delusional conceptions of leadership withstand the stands of time? I'm sorry. For leaving you alone. He has to protect his people. I'm trying to show them that I'm not a fraud. It's because of you dodging the draft in Vietnam, isn't it? How do you know that? He exclaims. I had no choice. The army would have found out. And I would have been sent to an asylum. Do you know how hellish those places are? She grabs him by the hands. Come with me. Where are you going? 
You'll see. Wolves pounce at them, showing their razor blade molars. By far helps the animals blend in with the surroundings like chameleons. When they attack, they disappear, leaving Forrest in a constant state of catatonia. Alice becomes the only thing that controls his movement. Further down the path, the karma wrong appearing. In the middle of it, Gallo is burning to the ground. Babylonian corpses encompass the murder machines. They're all of Forrest's victims manifesting in one area. Show how far he really is. That girl leads him to the bodies, gesturing over their deflating position. You know how many people you killed? Your own people? No. Do you know the effects such as demonstrations have on the populace? No. What's the last time you felt regret? Oh yeah. Why do you need to know that? Alice smirks. Don't worry, Dad. Anything you say is completely confidential. His eyes fixate on the fire. A few years ago, Echo went beyond the walls. This was during a time where anyone could... She, she, she was hunting at the bell rips off her arm. The most captivating thing about this stasis story is that the, she managed to kill it. Do you want to know the first thoughts my brain came up with after I heard that story? At least you have more meat. That's when I forced myself to feel sorry for someone else's pain. I didn't want the burdens of an ego. I just wanted to care. I, I still want to care, but I don't want to get too attached to anything. Anyway, after that event, that's when we become isolationists. Follow me again. Isn't the trail back to the van in the other direction? All paths lead to the same destination. Everything happens for a reason. Just go with the flow. You don't understand. Babylon's at war right now. I have to be with my people. They'll know who to thank after this is over. So you're only fighting for your ego. Isn't that why anybody fights beneath all the facades we project? It's not the act of survival or something to be proud of. How about the act of helping your people? You haven't changed at all. To some part that you want to get better. Of course. Who can I trust now? If I tell anybody, we'll face revolution. I wasn't afraid of that when you told Heather. He gulps, remembering that distant night in the hospital. I was sick, delusional. I didn't know what I was saying. Have you talked about this since then? About the war or not? That, though. Does Echo know you have told her? No, we're going to talk about it when this is over. In that case, let's get a move on. Ten minutes of walking past, and they happen upon the ruins of a slaughterhouse. Sign, door, sign on the door, no trespassing. Conscious of her decision, Alice leads him to the relic. Here, he begins coughing from winter's exposure. The girl leads him to the main floor, where black, infinitely rotten carrion dangles from hooks. The pool doesn't keep the swarms of maggots and flies from partaking in their usual behavior. Thankfully, this area seems to be a suitable hideout. Alice sighs. You went back to the van. Hypothermia. At least you have a cough. Just a cough. How long do I have to be here for? Till the snowfall stops. Does Ignitus make it? How would I know that? You seem to know everything about me. His people are traveling in mobile campsites. Like the tribes. We'll find one eventually. Even if he's wounded. What's to see you fall before he dies? I doubt the crash was fatal. You know where we are. Southern Oregon. Long ways from Babylon. Where can I go from here? Do you remember what Malin said all those years ago? The path to heaven begins in hell. This is your hell for us. This can be your chance to redeem yourself. Back downtown, Heather joins the Babylonian knights as they swarm a skyscraper. They flood into the lobby, drawing their blades against the for forces of a seizable vantage point. The roof gives way to the perfect aerial view of Patak Mansion. Vital pathway for the commander's next decision. With an urge of hope, the commander fights with her people to the top of the tower. The thing that terrifies her the most about war are the screams of the dying. Some cry out for God, begging for their father to just let them come home. No available medics, people die on the scene. Heather feels guilty for surviving the bear traffic, so as if she needs to experience what they're experiencing and get a full understanding of what she did to those people after his sight. She turns her focus away from these things coming in on her fighting capabilities and bravery. The skyscraper becomes, becomes vital to the Babylonian success. Stairwells and narrow hallways paint themselves on the blood of the weak. Smoke clouds build up from consistent gunfire. 
choking some to death. The battle damages the skyscraper's structural integrity. When the knights reach the rooftop, it sways slowly, barely noticeably, beneath their feet. They steal snipers from fallen acolytes, taking their position among the rooftop. Below, the fighting continues in the streets. Who knows how long they have until their enemies reach them again. Neither watches an expert shooters calculate wind currents. Their crosshairs focus on the toxic facade, finding humanoid shadows in the snowfall. Hellfire rains down upon their foes, surprising all inside the mansion. One Babylonian manages to find Brandon. A fatal error sends a bullet flying right above Sherman's shoulders. The commander turns their attention to the main conflict, ensuring the building's safety from those goddamn acolytes. The thing that worries her is that if the battle inflicts any more damage on the skyscraper, it will collapse. As the scene unfolds before everyone's eyes, a dreadful aura consumes the battlefield. His intuition grows stronger with every passing second. Heather finds a source after looking over his shoulder. A fleet of airships from San Francisco over the eastern horizon. They fly in a 3 x 3 grid pattern. Hatches that chrome their underbellies allow good passage for bombs. Only chance Babylonians have is shooting at the fabric. Amada! Screams the commander. We have to go! Uh, we lost people on the way here. Towards the night, we just can't forget that shit. We're not, I am keeping you alive, we can remember it. But now we have to leave! Go where? Previous Babylonian inquires. Heather moves over the roof axis. Back to the fight! We need to end this! The fleet arrives quickly, dropping explosive into unsuspecting knights. Buildings collapse under the responsibilities of retaining themselves in this environment. Bear in mind, Heather knows Force made the right call in negotiating boundaries. If this took place at Babylon, it lose a lot more than the farmlands. Every time she closes her eyes out of shock, fear, or disarray, Brandon's face still appears. He is the only consistent throughout right now. That's for good reason. She figures killing him would redeem himself from losing the Saiga Patak. The only way to achieve this is by drawing Brandon away from the mansion. She used to success fly high overhead, but they're not at her reach. Uncertainty is a leading force of expression in the universe. The balance between good and evil is only but a small part of a sum of our collective unconscious. War and uncertainty share a nuclear bond, a bond almost atomic. For the scars of both ring through endless centuries like the blast of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Nothing is clear during those periods. Nebulous demands bounce off a climate where negative change is the only consistency. People believe that since we aren't born with murderous limbs like tusks, horns, or claws, this means we weren't built to kill one another. That's why soldiers turn out with mental disorders. It was apparent to Heather that this idea is false. If a man is capable of you know, construct weapons, mass destruction, all alone, even protect his home, and he, deep down he always feel killing be justifiable to some extent. The fleet pulverized Babylonians, found some their night climbing clown towers in desperate effort to destroy sky demons. At this point, food supplies are close to zero, ammunition on either side drying up like a bomb desert. Even the bullets, the bullets steal from the factory are gone. Somehow, he managed to take down two zeppelins with a bazooka. Alone for third shot, one blind and land two feet, ten feet away. She evacuates the scene, dropping the burning bridge out of obsolescence. Surf to Portland goes Swiss cheese. Braves polka dot landscape like child with smallpox. Third zip and goes down because of lack of fuel. Fourth blast flare gun. Fifth from nice and I'm pilot. Rats go down center in a similar manner. Of course, two hours. I'm about to arm my dies there in Babylon, no more severe the blood out of their rivals. That's what won't expose to this technology. One of our fours build battle on their kingdom. Why don't we have this equipment? Our central restraint moral progression. Once the enemy of Dark Age is completely is doing it right. Moment five common bullets run dry. Hand in hand combat ripped through fabric sanity. Survives both sides remain the state of use kill them. no matter how hard they try. Won't be able to forget about this tragedy. The interesting thing about war is that although we perceive us side of the enemy, they still go home feeling the same regret. Sorrow and moral decay. So, well, you know, the essence of a style machine exists primarily at the core of any wall. Because it's difficult to perceive one's right to exist. Conflict forces may confront their religious beliefs, some toss away while others pick it up. Agalize wants sense of self doubt, capitalizing up a damn in Babylon. Our circle held forms around and from. 
all of them right? wins a mixed fire incredible comical romance that's hot tea blends with honey as the day fades to night one's mortality turns into immorality there's no way to survive a situation like this without giving in to your most basic primitive actions raw world is about what you do not what you want to do the babylonians so this collective instinct to become calculative any food they find on their victims, they eat it or save it for their families. The loss of acolytes attract Brandon to the scene, who aims his machine gun at any target possible. Gritting his teeth, the lieutenant fires off seemingly infinite rounds. Empty shells spray everywhere, striking some of his dumpster, clouds of dust preventing the lieutenant from spotting her. When the onslaught ends, Heather grasps the hilt of her sword tightly. Brandon's the only one with ammunition right now, and other acolytes chase after the Babylonians, even the lieutenant on a search for her. I didn't see you leave with them, he shrieks. I remember your face. San Francisco has stories about you, Commander. I know how badly you want that mansion, and I know how much you want to see me dead. But as far as I'm concerned, you brought a knife to a gunfight. He checks every nook and cranny at the block, shooting at anything suspicious. The gunfire tethers Heather to her hiding place. She figures staying put is the smartest thing to do, for a bullet from the machine gun is strong enough to cut through their armor. Even if she finds something to hide behind, what would she do? She's practically defenseless, and it wouldn't take long for any bullets to destroy her fanatical barricade. The commander feels like she's caught in a rat trap. Eventually, Brandon reaches her dumpster. Looming over the lid, he knows this is the spot, his own personal treasure chest. Wrapping his hands around the cover, a surprisingly fatal force strikes the lieutenant's chin. He stumbles backwards, jumping the machine gun, screaming as it clatters across the floor like a stone being cast over a pond. Heather reveals herself, dropping down her feet, the tip of the sword against Brandon's throat. Just out of reach, his only chance of survival. Where is it, Nitus? Heather demands. Told us he'd be here. He gave us his word. Brandon presses his throat harder against the sword. Yeah, as far as he's gone. Where are they going? Marissa's fort. Closing her eyes, she finishes the job. Around her, Portland burns to the ground. Ash blackens the sky, choking anyone in the upper stories of these gargantuan towers. Behind her, the Babylonians fight the remaining acolytes withstanding waves of treacherous infantry. As a soldier, you never forget the smells of warfare. Whether it be the stench of your friend's organs thrown out of the cross's body, the smoke of blazing infernos, or simple act of survival. The order of betrayal and desert remains unforgotten destinate remains unforgotten in the eyes of a forgotten justice. At the slaughterhouse, Forrest finishes creating a makeshift bow and arrow. Outside an open doorway, snow falls against the backdrop of dead trees. Alice hallucination sits in the center of the main floor, watching the king with great curiosity. He notices the stubbornness of his entity makes her the longest lasting ambition. No matter how many times he shots at her to go away, to disappear into the ether, it only makes her want to stay. He, he figures that the war is worse than his schizophrenia. Only if he would be seeing her if it wasn't happening. These thoughts upon his mind as he bounds over the push to the cold morning. He hunts for most of the day, coming up short on most occasions. He's about to give up, he spots a large animalistic silhouette in the distance, a black bear. He follows the path to it, remembering the day Echo got her arm torn off by one of these beasts. Aiming his arrow, he holds his breath, launching into the onion. He pierces through the side of the animal's head, trying as it goes down. Smacking, the thing approaches his skin. The idea is formulating in his head. He takes the creature back to his hideout, skinning it with a sharpened knife. In the course of three hours, he puts together a full suit, reminiscent of what Native Americans can wear when he travels across the period of the As long as admire the mobility of the sorcerers, he tries today act nothing like they did on his reason. Donning the suit, he instantly feels more. Alice stays quiet. Are you going to say anything? He asks. I can leave now without getting sick. Does that bother you? Yeah, because I'm like you, I have direction. How does the spirit have to say something? Like I said, the job is to help you redeem yourself. Why would a voice like that for me? It's just a simple. You seek something more. I'm a child. I'm not you. If you keep saying that, she's back at the king and the timid. She's sitting nice and 
still alive, or you bleed it. I knew you could end it. Really? Was there something else even in the way of you? No. What about Marilyn? King Paul says, what about him? Jesus Christ, you have to spell it out for you. In fact, if you save him, the people would respect him more. That's how much help he could be. Bill would trade San Francisco as a suicide mission. I'll get to him when this is over. I'll smash the stuff in the face. Am I talking to a fucking brick wall? That's can what press a beat! Turns around facing him. All my life is in an uncontrollable sin. I had dreams before Babylon, Alice. I had ambitions that we were helping with my schizophrenia. I come into people's lives like a forest fire, as I have this undeniable urge to control people. You know what to know what it's like not knowing how to tie those instincts up? I've been a prisoner. The only thing that distracts me from ending it are Echo, actual child, and kingdom success. That's why I want to do what I want to do. Knowing his gaze, corners on a realization. You're right. I am, are you sure? Only a select few have to live and die for this to end quickly. I need Marilyn back to help us with the war effort. Good! The hallucination stands up. Before I go, why did you build Babylon and do a kingdom? Oh, uh, would the peasants be without one? I tell you well. With that, she exists the room. Having a direction in mind, he disregards Anais for the real prize. To hell with chasing after him. This is a perfect time to sneak in to and out of the city. Once their military is fighting, he'll only have to deal with the guards. However, what would be the right way in? The Golden Gate Bridge would be suicide. That's their only entrance. He stores these concerns for the future, letting the relief of survival wash over him. Some people feel guilty for this act, but he penetrates Congratulations, you get a second chance on setting things right. Without feeling sorry, he carries on. Without feeling shame, he carries on. Living through these terrible days helps him convert his pain into motivation. During the journey, he wonders if the decision means going AWOL. And Marissa's for it, the warden stands AWOL again. And reminding her, himself of Marilyn's usefulness, he figures it's worth it. Marissa's for it, the warden stands outside, observing the campsite and its front lawn. To the tents, boxes of ammunition, food, water, and medicine. Behind her, soldiers add reinforcements to the Civil War structure. Some work tirelessly at crafting Molotov cocktails, coats, smoke grenades, and car bombs. Amazing all the burnt out vehicles on the roads leading this place, the warden realizes how they could use them, use them to their advantage. Jenkins! She screams at the soldier. What's the news? A man twice her size approaches. While we were scouting, we found that my ran as I give you the heads up. Is he injured? He was. He found one of our mobile camps and they vouched him up. Thank God, bring him to me when he gets here. I was already going to do that. Is there anything I'd do in the meantime? Help Axel with the car bombs. I trust him. But some brain power extra would not hurt. On it. The president arrives with the scattering party 30 minutes later. Manages to cover his arms and legs. The scratch marks plague his face. He doesn't look mad that he lost for us. Rather, he's in a state of total acceptance. Calculative thoughts flowing in the back of his mind. He has to see the conflict as one would see themselves at the peak of heroic acid trip. Ego death is the only appropriate nomenclature to describe such an experience. He realizes it's just a symptom of leading society during wartime. In one of the fort rooms, Marissa and Ignite sit on long chairs. I couldn't see where it's going, he explains. I was bleeding, I knew I had to get force off my back. I led deep into the woods. This is no covered up my trail. If anything, he's going to freeze to death. I'm surprised you didn't. Georgina found me. Have conscious guns a tree. Took me back to the camp. Marissa shivers. What do we do now? Go back to San Francisco. Why? We were needed here. <clears throat> but I'm not going to lead this crusade. I need to confront Dewey about Sawyer with the prisons on Alcatraz. Sawyer tells me that something terrible is about to happen. Warden smirks. Remember that time we took that trip to Grand Canyon? Cousin sighs, calm imagery flowing through his mind's circuitry. How can I forget? Who are worrying about them for the election? I discovered Hudson. Escapism is the only cure for depression for me. Do you want the conflict to escalate to this? To what justice, Marissa? They're terrorists. They blew up Alcatraz, destroyed a minty facility, and sent everything out of control with that train incident. How do they know where that train would be? I don't know. You're oblivious. Alan's still communicating with the Babylonians in some way. 
You? you? You think he would do that to me? Has he done anything to make you question his trust? Yes, but we need him for the future San Francisco. He was a chemist turned architect. There's an endless amount of ideas we can draw from his mind. So what's the plan? You're really gonna let him run free? I have a spot in Athena's chamber. Well, that's not a low ground. This is worse than all those elections in mind. You don't know how our world is gonna be when this is over. One thing's certain. Night is the social period and it can't be complete without a capstone. That's your role. The president stands up. Let's pack our things. They spend the day at the fort, helping soldiers prepare for any sudden attacks. The bombs will take a lot longer to complete than the rest of their objectives, so they forego it. Through the snowfall, they work effortlessly until nighttime. Campfires kindle and burst into fantastic flowers, a simple projection of hell. The smell of burning meat expands outward into a two-mile radius. Conversion whispers and rumors about Portland spread like their grief for fallen comrades. Unitas clears his throat, standing up before a gathering site. I know all of you are tired, but let me assure you that your work doesn't go unnoticed. Like your work, your lives are eternal. It's our obligation to fight for the ones that brought San Francisco together. Our blood is the price we pay to keep society's heart beating. Our actions are the pulse of our city's veins. We are not killing. We are the cleansing the world of evil. Just like how your productivity isn't forgotten. Neither were the actions of our terrorists, the Babylonians. Canisters fly from the darkness, spontaneously exploding into ear-popping blasts, entwining with bright flashes of light. Screams of panic and confusion proceed from the blast of Brandon's machine gun, whatever bullets the Babylonians found. Marissa stands her ground, but Ignatius retreats to the fort. Considering his injuries, the peaceful night turns upside down in a matter of seconds. True symptom of true fight. Blood spills over the once white grounds. Splatters turn into crimson rivulets from a source of complete malice and vengeance. Acolytes don't hesitate on pushing back. On this cold, terrible night, the battle answers the long-time question of evil. There is no such thing as someone who is truly altruist, selfless, heroic, and the same goes for the, op the opposing end of the spectrum. We are a combination of all these things, because duality exists as an internal mirror. Those who watch their friends die become the bleeding on either side of the party, even the children of Nazi soldiers grieved over the fallen parents. Where did I go wrong? This question repeats itself in Nice's mind as he cowers behind stone walls when he should be outside them. <coughs> the only thing the president witnesses tonight are the bellows from his own suffering people. He remembers what Hudson said to him all those years ago about the butterfly effect. If the accident didn't happen, the entire part of everyone's lives would be different. The squatter's eyes sink down to his cast, damning the internal balance. All societies come to a breaking point. It doesn't matter if they experience a golden age or whether or not a country unifies with all these others. Natural law dictates. The orchestra of society performs its show for however long it meant to, and then it collapses. We even immortalize great, great fallen civilizations like Egypt or uh, Sumer with our the history textbooks. What do you think will become of this in the near future? What makes us so different? Do we carry today within our knowledge the same sophistication it must have took to construct inoculate pyramids or other structures from the past? He decides to turn his back on Forrest's deal. The king wants both societies to remain undamaged. The fort is part of San Francisco. When he returns to the city, he plans on gathering the entirety of its air force to invade Babylon. He doesn't care if those knights would lead down the wrong direction or an incompetent leader. You do not turn on your word. Outside, Dreadful events cover continuously continuously unfold. Nobody has a legit obligation for their innocence, especially during these desperate times. Mother already lost most of the people in the Battle of Portland. 7,000 people came with her then, less than half remain. However, the number and the way she works with them makes her look like a corrupt, successful stockholder on Wall Street. The commander gives orders. The knight respects them. Every passing second, the interesting sensation of brotherhood flows through the Babylonian warriors. Something I haven't been familiar with in quite some time. The action of saving one's own back means a lot to anyone today. Trust is a rare resource, with sacrifice becoming as valuable as love. Heather recalls the national anthem in her head. As long as their bullets burst through the air, it will provide proof of Babylon's success. At some point, the commander draws her sword, lowering the machine gun forever. She encounters Marissa in the middle of a fray, their melee weapons shattering Sanity's fabric. What kind of person does it take to wake up tomorrow to 
morning to do this again. Is the psychology of war based on the most primitive function of survival, or is it something we haven't confronted yet? More and more impossible questions ring throughout the night like the echo of gunshots. During the fight with Marissa, Heather knocks the warden off balance, pinning her to the snow. Where's Forrest? growls the Babylonian's knight's protector. Smiling, the warden replies, not here. Acolytes appear on the forest's rooftop and fire down the scene, sending Heather to regather the rest of the people as a final charge. The massacre within becomes as quickly as it ends. Tight! The lengthy corridors prevent my staff from the advantage. Sections of scene collapse into some fighters, crushing them to death. When the end night, it becomes clear that the knights will prevail. Some acolyte fires, deserting people who give their lives for treason. Babylonians chase after those who run, killing them on the front lawn. The shooters from the roof descend, their hands high, empty, defenseless. Other washers have weapons clatter to the ground. The knights don't know what to do. Oh my god. Cutting the silence. She executes them one by one, for her people hail on the decree. No prisoners! Slaughter ensues, concludes and collates into their next steps. They search the building for any signs of risk or ignites, finding neither. Now if Babylonians steal any supplies they can, prepare the next journey. Heather gathers the remaining fighters on the front lawn, the smell of death fresh, crisp, and blending within cold gales. During ac tiny acolytes recess slowly, trying to be put down, the commander stops the fights her knights from from listening. I know what I did was wrong, she explains, but look here we are, they're all dead. The thing is, it's gonna end soon. Now we gotta look for forests. We can encounter any more acolyte camps. We used the guerrilla tactic like we did from Portland a year. That was the key to success for the American Revolution. Like the revolutionaries, we have to ensure the same attitude we can find our king. We find the king. We find the war. Those are the only things that in front of us, we will overcome them. Set up for the night five miles away from here. We don't know what's around this place. Sunrest eyes echo approaches the prairie, the national park being its backdrop. <coughs> she guides her team confidently to the vantage point, but they get an overview of the battlefield. The acolyte dug bankers and trenches onto the grounds, snow filing up some up entirely. To the queen, this is a perfect opportunity for a raid. To everyone else, it screams suspicion. Opinions, discussions, and debates last a half hour before Echo finally decides to press on. In the trenches, the Babylonians find boxes of supplies beneath piles of snow. Not hesitating, they take everything. Echo doesn't understand why the Echo shot themselves in the foot. She learns that just because she doesn't understand something, it doesn't mean it isn't so. Hitler made the mistake of rerouting the 4th Panzer Army early, leaving the 6th to face Stalingrad alone. Can they guys be on the same level in competence, or is this the set of some horrible show they're about to attend? The quiet raid continues. When they finish, they cheer. I'm to Echo, this becomes a decisive moment in the war. The Acolytes showed Maryland infected in the pit. They didn't know about the possibility of weaponizing them. Rotten hands protrude from the dirt walls, which clapped to reveal the Lovecraftian nightmare. The Babylonians make a beeline for any bunker they can find. Many die from the ravenous, infinite hunger of hijacked souls walking. The knights form a human shield around their queen, feeding off hordes of god. Ramani Echo watches as their people die before her eyes in an agonizing way. The overwhelming nature of the experience shows Echo the effectiveness of force and manipulation. If got from this easily, he threw out a thousand lives in an unknown conflict without much trouble. He could have gotten her without even knowing. What was that thing that made her help kill Judas? Did she actually want to? The more the queen thinks about that moment, the more she understands. It stems from blind attraction. She ponders on the time when Forrest forced, when Forrest forced Marilyn to make LSD. She still feels guilty about being the one to give it to Dante, even though it wasn't her fault. She probably would have threatened her too if she resisted. She still remembers the prisoner's screams. The way he thrashed back and forth, handcuffs keeping his wrists together. She wonders what he saw, or if he ever recovered before Forrest killed him. Following the execution was the extermination of Babylon's secret societies. In hindsight, she wanted to excuse to for force to kill. So there's no way the groups are gone. After all, the main idea behind a secret society for them is to live in secret. Maybe some fundamentalists that take that meaning to extremes. Closing her eyes, she sees Alice, the only clarity in the moment. If there's any, pr if there's any proof of order and chaos, it's her daughter. She wishes she had her with somebody else. That way, escaping the control would be much easier. Manipulation was never meant to be an easy hole to climb out of. Now she understands the king's true nature. She doesn't want to do anything she can to escape it. 
doesn't want to hurt anybody else because of him. She craves the independent attitude of taking care of herself. Her own happiness and sanity. Just because he's broken, doesn't mean it ha she has to stand by him. It took a war for her to realize this. But in a race, no matter how slow you go, you're always bound to finish. Anger courses throughout the body, and she takes it out infected. Swords decapitate heads, they finally clear a path to a bunker. Locking the door with the supply locker, surviving knights stand back, demonic cries emerging from the other side. They sit quietly waiting with no food or water. They all know this can't last long. Blood covering Echo's face, she sits up against one of her bunker walls, crying. Gazing up at the ceiling, she gasps, Your consciousness creates reality! End of chapter 8. Chapter 9 The Babylonian War, Part 2 The day opens calmly upon the remains of an old world. A strange mixture of peace and truth rings throughout the quiet atmosphere. Echo and Marilyn conquer it together in 1952, experiencing the hottest summer of their lives. Droughts make it hard for water to come by. Rivers and ponds evaporate quickly into the atmosphere. A defaced road sign comes into view, reading, the Acolyte's message survives anything. Keeping their bloody melee weapons close, the pair presses on to a weary existence. They find that the closer they get to Seattle, the more questions they have. Marilyn jokes about turning around, but Echo urges him on. They hide out that night in an abandoned gas station. <coughs> Echo does her best to distract them from heat stroke. When I was younger, I was a typewriter. It's the stupidest little contraption. I still remember using it to this day. The way the ink came out in this brisk, jet black color, the thoughts my mind had, brought me back to the simple times. Those days when all we had to worry about is getting another cartridge of ink for a clumsy typewriter. Those days are why we're alive right now. You're telling me this because... You've been questioning your existence, I can tell. Don't doubt yourself, Marilyn. Do all these things with your life that nobody else has done. Somebody like you starts questioning their meaning. You will lose that spark you have one day because of what you end up telling yourself. That you're worthless, nothing, and that there's no value to life. What the fuck does that have to do with a typewriter? I doubted my writing. Marilyn's heart sinks. How could someone not question their existence today? You know it's hard, especially with what we've been through. Every step we take us gets us closer to Washington. What if the rumors aren't true? What if there's nothing? Or what if it fell already? That gives us every reason to check. We might find Shangri-La or something else. Either way, we can't pass up this opportunity. He glances toward the gas station's front doors. Have you seen any infected? He glanced. No, I'm starting to see less and less of them. Can't wait for the day they starve themselves out. Think that's actually possible? Those things are hijacked by whatever the Viet Cong poked up. Even the corpse of a soul can't stumble around here forever. It's only a matter of time before nature takes everything back. Marilyn laughs. Civilization. <laughs> if you ask me, we deserve this. We did this to ourselves. War, greed, propaganda, the end was bound to happen. Do you want to know what Russia would have done to us after the MP? We are lucky. Do you really have the audacity to say something like that? No, it's just how I feel. On the contrary, I think looking to the bright side is a strength. Echo remembers a night where she went to a Denver club with her old boyfriend. Jefferson Airplane was playing, and people were using all kinds of illegal substances ranging from light hits to blunts to long lines of cocaine. She didn't partake in such activities. She believes in the medical possibilities, but disagrees with the recreational regular intake. One's brain can only take so much, and when foreign substances bombard it on a daily basis, it's as if you're destroying a temple. This philosophy has kept her safe so far, but on this night, it proves to her that even such strong thoughts strike glimpses into their fatalities. At the bar, her boyfriend sits down next to her. This guy was selling a jar of liquid acid for Tony. I stole it when he wasn't looking. Ostrich, she replies, Acid? Are you kidding me? Why would you do that? Well, let's try it. <coughs> How will you drive home? Let alone be ready for school tomorrow. Come on, we won't take a lot. We'll microdose. No! She stands up. I'm going to the bathroom. Get out my drink when it's done. I don't want it anymore. 
Instead of going to the bathroom, she exits the club, alone in the city. She, si she shivers as the autumn winds pass through the surrounding mountain ranges. From her perspective, society looks like an unstoppable force. Even with everything that's going on right now, she doesn't want to be a writer, but she plans on attending college for political science. She wants to improve foreign relations. Every time she ponders on her motives, she scoffs. A woman will never be president. Sexism today will forever remain a staple in the government's ideology. As disappointing as it is, she transforms it into a compliment to gain some comfort from the situation. If the country falls, at least it won't be from the hands of her gender. Despite the current state of the world, a calm feeling befalls her. The journey home is long, but relaxing. A few blocks from the club, she passes an alley, where an abrupt force knocks her to the ground. Out of the trance, blood oozes out either, either nostril, and a taste of metal lingers on her tongue and broken teeth. She spits out crimson globs, gazing up at the attacker through a hazy vision. What do you do about yourself? A shadowy figure hisses. You did this to yourself. What kind of go would go accompanied by a man? He wields a, nas a rusty pipe, chopping against the palm of his free hand. She stammers. I, uh, I do have a man. Oh yeah, where is he? He's up the car right now and he's coming back for me. Your best course would be to turn around. The attacker laughs hysterically. <laughs> do you expect me to believe that bullshit? I've been watching you since you left the club. Hell, I was even there. Your boyfriend stole my drugs. She swears to herself. Why didn't you beat his ass? Why do I deserve this? Because I'm feeling that you can't reason with someone like him. I mean, if he treats everyone else as shit like it's his, why don't I do the same? Would you do this to other girls? Would you do this to other girls? Reason the pipe, he replies, I have. Echo's boyfriend arrives at the scene, tackling the delinquent. She screams, crawling into the darkness, and watching as her high school sweetheart saves a life. It's what every man should do for the woman he loves. The situation ever calls for such actions. Fight horror takes a grotesque turn. Our dealer gets a jump on a boyfriend, blowing out the pistol and pinning the pet's head to the ground. Echo shrieks, Aye! causing the drug dealer to press down on the trigger. Blast rings throughout the alibi, and Echo collapses in tears. Smiling, the attacker drops the pistol, grabbing the pipe. He beats the girl for seven minutes, leaving her a bloody mess for the ambulance. He calls, spray into the night. Echo falls unconscious. <coughs> Next morning, she wakes up in a hospital. Daylight shines throughout the window, and a harpy monitor vibrates from a machine next to the bed. Bruises manages cover her arms. IV tubes transport blood and fluids throughout her body, keeping the stability alive. She feels more like a machine than a human, but in the end, isn't that how things always turn out? Why she have to go to that club? She usually never attends those kind of events, but that night, something about it made her want to go. Was it because her boyfriend was destined to die in all the versions of his life? Like some entity unanimously agreed with itself? She could almost hear it whisper. It's written in stone. There's no stopping what's going to happen. Recently, her life has been like a snowball that rolls infinitely down a mountainside. It grows with every rotation, ending up as a size similar to a boulder. To her, the snowball represents an endless pressure from an unknown source. On the surface, everything is going fine. But in her mind, a storm over the ocean grows into a hurricane. She quietly wonders if anybody else has the problem, and she stares in the great void before her. She realizes her parents aren't here. A sign of her mother, father, or siblings. Who made them stay home? Perhaps the reason stems from this disappointment, neglect, or some unforeseen wisdom the force of nature prevent her to detect. The nurse doesn't come in the entire day, and she's alone for the f entire night. Here she doubts her existence. <gasps> How could someone be so forgotten by society? Would the world be any different if she weren't in it? All her life it's been a domino effect of bad events. Her parents divorced, the youngest sister getting kidnapped, and the old house burning down. It's like the universe won't let her take a breath. One second, she begs. One second without all these memories. That's all I want. In the gas station, she sits across empty shelves, tossing a flashlight back and forth in her hands. Same one she found in the police station. It's funny to think how such a simple object can save someone's life. Way before flashlights, all cavemen had were fires. Imagine the amount of time it would take to prayer one if you didn't know what you were doing. Life begins with science, and end up the same way. The early apocalypse is a gateway to a clean state. Now, lifetimes later, she finds herself covering behind the walls of a cement bunker, asks questions similar to those after the nightclub incident. Why don't she just join the war when all she does is kill? After leaving several innocent people are deaths, she wonders if it's just bad as force. Codependency is a damn mess. Or does she rely on someone else for happiness, love, and acceptance? Why did God do this to her? He is so loving. Shouldn't he offer at least a pinch of mercy? 
queen's eyes widen upon remembering a revelation. Your consciousness creates reality. She doesn't have to remain under force of control. The relationship start with a death. What kind of love story is that? Will she be really able to distribute those memories onto Alice in the future? At this point, she figures a bullet is the only thing that could put an end to this madness. Outside their hideout, the infected continuously pound on the door, their weight breaking off its hinges. The Babylonians stand by their queen, ready for the fatal tray. Frey, instead of feeling weakness, the echo climbs to her feet, and we found energy spreading throughout the veins of a brittle soul. Raising her sword, she moves to the front of the corrugation, over the entrance. Wrapping a hand around the knob, she twists it, allowing their enemies a breath. The first puddle of blood forms within milliseconds. Crimson liquid covers the room within the course of ten minutes. The girl remembers her conversation with Marilyn at the gas station. The advice she gave to him was meant for this moment. Overcoming doubt is the only way to survive in this world. It serves as guidelines on how to make it to the next sunrise. When you wallow in your own self-destruction, what good does it do? And what advantages do these toxic mindsets bring into your life? The queen thinks about this as the fight continues. At some points, the infected push the Babylonians against the wall. In those moments, the combined strength shoves the hordes back. The room ends up looking like the aftermath of a concentration camp liberation. The atmosphere surrounding them makes it feel like the Russians were right around the corner, ready to save the Allies. In this world, Echo jumps ignites to Hitler. Using this analogy, she comes to the conclusion that she is the one who should bring him down. What he did to Merlin is enough of a reason to her. Force justifies who he kills with the same philosophy. Ferocious going down reminds her of old hatred for her hatred for her hypocrisy. The more she tries to escape the king, the more she ends up sinking down like a bottomless well. With her eyes closed every time she swings at the predator, force head replaced the one her blade decapitates. <coughs> the motivation she feels more than the anger. The Babylonians use this to struggle into the trenches. They stomp over their friends' bodies, stumbling towards the access stairs, an endless swarm surrounds them, it troops out of the walls over no man's land, and consumes the lives of brave forces. Queen doesn't let this bother her anymore. It's a waste of time. You know, survivor's guilt? Now you have thoughts loop in your head as if you're some cosmic carnival ride? Dead end conclusions, self destructive habits. She wants her life to change. She'll do anything in her power to make it happen. Crown will never prove somebody's in charge. Only actions matter. Doubt has always been a fleeting demon in her subconscious. In dreams, she represents herself as a dandelion. As those sequences progress, the dandelion dies. That's what it's supposed to be. Her doubt in the stem is she's the petal. Doubt creates her codependence, drains her of being the person you first forgot. She remembers going to the haunted house with her old boyfriend one Halloween. When the walkthrough began, she instantly took hold of his arm. This is a perfect example of how far her codependency has come. Every time she ponders on that moment, she wonders if the world's saying, I know who you are, I know you'll always be. During this fight, she realized the easy method of overcoming this issue is to let it go. Take the lives Brass and men to understand this. Yes, 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 yes. She walks. Dread replaces circulating thoughts of trains. Trains of thoughts. It is her only purpose now. Watching violence, voiceless names die before her. Brutality is a poor word of describing these events, but it's started grasping something incomprehensible. Will anybody remember this day two years from now? Is the trigger hidden demons within her ranks? The more she kills, the more persistent numbness consumes the soul. Get the king in the war! Get the king in the war! This truth repeats itself in Heather's mind as if it's on an infinite reset. It lashes onto her soul as they destroy acolyte camps, hidden behind dense foliage. They're the only obstacles. They become nothing more than a minor nuisance. With every step, San Francisco gets closer. That's all the Babylonians care about. The less cultists there are, the better. The knights encounter some camps at night, sneaking into tents and stabbing their sleeping occupants. Seems with every action, Babylonians descend into emptiness. By the end of this, will they turn from victim into criminals? Will poetic justice be their greatest fear? Justice! That damn war slitters in the commander's thoughts like how syrup flows in the depression of a waffle. At least a bad taste in her mouth. Anybody who has the audacity to even think about such a costume would just walk off a cliff. The Babylonians' dungeons prove justice is dead. The only thing she disagrees before is on the cops of the law. Her societies as large as Babylon should be under a singular obey the monarchy policy. Their attempt at hunting down Ignatius and Marissa turned to an inescapable game of cat and mouse. With every camp the Babylonians destroy, the farther away their main targets become. 
can the pair move around that fast? Is it strictly because of their importance, or is it merely pure skill? It's like they seep through cracks, akin to how light floods into a room from fissures as the water boards an empty window. Are they wasting valuable time? What else should they even be doing? Heather thinks about the speech at the Battle of the Fort. No prisoners! She can't understand why those words shot out as the third air. No breaks, pauses, or second takes. One with humanity should hesitate before speaking such deadly words. She didn't feel anything besides acceptance. That's what you have to do to protect your people. The lengths you must travel to find who you are. Today, one's mind is as broken as one's heart. What you experience changes you. Everyone understands this truth at the core of its definition. We are a rare species, able to be consciously aware of our own death. Facing this daily, they can't afford a moral compass anymore. Today, a compass gets you lost. It's honor obligatory when it causes costly? What's the exact root of evil? And if money is, why do we stop ourselves from eradicating it? Escapum is the art of distracting yourself from existentialism. Does this conflict be a symptom of that truth? Is war really unnecessary when peace always prevails? Thought pauses in Heather's mind. We are meant to kill each other. We are a social species. The core of our collective subconscious thrives from this. When we didn't have guns, we fought with fists. When we didn't have guns, we fought with fists. Evolution works in countless ways, from different modern versions of technology all the way to how we interact with each other. It doesn't just entail one genera turning into another via missing link. It's natural growth. The world vibrates on microscopic waves. The theory of evolution is part of it. War is proof of moral devolution, which implies evolution to be in a law in the first place. A sense of nationalism drives this conflict into a deeper territory. Pride cometh before the fall. To Heather, the only thing nationalism can do is make things worse for the Babylonians. The disadvantage, cockiness will parent the perspectives of their creator. He's a certain kind of person to kill another. An outside circumstance puts you to a point, there's no turning back from a person darker than yourself. However, you're killing really bad when you do it to protect the ones you love? Is that guilt trip just part of the human experience? Taking the life of someone else is divine sin in the eyes. The public, but when the public doesn't understand supply to self defense, that make you a killer or a savior? <coughs> she feels lost as the day progresses. The Babylonians act as if they're wandering in circles, except they're moving forward. March down the path, screams a distant whisper, a distant whisper, a distant blister. No pain, no gain. During the Revolutionary War, Washington trudged through the harshest winter of that time period, barefoot. They could do that and win. The Babylonians can do anything. Nothing is more motivating than hope, albeit it's only a pinch. Secondary goal becomes stealing supplies from the fallen. The knights end up calling the walk the Trail of Tears. Andrew Jackson would have been proud of them had the acolytes been Native American. Are there any true good people anymore? Are the cracks in our modern perspective of morality getting too wide? What's empathy to an inoperable tumor of apathy? Man has been stealing from one another since somewhere. But for some reason, this action drives the Babylonians further into the infinite numbness. No honor, no glory, only survival. What causes someone to take the life of someone else? What causes the criminal to go on a murder spree? Regret throwing out a window as if it's trash. You kill someone during war? Does that make you a bad person? Who gives life to these rules? Or is it just mere social construct? What would have any concrete law? The weather decays into a nightmarish hollow from Borais. Disorient is more, uh, both parties. Disorients both parties, slowing them down at unnecessary intervals. The, inter <laughs> the environment becomes an almost impossible obstacle to overcome. People get sick. They have to be put down. Desperation drowns any sense of relief. We don't know the power of that word until the universe forces us to face it. The emotion comes on slowly. Clock slowly to conduct bullets. The bomb goes off. It does so when you least expect it to. Con Contingencies, contingencies, fail the backup plans to thrown out the window into the nothingness from where it's it came. The game lasts for several days. God doesn't know when to stop. God probably might not have the controller in this one. Something like war happens, what role does God play? Is he the controller or the observer? Why does the concept of an alternative, alternative perspective frighten so many people? Does God's love blind them? 
God was so loving, wouldn't you want to stop the hate, the murder, the destruction? Why does God seem to make people so close-minded? The more everyone thinks about this, the more they lose their faith in their beliefs. Even the acolytes. However, the fear ignited is finding out forces them to find excuses to keep going. Swords dance against bare throats, slicing them as they're thin as a piece of paper. Babylonians feel like they're winning. This realization puts Nidus and Marissa to the finish line. The only goal is getting in San Francisco's airship facility. The Blitz on Babylon will be the final phase in this horrific chapter. Oh, I feel so uncertain when they're ahead of the Knights. You could possibly scare them now. What exactly are they running from? The Israelites wandered the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Nidus and Marissa began feeling like that, lost in their own minds. They barely speak to each other as time passes. Nothing in the relationship, no bonding. Why should they have time to do those things? The terrible part about war is that it isolates you, even though you're right next to someone. When you focus on living, especially winning, there's no leisure time. Rest lost itself in the aftermath of confronting true survival. There seems to be two sides of communication during conflict, orders and whispers. When a private has a different opinion than the sergeant, the social construct is for the private to keep his mouth shut. Dismiss this individuality. When you first go to prison, guards use the same philosophy to keep inmates in line. Death becomes normalcy and acceptance. This is when war peaks. Exhaustion adds their desperation, which only makes both parties fight harder. The orchestra of good and evil intertwines with the moral peace. Even in conflict, the moment is peace because you're alive. When you have to live presently just to make it the next second, you know you're breathing. Every comes as valuable as a currency. Keep your eyes open, keep your chin up, cling on to a branch of positivity if it'll save your life. All these confusing ideas and revelations mean nothing in the bigger picture, but they mean something now. Appreciating the small things becomes a last re resort for sanity. <laughs> the Babylonians feel grateful for every second they exist. I feel like an empire will come from these ashes. The Heather smites those who speak those things out loud. She still believes that nationalism is their enemy, that the only way to win is through a bittersweet victory. The end of wars always leaves one side in humiliation, like Germany after World War I. If the Babylonians win, she doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to rub it on their faces. Instead, she wants to show the kingdom grow. Perhaps one day, she can assimilate the acolytes into the Babylonian culture. Wishful thinking, that's all it is. The smell of violence brings her back into reality. There's no escaping the truth that the acolytes will never change. If their evil sticks to a role like Clue. Genocide slowly becomes an option. She doesn't want to be as bad as Forrest. If they end up conquering San Francisco, how will Babylon change? What if they fail just like that? They failed at the sage. Heather imagines two possible scenarios. One, force forces them to give up their democracy for their monarchy. Two, the acolytes win and do the same exact thing. Nice is exactly like Forrest, relying on a society with iron fists. What happens on one side suddenly like overcomes the other? Does it prove that the balance is nonsense, or is that the scales tip in their own favor sometimes? It's really lucky to survive these kind of situations where mental illness becomes a symptom. People were born to kill, we're not born to kill one another, that's why soldiers returned home from the western front with shell shock. Empathy fizzles down the lick awake. Empathy fizzles down and licked the wick of a burning candle. Must be comparable to the acts of a jester. The cold hours fly by within the winds of the blizzards. If draining someone of perspective was possible, that's how you could do it. Babylonians lose many ranks. Heather feels very, every last blow. Hourly, she exudes an emotionless facade, void of any compassion. Her experience turns the commander into a different version of herself. Before this, she would have been humane. Now, all she holds is contempt. Contempt towards what? Someone Forrest told us to hate? The flashbacks from Patog surge through distance, evil memories. This is personal. Even after Brandon's death, after their win in Portland, at Portland, no amount of victory can replace the guilt. No amount of luck can overcome everlasting sorrow. What do you do about yourself? A shadowy figure hisses. You did this to yourself. What kind of girl would go accompanied by a man? He wields a, nasty, a rusty pipe, chopping against the palm of his free hand. She stammers. I, uh, I do have a man. Oh yeah, where is he? He's up the car right now and he's coming back for me. Your best course would be to turn around. The attacker laughs hysterically. <laughs> do you expect me to believe that bullshit? I've been watching you since you left the club. Hell, I was even there. Your boyfriend stole my drugs. She swears to herself. Why didn't you beat his ass? Why do I deserve 
have a feeling that you can't reason with someone like him. If he treats everyone else as shit like it's his, why don't I do the same? Would you do this to other girls? Would you do this to other girls? Reason the pipe, he replies, I have. Echo's boyfriend arrives at the scene, tackling the delinquent. She screams, crawling into the darkness, and watching as her high school sweetheart saves a life. It's what every man should do for the woman he loves. The situation ever calls for such actions. Fly, however, takes a grotesque turn. Her dealer gets a jump out of boyfriend, blowing out the pistol and pinning the pet's head to the ground. Echo shrieks, Aye! causing the drug dealer to press down on the trigger. Blast rings throughout the alibi, and Echo collapses in tears. Smiling, the attacker drops the pistol, grabbing the pipe. He beats the girl for seven minutes, leaving her bloody mess for the ambulance. He calls, spring into the night. Echo falls unconscious. <coughs> Next morning, she wakes up in a hospital. Daylight shines through at the window, and a heartbeat monitor vibrates from a machine next to the bed. Bruises manages cover her arms. IV tubes transport blood and fluids throughout her body, keeping the stability alive. She feels more like a machine than a human, but in the end, isn't that how things always turn out? Why'd she have to go to that club? She usually never attends those kind of events, but that night, something about it made her want to go. Was it because her boyfriend was destined to die in all the versions of his life? Like some entity unanimously agreed with itself? She could almost hear it whisper. It's written in stone. There's no stopping what's going to happen. Recently, her life has been like a snowball that rolls infinitely down a mountainside. It grows with every rotation, ending up as a size similar to a boulder. To her, the snowball represents an endless pressure from an unknown source. On the surface, everything is going fine. In her mind, a storm over the ocean grows into a hurricane. She quietly wonders if anybody else has the problem, and she stares in the great void before her. She realizes her parents aren't here. A sign of her mother, father, or siblings. Who made them stay home? Perhaps the reason stems from this disappointment, neglect, or some unforeseen wisdom the force of nature prevent her to detect. The nurse doesn't come in the entire day, and she's alone for the entire night. Here she doubts her existence. <gasps> How could someone be so forgotten by society? Would the world be any different if she weren't in it? All her life it's been a domino effect of bad events. Parents divorced, the youngest sister getting kidnapped, and the old house burning down. Like the universe won't let her take a breath. One second she begs. One second without all these memories. That's all I want. In the gas station, she sits across empty shelves, tossing a flashlight back and forth in her hands. Same one she found in the police station. It's funny to think how such a simple object can save someone's life. Way before flashlights, all cavemen have were fires. Imagine the amount of time it took to prepare one if you didn't know what you were doing. Life begins with science and end up the same way. The early apocalypse is a gateway to a clean state. Now, lifetimes later, she finds herself covering behind the walls of a cement bunker, asks questions similar to those after the nightclub incident. Why don't she just join the war when all she does is kill? After leaving several innocent people are deaths, she wonders if it's just Baz Force. Codependency is a damn mess, or is she rely on someone else for happiness, love, and acceptance? Why did God do this to her? He is so loving. Shouldn't he offer at least a pinch of mercy? The queen's eyes widen upon remembering a revelation. Your consciousness creates reality. She doesn't have to remain under forced control. The relationship start with a death. What kind of love story is that? Will she be really able to distribute those memories onto Alice in the future? At this point, she figures a bullet is the only thing that could put an end to this madness. Outside their hideout, the infected continuously pound on the door, their weight breaking off its hinges. The Babylonians stand by their queen, ready for the fatal tray. Frey, instead of feeling weakness, Echo climbs to her feet, and we found energy spreading throughout the veins of a brittle soul. Raising her sword, she moves to the front of the corrugation, over the entrance. Wrapping a hand around the knob, she twists it, allowing their enemies a breath. The first puddle of blood forms within milliseconds. Crimson liquid covers the room within the course of ten minutes. Echo remembers her conversation with Marilyn at the gas station. The advice she gave to him was meant for this moment. Overcoming doubt is the only way to survive in this world. Serves as guidelines on how to make it to the next sunrise. When you wallow in your own self-destruction, what good does it do? Or what event? Back at Babylon, a bloody echo walks over the kingdom's drawbridge alone. The guards upon the wall walk notice this. The dread consuming them, friends, family, mothers, fathers, all gone besides the queen. Echo doesn't know how to feel. Walking through the gatehouse. Shame? What is it she have to war with the ones that the walls walk notice this? Dread consuming them. Uh, they did it out of their own violation. Silence rings through the empty streets as she approaches the Space Needle. Citizens peer from curtains, the same revelation hidden them like an atomic bomb. Uh, in the throne room, she stands in front of a mirror. The queen raises scissors to her hair, glaring at the reflection. 
The next ten minutes are spent cutting every inch of it off, so you are all around. It takes a few moments to get used to this change. She forces herself to accept it. Gazing down at her prosthetic hand, the new look makes it seem like she's straight out of a comic book. Now a true acolyte, the queen leaves the room, making a beeline for the bell tower. After, ga after gathering everyone together, she makes one fatal final speech. Sun Tzu once said, to defeat your enemy, you must become your enemy. That's what we do to win. The anger you feel right now, the betrayal, we must use it to our advantage. We have to make the sacrifice for the future of Babylon. Bonding together to put an end to this should be our main goal. We can't waste any more supplies or time. Your consciousness creates your reality. Wouldn't it be better if you made war without the acolytes? If you're a true knight, if you believe in Babylon like I do, join me. This will be our last stand. She has put an end to the infinite silence, reverberating off the edges of reality like how echoes bounce from one side to a ravine. Equilibrium between good and evil reveals itself at this moment. They all accept the queen's ideas, her demands. The Babylonians are forever under force of spell. She had to do it in order to retain public support. The queen turns away, knowing she has to put an end to this madness. That cold night, Echo walks through the empty gun factory. She disregards the floor below, its machinery forgotten. With no materials, what can anybody do? Why would they waste their time but come to work when they could just be protecting their families from starvation? Arriving at Timothy's office, she lets herself in. A baby cries in the gunsmith's hands as she cradles it back and forth. It's still here? The queen asks. A man should honor his work. Glancing up, he gathers at the bald head. What made you do that? It doesn't matter. Doing a final attack in San Francisco. This didn't go how like I thought we thought it would. Is there anything I'd do to help? You take care of Alice. You're doing more than you can imagine. Timothy hands the queen her baby. You know, I saw you when you first walked in. Can't cop around what you went through. For what it's worth, thank you for everything. If it wasn't for the monarchy, a lot of us probably wouldn't have met each other. She decides to keep quiet about her revelation. Community is the heart of civilization. When's the last time you saw Forrest? Before he left for Portland. I'm assuming things went bad over there. I, I can't believe he thought he would be able to abide by that deal. Is there an argument coming? What do you think? I just want to remember that what affects monarchy affects the people. You've always been a better listener than him. You're understanding what I mean. Echo looks into Alice's eyes. Do you think this place would operate more efficiently under a different style? No, we'd be worse under anything else. Don't doubt yourself, Echo. Do you know where that shit can lead you? The queen spaces out. The word doubt triggering several unpleasant memories from her travels with Maryland. She doesn't know what to make of this situation anymore. When the lines between good and bad are drawn this thin, can morality and mor immorality be nothing more than an illusion? Humanity is a concept long dead to this world. Civilization doesn't mean anything more than a large group of people living together. Is community really at its, at its heart of it, or is it the deathbed after realizing society's self-cornering nature? However, if that's the case, does that mean there's a chance for him to come back from this? No matter how hard the Babylonians try, the world seems to break down before every single day. There's been no moment for rest. Everyone is either scared or brave. Facing the end of existence takes its toll on their psyches. But what kind of world is going to emerge from these ashes? Who's going to be the one to clean up the mess? To get that rotten smell of carpets in the houses. With every step they take, wrong decisions push them two steps back. Failure at the National Park and the presumed failure at Portland bring echo to this conclusion. A deep anger festers within her. She directs it towards Forrest. For this single instant, she becomes aware of this manipulation. For this one blink of truth, she faces it with open eyes. He's not right for her, he never was, and he will never get better. The queen realizes that in order to correct an Im immaculate imbalance, one must restore justice to it. How can she, with a situation this big, putting a pin in the thought? Echo figures she'll cross the bridge when she gets to it. She wonders how bad people get away with what they do. This sounds her how long it took for notice Forrest's true nature. How did Castro come down from the mountains, only end up controlling an entire nation? How did Kim Jong ill manage to retain power when he despises everyone who follows him? Forrest is just another version of this archetype. If the devil tempted you with an ir irrefutable offer, you placed your bets if it got you what you desire the most? The queen lays her baby back down in the crib. Why don't you have any room in your house? Timothy scoffs, oh, leave an infant around gong, skeptic, shells, and models. Sounds good to me. Echo rolls her eyes. I was just curious. So 
Speaking of curiosity, what's our next move gonna be? We're moving out tonight, all of us. So I'm gonna go be alone with her? Only for a few days. How much formula do you have left? Enough. Good. You really don't know how much help you give us. He smiles. It's my pleasure. What are you gonna do about Marilyn? She tells her head in confusion. Don't you hate him? Yes, but I sure as hell don't want her on our side. We're working it out. Forrest or Heather's gonna do something about it. Timothy closes his eyes, leading Echo to the pathway outside the door. He gestures down an empty space below, machinery locking itself in the messy fog at that present moment. Took us three weeks to run out. We don't have the mines anymore, not since the collapse. We were always running on red, but now we are on red. It's a weird feeling, being on the other side for once. We thought we could do anything, but look. He points to the barren equipment. Men used to respect your law, your one request over thousands of civilians. You wanted them to obey, and they did. What you need to do is make the acolytes obey. That same night in San Francisco, Marilyn walks up to the presidential palace with the sound of glass breaking. Fear drags him to the bedroom's door, and he locks it quietly, taking deep, sunken breaths. He hides underneath the bed. Distant footsteps bounce off empty walls. The clicks of locks precede the creaks of opening doors. A storm rages outside, lightning bolts illuminating pitch black nooks and crannies with a holy electronic aura. Whoever stalk, whoever's skulking through the halls arrives at Marilyn's room. Attempting to open it, the intruder grunts at the lock of the other side. Marilyn takes a sigh of relief at the pause of brief silence. Suddenly, it comes crashing down on him as the perp hits down, kicks down the door. Wooden panels clatter to the floor. Marilyn lets out a yelp. Silhouette of the figure ch- genuflex before the bed, picking beneath it. Thank God, exclaims a familiar voice. The former Babylonian's heart races. He emerges from his hiding place and climbs to his feet. Uh, how'd you get in here? King readjusts the straps on his work stack. Your letters didn't mention a sewage system. Uh, we, had, uh, <coughs> <coughs> we made that project weeks ago. Is that oh, really all it took? Was well, your guards are out fighting my people? That's not much security. Not my guards. I'm still Babylonian. Did you attempt a way out before? I couldn't. I had too many questions. What do you make them? It doesn't matter. Well, that's what I did on the side. Uh, pigeons. I've constructed bombs and played them on the suspension towers of Golden Gate Bridge. I didn't do anything without asking myself. What would the king do? For us, although a great distance separates us from once we once were, I still believe Babylon. Are you abide by this with your life? What well, life is there? Forrest grins. Then let's get out of here. They sneak down the mansion into the city's underground system. Forrest produced flashlight flicks it on and leads Marilyn into a darkness beyond imagination. Skeletal remains lean against cracking brick walls. Clusters of rats scurry past their feet. During the early riots, people tried to escape this world, but none of them came out. Was it hunger that drove them to the death or a forgotten fear? Some tunnels lead to maintenance stations, where intense rest quietly from years of abandonment. Cobwebs stretch from one end of a passageway to another, or gantuan archetypes dangling from their own ensnarements. Let's blow enough if we get out, Marilyn asks. I haven't thought that far ahead. What if you run running night us? We won't. We'll set up a camp somewhere where the Eclipse won't find us. Why not here? Oh, you're insane. What do you have to do with the rut sack? Enough for a few days. I've got supplies on my way here. We must stay. We need to lay low. Just for the next few hours. We don't know anything about what's going on above our heads. Forrest stops walking. Why'd you leave? Did you know you're going to be a spy? Why does it matter? We are smart person in the kingdom left without resisting. Timothy would have died if I didn't intervene. I just I had to make up most of whatever was mine. What if I did with my... But it doesn't matter now because we have way out. Melon detonated from his pocket. We just need to write for the right moment. Presently, Forrest agrees. They stay in one of the maintenance stations. Droplets of water echoing off a cement ground. Rust drapes after every metallic surface and green liquid leaks from filtration pumps. The WHO set up laboratories here, studying the possibilities of, re- of reviving long-time dead diseases. Claustrophobics won't last two hours down here. The stench alone be enough to drive someone mad. That is our only choice right now, a choice dependent upon Babylon's future. Whether well, that future sons is up to them to decide. They stand against the crumbling walls, waiting for the ceiling to collapse. The only thing separating them from death is time. How many hours do we have to wait down here? Is there anything else we can do? Within the coming hours, distant gunfire echoes through empty landscapes. Whether it's the Acolytes or the Babylonians, squat- squatters don't care as long as they- at least they know a fight is still going on. Forrest, Marilyn sighs, I know there's something wrong with you. What? 
I hear how you talk. I watch how you give me speeches. You're hiding something. But at the end of the day, you save me. Sooner my awareness, I thank you. You think we're going to die? That's why you're telling me this. I want you to go without me saying anything. I just want you for us. If all the Babylonians take notice of these things, the monarchy will receive fallout. If rumors like wildfires, they consider the truth. So if you don't want another Dante, you need to learn how to control yourself. So you think the war was for nothing? You think we're going back to the days of capital punishment and secret societies? Still in those days, but we don't have to be. That's how you can't understand. I was going to sacrifice my life saving your ass, and this is how you pay me back. You didn't have to, you need me back in Babylon, because you know where I belong. That's why you're not gonna kill me after this is over. Forrest straightens his back. I don't know what to do, Marilyn. I feel like I failed as a leader. The war brought the people together temporarily. What happens next? Maybe you're right. We might be on anybody's watch list right now. How are you gonna control things when it's over? What if I personally want to change? What if I'm being doing the person I am right now? What if I want to be better? Changing your style is how you start. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for Echo and Alice. You still have a family to live for, to make happy. I've known you for the past 30 years, so trust me when I say that I know you can free your head. Leading through fear doesn't help that, Forrest. Where did I go wrong? Well, you choose to let it be that way. Forrest stands up. Well, that's not the case anymore. Come on, we're leaving. What? You want me to change, right? The king finds a ladder leading up to a manhole. Then I will. Marilyn, smirking, grabs the rucksack and joins him. They climb up, and when the king lifts the manhole, Babylonian knights above ground remove it. Flashlights shining through the open cavity. After putting a familiar stowaway to her feet, the, knight dis the knights disperse. Another ordered them to do so. She approaches the duo with a beaming smile, feeling hope for the first time since Portland. We had gunfire, Marilyn says. Was that you? Oh, well, slow down a nice and Marissa. We wanted to get ahead so we could ambush them on the bridge. We didn't know that we'd come across you. Forrest smiles, breathing in the air for the first time in years. We need to end this today. We're going to win. Heather chuckles. What makes you so confident? She shrugs her shoulders. Because we're Babylonians. Marilyn locks eye contact with the commander. I have an idea for the salt. Is there anything we talk privately? Heather motions them forward. Follow me. In her tent, the acolyte traitor shudders before speaking. <sighs> what have you guys done with putting a huge den on the military? Citizens are scared, and it nice seems to have underestimated you. This will hopefully be over quick. He reveals a detonator to Heather. There are bombs on the fridge. We wait for the opportunistic moment, and they go off. Horace rubs his forehead. How will we know when the moment's here? Marilyn drops up a scenario. Night is Merceau on the bridge. We'll kill everyone but them. We'll let them see what they did to us, and then we end it. He gulps. However, the detonator has a very short range. Someone has to be near the bombs in order for them to explode. There we go. I will be the sacrificial lamb. What? Heather shrieks. We just got you back. Those are my bombs, he growls. A man remains loyal to those work. Or slurs his head. Jesus, why didn't she tell me in the sewers? Marilyn pucks his pockets the detonator. You will understand. Dreadful science falls upon them. They ponder on a distant moment where everything will change once and for all. The awkward atmosphere pushes them out of the tent, down unknown paths. Time passes slower than the familiar relapse of falling in out of love. Snow falls through metaphysical passing seconds and burying the Babylonians in their ways. Nobody knows where to come tomorrow, but after everything will change. This is the edge they all fear. It's the tipping point of balance. They write letters home to their families and friends, saying their final goodbyes and passing on regrets. Opinions about the monarchy flourish when reading between the lines. The only thing that hides the devil is the details of God. Heather observes them from afar as the scene unfolds. In our darkest hour, we often find the core of humanity in strange places. A unique sensation of gratitude flows through her. She's dying tomorrow, at least she's dying with her people. Horus approaches the commander, wielding a flamethrower. However, before they meet, a knight shouts Echo's name. The king forgets why he's here, pursuing the source of confusion. Reaching a crowd of campers, he pushes through them, meeting the queen face to face. The first thing he knows is her bald head. More questions, no answers. She appears as if she's looking at him, but flashlights reveal Echo gazing over her shoulder into the cold blackness. Behind her, an endless gathering of Babylonian volunteers. All of them wield makeshift weapons. The reunion passes. After everyone disappears, Forrest pulls her aside. Why did you shave your head? He asks. She shakes her head. Why you like how you are? Forrest, awestruck, retorts. What do you mean? They all died because of you. I don't want to be another one of your victims anymore. I am my own person. 
We're not thinking of straights. You saw countless people die before you. You can't relinquish your sanity now. I don't want the verge of something bigger than us. Sanity? Was it saying to kill everyone we deemed suspicious for being in secret societies? Was it saying to force Marilyn to make LSD so just that I personally could give it to Dante? Was it saying to kill Judas so that we would have control? Was it saying to you get us involved in something we clearly have no control over? We take one step forward and two steps back because of your actions. It is not insane to me for wanting to think for myself, to be void of you completely. You say you hear voices, Forrest, but you can't hear me! With that, she leaves him behind. Should the world grant him motivation to get better? She let it stomp him to the ground, out of existence like God's vacuum collecting dust? Why should he even try to change how that he has nothing to change for? Perhaps he can blame destiny on the downfall of their love, but in the back of his broken mind, distance is the final nail in the coffin. How much time has you been spent with her recently? How many leisure hours are in a day where you have to control society? Why is this their ever-winding wedge that keeps driving us further and further away from each other? He returns to Heather's tent. She ins instantly reads his distress. What's wrong? She urges. Do you think Babylon has a chance to survive without the monarchy? No, isn't that what you want? He corners himself with his own philosophy. Waving outward, he states, delusional thinking, all of that negative shit. Heather walks around the box. Are you in echo okay? She's in shock. She says she doesn't want to be with me anymore. Did she say anything else? The entire fleet of Babylonians dead, right in front of her eyes. She gasps, my god, Jesus, what's going to come of us in the next few hours? The king, hanging his head, replies, I just don't know. Everything we've been doing, every death that's led us to this point, what was it all for, Heather? Well, what's any of it for, Forrest? Why don't we live in constant daily cycles that ultimately leads to nowhere? Because it's what we do until we find ourselves. Babylon gave me a chance to find myself. If I took it... If you weren't there, I wouldn't have known what to make of myself. I wanted to be useful, and you helped me recognize my potential. He struggles to find words. I wish Echo saw it that way. I need to talk to her when it's over. We haven't had a good conversation in months. She was bald when I saw her, and I asked her why. Do you want to know what she said? You, you, you hear voices for us. You can't hear me. Do you understand what this that makes me feel? 30 years, and that's what she does. Your first mistake all those years ago was letting her stay. I, lo I loved her. I loved Alex. Life changes you, Forrest. It isn't obligated to save you from anything. Only way you can get better is by accepting the truth. That I'm a piece of shit? Well, yeah, that's how any of us get better. It's a cycle of maintenance and persistence. Do you think the world forgives any of your actions? Eventually, yes. Eternal hatred is non-existent. I'm a sinner, Heather. I forced Marilyn to make assets so they could only give to a prisoner. I killed everyone who might have been involved in secret societies. Anyone who I thought was a traitor, United says we're the same. I might begin to accept that soon. The thing is, Heather, you're the only person outside the monarchy who knows about my schizophrenia. But Marilyn's suspicious and won't act on his emotions. I only told you all this because that's what we did in Portland. You did it for Babylon. That's why I want you to do what I do. Do you feel guilt from any of this? If I felt guilt, we wouldn't be here. Tell me, Heather, if I die, what will Satan do to me that I haven't already done to myself? Heather's voice turns colorless. He just struck. The next morning, Babylonian soldiers find themselves at the edge of a tree line. Barrels of guns from snipers to RPGs protrude from the foliage, aiming directly toward the Golden Gate Bridge. They're careful not to rush things, keeping quiet and surveying the surrounding landscape with binoculars. Their hearts beat faster than the clouds, than the chugs of a steam engine, and pe perspiration boils on their foreheads, even beneath a winter sky. Nervousness, detachment, self-pity. Standing by Marilyn, Echo gazes through the scope of a sniper. If I didn't have to come to this, did it? He shakes his head. How about it's our responsibility to make it right? Don't give me that bullshit today, Marilyn. Today there's only going to be blood poured from vengeance. There's no need to hide beneath these altruistic facades. We're going to make you weaker in the end. <coughs> Fuck. I'm sorry for what happened in the National Park. I wish I was there to help. We don't want to disturb any time you want, might have went up with your brother. Marilyn can't help but to chuckle. United no, doesn't swing that way. Just ask Marissa. She's hypnotized by him. I don't know what she sees in that asshole. He remembers the detonator. Echo, there's something I have to tell you. 
Oh, and what could that be? Forces are right for you. If the monarchy needs change, you have to go through with it. You have to be a better person for Alice. Life, it's not about you. Never was, never will be. Think of how she'll turn out if she raises him. That's something I've been thinking about quite a lot lately. Really? Yes. What I saw at the National Park made me realize who he really is. I woke up to that. I want to be my own person now. I've been codependent all my life, but it's time I break away from that. Relying on people makes you weak, Marilyn. Cripples you and allows the other person to manipulate you into doing whatever they desire. I used to depend on people for emotions, but not anymore. I'm going to find peace by saving Babylon. After that, I'm leaving the monarchy. Did you talk to him about it? He disagrees. He disagrees. I don't. You shouldn't. What are we going to do without a queen? That's the part I can't figure out. Well, Forrest and I aren't really married. I never want to become what I don't believe in. It's my first attempt at fighting codependency. We could just have an election. What about Alice? What are you going to do with her? Smithy takes good care of her. I'll take an apartment in the housing district and set up before I move her in. Chuckling, Marilyn states, the worst part of this is not the waiting. Before the train incident, I thought they were going to be deuced me for being a spy. I was so paranoid, I am sticking to the backyard. I just was too busy elsewhere. I spent hours training the pigeons so they could reach Babylon. So either you get the message or you didn't. When the train incident happened, I knew that it was time to stop waiting. But the time for action is now. For what it's worth, you and Force gave the Babylonians something to fight for. Something to distract them from dis disrupting amongst each other. Will they forget? Forget what? Where we are. Is this really enough to extinguish what was about to happen? I don't think so. It's also why I'm stepping down. Someone could kill Alice out of spite. Through the scopes of her sniper, she tracks a mobile acolyte convoy moving through the bridge's entrance. I got them. Wait till you get to the middle. Other instructs from afar. Oh. The Babylonians obey, unleashing their terror as soon as the nice reaches the end of the line. Acolytes drop dead on a surprising wave of bullet screams terror through the desolate environment, blood covering the asphalt beneath their feet. Not much hope, some acolytes surrender, dropping to their knees and raising their hands toward the sky. Heather repeats what she read at the mansion, and the Babylonians abide by her wishes. Within minutes, Marissa and Nice stand alone. Marilyn comes back and slips away from the group. Echo notices, reloading her sniper as she follows them. Come back, Forrest explains, exclaims. Heather rushes over to the king, subduing him. Don't let him go. They know what they're doing. He struggles against her strength, breaking free briefly before other knights tackle him to the ground. He cries Echo's name, reaching for her as if she's within grasp. Running towards Golden Gate Bridge, Marilyn and the queen notice San Francisco's gates opening. Echo lights flood out, but the Babylonians shoot them down. Marilyn reaches the president first, stringing with a punch to the jaw. Marissa retreats as nice tackles the traitor, whose detonator falls to the road. Echo swipes it off the ground, causing a stalemate between the fighters. Go! She demands. I believe in Babylon! We have to cut them off from the world! Without having time to think, Marilyn runs away. Echo presses the button, and the suspension to towers explode one by one, sending flames soaring into the air. Marilyn loses balance with the big claps, his heart burning with every step. At the tree line, Forrest collapses in tears. Heather holding on to them for support. Babylonians grieve over the tragic loss, watching in agony as the only survivor approaches the end of the falling bridge. Fire spreads over the city's walls, and the victors have a bittersweet moment of celebration. They only allow this when Marilyn finishes his journey safely. He trips and stumbles face first into the snow, sitting upright and observing splashing debris. Did they really win this war? Is the loss of power something to be proud of? Nations should emerge from conflict with their leaders, someone to turn for, for guidance. Forrest remembers telling Echo not to join the war, and this moment brings him nothing but pain. Why didn't she listen? What was the thing that made her so goddamn stubborn in the end? As the bridge separates the acolytes from any chance of survival, you wonder if this was the right way, or if this was the moment, monument to immor immorality. Is this what it takes to win now? Are these the lines we have to cross in order to make it to the next day? What hope is there for the future if this devolution continues? Devolution. The age of the unknown begins now. The morning after entails disarray and futile attempts to get things back on track. 
horse remained staring at the bridge for several hours, as Babylonians preparing for a tough journey home. Marilyn returned, sitting next to the king. I was with her before she went. She told me that. She told me we were looking for from the future. His lips quiver. None of this makes any sense. Why did nothing go as planned? That's why you told me you were suspicious, the king states. You knew you were going to die. Yeah, I did. When we get back to the kingdom, things are going to change. You told me once that the path to heaven begins in hell. Do you still believe that? As San Francisco burns, Marilyn nods his head. I do. He suddenly remembers liberty leading the people. Then it's time to make our way to heaven somehow. With that, the Babylonians pack up their camp, leaving as the backdrop of an inferno blooms from a flower pot. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10. Dogs, Pigs, and Sheep Two months following the Babylonian War, the kingdom rested in an internal state of Catatonia. They grieve over their losses, funerals becoming a regularity. With the bodies they can't retrieve, volunteers etch names into a granite plaque. An emotionless sky drowns the kingdom in restlessness. The Space Needle sits quietly among empty streets. The districts look like ghost towns, their occupants hiding in their homes. Aftershocks of fear race through the minds of unlucky survivors. Few Babylonians guard the wall walks with blank expressions, satchels of arrows on their backs. If we have to kill, we will do it without money. Construction crews build the walls high around their archers, casing security personnel in cylindrical masonry towers, pyramid roofs surrey up as a capstone. Arrows protrude through small slits in the stone, aiming out into a desolate world. No, they really are the last civilization. Marilyn rests in his house, gazing into a mirror and smiling at his sprouting hair. <laughs> Moving over to a window, he pulls back the curtain, glancing at the dirt road outside. Nothing. Everyone is effectively I isolating themselves from each other. Echoes sacrifice, the war, all of it. The purpose is unity, to bring people together. But the truth is they've never been further apart. He hasn't seen or heard from four some days, and nobody knows when an election for a new queen will be, or how it even work. <coughs> he ponders on the current gun dilemma. What are they going to do with all this spare weaponry? Are they going to store it? Should we get rid of them? No, goddammit. Marilyn scowls just for having an opinion about it. The kingdom needs guns no matter what. Even though we might not have the right ammunition, we can make it. Tim that damn name makes him shudder. Timothy has have enough experiences to do it. However, preventing this from happening is the monarchy's policy. With no gun regulations, my eyes would surely a cure. What kind of protocols do they need to protect the streets if everyone has a gun? What kind of horrors will ensue from this fatal choice, even if even it has a chance? You need to think of a code, this is for everyone to abide by. There will be rewards for people who obey them, and punishments for the ones who don't. It needs to be something the king will look at twice. At the kingdom's gates, Timothy wears the happiest expression imaginable. A new team of miners marches off to repair and prepare the miners for restoration. Civ civilians stand behind them, gasping. That place hasn't been touched since Alexander's death. Behind forming crowds, smokestacks remain useless in the industrial district. Not for long, Timothy thinks. In the throne room, Forrest weeps loudly at the dining room table. Next to the bed, Alice's crib. He wipes his eyes, reality cracking open before him. What they did killed off an entire nation, and Echo paid the price for his negligence. Was her sacrifice really necessary in the end? Could they have just used some desperate volunteer? The worst part about it is that the voices aren't talking to him anymore. That's just him and his actions. What made him disappear? What, did they leave his mind for once? Did they ever come back in some god nightmare, or is it true? Silence. All his life, noise. No more this time. He actually hears passing gales, howling howls bouncing off the edges of hay rooftops. He thinks about Echo every day, more specifically, the moment she went up in flames. The sound of the boom still rings through his mind like the church bells of some demonic sanctuary. The warmth of the ensuing fire wraps around his arms in the present moment, burning flesh and melting bone as if he's catching a glimpse of God's face. Without the, f without the queen, what will they do? Would an election be of any use that the people are too afraid to move on? Crossing over to the window, she scans the kingdom below, just like how she used to. Babylon is like this because of him, yet he doesn't feel any guilt. What will be the thing that finally breaks him? The physical representation of dissolving boundaries in his psyche? Unitis is nothing more than a memory, but that memory persists through one abstract perspective of matter. 
It's that it's as if an invisible crater rests forever in the hearts of countless survivors. Whether that crater is of emptiness, regret, or shame, it's up to the host's decision. Forrest thinks about what happened to his partner, Marissa. Did she survive that terrible hour, or has she succumbed to the collapse that she's still changing the world? History works in mysterious ways. It acts as a map, tracing back one's destiny to its origins. Forrest feels immense guilt for not studying it closer. Perhaps if he did, he would have had a more effective strategist during the Battle of Portland. Why does he even keep thinking about the aftermath of that fight? In the van's cargo hold, during the king's transportation, he swears the hallucination of Echo felt more real than her. Should he feel uneasy about this realization? Is this moment even worth pondering on anymore? He doesn't know if this is schizophrenia, but recently he catches sight of her ghost. Some nights he even hears a faint whisper for some time in the past, remembering what she said the day she died. He grins. Chuckling, he says, If you wanted me to hear you, I do now. The housing district, Heather marches its roads with a squadron. Martial law is still in effect. The strange thing is, the Babylonians want it to continue. She notices the vibrant yet colorless change in the atmosphere. What once mended the illusion of hope now emits what, what has been behind this curtain this entire time. The stage has fallen. The glitches in Matrix is real. It's almost as if an invisible virus is sweeping through them, hijacking any feelings of happiness. The worst part about this is Heather still believes in making a brighter future out of this. It is foolish to fight for the Babylon state of isolation. Is it foolish to defend the place that gave you a second chance at life? Is it foolish to doubt karma in this world, even if it's for an instant? Humoring herself, she asks if it's foolish to believe in God now. Widening her eyes, a realization dawns upon the commander. The very foundation of reality are built on belief. We get what we want, but only when we earn it first. All it takes is three knocks at the gatehouse for the day to even get weirder. Heather opens up the wandering wooden rock iron entrance, finding Marissa on the other side. She feels a lot worse now. Skin dangles off her bones as if the epidermis is nothing more than rags covering a light post. The commander imagines herself closing the gate on the poor girl, but she can't bring herself to do it. Babylonia should always save other people, even if they were once enemies. That's what Echo would have wanted. At the meeting room in the clock tower, Marilyn and Marissa sit at opposite sides of a rectangular table. You know what this is, she assures. We lost. You won. I had to get out of the city on the rafts. Uh, are you surrendering? No, I want to leave the acolytes so I can join you. Merlin settles back in his chair, a single choice inviting the possibility of domestic terrorism. What's it been like out there? Terrible. Winter's made it almost impossible for us to survive. More, all, m most of us are malnourished, maybe barely able to make it out the next day. The fire, that damn fire did it to us. We don't have enough water to fight a fire and keep society intact. We let it burn because we had to. We endured every second of it. Now we spend most of our hours outside trying to move on. They're too loyal to leave. I am not. Do you have anything to rebuild the bridge? No, I'm telling you, all our equipment is useless. I came here looking for a second chance. This is what place is about, right? Giving people hope. Give me hope, Marilyn. You know who I was when I was with Ignitus, and I don't want to be that kind of person anymore. I don't want to be codependent. Please, let me be who I am. I'll even be a prisoner for Christ's sakes. Crossing over to her, he pats the girl down. You'll be in the dungeon for two weeks. We'll have bigger issues to focus on right now. Crying, she collapses to her knees. Thank you. Oh, God. Grunting, he turns away, staring for the door. Me and Heather. Commander greets him by saying, I should have closed the fuck gate when I had the chance. No, you did the right thing. This is what Babylon needs right now. People need to see the boundaries of good and evil dissolve before their eyes. Let that fear working together. We won't move past this. That's the only way we can. We've, we've been apart from each other for too long. We need to regain the camaraderie we once had for each other. Where did it go? What we made it disappear? Experience, Marilyn. Smokes. The people need to understand this is Babylon, this is what we're supposed to become. The way I see it, Forrest is out of the picture for now. It's time we put our heads together. First things first, I need handcuffs for the prisoner transportation. That night, the commander knocks on the front door of Timothy's house. Opening it, the gunsmith invites her inside. What is it? Marilyn has an offer. Scoffing across his arms. Him an offer for me? Don't be like that, especially now, just listen to me. Fine, what is it? He wants to take him in on a debate. What? He wants to know differently than him about the gun issue. You and him are the brightest minds this kingdom has. 
Think about it. Two intelligent forces coming together to absolve us from purgatory. It's harder to perform an act for an opinion. That's all debates are to me. Come on, she shrieks. Just throw me a fucking bone. Our leader is a hermit and our other leader is dead. The people need someone to look up to. No. Gritting her teeth, she re- resorts to one last choice. All your life, you wanted the same recognition Marilyn has now. People know you for protecting Alice. But don't you want to be known for something historical? Something that changes the pages of future history books? This world needs that right now, and you could be at its helm. He rests his hand on his stomach, pointing the old bullet's impact. Fine, you're right, I'll do it. Happiness. Relief. Thank you, Timothy. I'm glad we see eye to eye now. Why does anybody reach out for him, you think? Why reach out for somebody that's not there? The following day, construction workers build two stages in Babylon's trading district, podiums in their centers. The crowd slowly forms into a mob. At the front row, Heather and her squadron of knights. They aim guns directly at the people, who hold the grips of their own firearms tightly. Tension, that's the only word appropriate enough to encapsulate such a spectacle. (coughs) Questions about force dance in the air like lifeless mysteries. They wonder who will be the next queen, who will just start getting exports from the farmlands or the mines. Fragile times, useless safety precautions. When the workers finish their projects, Timothy and Marilyn take their positions at each one. Marilyn scans her expression, feeling that unforgivable weight of pressure. If someone says the wrong thing during this, a storm will surely strike. It's not fear Marilyn and Timothy want to bring down upon them, but a sense of critical thinking. If a courtroom ever had the power to determine the future of society, that would be that courtroom. The opponents are the judges, and the Babylonians are the jury. Why do people feel this consistent need to stress the self-proclaimed holy virtues of their beliefs? Timothy thinks about this. Glaring at the em- enemy from afar, this debate is not another war fought with the issue they're trying to fight. It'd be one as a philosophical fern, a tree spewing its branches in every direction in tune with the motions of its growth. Everyone! Marilyn cries out, cupping hands over his mouth. May I have your attention? Everyone thankfully settles down. It's obvious we have a problem regarding guns. This debate is about whether we should keep them or get rid of them. Where's Forrest? A Babylonian screams, We need the king! We need the king! The chant grows louder and louder, and to a continuous stream of non-stop calls, Heather fires off a shot, quieting the madness instantly. Timothy takes the spotlight. He is not who we look toward anymore. He has forgotten us because of Echo. Henceforth, we will be your new leaders. Gesturing to the once upon a time teacher, he adds, I think we're the dream team. We'll be a perfect fit. The commander stares in shock. The commander stares in shock. What? Marilyn extends his hands as if he's blocking some invisible martyr. Now that's a great idea, Heather. Don't you see? Until Forrest gets back on her feet. We will be our temporary standings. Clearing his throat, he continues. Now, in light of our most recent developments, we have an influx of security. We need these guns. Cheers are up from the people. The knights do their best to calm them down. The speaker waits for a moment of silence. With these guns, I believe there'll be a system set in place. This entails an entire reformation of our current one real policy. I'm talking background tests, safety classes, and everyone wants one. They need to prove themselves. <sighs> How will we be able to change what the king wants? Timothy asks. How will you stand a chance against this word? Even if he does come back, he's not going to want to let go of the monarchy. That's why I want to get rid of them. We need to honor our traditions. The knights appear to have crumbs of interest in their words. The crowd listens attentively. When Forrest walks out of his throne room, do you want to think you see everyone holding a gun? Do you wonder how it'll make them feel? He chuckles. Ha, how can every us? Any of us forget about Dante. All of you have the potential kills right now. Where we stand. All it takes nowadays is a word to flip someone's switch. Uh, what about protection? Marilyn retorts. What if terrorists burn down the farmlands? The people don't have anything to fight with. We have an army, you know that, right? But you don't want to feel self-reliant? I'm thankful enough for our walls. As long as there's a roof over my head, that's all I care about. I don't want to worry about going to a gun factory where the workers would both snap and kill as they please. None of that matters anyway. It won't change the fact that the king still has all the power. Marilyn grits his teeth. It was a constitutional right for the people to overthrow America's government. It was a constitutional right to own a gun in case of such an event. The world is changing. We need to change with it. It doesn't have to keep changing, Timothy argues. You know you can't stop it, but you let it happen. 
The more change we experience, the worse off we are. Every move we made during the war sent us back countless steps in people. How can we control the world if we can't even control ourselves? We need to get rid of them before anything bad can happen. Only the army should be allowed to carry arms, not a stranger in a dead man's world. The more he talks, the more everyone seems to agree with the gunsmith. Marilyn didn't intend for this to happen. He honestly thought he would win them over. He already smells the burning pieces of life-saving instruments. Taking a leap of faith, Marilyn... Echo was the first person I met when this whole thing started. It was lifetimes ago. She was the one that got me to where I am today. I never got to thank her for that. But I guess I have to live with the guilt now. Anyway, I didn't know how to shoot. It was a miracle I even made to that tunnel in Colorado. We were making our way to the saddle. She taught me how to save myself. We got into a situation at the gas station. It was the hardest sum of our lives. <laughs> that night a biker game came to us. They beat Echo until she could barely breathe. I killed him with all pistol. If I didn't have it, your queen would be dead. He glares at Timothy. You're a gunsmith. Why don't you support customers having and using your product? I want all the army using my products. My product? Nothing from the war. Ha, huh, we don't need these things reminding us what happened. The only way to fix this is by getting rid of them. Will you trust me with, gun with the gun, Marilyn? You wouldn't know how much I despise you. What if I just decided to be the victor? What if God gave me the power to take your life with nothing more than metal and a mere trigger? If your policy goes through, wouldn't it really bring back safety? I will bring back what a guy people do understand. This power separates us from death. If we really want Babylon to become an empire, we should have the dis defense to make it, uh, name it as such. The hours press on like this, bouncing back and forth from one perspective to the next. Clear division makes itself apparent among the onlookers. The cracks in the once unbreakable mirror become visible. Heather doesn't know what made him like this. Is this really how a society should behave after a war, especially one after a division makes itself apparent among the onlookers? The cracks in a once unbreakable mirror become visible. Under the wrath of the needle, the space needle brings her to a conclusion. Society only prevails under wrath. Has there ever been a successful empire with merciless, merciless intent that survives without sin? Where is purity when you have to save people from doom? Occasionally, knights fire off rounds, the scene resembling the Boston Tea Party. Civilians grow restless, angry. They pump their fists in the air as if they're observing a mosh pit. Do you want an answer? Timothy finally cries out. Well, we're the question. You decide what we should do. Astonishingly, unanimously, unan, unanimously, Raylan watches with great fear as they chant, Burn the guns! Burn the guns! Burn the guns! The telltale time of changing dawns on the kingdom. It comes quietly like a whisper, but grows into the glass-shattering voice of a woman singing an opera. Marissa moves out of the dungeon into her own house. She spends her leisure time tending to a garden, pursuing art, and forgetting about Ignitus. <sighs> Heather develops a romantic interest in Marilyn, who remains oblivious due to Timothy Triumph's power. Timothy becomes prideful for solving the gun crisis, oftentimes rubbing in Marilyn's face at inappropriate intervals. The mines in the farmlands become operational once again. Finally, Timothy's machines sputter back to life. Finally, people will bring home the bread and bacon. Wait, where there is no bread, why not plant a wheat field? That's what the Babylonians come to realize during this period. Forest remains alone this entire time. Isolation becomes his happy place. He becomes too anxious to even peer out the, open, the window anymore. Nothing can make him forget about her. What is he to anybody now? How can he just pluck another queen out of an ocean of choices? How would he know who to trust when he can't even do the same with himself? Whatever it is, it builds his walls high. One day, a Russian survivor pushes Maryland in the industrial district. I have an idea for you, the stranger insists. My name is Darako Ramsey. I saw the bridge when it collapsed. For what it's worth, I'm glad you're alive. I'm not so sure Force would be too keen on listening to me. What is it? asks the new leader. We need to do this in private. Absolutely sort of. Can you stop at my house this afternoon? I live right to the playground. That sounds good. I'll see you then. At the designated time, Marilyn walks upon the steps of the Russian house. He knocks, Ramsey responds, and the civilian sets them up at the table in the kitchen. They eat fried rice, feeling good about themselves. Here's what I'm thinking. <coughs> Ramsey starts. You said that the world was changing, and we have to change with it. If I have something in mind that follows your line of thinking, an expedition out east? Marilyn almost spits out his food. <laughs> what, what? What on earth would you do something like that? Jericho sits upright in his chair, growing stern. 
want Babylon to become an empire. How can our boundaries grow if we don't know what's outside them? Force never let anyone outside the walls, but it doesn't have to be that way. We made this world a safe place by knowing it. Be careful or you'll navigate through it. If you ever want to contribute so badly to something that made you feel guilty for being useless? That's how I feel every day when I walk these roads. I, I want to do something different, something I can be really proud of. Pride will get you killed in this world, so we'll be ignorant of your surroundings. Maryland size. How many people you think you're taking? 59. Lewis and Cox style. Who would these people be? Knights? Peasants? Volunteers? The last time we had an expedition, our old commander was killed. Do you really think it's a risk worth taking? Alexander ordered oil from California. I want inner peace from Virginia. If I find any communities, I'll mark them and bring them to the king for who wants to conquer them. A bleak atmosphere falls upon Maryland. Where else do you fight during the war? Portland. Do you think we're any different from the Acolytes? Survival isn't based off the nature of good or bad. It's about how much you want to be human. The Acolytes are who we are. We got into this us and them mindset because that's just how the game was programmed. Now the game is switching. The hack was breaking through this infinite fucking firewall. When the game changes permanently, when we're living in the shadow of its former self, that's when we know if we're good or bad. And that's when you have to uh, you have your answer. Marilyn tilts his head. Alright, I'll let you go. Where are you planning on leaving? A few days, I still need supplies, names, the whole sheet bag. Okay. Jericho leans forward. Don't doubt yourself, Marilyn, you're making the right call. It's hard to tell what's right or wrong anymore. The Russian smiles, but it's not impossible. You must know that this war will be beneficial for everyone in some way or another. I do, but the risk is more to stop me from saying yes. Alexander went to California, found the acolytes. What will you come back with? Strange, a better world. The next frontier. Why don't you believe in me? What makes you think I'll end up in our position? You can't disclose Murphy's law. It's true in every scenario, especially just as perilous as this. You don't know how you much find in there. I do. Oh, you think so? Yes, it's been, it's been in front of us all along, destiny. You have maps? Kind of explore or wouldn't. A route? Navigation is the most important part of the journey. The geography? Well, we've been transversed through it. I'll only expect trouble at the mountains. Beyond that, everything seems possible. Snow is finally letting up too. It's the perfect time to spread our wings. The thing you said about down yourself, what made you see it? Instinct. Awestruck, Marilyn lets himself breathe. I gave Echo the exact advice. Tell me stuff to Jericho, what do you think of free will? Look around you and tell me it doesn't exist. We are the ones who got us here. There's nothing else to blame. You're right. I'm sorry for not stressing you before. I'm just trying to be cautious. It's okay, I understand. In your shoes, I'd be acting the same way. It's real shame what happened to Alex and what happened after, but I promise it won't happen again. Uh, what gave you this idea? Jericho smiles. A dream. How? I had the version of the East Coast that was standing out in front of this metallic wall higher than anything we've ever seen before. I turned around and I found a sign for travelers entering Virginia, a whole section of America with countless survivors occupying it. If I meet up with whoever's over there, maybe it'll be better. Instinct, Merlin. It survives all of our instinct. When, when, when will you return? Within two weeks of my departure. Marilyn chuckles. How do you people manage to make this shit so hard? Leading a society after a war is not meant to be an easy task. Grinning, Ramsey adds, I'm sure you've heard of Pink. Who? Widening his eyes, the Russian mouth drops. The Russian's mouth drops. Ever since the farmlands were completed, people found messages written in pink spray paint on Babylon's walls. Most of the messages are in that region, probably because it's the farthest one from the gate. What are the message? Let's just say the monarchy won't be happy. Can you just talk? Can you take me to them now, right now? Sure, I hope you're ready for a long walk though. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Shakespeare, down with the crown, anarchy shall guide us. Marilyn reads these messages, feeling what their creator felt in this moment. He never liked the way Forrest treated Echo, but this will be horrible for the damn helmet sees these scrolls. The queen's death and now this? What else is going to come at them from thin air? What terrible tribulations does a non-existent god have in store for them? The gods have seen this before, in the chateau, Jericho affirms. The bastard's too slippery for them, though. Why has nobody told you? Maybe they don't respect you. How is he getting through all of our squadrons of marching knights? How does he sneak out of the beams of flash that's feeling nothing? How does any of this make any goddamn sense? 
I don't know, but the only thing I do know is that they have to find who's been leaving these. They're a ticking time bomb for Forrest, and if he escalates into another Dante situation, the Babylonians will hear echoes that didn't change a damn thing. How do you know about Dante? I have ears, Madeline. I listen. The secrets are here, in this present moment. I could read people like a book. Do you know about anything else? Why would I tell you? You would want to trust you. You're not doing a very good job at convincing me. Maybe I'll backslide on my decision. All I know is what's in my head. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, if that's what it takes. I just need to manifest my own destiny. Analyzing the messages, Marilyn states, This paint's fresh. These were recent. If we knock on some doors, maybe we'll get some answers. I witnessed their testimonies is a useless form of evidence, and for court to law, it's the only choice you have. There's no we. I'll be gone. Right, you better start getting ready then. I'll let Heather know that this as soon as possible. That evening in the barracks, Heather retorts, I didn't know I was supposed to tell you. Why is it anybody lay me in on this shit? Other people have known since the farmlands were built. You saw how they behaved when you were speaking. They obviously have different opinions. Most of them favor Timothy. I don't know any of the beef you have between each other, but it can't get any worse. Things get physical. There's no telling what kind of madness will ensue. Control yourself, Marilyn, your ego, your pride, yourself. Let it all go. That's the only thing you'll gain the respect. There's something Forrest never did. He's always held on to his issues. Look where it got him. The people don't know they need you in charge yet. You have to make them want you. Hours later, Marilyn watches them as Jericho leaves the kingdom with his team. People are going outside the walls now, whether Forrest likes it or not. The more we isolate ourselves from one another, the more we'll spiral into something we can't come back from. The Babylonians can't be as broken as this world. There needs to be a sense of brotherhood amongst us all of us. He doesn't know what makes him stay, but he remains at the gates for several hours, Babylon continuing behind him. We sometimes find ourselves staring up to a vast, tameless universe. We have the audacity to believe that the truth of our existence is out there, hiding just beneath our noses. Perhaps the world ended because of our negligence to find it. We decide to waste our attention on unforgivable, treacherous activities. Whether it's the temptation of evil or the natural devolution of good, society only prevails under wrath. When has a successful country ever been led through merc merciful intent? What is that utopia we long to create? The Atlantis or Shangri-La? That's just around the corner, waiting for someone to uncover it? Drain that damn ocean, Marilyn thinks. Something guide us out of this shithole. Here, peering through the gatehouse, he watches as another figure crosses the bridge alone. The guards on the wall walk to call for a newcomer to stop. Whether it obeys, whoever it is, obeys. Obey. Walking to the gate, the keeper opens it and closes after he passes the threshold. They meet face to face on the drawbridge. The loner is of African American descent, wields a three pronged trident, carries a military grade backpack. Who are you? Marilyn demands. I go by numbers. And I would like to speak to the leader about this society. I am its leader. I built it from the ground up. Whatever you have, offer it to me. I'm not taking you inside. You don't trust me. Yeah, you stand outside your own protection, open to people who might have crosshairs on you this very moment. That logic is inconsistent. The stranger can't be inside right now. Just went through something terrible. I'm not going to willingly invite something terrible in our lives. A white smile appears on his face. You're just going like what I have to say then. I've been watching you since Portland. I know about all the war between you and the acolyte. I was there up to the Golden Gate Bridge. After that, I got distracted by family business, but here I am. I just have one question to ask you. What is it? Would you like to join the second Silk Road? At the throne room, Heather kicks down the door against the king's orders. He stumbles back from the force, but the commander catches him before he falls. Standing upright, he screams, What the hell? His new appearance makes her gasp. The king now has a bald head, and he wears Echo's crown. How did you get that? Heather asks. She left it. It's like she knew that was coming. Breathing heavily, she retaliates with, It's been too long. I couldn't stand by and watch everything plunge into confusion anymore. We need order. You're the only one that could provide it for us. That speech you made at the debate, none of that is true. I understand that you're upset that Echo died, but damn it, you have people to lead. You have to know to honor the crown that you're wearing on your head right now. Remember the night that you were sick, delirious, barely conscious at the hospital. You told me that you had schizophrenia. Well, Forrest, if you want to get better, the only thing you can do is free your head.
To be continued. End of chapter 10. End of Babylon's Final Hours. A Psychedelic Trilogy into the Apocalypse by J.R. Mason.